Heads up, rogues, this channel is exploding and there's a lot of y'all who are brand new. We've had 60 million plus views over the last three months and you guys are all asking, where's this from? What was this episode about? Where can I hit a button and have it on all day so I can finally get caught up? Well, guess what? We are introducing the Modern Rogue Challenge. In chronological order, the first 71 episodes all strung together so you can turn it on and just watch it like classic waterfall television. You get caught up, you get reminded of all your favorite bits, you become a national hero if you take the 12-hour Modern Rogue Challenge starting right now. No, dude, I would do Jet, I would do Mentats. I would do stim packs. Stim packs. Uh, I do yeah. super stim packs. I would do psycho. Vigors? Yeah, vigors. <laughs> yeah, man, I'll do vigors. <laughs> I want a drug that makes bees shoot out of my hand. <laughs> you can at least believe it, like, ah! <laughs> the Modern Rogue presents Whiskey Vapor. So, what woefully inappropriate, dangerous thing are we about to attempt? Uh, don't do this. Lots of people are doing it. Don't do it. First of okay. all, we don't know that anybody's doing it, except for us right now. I've seen, I've seen it on the internet, so okay. it's a thing. There are products that were marketed to sell the idea of inhaling alcoholic beverages. Yes, correct. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of problems. First of all, long-term effects are unknown. There aren't any long-term studies. Number two, what is known is that you can absorb the alcohol through your lungs, but it goes straight in your bloodstream. Correct. So you could get way dangerously drunk and Faster. Un yeah, exactly. And and unlike alcohol, like if you were to drink this and your body's like, Oop, that's too much, your body has a way to reject the, it. The body's natural defense system from overdosing in alcohol, vomiting, doing this, uh, obviates that. Yes. Poison.org says some... Oh, they, 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 don't know. <laughs> they, they don't know. Good old killjoys. <laughs> if it's going through directly from your lungs to your bloodstream, just like air and all of the other impurities in air, you are not digesting anything. So you, not only are you getting it faster, it's more potent. Right. And uh, now uh, it is a myth that this is a way to have alcohol without the calories. It's like the lower alcohol content, the less calories because beer has more calories than alcohol anyway. Right. So, but yeah, if you're trying to do this to avoid calories, it's not even worth it. There are lots of devices that you can buy to do similar things. There are various ways to have booze as your inhalant. There's pouring it over uh, dry ice. Right. And then there's the uh, devices you can get to heat it up and then do it that way. This way is really easy. And you can put it in any sort of container like this, any sort of bottle, glass, or plastic, or whatever. I did it with vodka the other day. Uh, this is whiskey right now. So you take just a, not really a bicycle pump, but a pump for like basketball, basketball. Or, or soccer or what have you. So you gotta have that needle on the end, which we've uh, threaded through this uh, this cork. So you pour a little bit in there and you gotta leave some room for it to build up the pressure. You jam it in there like that, get your straw ready. The idea is to look really like you're free basing someone's unhealthy oh, urine. Jeez, this is a bad <laughs> idea. This is a bad idea. It's not that bad. But yeah, you wanna build up a lot of pressure. I understand theoretically it works, and trust me, I'm no stranger to the experience of, what the? Yep. Do you feel anything? I feel classy. <laughs> well, you feel the burn, and I don't know if I feel anything right now, because really, it's a minuscule amount of alcohol that you're well, that's, getting that's in That's the part I can't believe. I mean, it doesn't feel like anything. I'll buy you a little bit of whiskey if you do it through your nose. <laughs> Basically what we're looking at is it's like a, a fog bank rolling in. As you increase pressure, the likelihood of evaporation decreases. You're increasing this pressure, but then when you let it off, low pressure is moving in. So like a low pressure front, like triggering a, a phase change. Through the nose, you say? Through the nose. Responsible science. That burns. <laughs> <laughs> I was not good. Not good. <laughs> do, you, do you feel anything? I can't tell. Maybe. Can't Maybe it's because we're anything. drunks. I mean, <laughs> it turns out it's like, uh, uh, you have a bit of a tolerance. Yeah. I, I don't want to overdo it because that's the big thing that you worry about with this. Right. Is, well, in the 50s, they used to use it to treat pulmonary edema. So think of this as preventative medicine. They would do that with alcohol? I believe so. Turn that through the nose. Is it supposed to help through the nose? It looks so wrong. It's terrible. You're right. Don't it doesn't. Do it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I'm not feeling. I don't think so either. That is alcohol. Make no mistake. Really, it's more of a gimmick than anything because this really isn't much less booze than we put in there. That's a lot of work to get some alcohol directly into your bloodstream. I've also read reports that say the alcohol buzz lasts for a shorter amount of time. Yeah. And the most vocal critics of it have been, you know, the folks 
trying to prevent drunk drivers. Make no mistake, if you drive after this, you will fail your driving test if you get pulled over. Because that's how so much of the, so much booze is eliminated from the body is from exhalation. Oh really? Yeah. Y you know what, do it with soda. Let's try it, let's try it with a responsible beverage. <laughs> but it's the alcohol that evaporates the easiest. So do you wanna do it with rubbing alcohol? Uh, oh Jesus. <laughs> All right, so what's the verdict on this? It's cool to watch the vapors explode. The science of it is interesting, I yep. think. I can't really speak for the efficacy because we're not trying it enough to really get anywhere. Yeah. But I also don't want to, but it is kind of cool to know that that's a thing. I don't know, I, I just say drink the damn stuff. Yeah, that's much better. <laughs> a drug that makes you hallucinate things from video games. That like, would be amazing. Yeah. I do, I do sex packets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mushrooms. Uh, wait, wait, that's a real thing though. Oh wait. Everything else. Right. Wow, you crossed the line. That was dark. <laughs> Too far. Let's start with an easy one. Hard taco or soft taco? Hard taco. Okay. Uh, in Chirito or Mexican pizza? In Chirito. Okay, uh, I'll give yeah. that to you. I'm, I'm a team Mexican pizza. I don't know about you, but I am in love with the Taco Bell app. It unlocks the entire menu. Not only is it more convenient, but you can mix and match the ingredients. So I was wondering if it's possible to cheat the system, to hack the Taco Bell menu and get items cheaper than they should be. It is absolutely possible and I did it. We gotta do some science. We're gonna have to put this to the test. For science! Modern Road hacks the Taco Bell menu. Try not to look too suspicious. Yeah. Cool. Let me let me get a, a quesarito burrito, a nachos bel grande. We'll do a uh, mexi melt and one burrito supreme. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good one. I'm using your own technology against you, Taco Bell. Uh, I have a VIP pickup for uh, Jason. All right. Thank you very much. Is this the part where one of us looks at the camera and goes, "You just got hacked." Item one: the quesarito. What are we working with here? This is the beefy Frito Burrito, but I hacked it. Oh, that's really disappointing looking when you open it up like that. Uh, as all Taco Bell is. No, look at this. So what you do is you take the beefy Frito Burrito off the Dollar Cravings menu. The Dollar Cravings menu is the uh, starting point for all of these delicious hacks. You remove the Fritos, which is against the laws of God and man, but <laughs> if we're gonna do apples to apples, and then you add the chipotle sauce, mm -hmm. the cheese sauce, mm -hmm. and the sour cream. And then you have the exact same ingredients as the quesarito burrito. Total savings, what, 60 cents? 60 cents. Hells yeah, count me in for that one. I think that's a success. Item two, the Mexi Melt. All right, so what do you do to make a beefy mini quesadilla into this guy? All right, it's actually really easy. All you do is take your beefy mini quesadilla, you remove the chipotle sauce, no savings there, but then you add pico de gallo. For what, like 20 something cents? It's like 25 cents. And then once you add that, you that have- That is the exact same thing. Are you kidding me? For half the price. Half price? Yes, the two, Mexi Melt is $2.49. 249 125 Exactly. Yeah, this guy's out. This guy's my new jam. Item three, the burrito supreme. Burrito supreme versus the beefy five layer burrito. So what do you do to it? You just take the beefy five layer burrito, you go into the add-ons, you add red sauce, lettuce, onions, and tomatoes, and you have the exact same thing. So this one's $2.99, what does that come out to? $2.19. Wow, it's the same damn thing. For almost a dollar <laughs> savings. I feel like this is like alien autopsy, but with Taco Bell, the cigarette smoking man is gonna walk in in a second. Did you try the Enchirito? You really should. Item four, the Nachos Bel Grande. All right, number four is a little bit different. We have a Nachos Bel Grande versus the triple nachos with the Taco Supreme. So this one you have to do a little bit of assembly on. Right? Yes, this is as close to cooking as I ever get. You start with the triple layer nachos here. You can remove the red sauce if you want, but there's no savings for that. And then you take the Taco Supreme and it has all of the same ingredients that we have right there in the Nachos Bel Grande. Cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, sour cream, beans, and seasoned beef. So we're just gonna take this, you want me to go ahead and? Yeah, go ahead. All right. This one you get actual shredded cheese in addition to the cheese sauce. That's right. So that's 319 versus? 259. It's looking pretty neck and neck, honestly. This one I might go over here. I don't know that I wanna get my hands all mucky on that. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought we were eating at Taco Bell. <laughs> the final results. Ordering everything straight off the menu, no changes. My meal was $11.16. How'd you do with your hacked meal? With the hacked meal, $7.93. Are you kidding me? 
kidding me? Three and a half bucks practically. That is amazing. Yeah. For essentially the exact same order. Yeah, that's another entire meal if you stick well, to the dollar cravings. Yeah, menu. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we get to eat now? Yes, please, Good. please God, I wanna eat. Dude, I gotta tell you, I knew that there was some savings in there. I did not expect it to be that huge. A whole other meal between your cost and mine. Yeah. That's insane. I thought we were going to have to justify and tell people how exciting it was that I saved 30 cents or something <laughs> like that. No, it was actually like almost four bucks. We should point out that all of the prices that we quoted here are the nationwide prices. Each individual restaurant will vary. Some of them you'll have bigger savings, others of them you'll have a little bit less. So your mileage may vary, but you gotta toast me, man. We got an epic meal on the cheap. Yeah, I like using the app way better than having to sit there and explain it to that poor person and having them have to jump through all of my hoops. Uh, having them communicate with the technology puts up a, a protection, a shame barrier <laughs> so that I don't have to explain to them <laughs> my recipe. I'd like to introduce you to the best uh, 1999 has to offer. <laughs> Modern Rogue explains burner phones. Do you have a burner? I do, actually. Do you? Yeah. A lot of people know what a burner is, but they don't know like what it is. The term burner actually comes from criminal jargon, uh, the patois of the street. Hey man, I will. watch The Wire. I don't, it's I don't, very I'm much picking from up what you're wire. putting down. So you say, uh, oh, this number's burned. The police are onto it or too many people have it or whatever. So you just toss the phone. And uh, I got this one at a uh, big box retailer for uh, about $8. That's yeah. amazing. Now that, that, that was not activated with minutes, right? Correct, and that's part of the point is that they're disposable. These are all prepaid phones and that's really all they are. And I know a lot of people think that that's just really kind of common sense. Of course they're just prepaid phones, but the reason that is important is because you don't log any of your personal data whatsoever. All you pay it is cash, is, you show up wearing a funny hat and glasses. Maybe using a French accent. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but yeah, you just buy a prepaid card again in cash from like a convenience store or something like that. And that gives you minutes. And there are a lot of prepaid providers that aren't, you know, AT&T or Verizon where, you know, when you go into one of those stores to get your smartphone, they do a credit check and ask you to, you know, provide your work history and et cetera. None of that with this. It's not off the grid, but it's as close as you can get with, and still have a communication device. In Asian countries, oftentimes people will have a work phone and a play phone, like a home phone. And so sometimes they'll actually have phones that actually have two different SIMs so that they can keep two different numbers active at all times. I get a lot of calls from fans of Scam School and sometimes I'll want to text them back, but I don't want to give them my actual phone number. I use an app called Burner. You just create a new Burner. Now, of course, you know, if you're doing anything criminal, you probably don't want to use this since they have all your actual contact information. But if you just want a discreet way to chat for a bit and then you can pick whatever area code you want to appear to be from. So oh, we'll wow. Do Austin. Boom. Now I've got an actual one month long Burner 50 minutes of talk time, 150 texts. That's really cool. One of the things though that uh, actual burner phones have over the burner app, it's much more difficult to trace these. Because yeah. on these phones, depending on which one you select, uh, track phone is the most popular one and often kind of uh, interchangeable jargon for burner. A lot of them don't have GPS. They're not smartphones. They don't even have 3G or LTE. Uh, they're run by MVNOs or mobile virtual network operators, these prepaid companies. And what they do is they buy up space on an existing large scale provider like on Verizon's network or AT&T. AT yeah. And the NSA has actually admitted that it is very difficult for them to track burner phones. Once they get your number, they've got your number and they can track you. One guy had uh, two burners and they used the positions of both of them to triangulate and find out where he was. If you do need to vanish and not be found, then uh, you buy these, you pay with cash, buy minutes from a different place than you buy the phone. And change them regularly, they're cheap. Don't give them uh, the same number to latch on to. Yeah. Switch it up every few weeks is what uh, the, uh, the professionals uh, advise. It doesn't have to be just for criminal enterprises, like you were saying, you can also use it for, uh, say you're selling something on Craigslist, or uh, having to input information on an online form or yep. something like that. And also, let's say you're running multiple businesses and you want to answer sounding more professional, you don't have to call and say like, hi, it's Joe. Oh, which thing are you calling about? You have different phones labeled with each of your enterprises. You shelves are us, what's up? And then you automatically sound more pro because you know everyone calling that number is calling just for that one thing. Yeah, and if you just want to feel like Jason Statham in the transporter, you just keep like six of these in your glove box in a velvet line box <laughs> and uh, don't explain it. Don't ever explain it. Plus, for $8, you get to be that guy out in public. You're like, fine. You just yes. throw it out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the 
modern row makes gas masks. Uh, dude, there's a big one. Yeah. Homemade gas masks. Yeah. Are you nervous? Well, cautiously optimistic. <laughs> That's encouraging. I think this is going to be okay. My only misgiving is that all of these ingredients are readily available and none of them are terribly exotic. It's really easy to put this thing together. Well, we got two liter soda bottles. We got uh, soda cans yep. that it looks like you make the housing out of. But what's the magic go-go juice? The most important thing are the activated carbon pellets. Now, these are what you find in like Brita water filters. I got at a pet store for aquariums. So this is just from a pet store, yeah. activated charcoal. Now, I know activated charcoal is what they'll give to people who have overdosed yes. or who have something in their belly. Yeah, something. it bonds with uh, the uh, contaminant that you've taken into your system. Uh, they, the vets often recommend that you give it to a dog if he eats chocolate or something else that will make an animal sick. Theoretically, we're gonna breathe through this stuff and whatever the tear gas is. Theoretically. <laughs> it's going to filter out all of the impurities, and we're going to put some cotton in there to add a little extra layer of protection on all top right, of let's, it. Let's start. Let's, let's just dive in here. Step one. Yeah, step one. What you want to do is you want to cut the bottom off of the canister. And the bottom of the two liter will actually be the top of your mask. Okay. You want it to fit over your face, so you don't want to cut off too much. You'll just take it and cut like a rectangle. So the idea right is the wide part should be a band across your forehead. What you want is something like this. Ah, uh, yeah. That your face fits into, and you want the sides to wrap around a little bit. It's going so to work great. From, okay, from the front line looks like a Roman centurion mask. Okay. See? Is, is that a fit? The tape will help with that, but yeah, you want to make sure that you get as much contact with your skin as possible. What about there's kind of a gap up here, yeah. and then this is poking in. It feels like the pokey bits are pushing the mask off my face. Uh, so I'm going to try rounding, rounding these down. Oh, that feels much tighter. Yeah. And, and in fact, if you have it sealed off and you can suck and keep it in, then I think you got a good seal. Oh, and you could take the uh, the cap and toss that. So what we're gonna do is wrap electrical tape, not only for sealing it up, but just for comfort, really, so that you don't have these sharp edges jabbing All into right. your skin. I kind of feel like we're the Elon Musks of garbage. <laughs> All right, I'm feeling pretty good. It's a tight seal. The next part is that we want to uh, set up the filtration system. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna take these cans and I was making mine rather long, actually. You figure the more that you're breathing through, the better, right? Um, yeah, and before you cut it, it's a little easier if you poke the holes in the bottom. Breathing first. holes first, okay. Yeah, all right. And so you wanna get plenty of these in there. Now you're using a compass, right? Yeah, just to make several punctures. So I, I assume the thought here is we want enough that there's a free way for air to flow through, but we don't want so much that the charcoal can fall right out, right? Correct. Is that, is that looking good? That looks great. After that, you're gonna wanna put some cotton padding in there. You can use these regular little cotton discs. So those pads keep the charcoal from spilling out, but they also keep you from inhaling any kind of like heavy duty. That probably filters. Any particulates. Correct. Yeah. The trick is though, the more you put in there, that's another obstruction. And so that's the balance. You want the airflow to be going through this uh, respirator part, not coming in through the sides. Exactly. We're gonna take several spoonfuls of the charcoal pellets and just fill them up in the can. And then for extra added measure, you can take another little piece of cotton and put that on top. You were mentioning that those were difficult to breathe through, so I'm gonna try thinning this out a little bit. I went ahead and did the same thing you did and just kind of split them in half. And before you tape it all together, go ahead and just put it up to your mouth and see if you can breathe through it when you put the cotton in there. Try to breathe through this and make sure. Yeah, I can feel okay. it coming out the bottom. The next step, take your can, and just place it in there like that. Do we seal up the top of the can? Or we're not worried about it cutting in? You know, I didn't find that that was necessary. Okay. Maybe later I will find that it is very, very <laughs> necessary. We'll find out. <laughs> The key here is making sure that you don't leave any leaks. Okay. Oh, shit. Yeah, don't do that. Here, I'm, I'm gonna take just a little bit of this cotton and wedge it on top. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're going in in a controlled environment, but it seems like if you just wanna have this in your backpack, you'd want it totally sealed up. Yeah, that's There we go. Point. So in this case, I just stuffed a little bit of cotton in there. Now see if you can breathe through it. Oh, it is harder. That is one of the biggest challenges, is you have to be really careful about how much cotton you put in there. You know what? Because that I'm, can quickly gonna, yeah. obscure your airway. Okay, so it seems like we're just about set. We've yeah. got our respirator part, we've got the seal on our face. How do yeah. we keep it attached? For convenience sakes, just take a rubber band, cut it in half, 
punch a hole over here. I usually get it up by the temples, yeah, just by the, the corners where it connects. And I just take a rubber band and cut it in half and then tied knots at the end and pushed it through the hole there. So I guess it's important to figure out the right amount of tension on your rubber bands to keep it sealed on your face. Absolutely, I mean, you want something flexible where you can just slip it on and off. But I have seen other people who have made fastens and clasps and adjustable belts. It feels like I'm actually going to have to hang on to it and keep it pressed to my face. The airway is just occluded enough that whenever I exhale, air starts escaping the sides here. Well, I think it's okay on the exhale, right? It's probably so, yeah. Where I'm taking these two guys, threading them through. Yours looks a little bit more official than mine. <laughs> my plan is not so much for it to work, but for me to look good when my corpse is uh, on, on display. Oh, wow. That's a good tight seal. Oh, Look at that. nice. That looks really I gotta, effective. I gotta seal this off. Yeah, you got. You can hear the, the charcoal dancing around when you inhale. Okay, all right. I'm, I'm a believer. All right, I think our homemade gas masks are pretty much complete. Now we get to the brutal part the testing. How about some actual tear gas, Brian? <laughs> These were available just on Amazon.com. I picked up three of them. These are from Fox. They're called uh, 5.3. The 5.3 refers to the fact that most pepper sprays are rated about a million or two million Scoville heat units, SHUs. This is like the most brutal stuff. It's rated 5.3 million SHUs. In the event that we have to treat our faces, if it's worse than we thought, if these don't work, an alleged home remedy is 50% antacid like Maalox, this is an off-brand, and 50% water just sprayed in your face and it should help, question mark? They're like fog grenades. You trip them, you toss them in, it fills up the room and they come out crying. It's like a bug bomb, but for people. Yeah. I'm gonna need some more duct tape. All right, welcome to my meth lab. Oh, good. Let's start by sealing this up. I feel like we're about to commit a murder. We just dug our own graves, didn't we? I mean, this is the thing, right? I can't think of a place more effective than in here. We essentially have no ventilation. We really are just relying on our homemade janky gas masks. Code word, if we come running out and pull off the masks crying, it means it didn't go very well. Fox 5.3. And nothing but our janky ass homemade equipment to save us. Modern rogue test of the tear gas grenade against the homemade gas mask. Attempt one. Jesus. <laughs> Oh, no, it's, oh, it's very bad. <coughs> it's very, very bad. Oh God, it is burning. I need to get out, I think. <coughs> it's terrible, yep. You breathe very slowly. <coughs> I got a leak. <coughs> it's not good. I think I inhaled lava. Oh, it's not ideal, but, uh, hey, we're doing it. <coughs> Breathing slowly works, man. Yeah, you gotta let that charcoal activate. I can't believe it works. Oh no! Oh my god, it's getting better. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap! Holy crap, no good! I mean, that's entertaining! <laughs> 5.3 million Scoville units! <laughs> oh! Oh man! <sighs> I can't believe that worked! <laughs> The worst part was, yeah, if you breathe too quickly, it started burning my throat yeah, you and have... it tasted terrible. Well, and, and, and it is, I still feel a little bit of the burn all the way down my throat, but when you breathe too quickly, you could hear all of the charcoal rattling around and you could tell it wasn't binding to the capsaicin. Yeah. But, and, and it was, there was a brief moment of panic. When I hit it at first, I was like, I can't do this. I gotta go, I gotta go, yeah. I gotta go. Oh, I almost called it, but right now, when I took the mask off, I immediately felt it like stinging my face. Uh, my hands were fine. Yeah, dude. Uh, everything. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna touch my face or nothing, but. Uh, oh, I've been touching my face. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. That's a success for I the homemade so. gas mask. I've not seen anybody stand up to the 5.3 mil before. Have you seen videos of it taking people down? Oh, uh, no, really? it's brutal. Like you see you see big tough bouncers just crumble before this stuff. Oh! oh. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
<laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that answers that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I just walked in there and it destroyed me. That's just the residue left in there. I oh I stood by the door as you were opening it. Oh that was too much. Alright, well I'm going back in. Ah. Bye. I feel like this scene is familiar for some reason. I think so. I don't know. We need an RV. <laughs> yeah. The modern rogue. So the dumbest thing we've ever done. Why is it that whenever we hang out that I find myself in a hazmat suit? Not even good ones. It's called a clean suit when it's all white like this. Second of all, these are just the hazmat suits from the last shoot turned inside out. Jason Murphy, are you scared of chemicals? It depends on the chemical. Booze, I'm okay with booze. <laughs> this looks like something- all you're cool with. Ethanol's good. This looks like something that's gonna get us arrested. We are gonna get hands on with some of the most dastardly chemicals ever used for pranks. Now, first of all, to be clear, we are not saying that anyone should use these for pranks. They should only only be used on consenting adults in appropriate situations. However, these are some nasty freaking chemicals. <laughs> That's why you told me to bring a change of clothes, isn't it? Desiccated oleo resin capsicum. Now you remember this guy, right? Oh, let me, let me. I immediately felt it like stinging my face. Oh yes, I do actually. <laughs> this is a completely desiccated powder form. You ever see a ninja? You know I've seen a lot of ninja movies. You do it to me. Really? Yeah, because something worse is coming. <laughs> oh, that's a lot. Geez. That's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. Who are you? Why are you in my room? That's... It's not so, oh, jeez. Oh, God. <laughs> are you all right? <laughs> oh. What's it like? Uh, it's like Satan farted in my face. <laughs> oh. It's a bad taste. <laughs> Oh God, I'm getting it now. <laughs> okay, it's just getting worse. I can't, I don't even know if I can see you to. All right. Yar, I have ninja here, powder. Okay. I'm here for your treasure, sure. Oh Jesus. It's no good, man. I just tried to fly. <laughs> oh. oh, there it is. Oh. Hypantheum of Rosa Rugosa. It's a total plant-based thing. Can, can you pull, pull off your... Uh, I, I was gonna do a little down your back. Down my back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just gonna a, ruin my entire a, weekend, isn't yeah, it? Just a dash, all right? Here, here we go. Do it. You feel anything? No. Okay. I felt you dab some sort of powder. Okay. Oh, oh, that's wait, not good. Wait, what's happening? It's itching. Here, it's let, like... me do, let me do a little more. <sighs> okay, that's... Yeah, I think all we're right, good. there you go. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That's way worse. Wait, what do you mean? Oh, it's just like a bunch of, like, thorns and stickers all down my all right, back. Because I am on fire all over my <laughs> body right now. Don't breathe it in, not for internal use. Yeah, is that gonna come out of my skin? You gotta take a shower. Oh, you ass. <laughs> Salmon diuretic simulant. Used by the military as a diuretic simulant. It's gonna make me grab my pants? It is meant to simulate human diarrhea, both in smell and texture. I don't know how to be kind no, about this. No, you're getting it. Oh my God. Oh my God, do you smell that? Oh God, oh God, no, stop, stop. Oh God. I can't, I can't smell you, it. You will now. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Oh, damn it. This is bad, man. That was barely any of it. God, it's right under my nose and you can't stop it. Try real mitten family of chemicals. Purple rain is from the, I'm gonna try to say this right, the triarol methane family of chemicals. We're just gonna do a little doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, You don't even see that. You don't see this either. Doo -doo 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 -doo. It's a little Nothing. powder. It's a little powder. That's all I'm gonna do. It's because... not gonna burn, is it, or smell like poop? The more you wipe that off, oh, wow. the more it's just gonna go everywhere. And every little bit of powder, look at this, on my hands, the more liquid it starts to spread. Yeah, so this will get like everywhere because- Dude, just that was nothing. Tiny, like, like this is how afraid I am about getting it all over this workplace. You sprinkle this around or, or you throw it up in the air. And it reacts this with is, just a little bit of moisture. Correct, and it sits there in desiccated dry format forever and ever, and, and then eventually liquid gets on it and boom, you got purple crap. That'll stain forever. That's totally ruined. I hope you weren't planning to wear that to a wedding. 
industry grade yellow food dye. This one is an industrial food grade dye. It is a highly concentrated mixture of FDNC yellow. Got number five and number six. It's fine. Sue, I'm telling you that purple will be everywhere forever. Even if you had this in a clear cup, I could pour this in and you would not tell on a cola or coffee. So it's completely safe to digest. I ain't saying that. Wait, did you put the whole damn thing in my- I, I didn't say that either. You drop that in there, they don't see nothing. Salud. To the dumbest thing we've ever done. You have the teeth of a <laughs> lifetime smoker. Here. I'm gonna do my old lady impression, Here. hold on. <laughs> oh my God, you look like a damn demon. <laughs> Stick your tongue out. Oh, wow. <laughs> ah! It's not, I mean, it, your, your teeth look gross. But, but it's, it's like you taste nothing though, yeah, right? No, no, nothing no. looks or tastes different. Super absorbent polymer. I would never do this, but I want you to imagine somebody went to the toilet and used a super absorbent polymer and maybe turn it into two gallons of gel. Back up, super absorbent polymer. Yes, but not just any super absorbent polymer because you can get what magicians call slush powder out of diapers and such. This is some heavy duty stuff originally formulated among other things for sexual devices. Well, don't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody were truly a bad person, I would imagine they would fill the bowl first and then jellify it. All right, I don't know what the punchline is. Wait, jellify? None of this for internal use. And then just, oh yeah, so anyway, good luck with that. This is designed to totally absorb all the water and the entire thing will become one thick gel. All right, so we'll give this time, we'll come back to it. To oh, your slime! Look at that, it just slurped back in. It goes, Wap. <laughs> oh. Look at that! <laughs> that is amazing. Can you imagine? It doesn't flush because it's that. They're gonna either call a plumber or a doctor. Military grade putricant. All right, now it's time for the granddaddy. What's the, oh. This is a military grade putricant. <laughs> that word, putricant? We're gonna put it in the box so we can throw the box away. It's made from low molecular weight thiol compounds. They say half a thing is enough to clear a room and so on. So oh my God, I already smell it. That's it's worse than the dew drop? So no, oh dear. Okay, so normally you spray an aerosol and that just blows out with the, with the, with the wind, right? Yeah, yeah. This is liquid that permeates stuff and it will stink forever. Oh, well, hello, did you smell it? Oh, oh my God. It's garlic skunk. It's like a skunk from hell. Don't get that on you. <laughs> It's, it, it smells like sulfur and ass. Okay, if this got on our carpet, it would permeate right through the carpet. That's worse than the dewdrops, man. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm closing God. it. I'm closing it. You gonna put some goo in there? Yeah, put goo in it. Oh, jeez. Make it. Somebody's gonna think an alien landed. Okay, I'm, I'm closing it, man. No. No? Yes. 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 Let's go throw it in the dumpster. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was the worst thing we've ever done. Oh. All right, when you hold a whip in your hand, who do you wish you were? Oh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the modern road like learns how to crack whips. All right, Murphy, you want to crack whips? Yes. Then this is the man, John Maverick. That is loud. Oh. And it's just so effortless. Those are tiny sonic booms. That is correct, sir. The tip of the whip is traveling at at least twice the speed of the rest of the whip. It's the tiny tip of this magnificent monster going over 900 miles an hour. 900 miles an hour? Whips in general really have four parts. You've got the handle to start off with. Then this long part right here is called the thong. Then back here, this long straight part is called the fall. And then finally you're left with the cracker. So what's going on really simply is the kinetic energy starts on my shoulder, uh -huh. coming up making a wave that goes down. The handle keeps it rigid. The thong, if you notice, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And as it goes down the thong, it speeds up, 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 because there's less resistance. The fall is where it really gets all of its speed. The fall just zooms forward, and then down here at the cracker, this little guy just gets so fast that it just breaks the sound barrier. You're, you're not using a lot of force, no. either. When you start off, you're gonna be out there, you're gonna be trying to muscle it. Yeah. Two things are gonna happen. You're gonna hit yourself in the face. The other thing, if you muscle it, you're gonna get tired. It's a lot like card throwing, right? And as a magician, you know that, that it's one of those things where it's more of letting it whip out at the end. Totally. This is the forward whip. 
Okay. Like There's the forward crack, as they call it. There's the overhead, which I'm not going to do right now because it's smack both you guys in the face to do it. Going forward like that, that's more what you see a lot of movies. The They'll Old do West, it. right? The Old West, boom. They're not whipping the horses. They're cracking the whip right, right over the horses. You don't want to hit the animal. You don't right. want to damage your livestock. You want to just make that cracking noise. Scare them. It scares me. Yeah. <laughs> if we back up, can we see an overhead? Sure. Or? Duck. Okay. <laughs> wow! That is so much louder. Yeah, it's got more force to it. Wait, uh, okay, okay do, do, do it again. <laughs> that is amazing. Okay, I'm gonna say it now. Up. When it's like this, you know I'm not gonna win. Okay, okay. okay. Talk us through the history of whip cracking on stage as a variety art. As far as I know, it goes to a lot of your Western arts. Roy Rogers, all those guys, always had a whip cracker with them. You're out on the range, you're driving cattle, you got a whip, and there's not much else to do. It's a bit like being a prisoner, you got nothing but time. Right, so it's uh, throw knives and play with the bullwhip. So these two skills got really big, and it's entertaining to watch someone make sonic booms let's, from their hands. Let's see your uh, best tricks. So this is a John Maverick patented bullwhip target. It's a really cool piece of spaghetti. The most common trick that people would do is either to hold it in their hand themselves or get someone else to hold it. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay, okay. That's yes, that's ow my eye. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah, this is, I'm casting a spell. I'm a wizard, Harry. <laughs> just gonna nip the tip. Wow! There we go, right there. Wow! wow. <laughs> have you ever hit someone's hand? No, I have never hit <laughs> anyone. Uh, well, here, we can, we can keep going a little bit. With that. I'll just keep going until you get nervous. Oh, I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else you got? What else you got? Well, right. knocking out of your hand is easy because I've got nothing to worry about. It's no danger. We're gonna make it a little bit more dangerous. I'm gonna take this one, and place it behind my own back. We'll just be over here. Wow. <laughs> Here, hold on. No, 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 no. Hold that right there just so we can measure it out. No, 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 no. You got this. It's different when you're looking right at it. Oh, I know. <laughs> he didn't even warn you. I didn't even see it. <laughs> My eyes closed. That was a thing. Do you want to try it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one I always measure out. I go. <laughs> terrifying. All right, walk us through the fundamentals of cracking a whip. First, what not to do. Perfect example of what not to do is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when River Phoenix was the young Indiana Jones. He comes up, there's a line in front of him, he goes like this, and he comes back, smacks him right in the face. That's the first thing anyone ever does. Is that just because we all do that with towels? You see someone do it on TV, it looks like they just take their hand and go like this, because chances are the person on TV is just doing this. Yeah. They're not getting a lot of training. So what we're gonna do, we're going to bring our arm up to 12 o'clock but we're gonna bring it up with abruptness so that the whip goes all the way back. Okay. Aiming to They get mermaid hair. Perfect. That's what came to my mind as well. Arm goes to 12. Whip goes to nine. Goes nine. And then you're gonna bring your arm straight out to three. How much of it is timing? That is the timing right there, okay. cause you gotta wait for the whip and then go. I have to break 30 years of bad habits. Uh, Lash LaRue was one of the first big Western bullwhip artists. Yeah. He got his interview and they said, do you know how to use a bullwhip? He said, sure. Went to a pawn shop, bought two bullwhips, learned how to use them over the weekend. He had to wear long sleeves his first day shooting. Because he was <laughs> Because covered. he was so beat up. I am surprised I don't have scars going across my face from learning. Oh, that's terrifying. That's why we got goggles for you guys. Although we have two whips, we're gonna do this one at a time. Yeah, right. Jason, go for it. Okay. Look at you. Kinda. Ow. Ow. You're, it, you're going it. off to the side. Like, yeah. do everything straight forward. Yeah. You're going to aim at my face. Dude. Uh, it's really just a timing issue for you. You've only, you got the motion down pretty well. A little bit too long. You waited too long. It told you. That's oh! it. Oh! Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's right. Right. Do, it again. Okay. do it again. Do it again. Yes. Give me, give me, give me, give me. That was, that was good. That was good. All right. All right. There you go. Aha. There you go. Nice. Yeah! Oh, nice. Go it. faster, John! <laughs> Teach faster! Yes. All right, what else you got? You want to do the um, overhand, the, yeah, the loud heck one? Yeah, yeah. When I first learned it, there was blood. Marks across the face, uh, nicked my ear once. It's actually the almost exact same motion, except over here, it's on top of you. Arm comes to three, whip goes to 12, you go to nine, right? Now, some people do like to do the wind up, and this one is louder simply because your body has more momentum. Yeah, go for it. No, it's, it's you. Go. I'm going to just be way over here. Okay. That was all, yeah, that, that was, was pretty much it. Yeah. That was pretty much it. You're doing all wrist. Don't do wrist. Okay. So arm out. That's it. Nope. This arm isn't going in a full circle. It's going half circle, half circle. So it's like here, here. Yes. Oh, oh that was amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm powerful! I just grabbed a freaking table! 
was great. <laughs> yeah, this is not gonna go as well. No. Nope. Oh, oh, that hurt. That's, that's uh, why. We, uh, that's why we have. That was no good. Gas oh mask. my god, that, <laughs> that looked bad. You came around and you got to here, mm -hmm. and then you went like that. Oh, that's no good. And so bring it all the way around and keep it up. You want to go over your head, not yeah. through your head. Oh! There you go. You're getting over and then you're going down. Oh, yeah. Get over Straight and up. then go back. Perfect. Okay, yeah. And <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm helping. I'm helping. I'm giving timing notes. And now. Yeah! You came back. Two double high fives. That was back. amazing. Yes. Am I bleeding? Yeah. No, no. You're in great shape. You look awesome. I need one impressive party trick to do with a whip. I'd say the easiest thing for what you've already learned is the one behind the back. That's counterintuitive. Yeah, I know. I'm going to tell you, you're really not hitting the target. You're putting the target in the way of the whip. It's not like the spaghetti bursts at the very tip of the sonic boom. Right. If I may. Yeah, please. I'm going to hit it with that part of the whip there. The sonic boom happens way out there. So at speed, it's... This one's you. Uh, yeah, 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 I was this about one's to say. You. I'm poking this as far as I can out to the side. Turn around. You want to be able to see it, too. So look over your shoulder. Kind of aim over this way. OK, so the farther to the right I aim, the farther to my left behind me it goes. Yeah. Exactly. All right, here we go. Yeah! 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 That's it! Oh, that was awesome! Well done, Woo! sir. Thank you so much, John Maverick. Yeah, it's time for me to hit those old byways and eat some spaghetti. Right. The Alfredo boy. <laughs> the Alfredo kid. <laughs> <laughs> So if you wanted to take these pictures, you're screwed. Ow! <laughs> Damn it! The Modern Rogue makes disposable camera tasers. Easily, one of my favorite parts of doing the TV show was messing around making tasers out of disposable cameras. Uh, the show was really predicated on showing you how to do all sorts of cool stuff, but we couldn't really show you how the camera taser was done, how it was made. When you use one of these disposable cameras with a flash, you turn on the button for the flash, you wait until you see this red light charge up, yes. and then when you actually pull the trigger, boom, it's discharged, and then you notice that as long as it's set, it will recharge again. Yes. Behind the scenes, what's happening, it's drawing electricity from this battery, it's charging up this giant capacitor, and once it's turned off, that capacitor is still fully charged. Brian is touching a little button where you charge it up. I'm turning on, there it is, there it is, there it is. See the light. Even though I just did the equivalent of turning it off, that capacitor is fully charged. You wanna make sure to fully discharge it. A safe way to do that is if you have an insulated screwdriver. And now I'm gonna bridge these two contacts right there. <laughs> it's never not scary. Before you dismantle your camera, make sure to discharge that first. Because we know the capacitor is just on the other side of the flash, that means the capacitor is right here, which means we should be able to bust this open. Yeah, it's a little tricky. There we go. We could break open and expose that capacitor, and we could leave everything else intact. So you're keeping like the button mechanism and everything. You can pull all of this out, but then you'll have to design some way to press that to button press down. Button. Let me pop this open and I'm gonna run a couple of wires just off of this thing, because all it takes is bridging that gap and then- That's it. Ouchie. Oh. Don't do this, because you could get a good shock out of it. And some disclaimers have said, no, it can be lethal. I, you know, I read that somewhere. I don't know that I believe it, but- <laughs> There we go. So that's fairly well exposed in there now. Yeah. All right, so I'll do this green one. Here, hang on to that. Now, as I'm attaching these, I wanna be really careful that the two are not touching. But right now, we have them bit on two separate leads and the two are not bridged at all. I'm gonna fully charge it. All right, we have red lightness. <laughs> that's so good. Oh, you can feel the alligator clamps kind of stick together yeah. from the, uh, the, the welding. Yeah. So instead of the alligator clamps, we could put two separate leads on here. If you want to get fancy, you can solder all this together. I don't I don't think that's even really necessary. If I'm gonna grip both sides, I'm gonna twist it around so it's on there nice and solid. It would be a little bit disastrous for this to bridge across the two. So you wanna make sure that they are not touching at all. And in fact, take a little strip of this gaff tape and we'll make sure this wire is constantly pulling away. I'm gonna hook this guy on. Again, you wanna make sure you're fully discharged. Twist it off really good. Okay, so let's give this a little test. All right, you ready? Yeah, go for it. All right, make sure it's all the way discharged. 
Okay, so now for this last part, we're gonna take these two leads, we're gonna attach them to our kind of electrodes. So first, let's go ahead and just kind of screw these in. Right about there is good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it looks safe, right? <laughs> strip both of those for me if you would. Ah, uh, it's two, perfect, great. So now, you really are just wrapping this around. We wanna get it tight, tight, tight. It actually looks really good. It looks gruesome, right? Yeah. He's a beast. There we go, we got, we got red light. Oh, <laughs> so much bigger, so much bigger yes. than I thought. You do it to me and I'll do it to you. Really? Yeah. I just wanna get it over with. It... <laughs> hey, I, hey, just, just do it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know, I know, I know. I yeah. It's hard, I, I don't want to do it. Recoiling. It's <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I felt it all the way up the side. It was like, it was like, and it just kept going. I was like, it's still zapping. Little one? Okay. Three, one, two. Ah! Oh, son of a bee sting. It's, that's it's, it's, no it's harder, fun. It's harder than you think, right? Oh, you could, yeah. Oh, that's right. not That's not good. Do, not do, good. do, do, do you want to do, do, like, do you want a full charge? Yeah, do it, full charge. Really? Yeah. Dude, the, the, the light's red now. I'm, I'm hoping I get superpowers. <laughs> okay, ready? Three, two. Oh, no, no, that's bad. It was bad? Oh, that's bad. Yeah, it's like, I, I didn't even feel it. I yanked it away. I'm sure my... there's, look, There's. this yeah. is how much is left. That's how much was left over. I can feel it at my fingertips. Still? Yeah, I think so. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. No, this is a bad idea. You want to go full charge? No. No? I mean, I can't. I can't. I mean, if you, if you, I'll do, I'll do full charge if you'll, if you'll zap it, if you'll pull it away very quickly. I will. I will. But I'm gonna do it to your neck. No, you're <laughs> not. So okay. not. <laughs> okay. That was insane. It's horrible. It's that was horrible. like a. Full on finger in the light socket. <laughs> so bad. What's, what's, what's left? What's... Oh, you got, you got it. You, you fully discharged that. I pulled it quick though. But you know, it's electricity and we're not faster than that. Dude, hats off to electricians. America's yeah. true heroes. All of that power mm -hmm. was out of one AAA battery. Yeah. This was terrifying and we don't recommend anybody do it. Yeah. Do you want to do it one more time full charge? No, no, no. no. Let's go back to safe things like drinking or something. Yeah, let's take that to the next yeah. scam school. So you're in the joint, prison. You're doing hard time. <laughs> of course I am. Why yeah. wouldn't I be? What is your prison name? It's like you use the name of your first stuffed animal and then the first street you grew up on. Well, Kate, okay, what is it? Do it, would, it would be a Huntington Brownie. <laughs> I think mine would actually be Duke Virginia. <laughs> Duke Virginia would be a great. The modern row makes prison spears. We're gonna make spears. So you have limited resources in prison, and that's kind of our MO too, right? Now the one thing you do have in prison is unlimited time. There are a lot of people who have become very ingenious. People using electric razors and turning them into tattoo guns. Amazing inventions being made out of just the only things that they have at their fingertips. We have a pillowcase, some newspaper, and we have some big spoons. People often forget newspaper is actually wood. Actually, that's interesting because you think about it, like if I had a club made of wood, you'd be like, well, that can kill me. Yes. But but you wouldn't think of it with this. Correct. We can dive right in. Because I'm not in prison, I'm gonna use a Leatherman to get rid of those tables. <laughs> We're probably going to have to use several newspapers. As you can tell, we grabbed a huge stack. Now, so you don't need any kind of glue or bonding agent or anything? No. All you know is that this is possible. You don't have yes. any knowledge about the best method or anything. I have seen similar devices built, but I have never actually tried this or seen a demonstration of this particular weapon. Let's find out if we're wrong. Maybe, ah! Oh my God. Right? Meanwhile, can you break that off there? Is that a thing? Uh, probably, these cost a dollar. Wow, that was easy. Yeah, well. <laughs> when I make torches, for fire eating. We wrap t-shirts around the, the end and we always end up putting a hook on there so that it can't slide off. Sure. So if our goal is to keep this from falling off, and I know we're improvising, but it seems like you would wedge this against a bedpost or something and be able to spin this around and then a picture of this kind of slamming down and then just kind of stomp this. Ugh you end up right here, right? Okay. I would actually take these and run it all the way down so that this oh, runs I down the you. entire core. So give me a long strip of I that. For the bindings, prisoners often use their bed sheets either cut into strips 
or pulling out individual threads. Here we go, so here's what I'm thinking, right? So now we've got this, this kind of core and we can thread this through and run it down. Look at that. Interesting. If we, if we get it all uh, keep it shorn up, right? right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, here we go, same, same deal on this, right? Yeah. We're just trying to keep the core so that the thing won't go anywhere. So now we've got a core that's that's not going to go anywhere. Well, it's looking reasonably sturdy. They'll take their newspaper crafts and soak them in water and then dry them. Then all of a sudden you're dealing with wood pulp. All right, you got strips? So excited, it's starting to look scary. Oh, you know what? You are cutting against the thread. And oh, so as a result, it's problems. very easy. You want to go the opposite direction. Okay. You want to go with the grain. Yeah, that's much stronger. Oh, good. Good call. I would not have these. But a lot of the uh, cutting uh, utensils that you find in prison are taken from like the metal legs of the bed mm -hmm. and they'll slowly grind, grind them, them down. down into blades and so forth. Let's take uh, one, knot it to another one, knot it to another one, and then wrap it around with that. All right. Oh, good. Now yeah. we're on to something here. You see how it's thicker on this end than on this end? Yeah. I'm twisting everything, mm -hmm. and then that way we can fill out the bulk of this here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then this way we got everything kind of building at the same rate. Okay. So right now we're a bit floppy, but we're all one thickness. Let's start winding this around. Let's do a full one. Just wrapping around oh, it. Gotcha. We can okay. get that length. Okay, this one tight. Yeah. Crazy tight. Obviously, we, we're not encouraging anyone to do any of this in prison. But, or anywhere else, really. Well, I mean, if you get captured by robot pirate ninjas. Yep. You know what? I found that it helps to really double up with these because otherwise they kind of fall apart. But if you take them and twist them, you can get a lot more tight. Like having this to, to pull it tight makes a huge difference. Look at that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I mean, at this point, it's definitely secure enough that I could puncture somebody. You can was, get enough leverage and force. this was sharp, yeah. We pretty much have the base, right? We can pretty it up later. Is there anything besides just grinding on concrete in order to, because basically if, if there's concrete everywhere, the whole prison is one big whetstone yes. just waiting to carve this thing down. Precisely. Yeah, All right, I, I'm gonna call it. Let's, let's move on to grinding. Okay. Oh geez, that's hot, <laughs> hot. It's already starting. You can see it's kind of grinding down right there. Yeah. And really, you wouldn't have to grind it down into a fine point. You could sharpen those edges. So this is the part where let's just pretend that 15 years of our life goes past. Yes. And we instead use an angle grinder. Agreed. Start it up, bro. I would not want to meet that guy in a dark alley. Feel that, feel that. Oh, wow. Like that's, uh, that's, okay. that's legitimately terrifying. Like, this is all as sharp as you could get it just by rubbing it on the concrete. Obviously we went fast because we had the angle grinder. You would do a little bit of fine work, just kind of grinding it down. In the joint, the whole thing is fine work, right? Oh, of course, of course, because it you takes you years and years to get to this point. You could feel the bits and pieces that need oh, to be gotcha. rubbed off there. Okay. You see how that feels? Oh, yeah. Right? That is a literal knife's edge, man. Yeah. This right here, I think, is the key. Uh, there's a little more give than I'd like, but, I mean, this will do the job, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. It'll definitely hurt some I mean, speaking of which, you know, it's... It was... We have to test it. Yeah, we have to test it. Absolutely. Oh! Do you want to do the honors? Uh, I'll hold it. You stab. Oh, that seems like a bad idea. <laughs> ah! Oh, my <laughs> God! <laughs> Holy crap, that was like it was oh. nothing. So you want to take this tail, yeah. pull it tight so the whole thing has yep. a good grip, yep. and then just go, uh, 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 just oh, slaughter. repeatedly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. let it have. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you don't even need to go fast. Look how sharp it is. Well, this is terrifying. Remind me never to go to prison. Because I assume everyone has these. Uh, hold on, hold on. Oh, you're so delicious, little biscuit. <laughs> yes! Kill it! Kill it! Destroy it! Oh, you're a strong Murphy! <laughs> Who ruled Bossa Town? <laughs> Who ruled Bossa Town? <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> that was 
I don't want to say I'm nervous, but it definitely looks as though some unlicensed medicine is about to be practiced. Well, guess what's happening? What is happening? Unlicensed medicine. <laughs> the modern road experience is the Gansfeld effect. We are going to hack our brains. Do you want a trip? <laughs> Let's define some terminology here. What, what are we getting at? This is the Gansfeld effect. Okay. This is something that was discovered in the 1930s, and it is a way that your brain finds patterns out of unstructured stimuli. So in other words, you produce hallucinations. Exactly. It is a lot like the experience that you get in sensory deprivation tanks, where you start to hallucinate auditory and visually. Your brain wants to find patterns in things, and so when you have an unstructured stimuli, like a uniform field of light or white noise in your ears, or both, you will start to hallucinate, and your brain will start to convince itself that it's actually seeing these Now, things. I know that the scientist Richard Feynman he was really into the idea of altering his consciousness without drugs, so he would do sensory deprivation tanks, and specifically, he had read that there was a certain tribe of people we perceive ourselves as living behind our eyes, but this other tribe believed that the selves lived in the liver, and so he would get into the tank and try to shift his, his sense of being to a different part of his body with limited success. And in fact, I experienced this. I did a live cast with the incredible artist, Rallis Khan. He did a complete live cast. You cannot talk, you cannot move, or it'll screw everything up. And over this time, I got the strong sense that I was tilted over the entire time. I was seeing patterns, it was, it was completely unreal. What kind of patterns were you seeing? Geometric stuff, th there was kind of a waking hallucination with almost a narrative. You ever have it where you kind of wake up out of sleep and you want to finish your dream and you're not really sure if you're making up the dream or actually falling back asleep? It was like that without ever having been asleep to begin with. But you were totally safe. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's my biggest concern, which is my biggest concern anytime I go to sleep. Freddy Krueger. <laughs> That's good like, point. like good bears, point. Good point. bears, Freddy Krueger, well, like got, right we've, there. We've got awake people supervising us, so I think yeah. we're going to be good. Thank God. If you want to produce Gansfeld hallucinations, you can't just close your eyes or turn off the lights and have it be quiet. You have to have uniform stimulation, right? Whether it's white noise in the ears or, or whether it's white light, red light, you have to be looking at something so that your brain is shifting, looking for patterns yes. in there. You have to give your brain some sort of input. This is giving your brain something that is completely unstructured. Some people have experienced things like picnics, women riding by on bicycles, geometric shapes, Tetris, explosions, aliens, dogs and cats living together. <laughs> Mass hysteria! Mass hysteria! That's awesome. I know that miners who have been trapped in cave-ins, they're going four or five days without any stimulation at all, similar to the deprivation tank. Prisoner's cinema is what they called it. Pythagoras' disciples would go into caves uh, to achieve enlightenment, and they would just stare into the darkness for hours on end. And also, people going through the Arctic in whiteout conditions and just seeing this field of unending white would start to hallucinate. Well, now I'm terrified, and now I guess it's time for us to get started. I know that you can create the uniform field by cutting a ping pong ball in half, but you were mentioning that maybe that's not the best way to go? Yes, I tried it with the ping pong balls, and they don't always fit over your eyes, and so you can see out the edges. One of the ways that I read was actually better is to make your own sleep mask out of just plain printer paper. Just plain printer yeah. paper. And you want to get the lightweight printer paper that you can kind of see so through. You can see through, yeah. Don't get the card stock. You don't want something that's completely opaque. Oh, dude, yeah. So go ahead and cut yourself out something in the shape of a sleep mask. We've got some rubber bands here to fasten them to our heads, staplers and tape and so forth. You need some extra padding to pad the corners out. You can actually use pieces of cotton uh, to line the insides. Dude, for the record, these are the sweetest sunglasses I've ever owned. I'm gonna take two of these, just tie them together, because I figure I could keep it loose. We're not gonna be moving, right? It's just Correct. the idea is that we stay still. How quickly should we start experiencing something? I have read anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes as the average. The trick is you have to stay quiet and stay still. No other flashing lights. You really want everything just kind of flat and quiet. So like if you experience something, don't go like, hey Brian, you'll not believe what, I, what I'm experiencing right now. Yeah, exactly. This isn't the Oculus Rift. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I'm doing, just tying a little knot on there. Because again, it doesn't have to be super tight. Okay. But then that way the staples keep it from wanting to pull off. Oh, sure, yeah. Now, what about the white noise? I like television white noise myself, just the old sound of static from an old CRT, which you can find in YouTube or SoundCloud or anything like that. Of course, you're going to want something uninterrupted for the entire duration of when you're laying there. I am peeking out a little bit at the bottom, so I'm gonna just add a couple of pads to cover up on the edges of the nose. All right, I am set. Oh, that's actually really good. Perfect, I guess we dive in. I'll see you in 30 minutes. I guess it's also good to have noise-canceling headphones for this. Yes. 
you on the other side, Brian. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Damn it. <laughs> you beat me. I'm calling it. Felt like a lifetime in there. Yeah. Um, How'd it go? It was intense. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I definitely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's. I can't believe it was only 20 minutes. Um, Jason, I'm changed. <laughs> I know, right? So the first thing you get are um, blooms of color, yes. right? Yes. So, so um, there is this brief period where at first you notice the imperfections of the paper mm -hmm. and all that stuff, but then at some point it was like a switch flipped and everything just looked completely uniformly white. Mm -hmm. And then you started to see blooms of color. It was like the room in the Matrix. Yeah. Where he said, we need more guns. And then the guns <laughs> yeah, came. Yeah. You know how you can rub your eyes and see fireworks? Yes. Like that started to happen even though there was no stimulation yeah. at all. And then after a while, they would, they would start to move into shapes. I, I saw silhouettes of dinosaurs, like yep. a puppet show basically. There was a brief moment that I was convinced that I was looking at a frosted window and I could see an office around me wow. in there. Yeah. It was fleeting, right? It was like the moment I thought too hard on it, yes. it would evaporate. You really have to give yourself up to it. With mine, what started as a simple screensaver experience turned into the eye of Sauron staring back at okay, me. Okay, do you, do you know what I saw? I saw a face. Uh, do you remember the supreme being from Time Bandits? Yes. That's the return the map. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Mine started off with like lots of blossoms of colors and everything just kind of undulating and coalescing. And then they turned into like jellyfish type things. Yeah. And then the Eye of Sauron was there for a minute. And around that time, the sound, I started to hear screams. Okay, I heard laughter in the background. I could hear people applauding, like there's a party in the next room over or something. See, I heard screams in the multiple layers of the static, but then once you started to focus on it, it went away and it was just static again. But then after that, it became me flying through the clouds, looking down over this rocky desert planet, wavering everywhere, and I realized I was hearing seagulls. Wow. Yeah, it was. Fascinating. And it started happening right away. Well, it, it, I, I, that's the same thing for me. It was like maybe 90 seconds till the first tickles start to happen. And I think it's like you get caught up in a feedback loop where it's like, you think like, did I, did I hear laughter? And then you listen for laughter. And sure enough, yes. then now you're seeking that pattern and you absolutely experience yes. it. It was definitely enhanced because I tried to not move my body at all. They didn't want to be reminded that I'm sitting on a table or whatever, but instead you, you start to feel without form and without presence. That was a trip, man. Uh, dude, high five on the Gansfeld effect. Highly recommend it. Yeah, absolutely, dude. I'm going back in. <laughs> no, no, we've lost him. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> Let me get a beer. <laughs> Hold on. Ha ha! That's the I modern do. world yeah. learns how to flip butterfly knives. You know what this is? Besides showing off? It's a butterfly knife. Yes, also called a balisong, where they originated. Do you know where they originated? Mm, balisong, Sweden. No, not bad. It's I'm not good at languages. The Philippines. They Philippines. came from the Philippines. Yeah, click clacks, fan knives they're called. There's all kinds of fancy, fancy ways to open them. I don't know whether or not these are going to be legal for half the people watching right now. I went to nine different places in the city of Austin. Everyone gave me like nine different answers. That's amazing. Like, it's not legal. Well, it's legal, but you can't be 
be caught with it. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? It, it sounds like it's not yeah. legal if that's it's the case. Like, we don't sell them because they're illegal, but you can find them at the flea market. I heard that two times. Here, I'll show you all the steps for this. All right, so before we begin, we of course have to do disclaimers. Make sure to check your local laws about whether it's legal to have butterfly knives. If you want to practice, I don't recommend starting off just with an actual blade. You should use a trainer. They're like four or five dollars. You can get them off of Amazon. You can make your own using popsicle sticks or for the longest time, I practiced with my Leatherman. I figured out that if you covered it in WD-40, it would get loose enough that you could actually do all of the steps for the butterfly knife without having any risk of injuring yourself. That is good. We should also say, don't stab people. Oh yeah, what he said. So this is the tiniest, cutest, littlest four inch baby blade. You're gonna start with it in your right hand and your pinky should be able to disengage the lock on it. So when you fling it forward, the side with the lock is gonna go forward. That's the side with the blunt edge so that you can keep going back and you don't have to worry about it cutting you. That sharp edge should never get close to any of your body parts. So the first move, basically you're gonna flip out and now you need to get to here, but that would be lame. Instead, what you're gonna do, you're gonna flip out, you're gonna rotate over, and then you're gonna flip back. To close it, same thing. You're gonna go forward, you're gonna flip it over, and then close it. This one's a little bit trickier because it's coming back in and you don't want it to pinch anything. So you're gonna wanna kind of cradle it in your hand yep. so that it's able to just go like that. So it's basically three clockwise rotations. You're gonna go one, two, three, one, two, three. That's super easy. That is way easier than I thought. <laughs> yes. As usual, at this point. I was making it way too hard. <laughs> if you kind of choke back on it, then the knife is gonna want to direct itself in the right way. If you get too choked up on it, then you're kind of forcing it and you're not letting the natural flow, but it should be. And when you get the timing just right, it's like it never really stops. It's just all sw one big swinging loop. That's right. it. That's it. All right, now here's what I want you to do. I want, uh, here, let me get to. I gotta, want you to stab me yeah. as hard as you can. <laughs> you're just gonna flip out, then you're gonna flip over, and then up. That's it. Easy. And then the reverse, go forward. There you go, flip over, and then back. You got this. Now, of course, there are way, way fancier ways to do this, but this is kind of the most standard, simplest version. Boom, boom. Oh, oh ooh, that was scary. <laughs> this is why you practice with a trainer. Look at you, you're a beast. You rule the knights. These streets belong to you, Jason. I'm Batman with a butterfly knife. <laughs> Does Batman have a butterfly knife? <laughs> Batman's got everything. Okay, fine. That's you, you have everything. <laughs> All right, Murphy, what is the greatest lie perpetrated in the history of bar culture? That I've had too much. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. I can stay here. <laughs> the I modern road here. makes an award in a martini. My entire life, every time I think of martinis, I think of one phrase, shaken, not stirred, and you two are telling me that's a damn lie? I'm sorry, Brian, but the guy who drives an invisible car, 007, he lied to us. Sorry, he look, lied. I want to clear this up. So we're at the Steampunk Saloon on 6th Street in Austin, Texas, hanging out with the supremely badass Trevor. Trevor, why is it bad to shake a martini? How much water do you like in your drink? I would assume as little as possible, right? Exactly. That is why when you make a martini, you're going to stir it. You're going to get a more flavorful drink that hits your palate. Like, there are many cocktail shots, things like that, that are shaken. When you add citrus to a drink, that's when you want to shake it. It will combine all the ingredients in the best possible way. And plus, you can also shake cocktails with egg or with creamer. There are a couple of other things that really matter. That's the proportion of the alcohol and the type of ice you use. Can you tell us about the proportions of the alcohol? Yes, what you want is you want a balanced drink. You don't want too much alcohol. You don't want too much of any additives, say a bitters or a vermouth. What you want is balance. Overall, you're gonna have a bitter drink. From what I remember, the basic martini recipe is a two to one ratio of gin and vermouth, right? But we're gonna learn a fancier version, an award-winning edition. This is Albert Truman's recipe, the renowned New York bartender. And this one was chosen by Esquire Magazine as the best gin martini you can have. So no matter what, if you learn this recipe, you will never look like a chump making a martini for Correct. the rest of your life. This recipe is four to one gin to vermouth. We're gonna adjust that for the size of the glass a little bit, but Trevor's gonna walk us through. All right, go okay. for it. You wanna grab a martini glass. You're going to ice the glass first. Now the icing does what? It, it chills the glass down. You just a little ice and a little bit of soda water and let that sit for just a minute. Then we're gonna take our soda water. So this is the weird counterintuitive part. This well, is not really. I don't clean the floors. Oh. <laughs> I paid almost $50 for these boots, Trevor. <laughs> well, you wasted your money. 
up. Now, uh, with this recipe that we're using from Esquire Magazine, we are going to use an ounce of vermouth, and I know this seems like a waste, but we're actually going to put it in the glass, swirl it around, and then dump it out. But we'll have a nice coating of vermouth that's still left in the glass. Seems uh, like a sin against humanity. Well, as Alfred Hitchcock put it, he preferred the vermouth in his martinis to just see it from across the room. Just knowing that vermouth was there once is yes. all it takes. Now, with the chilled glass, the vermouth will adhere to the sides. What is vermouth, by the way? It's just a fortified wine. It's actually from the German word vermut or wormwood. It's the same thing that's- Same uh, thing as an absinthe. Exactly. It's the same thing that allegedly gives absinthe Watch its hallucinogenic feet. properties. I didn't which know is still that hotly was debated. So metal. Oh, man, that's amazing. It's really not. Okay, so right now we have a chilled glass coated with vermouth. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna add the gin and we're gonna stir that gin. And I'm gonna add quite a bit of ice here because I want my entire vessel that I stir in to be cold. We're gonna do a two ounce pour of gin. Today we're using Bombay Sapphire. We talked about the different types of ice. Fancy joints will have a giant block of ice. They'll try to break off big chunks so that they dilute as slowly as possible. Correct and you'll have less impurities in those ice. As you're spinning, everything's moving around as one block. You're not breaking it apart. You're not getting the ice to melt. And with ice like this, you want to give it about 20 rotations or so. Now, as I stir, my entire vessel is starting to chill down. This is all about surface area. My ice is cold, my tin is cold. There's less dilution as I'm doing this, but you don't want to do it too much or you will add water to your gin. You can see, meanwhile, on the chilled glass, you can see the vermouth still adhering to the sides on there. So it's a four to one ratio. One ounce of vermouth gets spilled around in the glass and now we're doing four ounces of uh, gin, correct? Uh, in the recipe, you're doing four ounces of gin. We're only going to do two ounces here because yeah, our martini glass is a little small. And when you're busy and walking around with this thing, you don't want to get bumped into it and have this go everywhere. And again, something you should consider, this is all booze. <laughs> yeah. There's no sugar in here. This is a proper way to drink liquor. As Ernest Hemingway put it, nothing makes him feel more civilized. So is it a martini yet? It is now. Go for it. All right, this uh... adding, adding one to two olives uh, will add a little bit of salt. So now you have many flavors in that one drink. That is so good. You're telling me to make an award-winning martini. All I have to remember is one ounce of vermouth put into a chilled glass, spun around, pour out the vermouth, put in a whole bunch of ice, put in four ounces or two ounces if you're doing a reduced amount of gin, stir it to, for 20, 25 times, pour it in, add a garnish, and you're done? Yes. It's like drinking a cool cloud. Dude, Jay, we're, we're, we're cloud, I can't even talk. That's how excited <laughs> I am. You guys are really making me jealous though because technically I'm on the clock and... Well, technically we are too, but we're our own bosses, so. <laughs> Boy, that is amazing. I got a little nervous there. A little panic, a little panic moment. The modern oh, rogue right makes right smoke bombs. Yeah. This is the first episode of The Modern Rogue that we're doing anything that has the word bomb in it. So yes, I'm extra, extra nervous. Well, you know, some people would say the Taco Bell episode contains some bombs. <laughs> Later. Fair enough. Look, we're making smoke bombs, <laughs> but what I couldn't believe is that the recipe was so dead simple. I guess we're just doing traditional combustion, but with a mixture that is gonna be real smoky? Yeah, well this one is the most common recipe for a smoke bomb. Granulated sugar and potassium nitrate. Uh, you can order it from various chemical distributors online and get it in its pure form. You can also find it in some certain stump removers that have almost purely potassium nitrate. Is there any kind of scary, like you're gonna get cancer for handling oh, this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't make eye contact, don't ingest it. Uh, let's just say nobody try don't this. Don't eat it. It's not terribly common anymore, but most people know potassium nitrate as one of the key ingredients in black powder. Gunpowder now uses cordite, but back in the day in black powder, when you combine sulfur and charcoal, you also use potassium nitrate, which is why we can still find it in a lot of fireworks today. All right, let's make it absolutely clear that nobody should try any of this at home. Correct. We are going based on recipes that we have found in our research. If we suffer harm as a result of this, that's our own dumb fault. Now, let's show everyone exactly how to do it. Well, I would show how we're doing it. <laughs> All right, Jason, what is the super complicated secret formula to mix household sugar with potassium nitrate? Three parts potassium nitrate, two parts sugar. That was not nearly as complicated as I'd hoped. That's hope. all it is. <laughs> now, there are different ratios that you can use. Some people say five to three, some people say three to two. The more sugar you have as compared to the potassium nitrate, the slower it's going to burn. So I'll just go 60 grams. Yep. And then what, just pour the rest in there as well? Go ahead and do about 40 grams, takes it up to 100. Now, if it's not 100% right on, I assume we're still okay? There's a lot of room for flexibility in this. Great. Grant Thompson did a mixture where he went 40-60 instead of 60-40. Really? And it ended up 
up crawling out like one of those Fourth of July snakes. Yeah, Pharaoh serpent, I think they call that. And we're doing what, low heat on this? Yeah, now you should take it low heat, and it's, it's safer if you do a hot plate versus an open flame, clearly. Just go ahead and dump it into the frying pan. Then we're going to stir it. The potassium nitrate is acting as an oxidant here. The sugar itself is what's flammable. That's our fuel, our substrate. So essentially, we're just burning sugar really fast all at once. Exactly. Thanks to the presence of oxygen in there. Correct. Okay, so we keep going. Now, now at this point, everything's getting caramelized, but keep we going. keep going until it totally liquefies? Yes. Okay. It really is important that you take it off when it looks like peanut butter. Otherwise, it will turn chocolatey and eventually start to burn. <gasps> oh, it's happening. It's happening. Is it? Look at that. That's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. Here, I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. Yeah. See, even that right there is enough to make a decent smoke bomb. You can make other very of your own fuses that we're not gonna get into right now. What is this? That's some yarn. Yes. It actually solidifies really quickly, so you have to move very fast as soon as you take it off Still of the heat. Still hot. Let's, let's clear off everything okay. of value here. Yes. All right, I'm doing it. Back up, burn. back up, back up, back up, burn, back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. It's fine. Oh See? my God, it's Look happening. It's gonna explode. Yes! Oh wow. Holy shit. Okay. Holy shit. I didn't expect that. Holy shit. That was unexpected. That's a lot I of- I told you! I told you! I told you! Holy cow! Wow! That was amazing! Ah. <laughs> oh my god! You were not worried enough! I was you not worried not enough! You were not worried enough! I oh my god! I didn't think it was going to turn into a mini volcano! It is a mini volcano! You were right on the safety thing! <laughs> You thought I was being a big baby. And you look, and, and it does, it looks like those those little 4th of July snakes. It's, yeah. It's all just crumbled, decayed sugar. That was so satisfying. <laughs> I'm so happy we did that. Yeah, and look at all the smoke that that little amount made. Apparently we're vanishing, we're ghosts. Here, let's do, let's do our disappearing act. Where's my grappling hook? Murphy, how do you like espionage? Is that the language uh, that they made up to? No, that's Esperanto, oh. but that's close. Espionage. The modern rogue sends secret encrypted messages. All right, now, slow scan television is something that was developed in the 1950s as a way for people to transmit static images using sound. And it sounds a lot like a modem sure. or a fax machine. Most of us hear those sounds and we think of like late 1990s trying to get on AOL.com and downloading extremely slow pornography. But this is the same technology from the 1950s. It's the technology that the Soviets used to transmit images of their dogs in space. The U.S. used it as well, and we can use it today on our freaking iPhones. There's nothing more ridiculous and awesome to me than the idea of using the height of 21st century technology in order to replicate 1950s tech. Exactly. It actually makes me think of how you obfuscate something by going backwards. Much like in World War II, one of the most impenetrable methods of communication that the Allied forces used was the Navajo language. Code talking. Yes. Yeah. Traditionally, uh, people had cumbersome modems and phosphorus tubes and ham radios. They had this elaborate setup to transmit the audio to whoever else had the same setup. One of the things that you have to have is a decoder slash encoder. Encoding technology is developed by a handful of companies and there are all sorts of types. Now they all vary on how fast they go, how many colors they can use, if they use colors at all. Because this is audio based, it doesn't matter if it's ham radio, shortwave radio, over the telephone. In this case, we're using these cheap $20 UHF transmitters. So the app we're using is just called SST TV and I just started the app and this is what our speech right now looks like because I'm gonna be holding the iPhone up to the walkie-talkie if there's any kind of like birds tweeting or noise that's gonna interfere with the that's actual all gonna show up yeah. yeah let's do this you head up to the studio we'll maintain contact over UHF walkie-talkies and I want you to transmit me some super secret important image oh you're gonna regret I this know, I know <laughs> I regret everything I do all right this is uh, Echo 7 to Echo Base we are commencing our Journey out into the wilderness. Godspeed to me. Copy that, Echo 7. Uh, don't go out past the first marker. Echo 7 to Echo Base. As I walk along, it occurs to me that uh, this is my actual neighborhood, and a lot of people are watching a grown ass man pretend to be a spaceman. Echo Base to Echo 7, when has that ever stopped you? We just set off a smoke bomb in your garage and it didn't get any attention whatsoever. Over. Echo 7 to Echo Base, I am halfway, and it really makes a difference that we're walking so far away from each other, because I can imagine being, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles with a direct line of sight. There's part of me that's like really geeked up about actually transmitting images this way. Echo 7 to Echo Base, I am now officially in the wilderness. I cannot see any man-made structure. 
pictures, I'm going to imagine that I'm on the surface of the moon, and I need some final information that only you can send to me by slow scan television. Copy that, Echo 7. Echo Base is transmitting the image in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Echo 7 to Echo Base, I have received the image. I am attempting to alter the phase and skew so I can figure out oh, you mother God damn it! <laughs> uh, Echo 7 to Echo Base, it appears you sent me a picture of me with french fries stuck up my nose from approximately one decade ago. Can you confirm? That is correct, Echo 7. French fries in the nose. That picture is freely available on the internet. Over. Echo 7 to Echo Base, you're an over. Roger that, over. <laughs> Echo 7 to Echo Base, in the interest of a uh, complete connection, I'm gonna try to take a beautiful picture of this alien landscape. I believe it's called Outside that I will send to you. Are you prepared to receive? I am prepared yet afraid, Echo 7. We are ready to receive, over. I am transmitting image of nature splendor in five, four, three, two, Echo 7 to Echo Base, did you receive? Echo Base to Echo 7, picture is received, and this outside looks terrifying. It looks like uh, somewhere the Blair Witch would hang out, over. <laughs> Roger that, Echo 7. Copy that, beers at 0500, Echo Base out. Now back, oh, I was gonna toast you, but you're a terrible host and haven't offered me a beverage. <laughs> I, 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 that's not true. I always offer you, I'm out of here. Get me a beer. Make up for your sins, repent. What is the single most iconic mixed drink named after a city? The Waco. <laughs> What's in a Waco? Turpentine. <laughs> Turpentine and sadness. The modern road <laughs> makes a man happy. All right, so we're back again at Steampunk Saloon on 6th Street, hanging out with Trevor. Thank you so much for joining us. We're talking about fancy mixed drinks like the Manhattan. Just the name intimidates me. It sounds like the city itself. Loud, boisterous, and way too sophisticated. Chuds everywhere. <laughs> oh, God, I didn't even think about the chuds. Tell me about the history of the Manhattan and why we should be excited about it. It's just a man's drink because it's pure, smoky, earthy booze. It's actually the first cocktail that used vermouth as a blend. The origins of it are apocryphal. A lot of people say that it was created for a party at the Manhattan Bar. They claim this, of course, for Winston Churchill's mother. And she requested a particular recipe, the guy made it, and from then on, it's been called the Manhattan. What if you're like me and don't know the first thing? I don't even know what ingredients go into a Manhattan. It's just simply bourbon, yep. bitters, yep. and sweet vermouth. Okay, now what are bitters? This is pretty standard in any bar. This is the Anglostar Aromatic Bitters. This is like the salt or the ketchup of a drink. Can, can this, I smell it? Or? Yes, absolutely. It smells like Worcestershire sauce. Don't. <laughs> Okay, oh, yeah. you don't drink them direct. No. Okay, all right. So we're gonna have our mixing tins here. We're gonna start out with two ounces of a bourbon. Bourbon is different from whiskey, is different from scotch. They're okay. different types of whiskeys. But bourbon is what? Bourbon is going to be from Kentucky and it's at least 50% corn malt. Whereas your rye whiskeys are gonna be 51% rye. In my mind, I'm just thinking Manhattan equals bourbon. Always bourbon. So we're gonna use two ounces of some Kentucky bourbon. All right. We're gonna use our jigger here because we want balance and you want a good measurement. Are we, do we have ice in here or this is just the bourbon no, goes in straight? we're just adding the bourbon in straight. And now we're gonna do one ounce of sweet vermouth. So we're at bourbon and sweet vermouth. They all have different levels of floralness, right? Like different right. Uh, aromas and each of them adds a different thing to the drink. This is gonna really sweeten up the drink and we're gonna take two dashes of Angostura bitters. Two dashes. Is Angostura, this is a brand name? Yes, that is a brand name. Got it. Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> when you taste a Manhattan, you will taste that bitters in there. Like I said, it's just gonna bring the drink all together. Now, we're gonna take our glass with a little bit of ice and a little bit of soda water, and we're chilling the glass. This drink is typically served up, but you can serve it on the rocks. Uh, it all depends on how you like Personal it. Personal taste. Right, but when you put it on the rocks, it's gonna dilute the drink. There's no ice in here at all, Not right? Do we shake it? Do we stir it? This is going to be a stirred drink, just like 
any martini and any classic cocktail like this, there's no citrus involved. Therefore, we don't have to shake it. We're gonna fill the tin up about three quarters of the way because we want this vessel to be completely cold. Most people agree that the best way to serve a Manhattan, no matter how you make it, is very, very cold. So now you'll see the tin starting to get cold throughout. You see the condensation forming on the outside yeah. and you're not vigorously stirring. You're just doing it nice and easy to make sure it gets very, very cold without diluting it. And we're gonna give you this uh, about 20 rotations or so. So we're gonna uh, discard this gentlemen and watch your feet. And we're gonna uh, cap this off with our strainer and we're simply going to pour this out and you get a nice caramel color. Manhattans are typically served with a cherry. You'll typically see like a cheap maraschino cherry. Yeah. Uh, but I went a little extra today. Got a gluten-free cherry. Just goes in the center right Nicely there. Nicely done. Some people prefer not to garnish it because that is room where whiskey belongs. <laughs> yeah, but then you get your vitamins, right? Here, I'm gonna give this a taste. That is so smooth. Yeah. You, you can taste some of that smoky flavor in there. That's what I was talking about with the bitters. That's what really brings the drink together. Okay, so we got two ounces of bourbon, one ounce of sweet vermouth, two dashes of aromatic bitters. Is there a mnemonic I can remember all this? Well, I would say 212 because that happens to be the area code. New York Man City. Of New York City, 212, brilliant. You can't oh, forget dude, that. I'm gonna remember 212 forever. Yeah, I don't know why I'm shaking your hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I should be drinking this. Take that, get out of here. All right, I don't want to say things are ominous, but between the thunderclaps overhead and the scorpions we just encountered, are you are you feeling okay about learning to chainsaw carve? Brian, my favorite movie of all time, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, okay, no, Super that's exciting. The You're modern row makes You're art with helping. chainsaws. We are here with the amazing Griffin Ramsey. Thank you so much for joining us. Is this the kind of thing that as newbies we should be terrified? Is this the kind of thing anyone can know? You should have a healthy level of respect. Well, I got to imagine within about 20 minutes of the chainsaw being invented, chainsaw carving was invented, right? Actually, chainsaws were around for quite a while. In the early 19th century, the first one created was a proto-chainsaw called an osteotome, I believe. Can you imagine what that was designed uh, for? Bone saws? Bone saws. Really? Yes. yes. Decades later, they started using them to cut wood, and a lot of them were hand cranked. Uh, this is not making me feel more comfortable with any of this. <laughs> it, it's, they all cut through a bone a lot easier now. Uh, I, I, I believe you. They didn't really start actual chainsaw carving as an art form until the 1950s. Now, so, tell us about like competitions and the, the shows well, and so forth. Well, some events aren't really designed as competition. They're sort of like a gathering, and some are more focused on auctioning. So you make a bunch of stuff and you auction it, so different ways to structure it. I just did the Australian Chainsaw Carving Championships, which is relatively new, but it seems to be gaining speed, and that's a good one. Are you judged based both on the quality of your art and how quickly you're able to produce it, or well, is there a time limit? You have to finish on time, so that's how quickly you get it done. There are competitions for speed, but those are quick carve, speed carving. It's a different kind of animal, and a lot of times you'll do both in the same event. How similar is chainsaw carving like we're gonna do with wood versus with ice, because I've seen that done as well. I'm not really an ice carver, so I can't speak to it in much depth, but I have used some of the tools on wood and you can use a lot of the same things. Though with ice, you want to go lighter and you, I don't think you use any bar and chain oil because you don't want to get oil all over it. All right, so what are the tools of the trade when it comes to chainsaw carving? You start with the chainsaw and your big cuts, cutting off the ends, prepping your wood and doing your major blocking. You'll do with um, usually a standard saw, like this is the one I have, it's my big saw. Jeez, you're not kidding. <laughs> the Steel MS261C is what I have, and then it has a 22 inch bar on it. This has a regular chain. This is what you, you can find at the dealership already ready to go. So there are different types of guide bars, different types of chains and things like that? Yes, so when you get into carving, you usually try to find a lighter saw so you can go a lot longer and get more detail. For me, this is heavy. For somebody else, it's not that heavy, but after a while, trying to get nuance. I would imagine the longer the bar, the more difficult fine work becomes. Well, and you don't want to do any detail carving with the tip, like you can't use the tip of this bar at all because it can kick back. There are carving bars designed to uh, be able to do that kind of um, carving and more nuanced type stuff, drawing onto the wood with it. So for a long time that people were chainsaw carving, but they were still using this and they could only get the level of detail that you can get with a guide bar this size. So I'd imagine you have to make these giant structures just to get anything resembling yeah. fine work. Yeah, well and a lot of things had that chainsaw texture, which some people love and some people still prefer to use stock guide bars and they don't use carving bars. There's some like purists out there, but most of us really like the level of detail and you can go so much further with this. So you don't have to use sanders or grinders nearly as much when you have like smaller specialty I bars. guess if you're getting more specialty and smaller work and you start to get to use a Dremel, then it becomes not really chainsaw carving. Some people say that. I disagree with them. And so, uh, no, you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> Fair. She's holding the chainsaw. What about the safety side of things? I assume uh, safety goggles to begin with. Yeah, well, the most important thing 
Well, they're all important, but this is very important. Kevlar chaps. Will that really stop the freaking blade? Yeah, the inside of the chaps are, uh, it's Kevlar and it's woven fibers that tangle up the chain if you cut into it. So yes, it ruins the chaps, but it saves your legs, which is way more important. Awesome, and then finally, I guess steel-toed boots are a necessity. Yeah, so steel-toed boots are good to, for obvious reasons. And then I've got gloves, eye protection, ear protection. You can also, depending on what you're cutting, if you're using the larger saw, if you're not comfortable, you may want to wear face shield. The helmet, this is more for loggers, you know, like things potentially falling on them. Probably not going to be something that we need to worry about, but there is a tool that I have that throws big chunks, so I like to have a face shield around because it's no fun. Can you show us the basics? Yes. All right, let's go. So, with the big saw, I'm gonna be getting my blocking done, which I wanna get rid of as much of the wood that I know shouldn't be there right away. Right. So if I can start to see the shape, I'll be able to have that energy to generate the rest of the carving. And it is a nice way, while well, you have the weight of it and the length of it, to get a lot of that stuff done right away. If you use the small tools, you can do it, but it just takes forever. And so do you think in terms of like, uh, like cut out everything from the vertical plane and then uh, and then etch in sideways? I, I guess this I is what it means to be an artist. Yeah, for me, I feel it more. But when I look at like traditional wood carving books, they're like, you do this first and then you, they break it down and they think it way through. I don't do that, but it's, I think, a personal style choice. For this one, I think we had originally talked about doing a little bomb or something together. So I think to show you kind of my process, I'll start making that. But then I brought you your own piece of wood. This is ideal for a wall hanging or something. It's just a slice of a white pine log. And it matters like what type of wood you use for different things? Oh, or? totally. Well, and there's certain woods that are carvable and some that aren't. White pine, this is from Pennsylvania. I brought it back with me. And that is used by a lot of carvers up there. And it does have a nice uniform color and it's pretty soft. So let me tell you a little bit about my process before I start. I'm going to start by removing the big chunks with the silhouette that I have in my mind on all sides is not going to be there. So just get rid of all the excess. And then we can go a little more detailed. Switch down to this saw. For what I'm making, I probably won't even need this little baby saw, but you guys might, so I brought it. Works it's, for me. It is the cutest. <laughs> it's only eight inches. Look at me, it's adorable. It's Wee. <laughs> I just peeled off this big piece of bark. And even though the chainsaw can't go through it, you usually want to pull it off because it dulls out your chain a lot faster. Ah, Got it. Another Got it. tip. All right, let me switch to the carving saw now. This is actually an extra long carving bar. The one that I typically work with, it's only 12 inches, but a 12 inch standard carving bar that's got a quarter pitch chain is your basic setup for carving. And it is really the most versatile and you can do most of everything you need with just that if you want to start off trying to carve. With that, that little dime tip eight inch carving bar, I don't even need to use a die grinder half the time, which is like a big Dremel. You can do a lot of it with that now and it's so much faster. Oh wow. Chainsaw is the fastest, most versatile tool. And the further you can go with the chainsaw, the less the time you have to spend on yes. the fine details. Got and it. if you would try to make money with it like I do, time is everything. For sculpting, it helps is when you make sure you have a nice clear line where one object starts and one ends. So the base will come up to meet the bomb. And that's where this would be helpful to okay. get that little crease in there. Right, okay, I gotcha. But yes, yeah, so it's much lighter. It's like seven pounds. I was kind of worried that you were going to try to carve something spherical and I'm imagining it rolling around and you chasing it all <laughs> around with the Yes, chainsaw. and actually the, I screwed this piece of plywood up to the bottom and then screwed it down to the table. That is the cheap and easy way to hold your piece steady. When you want to cut, like say across the top, you jab these little grabbers into the wood and it'll kind of give you like a nice straight line. So it's not like you have two hands and you're swinging like this. It's like you, you hit the point and then you just pivot along the one yes. hand. Yes, I should actually tighten this chain a little bit. As it heats up, it starts to stretch. For carving, it doesn't matter so much if it's loose, but I kind of prefer it to have the little teeth at least grabbing the groove in there. So I don't take it all the way off, I'd loosen it. But... Oh yeah, and you could just watch it tighten right up. Yeah. Someone set us up the bomb. God damn it, you took my line. Yeah, <laughs> you beat me to it. I've been thinking of that one the whole goddamn time. <laughs>
Oh, we couldn't see the other side. That's fantastic. Yeah, so then what I was thinking, I don't have any black with me, but I brought stuff to burn. I love it. I, I love like all of that. Things. I never thought I'd say this, Murphy, but you look dashing in chaps. I bad. feel pretty good. <laughs> Show me how to start it and everything. It's already warm, so it should be easy. You okay. put it in between your knees. Yep. Hold the handle with your knees. Okay. Now grab this right here. And then it's easier to start when the chain brake is not on. Oh, scary. <laughs> look at that grin. <laughs> That's not terrifying. Stop, 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 stop. Come around the other side. Hold it like this. Ah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> All right, stop. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is not your fault. It's getting a little rickety, so we have to reinforce it. But come over here. Granted, it's not maybe the suit's sharpest, but it should be sharp enough. It doesn't help to saw. Just bear down more. Okay. And hold steady. Okay. And the weight of the saw, if you let the weight of the saw pull, it should be able to make the cut without as much of you having to force it. Gotcha. And it, keep you, this arm as straight as you can, because that'll give you the most like, this oh. This arm here? Always wrap your thumb around this. Keep your thumb wrapped around. Because yeah. if you hold it like this, it could fly back. So what do you think? I dig it. It's good, it's right? It's fun. It's a power trip. It is. And the saw cuts much more smoothly than I thought. It really just kind of slides into it when you're doing it right. Sometimes when it catches, it's because you're pushing on the bar in a weird way. If you try to keep okay. your bar straight, whatever direction you're going, gotcha. instead of cocking it, because then it creates a pinch. But as you play with it more, you'll start to feel it. Yeah. And when you start to feel the resistance, you'll balance yourself better. Yeah, it's becomes, like when you're driving in a screw. When you're when you're lined up on the drill totally straight. It starts to become kind of intuitive. You know how to, yeah. to respond to it. That always makes me nervous. This arm straight as much as you can. It's not possible all the time. All right, you don't have to be crazy about it. Just like as much as you can, keep it away from your face. Hey, Jason. <laughs> the problem you get with the pinching is because you came in like this. If you go straight, it won't pinch the bar. Right, right. And you don't have to go as fast as you think you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah! There we go. Can we, can we just take a moment to see the less than ideal conditions under which we're shooting right now? I could not be more terrified. I'll go over with the small one. You gotta do a plunge cut. I love how people, I do that trick to get air yeah, They keep sawing, they keep thinking it's a real saw. Yeah. It's interesting how powerful it is, but also how easy it is to fall into the sawing motion. Oh, I know, we are just watching you. Yeah. It I, doesn't make it easier. Yeah, like no, it's, not it a saw. It it's not a saw. It makes it harder to yeah. do that, actually. You gotta just stress the weight of the saw and just keep it as smooth as possible. The thing that you had the hardest time is, granted, it's because it's on a cocked angle. It's just not let it getting a pinch. Yeah. The more you move, the more you open yourself up to that. Well, I kept trying to correct, and that's not the right way to do it. Yeah. So don't, don't like twist, you know, when you're in oh, there. Oh, yeah, no. So you can twist enough to find where it's smooth. And then I noticed, too, you would get uncertain you let off of the throttle, yeah. but then it would get stuck. So right. you gotta keep the throttle up a little bit. And your body gets more in tune with the saw. Yeah, and you gotta just kinda let it do its thing if you're on the right track. You right, know, just... unless that thing is carving into your body. Right. Don't let Don't it do, do that. Unless it yeah. really, really wants to. Dude, if this is gonna be decoration for the warehouse, I feel this heavy mantle on me that, to do it right. That was easier than I thought. Yeah! 
So I can show you how to use the chainsaw like a rasp. I saw you doing it on the uh, just on, on bit, the, yeah. the bomb. It just looks like you cut, just kind of texturize it all the way it. down. Yeah, and so you can do that. And you can go as far, far with it as you want to. So to get rid of some of this bug stuff, this stuff's kind of going to rot faster anyway. All right. So, Actually, okay, so now we're at the point where we want to do more fine work, right? Yeah. Let me round off this, or you like it blocked? I like it blocked. Okay, all right, we'll leave it. I'm gonna thin out this uh, R. He'll spend all day on this if we let him. Another trick is if you hold it at a 45 degree angle to the grain, okay. it won't catch as easily. Okay. And if you catch it a little bit, go the opposite direction, 45 degrees. I love the smell of cedar. Here, you want to do it? You're better at the detail work. Sure. Okay, yeah. so what am I looking at? So you just want to try to get it smooth and straight. This is really aggressive, this disc. You have to order them online. You can't buy them at Home Depot. Oh. So it's actually kind of a cutting tool. The grinder, I find way more dangerous than the chainsaw. And a lot of carvers have had incidents with the grinder, not with the chainsaw. So be wary. And luckily mine right here, I used to have the kind that locked on. Yep. I've switched to the kind that... You let go of it, it turns off. Yeah. But it doesn't turn off right away. Gloves? Sure. gloves? Better, no, gloves no, because your gloves are more likely to get caught up in it. We don't have dust masks, which is a kind of a faux pas, so just keep your mouth closed. Okay. Okay, so let's light things on fire. Nice! <laughs> All right, Jason Murphy. Do I pull the trigger to do it? Yeah, I guess so, huh? Oh, sir. I'm inordinately nervous about this. Oh. Now it's on my end. All right, go ahead. Because that's going to be your shadows. That's good. I think we're real good. And then you can take this guy if you want to do some, like, get some of these creases, because unfortunately the creases don't burn as quickly as the outside, but you can actually go a little deeper than you think, because with the flap center, it'll take this first one off almost immediately. The areas you want more shadows in, like if you're creating depth, you want those to burn a little harder. And I'm gonna burn a little bit inside of those grooves, because then it'll create more shadow. It's not ominous. It really changes the whole thing. So I do think that some of this area, you guys didn't burn very deep. So if you do take the flap sander over it, it'll kind of create a softer texture to it. Okay. And then this stuff has a chance to, look, to make it stand more out and be more three-dimensional. So the purpose of this is to create, what, more texture and, and depth? Yeah, and shadow. Well, I forgot to bring any spray paint or stain, so this is for the bomb anyway, the only option to get it dark. <laughs> I like it, and I think that for shows, it's a great effect because it gives you that effect immediately. Yeah. The only thing is, if you, especially if you don't treat it, it has a tendency to fade over time. So if you rely too heavily on your burning to create shadows, eventually your carving will look a little bit flat. So you can't rely on it too heavily, but it is kind of a nice added effect. And I think people really like the look of burned wood. And it smells awesome. So this is a flap sander. Another specialty item, a lot of carvers use it, especially after burning. You don't press on it. You just sort of let it do its thing. It's hard to get a sense of where it is. You gotta kinda go bit by bit. Yeah, so you can see a little bit more of the ridges in the wood. Yeah. And it brings out a little bit more. Oh. 
Holy cow, Griffin, that was extraordinary. You guys did really well. Of all the things I expected to actually like what we made was not on them. <laughs> I thought this was going to be something that my parents would pretend to put on the refrigerator. <laughs> it's an ashtray, Mom. <laughs> yeah, and then they lost it forever. All right, Griffin, where can we see more of your wonderful stuff? Well, you can find um, my carving work at youtube.com slash Griffin Ramsey. Right on. It's Griffin with an O. And R-A-M-S-A-Y. E-Y. E-Y, don't do it. You're so bad at this. I'm the worst. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have beer, and then it's going to work. Look, man, I don't want to say you wasted your time, but this might be the worst buffet I've ever seen. Welcome to the Rogue's Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's like the cinnamon challenge. And Period. <laughs> Period. The modern rogue eats miracle fruit. We have something today that is going to make all of these items on our table absolutely delicious. Whatever this is, it must be literally miraculous. I suspect it's made of a substance called miraculin. That is the glycoprotein in Sensipalum dulcificum, or the miracle berry fruit, which is a plant that originates in West Africa. From what little I've read, it looks like the miraculin binds to certain parts of your tongue that blocks out stuff like bitter and sour tastes. Exactly, so it makes sour things and acidy tasting things like lemons or vinegar taste sweet. So what I read was back in the 1970s, they were looking at this as an artificial sweetener, something that would make bitter foods more palatable, but there was some breakdown with trade. As I understand it, the additive got classified as an actual food additive, and that created all sorts of hoops that they needed to jump through with the FDA, and the company that was trying to push it forward went bankrupt. When I first read about this, it sounded to me like a psychotropic drug or something. This is not a drug. This is a food additive. Correct. It is generally generally accepted as safe. That's actually a rating from the FDA. <laughs> generally accepted as safe? Made me a little nervous. Okay, yeah. I will never get on a roller coaster that is rated as generally accepted as safe. People don't even really know exactly how the miracle fruit works. Oh, generally safe. Generally believed to be safe. Okay, fine. So if we're gonna be scientific about this, it seems like we have to eat these before the miracle fruit and then We'll find out what they taste like. Oh, wait. You're gonna make us do it without the Miracle Berry? Yes, yes, yes. Eat. It's not as bad. Mm, mm. It's sour. It's okay. not as bad as you think going into it. It's the after pangs. <laughs> That's better. You eat the rind? <laughs> That's so gross. A tomato? Yeah. It'll be fine. In no way is this an appropriate eating surface. Fine. It's like eating cardboard, basically. Not much to it. It's a tomato. Yeah. yeah, you cut the onion. Mm. I actually really love the sharpness of raw onions. Really? Yeah. Gross. I, I could do this all day. Oh. Our breaths, after all this, it's going to be like a dumpster fire. Not to us. It'll smell like sweet molasses. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> okay, so a red pepper right now, by default, tastes more, I wouldn't call it a bitter uh, strain, but there's like a sharpness to it. Yeah. Now, a lot of these were foods that were often recommended for food tripping. Right. Some of them I just guessed at. So Tabasco sauce, part oh, of the reason that it really pops is because of the peppers. That's the capsaicin in there. I hate Tabasco sauce. Really? I hate Tabasco okay. sauce. Wait, you putting it on the thing? Hold on, let's also put mustard on there. <laughs> what are we this doing? The worst job ever. This went totally awry. I hate mustard, I hate, I hate Tabasco. vinegar. I love peppers, but right. I guess. Cheers. Eh. That's the worst. Here, goat cheese. Oh, for the love of God. Why are you bringing goat cheese? This is terrible. Have a pellet. Jesus, I mean, smell that. I don't, yeah, I mean. I know. Oh, oh, that's good. But it tastes like rotten styrofoam. <laughs> I, will right. not, I will not, I will not, uh, I'm not, do, I will not, I will not. No, 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 I seriously, I seriously hate pickles. Really? I seriously. Come on, one pickle. Uh, you know what? For science. No, 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 never. Yeah, no, good for you. Limes? Limes? Oh, dude, we could do a lime. Can I say for the record that it is a crime that lime is no longer the default green color of candy? You f***er, you f***er, you bitch. You mother f***er, you f***ing mustard wiping mother f***er. Here, yeah, I, I'll try, here, no, I'll do it. Okay, I'll do it. Good. I'll yeah, do it. No, good, yeah, no, enjoy your mustard lime. You wiped mustard on this one, too. Mm. Mm. I hate the smell of vinegar. I hate vinegar-based cleaning agents. I hate anything vinegar, anything vinegar. I hate you, vinegar. Just a sip. Don't you have shot glasses in here? <laughs> this is the one thing that makes that sense. Bad. Was it like super bad for you? No, it wasn't that bad no, no, no. The, the worst of all of them was the pepper with the mustard and the Tabasco. It was literally was the gross. worst thing ever. I didn't like that. 
And now. Do you like the bitter agent? It's got like hints of coffee and it's very creamy. I don't dislike it, I just don't usually pick it. If I handed these to you and said they're generally considered safe, would you dive in? No! Hey bro! Especially because you handed them to I'm me. I'm loving this EDM. These are generally considered <laughs> safe. Would you like some? According to instructions, place it on the tongue, roll it around, do not swallow it. You want to coat all of your receptors for sour and bitter, right? Right. It'll last for about an hour. Mm. We're well coated. So begins our journey. Is it bad? Mm, no. It tastes... It, it, it tastes... Wait. Mm. There's a candy taste on the back of my tongue. It's chocolatey. Yes, yes! I hate chocolate. I know, I know. Okay, we're off to a bad start. If this somehow <laughs> made you take something you already love, beer, and turn it into something you would love even less, and also that thing is chocolate. Damn you, Miracle Berry! Let's cut to the chase. Everyone wants to see the lemon. Okay. Let's get the lemon. Chew the whole thing up. Mmm! <laughs> it's not sour at all. Oh, hot damn, that is good! Yeah, that's really tasty, right? Oh wow. my god! That went from painful and a dare mm -hmm. to instantly being sweet, sweet lemonade. I mean, the lime's not even fair because I already love me some lime. But all of a sudden, this is like lifesaver lime. This is lollipop mm -hmm. lime. Yeah. This is amazing. I mean, you can still taste that it's a lime. What's funny is I can detect the sourness mainly by smell, but the taste is 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 super sweet. Yeah, that's really good. Now, the danger with the Miracle Berry is that you're eating all of this acidic food like it's nothing, mm -hmm. and it can really end up kind of wrecking your stomach for a while. Yeah, but it's generally considered safe. <laughs> generally, it's slice of tomato. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll eat a slice of tomato. I don't, no I don't know what. if this is going to do anything. It still tastes like a tomato. It, it does have. It brings like, out the the tomato ness of it. It's very much the tomato experience, but everything just leans towards sweet now. We're running out of stuff that you can handle, Mr. Brushwood. Uh, no. Mm. Yeah, it takes the edge off. I can sit here and eat an entire onion like this. There's a big difference between getting a raw onion and a cooked onion. Oh, yeah, yeah. This tastes like a cooked onion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Maybe slow down? No, it's fine. I feel so sorry for your wife. If we're going to do the pepper, we have to do it the same way. Oh, yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. Why don't you like Tabasco? I've never liked Tabasco. It's that flavor between spicy and sweet. It's like it can't decide where it's going to be. Jesus Christ. Why, why do we do this? There we go. I, I don't... Hmm. <laughs> You're not encouraging me. I mean, it's not good. <laughs> it's just not sour anymore. It does have that weird Tabasco burn to it still. The mustard is the big surprise. The mustard gives a weird spicy pop and you can identify it as mustard. Yeah. But it doesn't have that sour tang. Like, like at no point is my mouth flooding with saliva. You can taste the sweetness of the Tabasco sauce. That really wasn't bad. It was just strange. I don't like some goat cheese. It's really creamy. Yeah. The uh, dairy aspect seems to be counteracting the spicy aspect, right? Mm, yeah. I think I liked it more beforehand. Really? Yeah, yeah. Now it just feels like sand. I'm, putting sand in your mouth. I'm not getting that at all. Sweet sand. We just, We're down we to the last say, two. Can we just say, this was a lot of fun. You should try no, it. No, we can't. You want me to do it first? Make you feel better? No, no. I'll you, do it. You make me feel like a little child. Oh, good. I'm doing it first then. This is like a novelty drink. There is still the distinct hint of vinegar there. There's but no it is way. Very sweet. There's no way. Yeah. It's, uh, you're still not going to like it. Just drink it. Drink it. Okay, there's a little bit of the aftertaste that's sideways, right. but if you told me on that first hit that I was having some new formulation of lemon lime Gatorade, mm. I would have believed you because yeah. it is acidic and it does bring that lemony lime f yeah. flavor. It's the aftertaste that's when you realize, oh yeah. wait, no, yeah. this is still vinegar. I like the first part yeah, a lot. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. And now the coup de gras. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, sir. No, 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 no. Yes, no, sir. No, no, no. Just one, one pickle slice. Oh, Come God. on, man. Oh, God. <laughs> Stop, don't put, don't put pickle juice on me. <laughs> These are dill pickle chips, which are generally more sour. After this, they taste more like um, bread and butter pickles. You're like, uh, normally this is peanutty poop, but this is more dog poop. And I'm like, oh boy, this is still poop. Still poop. Why would I put poop in my mouth? Do it, you got it. Come on. Are you kidding me? Do you like it? I don't like it, but everything I hate about pickles is not happening right now. I am not experiencing the, the, the pain of the saliva rush. 
I'm not experiencing the overwhelmingness of the pickle. It's as though my entire life somebody has screamed pickle in my ear and for the first time they're whispering. And as a result, I'm like, oh, pickle's not so bad. It just dialed down the intensity. Yeah. Okay. This is a very novel experience. Right on. And strangely enough, pickles are often preserved in vinegar, I think. You know, me and vinegar, we had our issues. We worked it out. Not you, vinegar. You're one of the good ones. You know what I'm saying. I imagine that if you drank this entire thing, you would be sick for a good day. Would you bet me? No, because I know you would. At this point, I know you would. No. No, 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 no. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is a thing that's happening? Oh! 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 No! I can't handle Oh my god, you're like toothpaste! You're swishing with it! <laughs> Cheers! Why did we do this? Brian, who is the coolest guy on television ever? Well, it's got to be Don Draper, It's right? Don Draper. Yeah. Yes, good answer. I was really afraid you were going to say Gilligan, and I was going to say, okay, I fine. Mean, he's pretty the cool. modern road <laughs> makes an old fashioned. When you talk about Manhattan, I vaguely understand it. Certainly a, a, a martini, I, it makes sense. Old fashioned, you might as well say old wizardry. Fortunately, we have a wizard here to tell us. Trevor, right. at the Steampunk Saloon. Trevor, tell us about the old fashioned. The old fashioned has been a staple of the bar community for years. Is it bad for me to confess that I don't know that I've ever had an old fashioned? It's one of the predecessors of all cocktails. Way back in the 19th century, whiskey drinks were whiskey, sugar, bitters, and water. That was just a whiskey cocktail. But they started spicing them up. Maybe somebody will add a little bit of curacao. Then one day someone said, just give it to me old fashioned. Walk me through this, Trevor. Okay, I'm gonna start out with a sugar cube. A lot of ours have started using like a brown sugar cube or molasses sugar cube. Oh. So we're gonna drop that in there and we're gonna dash this with, depending on how you like the drink, we're gonna use three to four dashes of Angostura bitters. One, two, three, four. And you really want a good coating on that sugar. This is uh, uh, Angostura aromatic bitters. Yes. Which You're gonna see this in just about any you go to. This is the Coke brand of bitters. Now that it's sat there for a minute, we're gonna muddle this. And you want to really get it good and mashed up with that bitters. How do you know when you're done? Because if I was doing this, I would keep mashing until everything was a frothy, foamy paste, but I'm guessing that's not what you want. Well, when you're using a sugar cube like this, you can really start to feel it break underneath your muddler. You want to leave just a little bit, because this will add texture to the drink when the sugar mixes with the bourbon. Okay. We're going to put an orange swap in here. This is really going to add a lot of flavor to the drink. And this is just a simple, you know, fruit peeler. We're going to get the oils out of this swap. You just kind of hold it like this. Got it. And then some citrus kind of shot off there. Sure. You have a fresh peel. We have very little pit. This is the white part of the fruit that you don't want to eat. See, I had always thought that you put actual orange in there and not part of the rind itself. Some of the best flavor of the orange is actually in the rind. Because of the oils, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And what you can do is, especially the fresh one, is when you break it over, you can see it. You can see it bursting out. And that really adds flavor to your drink. You can take a swath like this, go around the rim, and that's going to add that flavor the entire time. Some bartenders will throw this out. It looks good in the drink. We're going to put this in there. We're going to muddle this again. And all you have to do when you're muddling the actual swath, you're just pushing the oils out. You don't need to kill it. There's no benefit to breaking it up into a paste or a mush or a pulp. No, not at all. That's the last thing you really want to do. Got it. Because it can overtake the drink, and you want to taste that food. Some people will say this is sacrilegious. Some people will say that this is the way it's done. But I always add soda water to my old fashioned. It's really gonna bring out the bitters and the orange and it's gonna really connect it all. And you can see when I added that soda water, how it frothed up like yep. that. It really took in the bitters and the orange and really just put it together like a glue. This is turning into a chemistry experiment, so you're speaking Brian's language. That's right. This may sound disgusting. You can actually take a sip of that right now, and it would be very, very flavorful. So far, it's just bitters, bitters soda water, and orange with that, a little bit of sugar. sugar. It's like an orangey licorice. It's not bad at all. You like try it too? Yeah. For a good old fashioned, you just need a good night. Not so boozy, but definitely it's tasty. Yeah. Now, we just need our whiskey. What kind of whiskey? We're using a rye today. Traditionally, old fashioned was made with rye. It varies from era, it varies from bar to bar, but I like a good rye because it has more of a bitter flavor. Typically, in an old fashioned, you're going to have two to two and a half ounces. We're going to do a, just a standard two ounce pour with our jigger. Okay. Get some more ice here. And we're gonna stir this drink. We're not gonna give this a lot of rotation because we don't have really good ice. Yep. 
and when you use ice like this, it can dilute too quickly. So you want to use a little bit less ice here, but you still want the glass to be chilled. A lot of people, when they're trying to make a really fancy old fashioned, they'll use one of the spherical thing of ice. One of those like of eight ice. balls of ice. Exactly. And that is one of the best ways to serve it, but you just don't want to dilute the drink too much. Now, some people will say that you shouldn't put a cherry in an old fashioned. I like a little bit of a nicer cherry, like a black cherry. I like the oils that come off with it because I really think it complements not only the orange, but the right whiskey. So we're just gonna drop that right in here. All right, so when you drink this, what are the notes you should be expecting? You're going to have citrus and earthy, smoky tones from the whiskey. All right, here we go. Have a sip. Wow, uh, tr try this. It's like almost a mossy, kind of like a rich, foresty kind of flavor. That was your first sip of an old fashioned? Yeah. You've just taken your first step into a larger world. I, I, I'm so excited, Do you dude. feel like Don Draper? I do. Yeah, this dude, is delicious. That is really good. All right, so all of this stuff is voodoo to me. We got yellow arrows, we got a dotted red line, we got a white X here with an arrow pointing at this thing. We got stuff coming out of electrical junction boxes. What does all this crazy urban graffiti actually mean? Uh, it tells you where the next Illuminati meeting is. The modern road learns about utility location go. markings. So you got different colors, you got different symbols, you have little bits of text in there. I assume that each of these are pointing out different utilities that are all buried underground. Exactly. These are required by construction companies when they're going to excavate something that is in the public way, like in a street or a sidewalk or something like that. So what surprises me is that everyone's okay with just spray painting on there. Like this is all meant to be washed away. It doesn't really last very long. It's a special type of spray paint. Since it's on the ground, it has to be able to be sprayed upside down because most spray paint cans don't work it's like that. It's actually built to draw stuff on exactly. concrete. Who is the one making the marks on all of this stuff? In the United States, you can actually call 811 and they will hook you up with the resources to find out exactly what utilities are in your area. And then there are utilities locations companies that you can hire and they will come out and mark everything for you. So let's just start with the colors. We got white, yellow, red, uh, green, blue. What do the different colors mean? Well, each one is a different type of utility. The red, of course, is going to be power. And of course. You can, yeah. Why wouldn't it be? Right. <laughs> you can see how it centers around the uh, little junction box The electrical box here. junction right here. This one right here is a manhole cover. But on the manhole, it says electric. So that's a pretty good clue. It's pretty good clue. <laughs> pretty yeah. good clue. Yeah. The white stuff is actually proposed excavation routes. There's nothing there now, but that's where they want to excavate. Blue is, of course, uh, drinkable water. Drinkable water. And the green is? Sewage. Non-drinkable water. Non-drinkable water. <laughs> Might yes. as well make it brown if I was in charge. Yes. And what about the yellow stuff? Yellow is gas or oil. Orange is telecom, cable. Got or it. Or fiber optic or that kind of stuff. Or something like that. So let's talk about shape. In this case, we got two arrows and three lines, which I assume means something's going this way, but I assume the distance between them is relevant? That is the approximate width, as I understand it. Now, if you've got one that's just a single line, that's going to be a really just a narrow single pipe or cable or something like that. All of this is not indicating what's already there, it's indicating what's going to be there? No, it's indicating what's already there, but it's so when they dig, they don't dig got into it. it. Got it, got in it, got it. In 1976, there was a terrible accident when a construction company dug into a gas line and it blew up an entire city block and there oh, were a geez. lot of fatalities. So the American uh, Public Works Association came up with this color coding and every construction company when they're excavating in the United States has to call in and find out where all of the utilities are and this is the commonly accepted color coding. And funnily enough, the colors are actually very strictly regulated so that they get the exact right shape. Interesting. So what, what does it mean when you have a diamond like this over here? The diamond over here, that's an actual duct that you have cables so within. starting here to there, there's actually something carved out. Exactly. Now, you'll also notice right over there, you'll see the initials DT. DT is probably the company that's going to be doing the excavating. There are codes that are established, like TWC for Time Warner Cable, ATT for AT&T, VZN for Verizon, that kind right, of thing. Right, right. That tells you who owns the cable that are in this area. Dude, this is freaking amazing. This is stuff I walk by every single day and never even pause to think about, but now I'm gonna have like laser vision looking around for this stuff all the time. It's becoming like a weird obsession. I almost got hit by a car on the way over here because I was just walking across the street going, yeah, now, definitely now we just telecom. gotta learn how to do gang tags, all this stuff. Well, next, next up on the modern road, we can do this? One step at a time. I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. I got it. Ah, don't, don't, don't. Brian, do you know how batteries generate power? Yes, because I wish it. 
Oh, good. Is it your midichlorians? Is I, that okay, what does it? Okay, well, why'd you have to make this a racist thing? <laughs> the modern row what, tests battery yeah, life exactly. with physics. Okay, so in all seriousness, how do you know, absent a battery charger, whether or not a battery is worth a damn? You drop it. Wait, you just drop it and then that's it? Exactly. You can, based on its bounce, tell if it's been discharged to a certain point. Okay, now I saw this animated gif of a battery dropping and everyone's like, oh, it's clearly dead or whatever. Is that for reals? Is there a chemical reason for that? There is zinc in here. It's more of a gel at first, and as it becomes discharged, it starts to turn into a ceramic. This is like the whole thing about telling a hard-boiled egg from a raw egg, where it's like you spin the raw egg and it sort of like lazily flops around because it's liquid inside, whereas a hard-boiled egg will spin around super fast. I hadn't considered that, but I imagine there are some parallels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when it's a gel, what is what? What, uh, what makes a battery? Well, you've got your zinc in there. You have your magnesium dioxide. There's an anode and a cathode. Whoa, 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 Professor. What is an anode versus a cathode? Okay, one of them is negatively charged, one of them is positively charged. Okay, got it. Once you connect the two, it starts circulating in there and it starts to turn the zinc into zinc oxide. Okay, so the fresh battery is more gel or more ceramic? It's which more gel. Which? More gel. So fresh batteries are more gel, which I would imagine if you were to spin it, it would slow down faster. And I would imagine, I'm just guessing here, but if you dropped it on a hard surface, a fresh battery would not bounce? You are correct. Oh, good, good, yes. good, good, good. As it turns into zinc oxide, all of the gel starts to turn into a ceramic with springy little links. It becomes a, a bouncy lattice work. Be it becomes a super ball. In fact, a lot of the patents for golf balls include zinc oxide to give them more bounce. That's amazing. Yes. A lot of people believe that the batteries only bounce when they're completely drained. But this study from Princeton has shown that that's not the case. They actually start bouncing at about 50% of their drain. For the record, how cool is it that Princeton is spending money to find this stuff out for us? That is amazing. All right, so we got two batteries. Is it just as simple as just dropping it on the concrete? It is. You have to have the right surface. This table, for instance, is a little too... Too bouncy. It has too much give. Let's test know. it on a hard surface. All right, you got it. All right. So one of these is allegedly 100% fully charged. The other one is completely dead. Completely drained. Pinky, drained it myself. Pinky promise. Pinky promise. Okay, what, do you, what does that mean when you say you drained it yourself? You don't need to know. <laughs> okay, fine. So dead batteries bounce, live batteries not so much. Exactly. Okay, here we go. Three, two. I don't know if that was a big bounce or a small bounce. It's gonna be relative, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like I'm looking at I'm like, uh, I don't know. Try the other one, you'll see. Okay, all right. Holy cow! Lots of difference, right? Are you kidding me? One, two, three. Wow! Yeah. That is dramatic! Markedly different, and it works with double A's, triple A's, C cells, D cells, and nine volts. Dude, this is fantastic. Okay, so it seems like this doesn't so much identify a dead battery since anything under 50% will bounce, but it does confirm a good battery. Correct. And again, it's not a linear relationship. It could be 50%, 40%, or even dead. Anything under 50% is gonna bounce. Got it. So if it bounce, smoke dead ounce. If it's flat, put it in your Walkman. You're on no. your own on this one. I don't know. Walkman? What the hell are you talking about? So which would you rather have, fire powers or cryo powers? Oh, fire powers. Why is that? Absolutely. Fire starter? Yeah, but you burn everything down. Yeah, exactly. Dude, I could blast crazy ice everywhere in this and it would be fine tomorrow. There would be no house if I was blasting fire. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Okay. That's not the only Batman quote I have if we're going to be playing with cold things. Oh, oh just all Mr. Freeze? Everyone chill. <laughs> the modern road acts super cool. So everything we're using, we got at the local grocery store. Yes, we're gonna be making super cooled cryo fluid. Now with liquid nitrogen, uh, obviously it's colder, but when it hits skin, it immediately boils and falls off. Right. This stuff is gonna stick to the body if it gets us, right? It is a completely different chemical. You don't wanna touch this at all. Uh, here, yeah, pop it up. All right, so dry ice is, I know it's carbon dioxide, and I know that when it warms up, it sublimates. It turns directly into CO2 gas, but who figured out how to make it. It was a company in 1925. Dry ice was their trademark, but now it's commonly regarded as any compressed carbon dioxide. Yeah, oh, you can feel it through the gloves even. Yeah, the gloves. Yeah. I used to have scars. What? Right here from dry ice. Why yeah. did you, you were a burner? You uh, were a dry ice, you were an icer when you were a kid? Exactly. <laughs> it was for a Halloween party and I was carrying a bunch feel, of stuff. Feel how quick the rubber yeah. gets totally stiff on here. 
Whoa, there we go. Whoa. <gasps> oh my God, look at it. It looks like it, it worms around like ants. Dry ice is actually kind of pricey compared to regular ice. How much was this? Uh, this was like 13 bucks for this block. I mean, it's not bad, but there we go. All right, beauty. Okay, so we got our cold source. What are we using for our fuel? Rubbing alcohol. So you want as pure alcohol as you can get because otherwise if there's lots of liquid in there, it's gonna get what? It'll get viscous. If it's like 70% isopropyl alcohol, it'll turn into like a sludge. Isn't this what you always wanted to it do? It really is. <laughs> this is in every way a childhood fantasy. Now this is where we wanna be real careful not to let anything splash on us because at this point, it's now super cooled. It will give you immediate frostbite. Oh, we're talking about freezer burning your yeah. body. Yeah, I guess we test it out right at this point. Shot, 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 oh, shot, God shot, damn. shot, Don't, shot. no yelling, oh, no yelling. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I want to do that thing with the flower. That one always blew my mind. What do you want to do next? I'm going to get that. Oh, marshmallow. Marshmallow? Throw a few of them in there. What now? Let's grab a hot dog. A hot dog. We're yes. going to make the world's worst soup. <laughs> <laughs> it's another really depressing meal at Modern Rogue headquarters. Should we cast a spell? Should we say something in Latin? Oh, what is this? Flarp. Noise putty. <laughs> it's Flarp. Copyright free. Glick yak. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, Want to take no, just no. part of it? Yeah, I'd feel better. Because it would be legitimately bad if the, if something had a big burst air bubble or something like that. Actually, bad. I don't think that's how it's going to work. I think it's going to contract. Okay. Than, that's why you can actually put blown up balloons in liquid nitrogen and they'll shrivel. And then it's go. Yeah. What about a stick of butter? So right now it's spreadable, right? Just hold that down. Oh my gosh. Hold on. It's brittle. <laughs> you want to do another awesome. one? Awesome, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just hit it with a hammer. All right, ready? It'll be a little bit better. Oh! <laughs> yes! Yes, it works! Success! Can you squeeze it? No. Okay, all right, yeah, let's give it a try. Ready? No, see, I think it's insulated. I think the outside freezes, yeah. but the inside maintains its uh, sponginess. See, now this one I feel like is ready because it finally, see how much smaller it is? So good! Yes! Boy, listen even to the sound of the cutting board. This is all frozen straight yeah. through. Here we go. Whoop. Yep, we're right. Careful. We're good. We're, we're done. good. Yep. We're good. Yep. We're good. <laughs> Hot dog certified. All right. <laughs> it's amazing to me that we have to go through so much dry ice because I guess it's all sublimating, but also the alcohol is evaporating. Yeah, alcohol has a really low evaporation point. Well, and the water that's in the rubbing alcohol, you can see, is starting to get it a little bit viscous. Do you want to do the honors? Sure. Wow! Holy cow! <laughs> it shot across a room like an atomic fireball. That's amazing. Here, I'm going to hold it in place. It's like a jawbreaker. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Let me give it a try. Hit it hard? Yeah. <gasps> Ooh. Showtime, you little scamp. One, two. I'm hit. Whoa. <laughs> I took a big chunk of it to the stomach. Jeez Louise. You know what's really gross? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the part they don't show you after all those demonstrations. Yeah. So I think this might be the most legitimately scientific episode that we've done. Uh, sure, if sure. not the safest episode. It's certainly not the safest. Here's what scares me about this, is the quantity that we're using. Because in order to get enough of it to immerse something in, this could mess you up forever if somebody were to grab it and fling it over your body or whatever. You would not be able to warm up your body fast enough. We're oh, not doing no, that? No, 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 no. Thought we were gonna coin toss okay, for it. Okay, this is, you, I, I don't, makes me uncomfortable. So if Satan was going to reach out to you, wouldn't he be more of a country music fan? <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair at all. All right, when we were kids, what were like the biggest things that you were afraid of? Uh, well, nuclear war, right? Yep. Everybody born after 1990 can't even imagine what it was it. like. And Satan, because he was involved in everything. Rock music, mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. 
daycare centers. Everything was blamed on Satan. And one of the ways that he got into your life, as I had always heard, sure. were messages that were hidden backwards in rock music. I remember my mom scaring the crap out of me, saying like, you know, little Susie came home and she got a piece of paper someone gave her with instructions to summon the devil. You don't mess around with that. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. What is so satanic about backwards messages in music? Because it sounds like nonsense. Yeah, well, it was started by some Christian fundamentalists in the late 1970s. They said that messages hidden backwards in rock music, if you listen to them, played forwards, these messages would bypass your conscious mind and work their way into your subconscious. Okay, so I'm gonna assume that they base this idea on some double-blind peer-reviewed science, right? Alistair Crowley. <laughs> the dude who got high at early, sex. Yep, early wrote 20th century. Wrote a bunch century. of nonsense. The Beast. He wrote that in a book. Some Christian fundamentalists ran with it in the late 70s, and suddenly it was everywhere. If you play anything backwards, it does legitimately sound creepy as hell. Yes. And if you told me beforehand, like, hey man, you're about to hear Satan's voice, I'd be freaking out, and yeah. I'm sure I would hear Satan's voice. Well, as Bill Hicks put it, if you're playing a record backwards, making it go brrrr, you are Satan. <laughs> Now, the Beatles popularized it during Rain. They were doing it intentionally. Sure. But then people started listening to all of their other tracks and hearing messages. That's where the whole Paul is Dead thing happened, right? Precisely. So that was a case of urban legend meeting uh, pareidolia and apophenia. Pareidolia is finding signal where there is no signal, exactly. right? So it's, let's say you got a bunch of clouds, you see the face of Satan in there. Apophenia is interpreting the face of Satan in the clouds to mean that you should go out and murder people. Is that right? Right. With the Beatles, everyone started listening and hearing all of these other things and it spread everywhere. There was a DJ in 1981 who started playing Stairway to Heaven and saying, no, there is a very clear backwards message. Well, uh, we'll be the judge of this. Oh, yes. I kill a bunch of hobbits every day before breakfast. And, and then, then more before to... second breakfast. I <laughs> 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 All right, all right, all right, all right. Tell me, tell me this is all just coincidence because that definitely sounded exactly like the one little path, my sweet Satan. So here's to my sweet Satan. Listen, yeah. to, here's to my sweet Satan. Here's to my sweet Satan. That clearly was Satan talk right there. And it matched word for word from what I saw. How is that just pareidolia? You're telling me we just found signal and noise? If we were listening to that song backwards without having these words on the screen, mm -hmm. we probably wouldn't hear anything but a bunch of noise. But it's priming. We're being told what we're supposed to hear. And of course we're hearing it because it all adds up. It's capitalizing on two different parts of the brain. It's utilizing those to make you hear something that otherwise you would just hear noise. Classic example is the old woman, young woman, cognitive illusion, right? Whenever they have one group of people who's shown just the old lady, while the other group is shown a version of the picture that clearly depicts a young woman, the two of them will argue insanely because they've been primed for different things. And this video is perfect because it primes you as you watch. So it seems like one way to prove this would be to take something that definitely, definitely has no meaning and ascribe something to it. You got an example? There's a band out of Austin called the Draculas. Yeah. Pull up game ground. Jump to the, the middle. Yeah, I'd love to all right so let's go ahead and pull it up reversed so this is the same thing reversed what section yeah. am i listening jump to, to 109 here we go you know <laughs> All right, so I heard exactly. <laughs> All right, let me try again. Let me try again. <laughs> All right, so I Yeah, I got nothing. I can make nothing out of that. Okay. Let's do it again, but this time I want you to pry me. What should I expect to hear? Oh Satan, to the end, you shall last until the end. <laughs> It's clearly there, right? Oh, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Let me hear that again. <laughs> okay, what dark part of your brain <laughs> found satanic lyrics in this? Oh, I find it everywhere. <laughs> you sat down and you're like, okay, I'm just gonna listen for the word Satan. Yeah, that was actually the cue that I was looking for. I found that this morning before I came over here to record. All right, that's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna back mask uh, positive messages like, hey man, you're great. <laughs> 
<laughs> in fact, we'll do that on this episode. Yes. Go back and listen again. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We've hidden messages all throughout this episode as we give more work to Brant. I, yes, exactly. Do you want to give Brant this power? It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Jason Murphy. Yes. You ever get emails forwarded to you with helpful advice? Not anymore, because I blocked all of them. That's why you never respond to me now. <laughs> exactly. The modern row cuts jars with oil and fire. So this is one of those that's been circulating. I saw it online and I thought, there's no way. It was overly simplistic and I still question whether or not it works on the timeline that it shows in the video. We're going to be cutting the glass without actually cutting the glass? Well, okay, so here's the thing. I would have called this total BS, except for I got to go work with a, a, a glazier. One of the things they do is they use heat discrepancy to stress the glass on just the right part. So when they bang it, it breaks on one clear thin line. Theoretically, there's no reason this shouldn't work, which is why as much as it looks like BS, I think it. I think this will actually work. I saw a bunch of threads on Reddit and so forth where people tried it mm -hmm. and they could not get it to work. So, oh, so it's a challenge now. I think so. I've already got my game face on, bro. Oh, Let's go. Okay, so according to the video, our intended outcome is to transform this mason jar into a tumbler glass. Right? Sure. You could fill the bowl with water up to the line that you want to crack it at, or you could do it from the inside, right? Correct. But the important ingredient is that you add something that has a much, much higher boiling point than water. So in this case, uh, corn oil is going to boil at, what, 475, I yes. think? All the oils will boil at different temperatures, but since the water will never get hotter than 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius, the oil can get very, very hot. You'll have a very precise band of thermal discrepancy where it stresses the glass and hopefully shatters it, right? Exactly. My suspicion is that less is more. I, I assume that we want as thin a band as possible okay. on that corn oil. You gotta make sure it's touching all of the sides or this one will not work. How do we heat just the oil? Well, that's why you would have more in there. Now we want to get the metal red hot, and I hope it doesn't start heating up the tongs. No, I think, yeah, I'm sure you'll be fine. You'll be fine. All right, boss. What happens when you dip it down into the water? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so the water evaporates, keeping itself at 100 degrees centigrade, and the oil's getting hotter and hotter. Let's heat it up again. Okay, let's try it again. So you're only dipping it in the oil. You're trying to avoid getting it into the into the water. Yeah, you can hear that difference. All right, give it a try. Maybe we need something with more metal mass so mm, that it can yeah. transfer more heat. So these are chunks of iron, and I'm figuring since there's more volume in there, it should retain more heat, right? Seems reasonable. It's like we're making a meteorite upon re-entry. It takes a lot longer for this to heat up. I think yeah. this is a bigger reservoir of heat energy for sure. All right, time to call it? Yeah. All right, just keep it gentle, gentle. You got this. Whoa. Now, when I saw glass workers deal with this, they would give it a tap and it would break along that. I wonder if... Yeah, it's not working. Okay, uh... Um... Yeah, the oil's hot enough now that you are igniting it, which is Ow. problematic. Um, okay, uh... That burned. <laughs> hey, why are you not wearing gloves? We know. should both go get the yeah. big green gloves. That'll be good. <laughs> and you could definitely tell the difference between when it's in the oil and when it's in the water, right? Yeah. So in the in the video, do they immerse it down into the water part? I don't think so. Okay. Jesus. You all right? This is a dumb hack. <laughs> this is a bad idea. This is why your bacon screams at you and 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 throws oil in your face. So you said there was a bunch of different videos, and some of them had the oil on the inside, some had the oil on the outside. You wanna try on the outside? Yeah, we certainly can. We can just pour that just directly into here and then put the glass in. All right, I'm gonna put the cooled glass in there now. All right. There we go. Oh, this is interesting, because we'll have the water on the inside that will be a kind of leverage against the heat of the oil on the outside. Mm -hmm. I'm not debunking this right now, but I'm not thinking this is gonna work. All right, go for that. You ready? Yeah, don't get it in the water. Yeah, 
There you go. Okay. That's definitely just vegetable oil catching fire. It's fine. I'm I'm a little bit not oh uh <laughs> a little nervous? Yeah. Hey there you go, now there's no flame. I'm beginning to doubt your commitment to internet science. I mean, you can't deny it looks cool, sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. You also can't deny that you're playing with a giant grease fire with water, which is pretty much the worst way to muck around and cut up a glass. It smells like when I had a deep fryer in college. I bet those were good days. <laughs> They're pretty great. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe, maybe that mason jar is just too thick. So we got a much, much thinner shot glass here. Okay. This is about the most generous interpretation I think we can give. Super thin glass, super small amount of oil. So theoretically, the oil should get super hot. I really want this to work. I do too. The space razor blade comes rushing to planet Earth, intent on cutting all your cocaine. <laughs> what? None of your cocaine is safe from Space Razor Blade. There's no like magic other step that we were supposed to do? I don't think so. I'm like sincerely I'm a little pissed. annoyed. I feel like the internet tricked me. It ain't happening. You can thump it all you want. You realize right now, in the comments, it's nothing but people explaining to us how we did this wrong. You're right, I can see them from here. <laughs> it doesn't matter if we did it wrong. Even if this works, there's no changing the fact that this is a dumb solution, very dangerous, for a problem that no one has. Fair enough? Had it been easy, it would have been kind of cool and neat. Had it worked the first time we tried it, then it would be something we could show off at you know, glass parties, whatever, when we go to glass, glass parties. Party. When we're hanging out, we're like, yeah. okay, all I need is some cooking oil and 35 razor blades. Also, do you happen to have a benzene torch? That would yes. be really great. Yes, this exactly. This is a dumb trick. Nobody cares. I know. You're taking it personally. It's okay. I I'm am mad taking too. it I'm taking you personally. I'm mad too. I'm out. Don't take it out on me. It was your idea. I got intense there for a bit. Uh, <laughs> I was like, it's harder than I thought. It's harder than I thought. <laughs> the modern row cooks with thermite. I'd say this is a fairly traditional American cookout, right? We got steaks, we got seasonings, we have rust, powdered aluminum. I think this could be a horrible disaster. I think I'm you're right. I'm very excited. We have two fire extinguishers, we have a bag of sand, and we all can run really, really fast. So there's a bunch of different types of thermite, but the most common one uses rust and aluminum powder. But not just any aluminum powder, it has to be of a certain fine grain mesh, and then once the reaction starts, it self-oxidizes, right? Correct. The rust is the oxidizing agent, I That's right. That's right, because the end result is you get aluminum oxide, you get iron, and you get heat. And in fact, like imagine you have a block of iron, it turns into rust. This reaction just takes out the oxygen and makes it back into iron. Yes, and we're basically making just a bunch of molten metal. How do we harness this energy for the incredibly frivolous purpose of cooking these steaks? Well, first, Let's make some thermite. There's a bunch of different recipes and each one will have a different reaction, but the one I learned is that it's three parts by weight of aluminum powder to eight parts of iron oxide. In this case, it just happened that we have three pounds and five pounds. So we have exactly eight pounds of iron oxide. Now we just need three pounds of aluminum. So this is five pounds of fine mesh aluminum. I figure if we just take out two pounds, then we mix the, them all together and we're good? I think so, yeah. All right. By doing bigger quantities, the rounding errors kind of blend out there. Right. Because it's finicky stuff. When we've tried to do it before, there's been times it just wouldn't ignite. There okay. we go. Well, we took out two pounds. So this is three pounds of aluminum powder. Yeah. And then we got eight pounds of iron oxide. What do we want to mix this in? Do you uh, should get a box. Okay, we're going to mix all these. We really should have respirators. Just. Don't breathe. All right, so at this point we just mix. 
<laughs> oh, hey, right on. Hey, yeah, remember we made these. Yeah, actually. probably the best way to do this is to get it in a closed bag and just shake it up like crazy. I remember once when we made 60 pounds of this stuff, we put it in a box and just kicked it down a hill. <laughs> yeah. And so the idea is once the reaction's hot enough, it begins to self-oxidize as it bonds the elements together. But the problem is how do you stop it once it starts, right? And most of the time when you use a fire extinguisher, it robs it of oxygen and stops the flame. But since it has its own oxygen, it won't stop, but you can possibly cool everything down enough that the reaction stops happening. Oh, okay. Because that's the thing is this is extremely stable. It's very difficult to get started. Once it gets started though, there, it's very difficult to stop. Wanna give it a try? Yeah, you gonna test it first? Yeah. Let me be honest with you, these masks, will offer little to no protection, but they look kind of cool. At least they won't blind you. Oh, there's that. If we mixed it correctly, if we have the right ratios, all we need is enough heat to start the reaction, but you need way hotter. Like, look at this. You can even take this flame and nothing really happens there. You need something with a little more kick. So we got magnesium strips. This is uh, test one. See if we got the recipe right. Yeah! Huh, I don't think we got the recipe right. I don't think we did. Okay, all right, so we'll add a little bit more aluminum. All right, take two. Hey! Now we're talking. Holy cow! Oh, this is gonna be great. Outstanding. Dude, that was gorgeous. I made the mistake of looking at it without the welding protection. You're Egon, you're like, uh, I looked, I looked, at, at, I looked, I looked into the trap, Ray. <laughs> so that mixture right now is a mixture of aluminum oxide and iron. Basically, we've reconstituted the iron that originally rusted to form the iron oxide. So now the now, question is, how do we cook this? How do we cook a steak? Oh man, that stays hot. It is glowing. This one will be a little bit bigger. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get some gloves and I'll actually hold the pan over it like I'm frying over a campfire. Are you kidding me? No, 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 I think it'll work. Okay. This is ill-advised. I like it. <laughs> Throw on a little bit of whoosh. Pour a little touch of vegetable oil. A little dab? Yeah. There you go. These are not sanitary conditions, but I've seen you eat pizza off the street, <laughs> okay, so. Okay, that did not end well and you know it. <laughs> Garlic? Yeah. I'll let you do the honors, sir. Here it goes, here it goes, here it goes. Come on, baby. No, no, need a little more aluminum. Let's try this again. One steak coming up. And keep on it. There you go. All right. Yeah, once it starts. Okay, so. Oh, God, that's bright. Yeah, it's hot. Oh, you can feel the heat. Yeah, I can feel the heat. It's hot, it's very hot. Okay, okay, so hot, it's melting. Is it melting the plate? The gloves, should have worn the other gloves. <laughs> All right, we're good, we're good. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. Is it cooking the steak? The steak is cooking. Oh my God, look, 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 it's working. Yeah! Holy cow! I did not expect this to work. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Woo! Oh, this is great. I can't believe it. Holy hell, that is amazing. I, I think you're gonna get your medium steak, buddy. Yeah. It is really, really hot. Open up that garage door immediately. Wow! That was extraordinary! Super effective! That was amazing! Yes! Well, and what I didn't expect is that it's even better, it's a more even heat that holds on after it after it stops sparking and glowing. Oh, it smells good too. Oh, dude. <laughs> My guess is it's gonna be super rare on the inside, but yeah. the outside looks like it's nicely seared. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about its rawness. That makes me a little nervous. Well then let's cook it some more. The trick is you gotta do the thermite flash and then let it just ride the residual heat. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's starting to look good now. You got that juices bubbling up on I'm just, top. Yeah, I'm just concerned about that center there, you know? I love the fact that we went from, oh golly, it worked, to, well, let's make it as good a steak <laughs> yeah, as I we mean, can. I mean, if we're gonna eat this thing. It's steak, right? I say we throw another, just a small flash of the stuff on there. Okay. Uh, keep it on there just like you did, keep going. There we go. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> oh. That's 
good stuff. It's starting to smell real good. Yeah, it is. Sell thermite and thermite cooking accessories. <laughs> Taste the rust, it's not a bust. <laughs> Partake of our thermite. <laughs> thermite! How long you been sitting on that one? Just came up with it just now, <laughs> right here. The first ever making of thermite. This iron slag got heated up to around 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and even after the chemical reaction stopped, it retains all that heat and slowly dissipates just by radiating it out, right? It smells pretty good. You want to, dare we try let's, let's cutting try off it. a slice? Oh, much better. That looks perfect. Yes. Would you like to do the honors? Yeah. Brushwood? Yeah. That is a good stick. Yeah! <laughs> oh my god, it's great. Look at that. Look at it's that. It's a perfect medium steak. That is good stuff, man. I'm calling off the rest of the soup. <laughs> We're just gonna cook and eat steak. Um, well done, sir. Mm. No pun intended. <laughs> When's the first time you had a whiskey sour? Probably 7.30 this morning. Ever? Wait, ever? Oh, you mean ever? I, oh, college, not not today. You didn't mean today. <laughs> Northern Road makes a whiskey I thought you sour. Meant this okay. Holy cow, back again with Trevor. Thank you so much for I joining know, us. We are right now in an undisclosed location, a hidden secret bar, a peekaboo as they call them, yes. that's disguised as another business somewhere in downtown. This thing's got a code that changes monthly and you have to know somebody who knows somebody to get you in. How freaking cool is this? So much better, we know this guy. <laughs> Me, I like it, I, you know. I like it. Today we're gonna be doing a whiskey sour. Now, you have a recipe for this that I don't necessarily agree with that makes me kind of nervous. Well, first of all, a whiskey sour could be something as crappy as a little bit of whiskey and some very sugary homemade sweet and sour sauce. That's, That's all I know it from. <laughs> I've never had a proper whiskey sour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm not talking about the stuff that comes in McDonald's cups. But what we could do is actually do a traditional whiskey sour, which requires an egg white. Now, some people are a little nervous about egg whites like they would be with sushi. Right. But there's a lot of alcohol in this drink. I think we'll be okay. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Booze kills salmonella. <laughs> I mean, the good news is the booze kills the brain cells that would be thinking about the salmonella. Okay, so the roots of the sour drink actually come from like seafaring days. People figured out that you could stave off scurvy with citrus. So they would give their sailors lemons and limes, which is why they call British limeys. Limeys, yep. yeah. And uh, to mask it, they would put rum in there and sugar wait, and stuff like it? that. Wait, 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 people hate limes that much? Yeah, they were like the lime. I'll not stamp this lime prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where the term sour was birthed. So a sour is any alcoholic drink that has some citrus in it. Well, that's, that's kind of dated. That's from like the you know, 17th century or something like that. But that's a pretty good rule of thumb if it has like bitters in it and uh, lots of citrus right. and things like that. Like this is one of the original cocktails. But originally. It wasn't even whiskey. They were on boats, so it was rum. All right, let's find out how to make a proper whiskey sour. Okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with this tin first. We're gonna get a strainer out, because we're gonna put fresh lemon juice in this. I'm gonna take a half lemon, and to get about a half ounce, you almost get an ounce of juice out of a lemon, so no special tools needed. You just need your hands. Let's be men here. Squeeze that in. We'll have that strainer there so it catches any seed or pulp, and just get all that fresh juice out that you can. Next, we're gonna add our whiskey, which we're gonna do a two ounce pour. Today we're using Buffalo Trace, which is just a Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. We're gonna use our jigger here. I'm gonna fill this to the top. That's gonna flow right style. in. Mm -hmm. Some recipes will call for actual sugar or sugar cubes. It doesn't always break down well. I like to use the best sugar possible. Today we're gonna use heavy simple syrup though. And with a heavy simple, it's a two to one ratio instead of a one to one ratio. Is, that, is heavy simple a brand or? Heavy simple just means two parts sugar, one part water. And this is pure cane sugar or? Co it, this uh, is just syrup? granulated sugar here. Got it, mm -hmm. okay. You can use an ounce if you like it to be really sweet. We're gonna use uh, three quarters of an ounce today and that's gonna go right in there. Now you will see different bartenders make this drink different ways. Some will actually dry shake. We don't put any ice in the tin to uh, break up the protein with the alcohol. I'm actually going to uh, get my egg white. Now, some will say, as a real bartender, you should be able to crack an egg and get the egg white out. Well, screw that, I don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, so you're excusing your use of a strainer here. Yes. Why the egg, though? What does that do? These proteins, when it mixes with the alcohol, it actually sweetens it up, and it's pretty good. <laughs> and I bought this cute little thing for $1.99, and uh, it makes the job just so much faster, and you could actually save that egg yolk, but we're not going to today. Then I'm gonna cap this off. 
And I'm just gonna break up the protein and the egg with just a few shakes here. About 10 seconds. And you wanna keep it lateral. Uh, you wanna keep the air flowing in the same direction. And it just really helps break up that egg. Makes it frothy. Mm-hmm. And it's actually gonna froth up more once we put the alcohol in there. So we're gonna break that. We're gonna keep this. We don't wanna lose any of that egg. Take our strainer out, dump that. Mix the components. Now, we're gonna add our ice. Cap that again. And you really wanna give it a vigorous shake because you really wanna break that protein up. Weren't most or all of the last drinks that we did stirred? Uh, yes. So now we're getting into into uh, the shaking. And that's because we've added citrus and protein, and you really want to break those up, and the best way to do that is by shaking it, because you're never going to break up those proteins. Well, and it seems like these are, th these are more potent flavors, so even if it does dilute with some of the water, it seems like we're going to still yeah, get plenty absolutely. of punch. Wow, that looks nothing like I what know. I thought a whiskey I sour was. I don't think I've ever had a whiskey sour that looked like that. You have never had a whiskey sour that tastes. You've never had a whiskey this, sour yeah. full stop, apparently. Yes. <laughs> For our fancy touches, we're gonna use a maraschino cherry here. Voila. All right, me first. <sighs> yeah, I feel like you have to do the honors. Is this gonna give me a whiskey sour mustache? Oh, that's good. Yeah? Yeah. What, what's it like? Smooth, a little creamy, just a little from the, the egg frothiness really, of the egg. Yeah, that egg really adds a lot of texture to the drink, mm -hmm. and you'll notice how thick the drink actually is. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, you don't even notice that whiskey until the aftertaste. Yeah, that wow. is completely different from any other whiskey sour that I've had. In fact, I read that in a lot of places when they add the egg, they call it a Boston sour to differentiate it because everybody really thinks that the other one is just whiskey plus sour. Yeah, that they, they, they had a frat party once. Exactly. So we had two ounces of whiskey, we had three quarters of an ounce of heavy simple syrup. We took half a lemon and strained it, and we put just the egg whites of a single egg. You shake side to side, make sure to break up all the proteins, add ice, shake it all up, and you're good. Mm -hmm. It sounds complicated at first, but then when you break it down like that, it's really easy. I mean, let's face facts. That's the reason we make these videos, is so we don't have to remember. <laughs> we could just, I know where to YouTube it. <laughs> yes, exactly. I just text you, Brian, whiskey sour, please. Link. Siri, make Brian tell me how to make a whiskey sour. <laughs> Siri, call Trevor. Which do you spend more time doing? Watching stuff on Netflix or browsing in Netflix? It's really kind of the equivalent of being at like a Blockbuster video, if you remember those. Blockbuster video? It is. Oh, this is hilarious! <laughs> the Modern Road is good at watching movies. Secret bitrate menu. Check this out, right? Here, I'm watching my favorite show about travel hacks right here. Oh, this is a good I one. hit Shift, Control, Alt, and S in Chrome. Boom! Buffering sucks. You can fix it. This is how by adjusting your audio and video bitrate or on the CDN, which server farm you're tapping into. You can actually do this on the consoles as well. It's like a variation of the Konami code. It's up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, up, 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 and it'll open the same menu. Do you get like 30 free movies or something like that if you enter that into the... No. No. Okay. No. It's just, it just brings up a menu. Sorry. Netflix enhancement. This is a Chrome add-on that you can use that will, within Netflix, show you the Rotten Tomatoes rating, the Metacritic rating, and the trailer as you pull up each movie. All right, so now when you mouse over... Well, look at that. There we go. So you get like the IMDb rating on it. Yeah, there. Pull, up a, pull up a movie. Dude, that's great. Hold go, on. Go, no, go, go to a movie. Look at the, this show looks really good. <laughs> These guys look awesome. Well, there's not good. Is, is there a trailer for it? Is that what the camera is right uh, there? Ooh, good call. Oh, right on. Oh, oh geez. Oh, it definitely is playing a bootleg of the same episode. <laughs> <laughs> Predictive rating system. The star ratings on Netflix, a lot of people don't realize that that is not the aggregate that they're showing you. They are just showing you what they think you will rate the show That's as. their predicted yes. amount of liking. Strangely yeah. enough, hacking the system. Thinks I'll like it four stars. It thought I was going to rate it one star. Uh, 
<laughs> Subverting geo-blocking. A lot of people would use VPNs or virtual private networks to access the movie catalogs for Netflix in other countries. Stuff that's geographically blocked. By the way, that's relevant now because the new Star Trek series that's being developed just for CBS Online yes. will be available internationally the very next day on Netflix, but not in the United States. Yeah. So and if you had a VPN, you could, oh, look, I'm over here. Yeah, and when I read that, I thought, well, I can get around that. Well, Netflix has started cracking down on yeah. it, unfortunately. I guess those days are over. Netflix is banning all of the well-known ones. There are still a couple of lesser-known VPN services out there. Or you could create your own. See, that sounds like voodoo. How, do, how does one figure out how to create their own VPN? You Google create your own VPN. Of course. Why wouldn't it be? Yeah. <laughs> it's the internet. Yeah. Keyboard shortcuts. Right arrow, left arrow for forward and rewind. And uh, if you do page down, it will pause, which uh, I don't know why you would use that. Well, because, because yeah, the space bar. Yeah, space bar is play pause, right? Yeah, so everybody what's, knows what's that. What's the point in that? Also, you can mute with M. Oh, that is that is a good one. Yeah. If you want to watch Hacking the System just for the sexy hosts, you don't want to hear their stupid words. <laughs> All right. M. <laughs> uh, you can do uh, full screen and uh, with escape and F. Look at that guy! Look at like a badass uh, on the front. He's a rebel of that uh, of that uh, Camaro that he nearly wrecked on the it, I-10. Has it out for this guy? Yeah. Oh. Optimizing HD. If you go to Netflix.com/slash/hdtoggle, you get all of these playback settings that you can do: auto, yes. low, medium, high. Right? I am not confident in how well auto works. I will just always put it on high unless it just totally starts. Oh buffering. no, that's a good point, actually. Although this matters a lot if you have some kind of like data caps that oh. you're working with, so you'd want yeah. to stick it on low all the time. The Netflix ID Bible. All right, so what is the Netflix Bible? You know how there are different weird categories on Netflix? Yeah, she's subversive movies starring. Yeah. Uh, Raul Julia. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Tense uh, suspense thrillers. Movies about Xerxes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> movies for ages 11 to 12. Like yeah. that is a very precise category. <laughs> yeah. Those always pop up and sometimes you can find them and sometimes you can't. Go to netflix.com forward slash browse forward slash genre forward slash then the number. Whatever the number is. Yes. Got it. And I'm, I'm going to spin the wheel. Let's do... Deep Sea Horror Movies. Yes. Yeah. Leviathan. Oh, yeah, of course. Of Deep course. Star 6. Oh, good old Sharknado. Harbinger Down. Harbinger Down's actually pretty good. Wait, no, it's got one star. It's, 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 it's got pretty good. It's decent. Five. It's got 50 on that. It's, it's got Lance Henriksen in it, so that's, don't bother with that. Okay. It's, it's, oh, awesome. Right, it's awesome. It's right, awesome. Right, right. Three headed shark attack. Avalanche, Avalanche sharks. sharks. I think we definitely got to Oh watch my that. God, I feel like we've stolen fire from the gods. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, oh, have you heard about the nonsense Netflix titles? What? No. So they do stuff for internal testing. They create shows that don't actually exist, that is just like boring B roll crap. Have really? you seen this? Oh, this is one of no. Example show. Okay. Hey, look, it's example show. Episode is spelled wrong. Oh, <laughs> it is? Yeah. <laughs> Pull, sh do the, yeah, look, episode is spelled wrong. <laughs> How long is this? And it just says there's no crying in baseball. It's a great show. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this is the stuff they use for internal testing, but that you can find the URLs to. Is that amazing? It's like Netflix is having a stroke. <laughs> there's no crying in baseball. That's my favorite. <laughs> I can't believe that's what's in the closed captions. Skip ahead. Uh, I, okay. I gotta find uh, out uh, what uh, happens uh, now. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yeah. And he's moonwalking with a laptop. Oh, it's so good. Oh my god. <laughs> that example show is my favorite Netflix original. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he works for Netflix. Oh my god. Or if they I'm hired sure. an actor. Tributaries follow him to Rome to grace and captive bonds his chariot wheels. You blocks, you stones, you worse than senseless things. Oh, is you this hard hearts, you cruel men of Rome. No, you're not Pompey. Let's just start talking Bring about. <laughs> oh, this is so amazing. I'm gonna go home and watch this. <laughs> so, is, there's an episode two. I don't know. Here, well, let's skip ahead. Uh, Look, like it says example show. An example of a show. An example of a show. An example, an example of, a show. of a show. Starring actress. actress. <laughs> An actor. <laughs> go to go to episodes. All right. Oh, there's two, two episodes. There's a second episode of an example show. Yeah. It's the same episode. <laughs> well played, Netflix. Well played. <laughs> I don't want to say Hollywood lied to us. Don't say it. 
Don't you ever say it. Okay, well, that was easy. <laughs> the modern road proves alcohol proof. One of my earliest memories was seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark at the movie theater. And one of the most iconic scenes in the movie is that total bar fire. Yes, it went up like kindling. That's not really how it works, is it? What? I mean, but that's the cliche is every time you see a bar, every time you see a single match in a bar, you know whether it's a movie or television show or Uncharted game, <laughs> literally <laughs> everything's going to be on fire, yeah, it's right? It's like, oh my God, they're all going to die. Yeah, exactly. Now, flash forward to me being dumb, maybe drunk, and in college, I remember having a campfire and pouring out whiskey on it and everything just sizzled. Shh. Yes, I remember getting into my grandmother's vodka and pouring it on the sidewalk and trying to light it. Nothing happened. So the truth is somewhere in the middle, and this is a lot of experience as a fire eater coming out here because I've had to learn about all kinds of different fuels to do the fire blast, the thing where you, where you, you blow onto a torch and you make yeah, the explosive. the one you told me never to do. Yeah, no, uh, that's how everybody gets injured. When the fire blast goes bad, it always results in a face melted off, and it turns out always, always they're using Everclear. Really? Yes, either Everclear or Coleman Camp Fuel. That is one of my favorite things on the internet, fail videos. Oh Specifically, my God. people doing the shots. They're always doing the flaming shots. They're always yeah. pouring liquid that's burning on their faces and they're always shocked. It's the best. Shocked. That alone, not pornography, not email, <laughs> makes internet communications the greatest achievement in mankind. Okay. So on the one side, we got the idea, our experience shows that alcohol is very difficult to catch fires. Hollywood says everything catches fire instantly. The truth, of course, is somewhere in the middle. All of them have ethanol in them. And all of them are flammable. So you have a whole spectrum of flammability. You have stuff that's really, really flammable, stuff that's very difficult to catch fire, and the indicator of how flammable it is is something called flashpoint. You can look up the flashpoint for things like Coleman Camp Fuel, for gasoline, for Everclear, which is almost pure ethanol, by looking up the material safety data sheet. That's MSDS, and then whatever you're looking at. One of the items on there will be the flashpoint. The flashpoint is the temperature at which that fuel will combust. Now, for some of them, for example, Camp Fuel, it's like negative 14 degrees. This thing could be colder than ice, but it'll still immediately combust the moment it comes in contact with flame. Something else like charcoal lighter fluid has a flash point of like 115 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's gotta be even warmer than it is right now. So it's not just the flame that you're applying to it. It is the temperature of the chemical itself. That's correct. And when fire eaters do the fire blast, oftentimes it's not the liquid itself combusting, but instead the oxygenated vapor. You'll notice that there's an atomization they do. They kind of blast everything out into a cloud, it's the vapor that combusts, not the fuel itself, which is super important because if the flash point is low enough that it burns as a liquid, that means when you do that giant cloud of fire and it comes right back down, whatever spillage is burning on your face. Here, let me show you. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is charcoal lighter fluid. This is meant to start fires, right? Light that match and put it in there. Okay. What do you expect to have happen? Uh, that it's gonna just burst in a flame. So it just extinguished it. Yeah, so in this case, the flash point is high enough that it is not at a sufficient temperature to immediately combust. On the flip side, whoa, that was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this is Everclear, which is alcohol. And this one, I'm gonna actually move the fuel sources away because I think you'll see something very, very different. And this is booze that is meant to be consumed by humans, Theoretically. right? Theoretically. Oh. Oh, it is burning. That's, oh, it is. that's the see. diabolical thing. Put your hand, put your hand over it. Yeah. Oh. This is why professional fire eaters don't use alcohol. Is number one, it burns when it's not supposed to burn. Number two, you can't even see the freaking flame. That's why faces go hideous and melty. So the one that is meant to burn things didn't light when we dropped the match in it. The one that's meant for people to drink totally went up in flames. Correct. Again, the flash point dictates the amount of volatility for the fuel. In this case, the flash point is higher than the current room temperature. In this case, the flash point is much lower than room temperature. I don't know about these guys though. Okay, so these are going to have much lower alcohol by volume. All right, let's science this. Yes. What are we starting with first? The misnomer. Fireball. There's no way. This thing is like half sugar syrup and water. Actually, 66% sugar syrup and water. Yeah. <laughs> and only a little bit of whiskey in there. By the way, this is also, whoa, okay. Well, well that was fast. <laughs> Try lighting a few of them. Like, 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 like okay. take a big batch of them because imagine it closer to 150 degrees or whatever. At that point, you got those volatile vapors everywhere. Seems like that should ignite. 
not so much. No, sound theory though, and considering that we are shooting this in a garage in the middle of a Texas summer. That's about as generous long. as we're gonna get here. Yeah, All right. okay. All right, next up. Whiskey. So now this is 101. That means it's over 50% alcohol, yes. right? Okay, so on the spectrum. This is, is this right on the threshold? This is 95% pure alcohol and has a flash point of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Man, I think that might be right around room temperature. I bet you drop one match in, it does not light. I bet you drop a handful of matches in, or especially if you take your time to hold it over, I bet it'll get hot enough to ignite. Okay, so we're at uh, 101 proof, 50.5% alcohol by volume. One match. All right, all right, so far my theory is validated. This time what I want you to do is take like four matches, light them, yeah. and just hold them there for a bit, and I bet enough of the vapor start that it's gonna start burning. You think so? Yeah. There, down a little more. A little bit lower. All right, drop it in there. Oh, I was wrong! <laughs> oh no! I think it was a sound theory, but it did not bear out. All right, now let's try, hold on, let's try this. Go yeah. ahead and light, light some matches and let's warm this. Theoretically, if we heat up this whiskey, get it past the flashpoint temperature. We don't even know what the flashpoint temperature is. Yeah. You're just kind of guessing. I mean, if it lights on fire, then that means we're above the flashpoint temperature, right? Oh, it's hot. We now have heated whiskey. All right. Try lighting those. Oh my God, it did! Yeah, it did. It's burning, it's burning right now. Oh, it is. Yes. So this is why, yes, it matters, but it doesn't matter the way you think it does. Like right. if a bar catches fire, all of that is gonna get hot enough that eventually all of that booze yeah. is gonna catch flame. Yeah, but it's not gonna go up immediately. Right. It's They're all going to go up at different times because a lot of it depends primarily on the alcohol by volume, which determines the flash point. So what do we do with all this? I've got some ideas. <laughs> Pay a dollar to take that hot shot. That's a lot of sulfur, man. Come on, now you'll be fine. A, a whole, whole it's, it's, gross. It's, it's look at smoky. that. Smoky. Smoky. Look at look a at the dollar. film on I got top a of shiny it. George Washington. Mm. Oh, waiting for you, buddy. No, mm. I'm good. Chicken. I'll give you a dollar. Mm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. All right. So if we're gonna declare our list of all-time hacking all-stars. What makes the top? War Games. That's just a movie. Oh, sure, that didn't really happen? <laughs> no, it did not. The modern row puts on the max right. headroom mask. Swordfish. In the hall of fame of hacking, I have to assume that the biggest display is for one incident, the Max Headroom broadcast signal intrusion. Yes, people were terrified about it. Dude, I would be terrified. I saw the footage and it was like there was something wrong and sideways about it. I cannot imagine being somebody just watching Doctor Who and all of a sudden somebody took over a television station, right? Yes, it's someone basically hijacking the television signal and showing their own audio or video. Now, I understand this in terms of like FM signals. Like you could get a pirate radio transmitter and broadcast a pirate radio station. This case is somebody hijacked I guess what the the carrier signal between a remote thing that's exactly what it is what broadcast television stations do they have their signal they broadcast it to a bigger transmitter on top of a high-rise building or something like that and then it goes out to the surrounding area so someone interrupted that by getting close to the transmitter. Enough to overpower the original source yes. and have their signal go out. Yes, and they're not entirely sure how they did it, but it's likely that it was something the size of a dish TV network thing that was placed really close to the transmitter and they just overrode it for 30 seconds. One of the remarkable aspects of this is that there were two intrusions on two different stations within three hours of each other. The first one happened during the news on WGN. It was a really brief interruption. There was no audio that was really discernible, but you saw this Max Headroom clad individual. And then it happened again within three hours during the middle of PBS broadcasting Doctor Who. The very act of the pirate signal means that an extraordinary amount of effort went into doing this, including the background and the masks and all that stuff, but it's as though zero thought went into what he was going to say when he got there. Yeah. So it's 1987, you're a kid just chilling out in your parents' basement watching Doctor Who, and all of a sudden, boom. I'll get you a hot drink, miss. Because he's a freaking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm better than Chuck's worst. Freaking 
<laughs> so when he's talking about Chuck Swirsky, that's a local news anchor, right? Yeah, there were a lot of Chicago-specific references in the broadcast with the audio. The voice distortion on here is really unsettling. So the voice distortion is happening, I assume, partly to mask this person's identity, right? Sure. So that's not an artifact of poor pirating. That is just like full on, they're hiding. It might be a little bit of both at this point because this was 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> to emulate the, you know, the digital background from the Max Headroom videos, uh, they had to go to the hardware store and buy some stuff and set it up on a pivot. And yes. somebody is back there right now. And that was one of the hunches that they were trying to follow up in order to find out who did it because there were only a couple of warehouses that could accommodate a giant eight foot corrugated metal thing. Yeah, yeah. But those didn't pan out. Do you even know what clutch cargo is? I do. Yeah. What is what is it? Okay, so do you remember the scene with young Butch in Pulp Fiction where uh, Christopher Walken comes in and says, yeah, this is your father's watch and blah, oh, yeah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what the little kid was watching. No It kidding. was mostly like still frames and they would have people's lips over it. Like oh, the annoying yeah, orange. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's clutch cargo. Oh my I God. Think. Clutch cargo with his pal Spinner and Paddlefoot in another exciting adventure. This is kind of terrifying. I mean, a lot of what he's saying seems to be calling out people at the other station, WGN, mm -hmm. right? So at this point, we have a scene change. It's very clear this was pre-taped, right? Yeah. And there's a butt. That's a butt. <laughs> now, that's the point that you start to run into difficult territory. I mean, it's one thing to pirate a station. It's another thing to pirate a station and also not honor the FCC. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the hunt to find Max Headroom. Why can't you just know who this person is? Well, immediately they suspected that it was going to be an inside job, but that didn't pan out at first. Now you're telling me that maybe they're back to thinking it was? There was a great Reddit thread where somebody said he thought he knew who the people were and actually launched a big investigation and has since come away saying, well, from talking to all the original sources, the people who were actually there working for those networks, he feels now like it had to be some kind of inside job. There's too much insider information. There was no out in the wild equipment that would allow you to hijack a signal like that. The FCC got involved, the FBI got involved, and yet unfortunately they couldn't get all of the participation they needed and they were trying to raid various locations throughout Chicago to follow up on hunches and none of them panned out. Well, and plus also it's like, yeah, imagine working at the FBI. Are you really, is that the hill you're gonna die on? Is I'm gonna be the guy who finally figures out who's behind that Max Headroom mask? Uh, no, you're gonna like, there's a child murderer that you really ought to be focused on instead of this guy. People were terrified because if these jackasses could hijack a signal, what did the future hold? Oh sure, that yeah. This, this could be rampant. But now you've got encrypted uh, signals and so forth, and it's a lot more difficult to do that. Plus, not a lot of people watch broadcast television anymore. The question is though, really what everyone wants to know, if you were going to intrude on any episode of any television show, what would it be? I would invade the series finale of Battlestar Galactica and put an ending that made sense. <laughs> I would do uh, one of the big battles in Game of Thrones, and then just me off of the tree line, just being like. <laughs> you would just, you would somehow get their signal. It's just middle of the biggest battle, end of the series, <laughs> and it just cut to 30 seconds of you drinking and staring like watching at the camera. Really intently, like... <laughs> Given how many weapons we've learned you can make out of newspapers, does it make sense to, uh, why do we allow newspapers in prison? Do they? <laughs> the modern world makes a newspaper ton of money.
You know that one of my favorite things is improvised weaponry, right? Uh, yeah, of course. Things that I will never use. Or so you say. Who knows? They might still even have newspapers by the time you go to prison. Is that what I'm hoping for now? <laughs> is that, is that, man, I really hope they have newspapers when I have to go to jail. <laughs> so what is it about newspapers that make them so attractive for improvised weaponry? They are flexible, and yet they are still essentially wood. Let me just, let me just give you a I want you to hit me up. as hard as you can. You ready? Yeah, no, hard as you can. Really? Right yeah, no, do it. Oh, Wait, did that? No. Wait, for well, reals? Well, it's... God damn it. It's stung. Oh! Not as bad as I thought. This collapses when it hits you, and yeah. it ends up being a flat sting yeah. type thing. So this is the Millwall brick. Go on. Football hooligans, fans of the Millwall Football Club, whenever they would go to a football game, they would end up in fights. And so at the gates, they were stripped of all weapons, anything that could possibly be used as a weapon. Kind of like a prison. Kind of like a prison. They even made them take their shoes off, no shoelaces, everything. Kind of like the TSA. But they wouldn't take newspapers away because why would they? Yeah. These uh, uh, resourceful football hooligans would take the newspapers and make deadly weapons out of them, the I mill mean, wall brick. What can you do? I, we already tried rolling one of these up for the spear. Okay. Yes, it's very tough, but I don't yes. understand how you make a, a, a decent cudgel out of this. Well, like with last time, we're gonna roll this up as tightly as possible. Super, super tight. Yeah. Now this is really simple. There are variations on this recipe. We've talked about this before, but in prison you've got nothing but time, right? So you can be super, super precise yeah. on this. Now right. technically, this is a primitive mill wall brick. You just fold it in half? Yeah. Okay, all right. Then yours, what yours actually looks better than mine. Now this is a, a primitive one. You can get them wet and soak it and it'll make it heavier. <laughs> and there are other things you can do that I will show you in just a second. Hit me with that one. No way. Yeah, do it. Dude, look at this. All right. In the arm. Harder. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, you, no, you, do it, you do want it. it harder? No, do it hard, do it hard. Oh! Too much, too much, too much. That was too much. We're arms. not friends. Oh, the arm's numb. All right, ready? No, yes, no. Ah! My aim was off. That was like a thud. Now you, you're doing like a stabbing motion. Yeah, you can do either one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it like this though. Oh, okay. Ready? All right. It's already falling apart. Okay. Oh! <laughs> you! There's that wave. You get the initial thud. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it comes, ah. Now imagine hitting someone in the head with that. That would be bad. Yeah. And if you make it dense enough, it's basically a wooden baseball bat, right? Jeez oh, Louise. All right, here we go. No, not feeling it. OK, let's kick it up a notch. You ready? <laughs> yes. Here, you're more patient and uh, detail oriented than yeah. I am. All right, go on. Do it again. Here, first of all, you want to get it. There you go. Get it all lined up in the middle. There you go. You want to do your best Dennis Rogers and roll it as super tight as you're able. Yeah, the denser and more tightly roll it is, the more it's going to hurt. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so now what? OK, I got some uh, packing tape here. Oh my god. I can already tell it's going to be grisly. Okay, then what? Break it. And then, okay, so in, this is fairly loosey-goosey at this point. Oh, right? Okay, and then we're gonna seal it again? Not just yet. Oh, you're a bad man. Oh my God. We're basically making a tomahawk. That is a tomahawk! Here, tomahawk. you hold this. Okay. Keep twisting. Yeah. So I would imagine once you start banging stuff, that rock is gonna work its way through the tape. Oh my God. This is that scene from 2001. <laughs> Our monolith is a barrel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Too much power for one man to wield. It totally. Maybe, maybe, maybe destroyed it uh, a little bit. Are you ready to make a mess? Imagine this is some dirty snitch's head. Ha! I give you the honor, sir. Yeah! Wait, wait, wait come what, what? Oh! Oh, you broke his head! Yeah! It split! <laughs> what? Here, put it back up, put it back up! Oh my god! Oh. Let it right open! Oh, dude. Now I'm gonna take down a white supremacist because it's milk. I gotcha. <laughs> Oh 
my god! Yes! Oh my god! <laughs> Oh, dude, you nailed it. I did. What up? Oh, my God. Um, if I had any doubts, they are gone. The, the Millwall, Millwall brick. brick. Holy cow. Hey, look at me. I'm, uh, I'm Blue Man Group. <laughs> Do you remember when we were shooting Hacking the System? We went to a tiki bar. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> The modern road makes a Mai Tai. So you've never had a Mai Tai before? No. Do you know anything about them? I... no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like most tiki drinks, they're rum-based drinks. The Mai Tai, its origins are disputed. It was either created by trader Vic Bergeron or Don the Beachcomber. Right on the early part of the tiki craze that happened right after World War II, when people were coming back from the Pacific Theater. So this is why I associate it with the 1950s then. Absolutely. I'll tell you this much, if I am gonna experience my very first Mai Tai, I want it to be made by none other than Trevor. Thank yes. you very much, sir. Trevor, tell everyone where they can find you on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Barstool Theory. Let's express again, we are in a secret bar in downtown Austin that you have to know the code to get into. It doesn't have a Disguised sign. Disguised as a perfectly legitimate business. Yes, and it is amazing. It's also horror themed inside, which makes it my jam. Oh, I didn't even realize that. That's it, How it did is. you not realize? <laughs> what, the floor I mean, is the carpet from The Shining. Yeah, okay, all right, all right. So what is a Mai Tai and what is in it? There are a lot of different components to a Mai Tai, but this one's really easy to make. And I feel like if you go out and look, you're just gonna be inundated by too many different recipes. So let's keep it simple here. Yeah, yeah. The great thing about make, when you make cheeky drinks is, you don't have to have tools. You need a shaker, you need ice, you need booze, you need a cup and you got a tiki drink. We're gonna be using a light rum and a dark rum. So we're gonna start off with one ounce of uh, plantation. This is aged five years. It's a Barbados rum. What is the difference between a light rum and a dark rum? Uh, it depends on the distillation process, what sugar's added. The rum is like the wild, wild west of liquors. There aren't many regulations on it, and you can do more in the distillation process than you can, say, with whiskey or gin. So you're saying this is, we are in the process of sorting out what's what and deciding what names. Oh, okay, exactly. Very cool. And most tiki drinks are rum-based drinks. What is it about rum and seafaring vessels? Like, why, why is rum suddenly great on boats? I think that most of the islands that the seafaring vessels and the pirates were around were growing sugar cane. They all have sugar. And that's where the rum comes from. Got it. And then next we're gonna go with an ounce of light rum. Today we're using uh, Florida Cana. So these are all pretty standard boilerplate rum. You're gonna be able to find these rums in most liquor stores. Next, we're gonna use a dry curacao. This one is actually a triple sec from the island of curacao. He directed Seven Samurai. Uh, no, no, uh, okay. No. <laughs> what is a curacao? I know a triple sec is a liqueur, but, but what is curacao, triple sec, Cur what is it? Curacao is a dry liqueur made from oranges. Next, we're gonna do a three quarter ounce pour of lime juice. Oh, so this is uh, zestier than I thought. And then we're going to add a orgeat. This is an almond flavored uh, simple syrup. What? I'm sorry, was that English? What? Orgeat. 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 Okay, and we learned that a simple syrup is uh, granulated sugar mixed and water. water. Mm -hmm. Got it. And this one is pure sugar cane uh, mixed and that is boiled with almonds to get the oils oh, and fat wonderful. out of Very an almond. Cool. And this is actually nothing exotic either. You can find this on most shelves. So now we're going to do a 0.75 or three quarters of an ounce uh, pour of orgeat. Now, with this drink, there's just a couple different steps, so we're gonna add ice to our tin. Now, previously, we've always done the big blocks because we haven't wanted to dilute this, but this, it looks like we're doing some crushed ice. Exactly. Uh, when you do tiki drinks, a lot of times they're overproof or have more flavorful liquors in them. You want a little, by, little bit of dilution. You want some water in your drink, in your tiki drink. This is not a bad thing. So we're gonna take our ice, we're gonna get some crushed ice in there as well. We're gonna fill that to the brim. We're gonna take our liquor with our crushed ice. We're gonna cap it off. And normally, when you have cubed ice or you're doing a more of a classic drink, you're gonna shake it a really long time. With tiki drinks, boom, you're done. Oh, that's it? Yeah. I thought for sure you were gonna go nuts shaking it so we, it was super dilute. No. It's because the uh, ice is already all crushed and broken up. Now this drink isn't quite done. After we pour this in, we are gonna add even more booze. A lot of times you'll use like a 151 
a, a really, really overproof rum. Think lemon heart. Now, when you say overproof, you mean just higher than is pleasant to drink? Anything that's over 100 is overproof. Got it. But this time, we're just going to use a dark Myers rum. So, like three different types of rum? Yes. And just float it right on top. <laughs> you said that with so much reverence. <laughs> you mean like three types of rum? Then? I've been down this road, Brian. I know oh, how wow, it I ends. Add some spank mint, and you're done. Wow. Okay. Man, so I can smell the mint from here. That's crazy. So we've got three different types of rum. The Curacao, the Orgeat, the lime juice, and the mint. Mm -hmm. Man, I feel, I feel like you have honors on this one. I mean, it's like you worship tiki culture, <laughs> man. <laughs> I have been meaning all summer to learn oh, how wait, to wait, make- Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're doing tiki, right, guys? Oh, yeah. oh, oh. This glass doesn't do uh, it. Any <laughs> we need something tacky. Uh, yes. Oh my there God. We go. I actually have a collection of tiki mugs at home. No, it's tiki. Dude, yeah. dear in kitchen, eat your heart out. That's refreshing. I feel like I'm on an island. Quick side note, what does it change in the drink to slurp it through a straw? With a tiki drink, you want to get it down as fast as possible all because right, you're right, typically right. wearing an ugly shirt that you regret buying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say this looks like I used to look. Ah, it's got the little Brian Brushwood. <laughs> it's got the O'Brien haircut. <laughs> look at that. Oh. Is that beeswax? How do you do that? It's just mine. Get out of here. <laughs> Hey man, did you hear the new iPhone's gonna have a holographic display? Hey man, bullsh**. <laughs> All right. The modern road makes peppers ghost. So they used this effect at the Haunted Mansion at Disney. Yeah, dude, it's the highlight of the ride. You got this giant table, you got a whole bunch of ghosts chasing tail. Yes, it's exactly what it sounds like. Everybody thinks it's highfalutin projectors or lasers or something. Turns out it's a really bright light shining on statues moving around underneath you. Huh. Okay, and they call it Pepper's Ghost. Why do they call it Pepper's Ghost? Because John Henry Pepper popularized it in the 1800s, but it was developed by John Battista della Porta in the 1600s. So how does it work? The same way they brought back Tupac from the dead as a hologram. At Coachella? Yeah. All you need is a transparent surface at a 45 degree angle and some kind of brightly lit version of whatever it is you're trying to show. Now in the Haunted Mansion, it's actual statues that are brightly lit underneath you and the reflections are what you see in what appears to be that 3D space. But for what we're doing, we're gonna take a 2D picture and reflect it to make it look like it's hovering in 3D space. Two questions, can we do it ourselves? And how cheap is it? Of course, yes, and dirt freaking cheap, as long as you remember what a compact disc was. Compact disc? CD, the CD, uh, precursor to the DVD, they came in jewel cases. All that matters is that we've got some clear plastic. That's all we need. We're gonna make like a reverse pyramid that's gonna sit up like a little rose and hopefully reflect four different images in four different directions. Should look like a hologram. Now, if we just wanted a tetrahedron with three sides on the top, we would do 45, 45, 90 triangles, but we need equilateral triangles that are 60, 60, 60, right? So this is just over six centimeters wide. So basically what I'm doing is I measured at six and a half centimeters. There we go. So if we get four of these, we should be totally good. Okay, watch your fingers. Yeah, see when you push hard, you get those cracks on there. Oh, you, right. And you could just keep scoring the same spot over and over again. Go for it. Okay, let's see if we can kind of crack these along those lines. Hey, there we go. Look at that. Okay, and we need four of these. These are gonna be our facets. Yeah, correct. All right, so theoretically, let's take these four parts. We well, have my horribly broken ass one. Well, you know, the funny part is, is you actually do wanna kind of cut off the top of it, so I think right. we might be all right. You wanna try to so, score so, that Yeah, so here's what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna line this up here. We're gonna score it with seven of these forward. All right. So we did our job right. We have four surfaces, each of which is going to reflect one of four images that if you look at it from side on, should look like stuff's floating. Does that sound right? Yeah. How did they make it back in the 19th century before these jewel cases? <laughs> they would use actual glass as far as I know. And in fact, if I heard correctly, the Tupac one was actually a thin sheet of plastic that was just tilted at a 45 degree. like saran degree. wrap? Yeah, 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 basically. All right, here, you start uh, assembling these. I don't want to get fingerprints on it. Yeah, and occlude the image. So here, we'll do this. 
right? All right. So look at this. You can see that 60 degrees yeah. would theoretically be a hexagon, but instead we make it a 3D pyramid. I think that's gonna work. You think it will? I think it's gonna work. I don't know, man. This is a fairly low fidelity prism? Wait, a holographic? This is a- Yeah, I don't know, I don't know what to call that. All I care about is does it work? All right, theoretically. Holy cow! What? Wow! Right? That looks way better than right? I anticipated. This is just a floating jellyfish! Okay, I knew this was gonna look good. I didn't know it was going to look incredible. I didn't even think it'd look good. <laughs> that was gonna look terrible. <laughs> well, and that's with my crappy tape job on there. Dude, that looks awesome, that flame. Dude, I gotta show the kids. Oh, this is gonna blow their mind. It's blowing my mind. It really does look like it's hovering right there in the yeah. middle. The only flaws to the image are, that are you my can... fault. <laughs> I mean, our fault. I'm calling it. This is the best investment of old jewel cases and 20 minutes of time I've ever made. Yes. Henceforth, all episodes of The Modern Rogue will be presented in Pepper's Ghost Vision. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to quadruple our camera budget. Are you, you're gonna be all right. The Modern Rogue yeah, uses a salt weapon walking. to shoot no. Pepper. All right, Jason, just spill it. We have a gun that shoots pellets full of pepper spray. This, there's no way this ends well, because when you pitched it to me, you're like, oh, it's like a paintball gun, but it does pepper spray. And I'm thinking, oh, pepper spray, we've been there before. Yeah. And then we open this thing. And it's RoboCop's gun. Are you kidding me? <laughs> with the and CO2 cartridges, and then I open up these pellets. It's like getting shot with a jawbreaker. And it's automatic? You, you got the... You got, yeah, so this is from the Salt Supply Company. This is from my nightmares is where yeah. it's from. Military grade pepper spray pellets. These are some of the practice rounds, but they're very hard and they're filled with military grade pepper spray. Yeah. Now when you got this, you said it's meant for self-defense and I'm thinking, why do you need to self-defend as something is running away? But it's not self-defense, this is home defense. Yes. This is get someone yeah. the hell out of your house. But it's also non-lethal. I'll tell you, I mean, this is gonna do damage though. Let's take a look at what the instructions say. Okay, good call. It uh, says here, this salt gun is not a toy and is intended for use by military, law enforcement, correctional officers, private security guards, bail enforcement agents, authorized personnel, or for self-defense purposes. What about internet hosts? I'm sure it's implied. This salt gun discharges projectiles from the barrel may cause serious injury or death. I missed that part. I didn't read that yeah. part. By purchasing this salt gun, you and your agency assume total responsibility for its safe and lawful use. You must observe the same precautions as you would with any firearm. Okay. Trigger discipline yep. at the ground. Safety you is can on. It. Fingers not on the trigger, pointing Thank at the ground. You. But keep I can still finger, hold it right. Keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot. Do not look down the barrel of the salt gun. Never launch at the face, eyes, ears, throat, or spine. The spine? All right, I'm thinking. What are we gonna shoot? The, the feet? Use only salt projectiles in the salt gun. Never load or fire foreign objects. Oh God, why would you do that? Hey, if you're trying to freak me out, it's totally working. Okay, there's four more pages of this. <laughs> I guess let's are load we... the practice rounds. Practice rounds? Yeah. All of them? Uh, no, let's do half of them. Okay. All right, seven ball mag. How many of those do we have? We've got five. Okay, so yeah, so we'll do two rounds of five. Oh wow, it really does, it loads just like a... Uh... Like a paintball gun? Okay. Well, no, no, like these like bullets. This is actually a paintball gun. Yeah? It's not even retrofitted or anything like that. This is part for part a, a regular paintball gun. It's the rounds that are gonna make life miserable. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna leave that. And then I guess we have to pressurize this. Yes. All right, we'll get eye protection as well. And then you pull it out, and then it screws all the way out. And you load this guy in. Mm -hmm. At this point, we got the CO2 in there. So this way you twist it, and then to pressurize it, you're gonna pop that down. On the one hand, it's like it's just a paintball gun. On the other hand, this is a mother of all paintball guns. Yeah. It looks so menacing. All right, here we go. Oh, it just, it just oh, that did the CO2. The, that was the CO2 cartridge now. getting pierced. Oh, God. All right, we'll just shoot it into the trees. <sighs> oh!
Oh, God. <laughs> it broke apart on yeah. the branches. It's powdered. And powdered. That's the safety round. That's just a practice yeah. round, so it doesn't have pepper spray in it. Okay, all right. You know what? Here, uh, I'm going to go for just that, that ridge that over there. That little rock yeah. ridge. Okay. That is live. Holy sh**. Okay, my turn, my turn, my turn. Okay. Do not think of it as a paintball gun, because you, those you have to be a little bit high so oh. it goes down. Think of it as a gun gun, because it okay. turns out it's a gun gun. It's, it's Jar Jar Binks. It's a gun, it's, yeah, it's terrible. Whew, just to the left. Nice. Yeah. How you feeling? Scared? I know technically it's a paintball gun, but yeah. those are not paintball pellets, man. Those are rocks. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is they fire so freaking fast, you don't need to arc it. It just right down the sight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's really nothing you want to toy with. When they said it's not a toy, I thought, well, it's kind of a toy. It's not a toy. No. These guys are marketing it as a way to keep your family safe. Yes. Which means it's not a toy. So now we need to kick it up a notch and go with live rounds. Oof. All right, let's, yeah. let's give it a go. I'm gonna aim for this black spot right here. Okay. The moment you feel it go, just take a big whiff. Sure, great. I, I think it'll be like the stuff we experienced in the worst aid kit. It's gonna suck. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. at least I'm not getting hit with it. All right, you feeling it? I'm feeling it. The moment that puffs, I want you, you in there. I'll pop up. All right, here we go. All right, it's live. It's coming at your face in three, two, Oh! Oh! No! No! I can't oh. see! Oh! 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 oh. Wait, oh. stop, stop. Don't move, don't move, don't move. Eyes closed. Oh, geez, it did puff on you. All right. Yeah. Oh my God, it's all over your face. Oh my God! All right, are you okay? <laughs> yes, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. My eyes are burning. Oh my God, my eyes burning getting near you. <laughs> oh my God. This is a drag. Here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Trust me, okay. trust me, buddy. Trust right. me, trust me, trust me. That was amazing. No, oh. no, no, now I can shoot you. Just give me the gun. I got oh. it. Oh. Oh. What was it like? It was just like immediate blindness and stinging. Okay, so what's weird is I only saw a little puff and then you just stood up. It didn't even look like much of your face was in there. The moment I stood up, I couldn't see. And it was just stinging and my face got all itchy. It was a drag, man. Wow. Now it's your turn. Oh, jeez. <laughs> there is 0% chance that I'm gonna take one of those at full force, even from that far away. I'm gonna put enough layers on. I'm gonna be like the Michelin man, yeah. covered up in so much stuff. I want the slightest taste of what this is like. I'm not gonna judge you for that. I think that's fair, because I felt it hit that board. Yeah. And it resonated. I'm thinking we do some low-tech body armor. <laughs> I become the world's <laughs> worst Iron Man. That's fair. Okay, yes. all right. I'm going to wear a whole bunch of layers because if it's meant to stop criminals or people break it into your house, I would assume it's supposed to hurt people. Yeah, even if they have a coat on or something. Oh, uh, good call. All right. That's good. I think, yeah, I think that'll be fine. <laughs> there you go. Hold that here. Yeah. There you go. Oh, and you're going to put that on over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do that scene where I'm like, Brian, and you go, Oh, oh, like, oh, he was wearing a vest. I don't know about uh, protect my arms. I don't trust you to not hit him. Okay, good. Right, hold on, hold on. We got it. Uh, uh, here, give me, give me, give me pieces of this. Of this? Yeah, tear, tear that up. What, of the bo the box or? Yeah, I need armor. I don't trust you to get the sides. Oh, I'm Iron Man. All right, all right, all right. Okay. Uh, do you want to do goggles and mask? No, we got to do mask. Just the mask? I'm looking forward to this. Dude. I'm uh, excited. I feel good. I, I think I should do the goggles inside. All right, do it. I swear, Jason, I need your aim to be good. Put your hands over the important stuff. No, it, 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 the hands are the important stuff. Oh. I'm a magician. Yeah. How are you uh, feeling? Terrified, terrified, terrified. OK. Uh, we need the water. It's going to explode, and it's going to puff right up into my face. Yep. That's the point. I'm just gonna put it right here. Don't knock it over. 50 mile an hour fastball. Okay. So I'm gonna be about right here. Yep. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> All right, ready? Uh, let me hold my breath. Hey, remember that time you tased me on national television? Yeah. <laughs> ah! See? <laughs> 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 no! 
That was terrifying. <laughs> that was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I told you it was gonna be fine. Did it bounce off? I think so. <laughs> Here, I'll get you again. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. Okay. All those years of duck hunt finally paid off. Don't miss. Oh! <laughs> hey! 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 Right here. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, oh, yes. I, I'm, I'm breathing it now. Oh, I should have done sucks, that. right? Get the water. Get the water. That's no good. <laughs> All right, come here, come here, quick. <laughs> All right. <coughs> uh. <coughs> yep. Uh. <coughs> it's highly effective unless somebody has put together a cardboard body armor and is wearing eye protection. Holy! <laughs> holy! Very effective. Okay. Well done, Salt Supply oh. Company. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at it. That was almost my neck. That is a scene I want to never experience in my life again. <laughs> yeah. Looking down the barrel of a Jason Murphy <laughs> raising a pistol at me. So what do you fear more, the impact or the pepper spray? It was the pepper spray, and even after I got shot, it was the pepper spray. And then I pulled this out, and ain't no question it's that impact. That's serious. That's, gonna, that's going to stop somebody from coming at you, especially because that thing is automatic. You're just going to go like pop, 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 yeah. pop as they're coming at you. Yeah, you're not going to have any well-measured discretion at, I'm just going to shoot them once. No, you're gonna unload. Oh, absolutely. That's the beauty of it being a fully loaded automatic weapon. I gave zero credibility to this as an actual home defense weapon until we did this test. And now there's no question, a single person uh, in a hallway coming at you, it's over. Ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> Even if you miss them, <laughs> that stuff exploding on the walls next to them, yeah. you cannot walk into that and yeah. not be instantly You're blinded. You're immediately blinded. Nobody's gonna go into it prepared for that. Uh, also, gotta say, the heft is amazing. The feel of it is amazing. Locking that magazine in is amazing. It's pretty satisfying, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. All right. Okay, now with healthy armor. Nope. Nope. Come nope. on. Nope. What if I get you right in the ass? No, don't you. Did you read that about the spine? It's 1992, you're a radio DJ, what's your DJ name? Because it can't be your real name. Long Dong Silver. No, I don't know. Uh, God, that's fun. funny. That's funny, because I'm Rocky Bukaki. <laughs> Rocky Bukaki. <laughs> Woo! Ring the cowbell. Ding, ding, ding. The modern row can only be heard in certain frequencies. First of all, the ability to transmit FM transmission is not very complicated. Pretty much anyone can do an FM or an AM broadcast, right? Right, but... I never could grasp exactly how far the signal was going. Some people say that there's a one-to-one -one ratio of wattage per mile that you can hear the transmission. But most people seem to agree that it's not even a good rule of thumb. That doesn't factor in competing transmissions, that doesn't factor in the antenna placement. There's a million other factors, including freaking sunspots. There's a reason that you can hear AM radio so much farther at night versus the daytime. It's because you're not competing with the signals from the freaking sun. So if you want to broadcast where everyone can hear it, you got to have a lot of money and a license from the FCC. What if you just want to broadcast local? Then you want to check out Title 47, Part 15. This is the part that says that unlicensed transmission is allowed for certain sections of the FM and the AM section. The AM transmission is determined by the power of the station. For FM, it has to be between 88 and 108 megahertz. It talks about the field strength outside of the antenna, is that right? That's how I understand it. It's Byzantine. As long as you are not affecting any broadcasts within 60 meters, I believe, you should be safe, question mark. I am not a lawyer. Also check out on the website. It also merits mentioning that most people don't own an EMF detector. That's correct. If you actually wanted to obey all the rules, you would get certain detectors that would measure the strength of the field from where you are based on what kind of antenna you have. And keep in mind, most people have already experienced being a pirate radio broadcaster because if you ever got one of those things that you plug in your iPod to transmit on your car radio, oftentimes those are overpowered and you're technically doing an illegal broadcast. Here's a good rule of thumb. If people can hear you, you're probably too loud. I am not a lawyer, so I can't say if that's true or not. I can say that if you are caught violating the FCC statutes, it's $10,000 the first time 
and up to $75,000 for being a repeat offender. In fact, there's a fantastic website that breaks down the United States and shows where they've been busting people with pirate radio stations. So this is nothing to be trifled with. One of the big things that they look for is if you are overriding or interfering with someone who actually has a license. Correct. If you are going to do this above board, you should go to radio-locator.com. Punch in your zip code. It'll tell you what the least used parts of the spectrum is in your area. This way you can make the loudest noise in the smallest area using the least amount of power, which is important to stay compliant with the law here in my area. The best channel is 87.9 FM. Do you know what's wrong with that? It's outside of the range. That's right. That we were told you could use. So we'll have to go with one of the next best channels. In this case, 91.5 looks good. Okay, what equipment do we need and how do we get it? Again, we are not encouraging anybody to do anything, but a simple search on the internet showed me one watt to five watt transmitters in the FM band for like $60. One watt to five watt anywhere in there? way too powerful. Yeah, although it does mention on the FCC website, it talks about the effective range. So it almost seemed like they were much more concerned with what you were actually interfering with, less with what your theoretical maximum could have been. Does that make sense? Yes. So as far as the equipment, we need a transmitter, an antenna, and an audio source. Yeah, I think that's it. Now this thing could theoretically get us into all kinds of trouble, but we're gonna restrict the amount of power so that we only reach your car. I wanna be a radio DJ for you and only you. Oh, that's what I've always wanted, great. <laughs> to be clear, we are not stupid enough to document our illegal activities and post them on the internet. This is right? why we're doing everything above board. I'm asking you, Brian, right? Check, 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 check. All right, we're at the far end of Brian's neighborhood and we're gonna drive until we hear the signal and whatever delightful broadcasting he's got planned for us. Pulling up to Brian's house now. singing my song live here on Unlicensed Radio. It's 91.5, a.k.a. 105.9. Look at that. Coming up next, we got Quiet Riot. Don't forget, Cook of the Races, Badger Morning, Snake Again, the Afternoon, Drive Time, Weather and Radar, Hot Pods. It's Unlicensed Radio. He's too good at this. <laughs> Did it work? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What did it sound like? It sounded like a really shitty radio station. Caller. Yo. You're on the air, buddy. What's up? Uh, hey. Uh, big fan, longtime listener. What about some uh, fat boys? Oh, the fat boys? The fat boys. Here you go, buddy. Oh my God. My special request from Jason Murphy. It's the fat boys. I I'm very pleased. I never thought, I thought I would die before I heard that song again. <laughs> okay, that's good. I'm gonna turn this off now. <laughs> okay, all right. Bye. How many times do you think we're gonna get called out for mispronouncing the content of today's episode? I, I'm never gonna say it. I, <laughs> I, I don't use the C word. How about that? <laughs> Your mom's a caipirinha. <laughs> the modern road makes a caipirinha. We're back again in our favorite secret bar of all of Austin with one of our favorite bartenders. You know what? I'm just going to call it favorite bartender. Favorite right bartender? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Trevor, what are we learning to make today? We are going to learn how to make a caipirinha. 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 Get ready caipirinha. for the comments. Caip all right. The caipirinha is the national drink of Brazil. Do we have a national drink? Why don't we have a national drink? I think we need one. What would it be? I don't know. It would be Budweiser, right? Budweiser? This is where a mean disappointment America? to our species, right? I'm not going to condone that. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm with you. The national drink of Brazil, it is made with something that is like rum because it's distilled from sugar, but it's called cachaça. Why is cachaça not rum? It is made from sugarcane, just like rum is, but with the distillation process, there are a couple of different variations and therefore you get different fruit flavored notes out of it, but it is still a sugarcane based 
liqueur. As with most of these cocktails, its origins are apocryphal. Apparently this one was possibly first created in 1918 in Sao Paulo, and it was used as a remedy for the Spanish flu. You just drink your time away. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm gonna be sick for a bit. Might as well spend it drunk. <laughs> Precisely. I see a lot of sugar. I know we're using cachaça, which is distilled from sugar. It's caipirinha Portuguese for diabetes. <laughs> No, but one of the root words actually does translate into the Portuguese term for hillbilly, so. Good enough? <laughs> All you need is lime, sugar, and cachaça. Wait, what is this? This, this is not part of it? Yes, there are variations of making this drink, and some people will actually use brown sugar, and we're gonna use a little bit of brown sugar simple syrup today to bring out Got the it. molasses flavor that you're gonna find in cachaça. What we're gonna do is you're gonna start out with about five to six lime wedges here. This is already off the reservation. <laughs> I was not prepared. Then we're going to add just a uh, bar spoon full of sugar into there. Just to kind of spice things up, I'm gonna put just a little bit of brown sugar simple syrup in here. And this is where the fun begins, because now we're just gonna mash the living oh, hell. This is the muddler. That. People are always asking, we got those bartender kits, and it's like, what do you use the muddler for? And it's this. Yes. You just really wanna grind this up as much as possible. I like it that since the typical recipe is so complicated, you're showing us something with a little bit more flair and something a little that tastes a little bit more interesting. Yeah, exactly. So typically the caipirinha is just cachaça, lime, and sugar. Yes. We're going the fancy route though. Yes, just by adding the brown sugar, just to add just a little bit of a different flavor. I can to already it. tell this is gonna be my favorite drink we've ever made. I've talked about muddling before, and really you're just trying to get the essential oils out of the fruit. This mm -hmm. time you really just wanna mash the hell out of this thing. Okay. Yeah, because I know like with the old fashioned that we made, you didn't want to mash it up too right. much. This one you really do, you almost want just a consistent pulp yes, all over the exactly. place. Exactly. Finish this off, it's as easy as just adding about two to three ounces of cachaça. Oh, this is gonna be the best drink ever. I'm calling dibs. Yeah, I'm no, saying first sees. So much rum. This is one of the preferred summer drinks for me because it's so refreshing. Now, we're getting into fancier territory. Is this the kind of thing that at most bars you can ask for and they'll be able to make? Yeah, depending because this drink does take a little bit of time with the muddling. Mm -hmm. But someone that really appreciates a good spirited drink like this, they'll take their time to make it for you. One more time. What's the C word again? Uh, the drink itself is caipirinha. Got it. Caipirinha. It's wow, ready. That was, that was, that was, uh, we're done. We're done, yeah. The good thing about this is that anyone can make it. You can find cachaça in most liquor stores. Oh, right on. May I? Yeah. You have the honors. Dude, I love it. That hit of acidity is perfect. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's one of the most refreshing drinks you can get. It does. It tastes clean. I think this is one of the easiest drinks that we've made. Well, it's one of the simplest, but it's also one of the most involved in that you have to do all the mashing in there. This is a good way to look fancy to somebody and show that you put effort and love and care into the drink. Yes. And also it's delicious. And plus you'll sound exotic when you're throwing out the Portuguese. Uh, uh, let me see if I get it right. Cachaça and... Kimchi. Caipirinha. 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 I want to be that guy who has a box of passports. Oh, so many identities. No, just like killing tourists and taking oh, their passports. The modern road crafts a fake identity. In the movies, it always seems so exotic where someone has all of these fake identities that they can use at a moment's notice. Yeah, sure, you buy them at the ID store. You're like, I would like an Asian male about 57 years old, right? Different store. <laughs> I don't know where you've been shopping. <laughs> okay, good point, good point. But they make it seem like this is something exotic that you have to have this hardened, mysterious life to achieve, and you really don't. It's a huge crime to do this. Oh, bigger now than ever before. But ghosting seems really easy. <laughs> so ghosting is assuming a dead person's identity. And there's a bunch of different reasons that you would want to do it. Yes, which is different from just creating an identity from scratch. Because if you create an identity, you can't go collect somebody else's social security checks. Right, you are just taking the pre-established information that they already have attached to their person. So why would you want to ghost? You could uh, steal someone's credit, you could just drop off the grid or just start over. And this is different from identity theft because it's not like you want to cash in on their good credit and get a payday. Oftentimes you want to maintain their credit and keep this as a persistent personality so you can leave some kind of old life behind. 
Right, and it's not necessarily always done for nefarious purposes. You could do it if you just need to escape. It's your own witness protection program. As a matter of fact, during the Vietnam War, a bunch of conscientious objectors went up to Canada and they assumed identities of dead people and just assimilated into society. Yes, and uh, funnily enough, it's actually easier for women because they changed their name at some point during their life. So their birth certificate would be different from their death certificate. Exactly. Don Draper is actually a famous ghoster. Seymour Skinner. Seymour Skinner wait, wait, as well. What was his real name? Do you remember? Oh, Armin Tanzarian. Wow! Yes! 10 points to Gryffindor. Oh. My real name is Armin Tanzarian. <gasps> <laughs> the whole thing that makes ghosting possible is that different government organizations don't share information very well. So you might have a death certificate in one state where they died, but a birth certificate from another state, and you just go back to that first state, keep on living. Exactly. There's no overall death record that people can easily cross-check. So I'm not saying that I need to drop off the grid. And in fact, I'm not even saying I did anything wrong. Let's just say I needed to start over. Where do you begin? It's really easy. You need one form of identification. That's it? That's it. Everything else comes from that. And the easiest thing to get is a copy of your birth certificate or of the other person's birth certificate. So I guess you start by trolling through the obituaries. You find somebody roughly your age, somebody that maybe you could even pass for if you saw the pictures side by side, somebody with a less prominent occupation, like maybe a waiter or bartender or something. Yeah, you don't want to pick a, a member of Congress or someone who had their own reality television show, for In instance. In fact, there's amazing stories of reformed criminals that wanted to leave their life of crime behind, but they were trapped in the same habits. So there's one guy who was into falconry and he kept attending all the falconing events and there's only like a hundred falconers in the US, so they all recognized him. Yeah, exactly. He was also a spy, but he got busted pretty quickly because falconers got a falcon. <laughs> so the easiest thing to do is to go through the obituaries in a big city. Because small town people all know each other. Right, you don't want to call someone and have them say, oh, he's my uncle. <laughs> I know you're not him. <laughs> so you begin with the birth certificate, and I know that in the pre-computerization days, London would have public records of birth and death certificates. So you're able to just literally walk around and just grab copies of that. Yes, yes. Now you can have a copy sent to you, and using that, you can get a driver's license, and you can get a checking account, you can get a new social security card, and you can take all of the trappings of this person's life and it just snowballs from there. You just need that one. One of the most disturbing things I read was that you want to look for an entire family that got killed out of state, because that means there are fewer people to recognize you and you get more targets to choose from. In fact, Eden Press back in the 1970s did an entire guide called The Paper Trip that was all about how to assume some dead person's identity. Yes, and things have changed, of course, since the 1970s. You can do all of these searches and get a little bit more background on your target using the internet, of course. On the other hand, as everything gets computerized, it's easier than ever for somebody to take a fingerprint and pull up your previous criminal record, because I know you have one, <laughs> and all of a sudden the sham is off. Yeah, exactly. So information, as we mentioned earlier, is starting to get shared more, but it's still not quite there. So when you make that phone call to get the birth certificate, there's a little bit of social engineering in there. You gotta have an excuse for why you haven't been around or what happened to your documents. Oftentimes you could say I was on missionary work or you were doing service overseas or something like that. You wanna take into consideration the moment of death versus the time you're calling. So if you've been gone three years, you need to come up with a lie for why you've been gone three years and don't have three years of work history. So what about social security numbers? Well, now you have to get a social security number for your child before you can claim them on your taxes. Used to be you didn't get a social security number until your first job. So if you found a kid who had died, maybe seven years ago, you're 22 years old, kid died at 15, you go apply as the kid for your first job and then they issue you social security number. Exactly. Now it is getting much more difficult to do this with the improvement of search engines and imaging technology that can cross-reference fingerprints in a matter of minutes. You're saying the dream's dead. I have to be Brian Brushwood forever? You might still be able to pull it off, but what's your new identity? Tell us. Ryan Rushwood. Oh, him. Totally different guy. Yeah, yeah. There might be a Ryan Rushwood out there. Is he a podcaster? He, he, he's a, he does rod casting. Rod casting. <laughs> he's a fisherman. He's fly fishing? Yes. Is okay. that what fine. he does? All right, fine. <laughs> Ryan Rushwood, fly fisherman. Don't look at me. Keep doing what you're doing. Act cool. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome, right? <laughs>
I've always wanted to do that. You're a nerd. Bucket Shit, list. You're a big nerd. <laughs> the modern rogue hides a dead drop. So many words I don't recognize. Dead drop, live drop, a spike, and tradecraft. Just start with tradecraft. What is that? Okay, tradecraft is the greater umbrella that covers all of the methods, techniques, and technologies of modern espionage. So that's, I assume, everything from following people to passing information to sneaking photographs. All of that is tradecraft? All of that is the art of the spy. Got it. Now, one of them in specific is the dead drop spike. Now, I've heard of dead drop before. That's like a way, like, isn't that where like you drop the drugs and someone gets the money and then they go pick up the drugs or something like that? Uh, essentially, yeah. The difference between a dead drop and a live drop, like earlier when we sat at the bench, that would be a live drop if I sent a password to you and left a paper bag under the bench. Got it, That's got a live it. drop. Dead drop is where you leave something and someone else is going to pick up that something on their own schedule. So like if you were to tuck something underneath a trash can or underneath a post office box or something, that could be a dead drop. Exactly, exactly. And it's often out in plain sight, but nothing obvious that people will say, oh, there's a briefcase, I'm going to take that. Well, and that's the thing about the urban jungle is that there's so much noise, it seems like it's super easy to find little nooks and crannies that nobody's gonna think about. Right, you see so much garbage and so many little structures where you could hide anything small under any of this. And now we get into the spike. Now the spike, is this. So this is uh, made of, it seems like aluminum. Yes. And uh, it's super sharp at the end. This is not a, is this a weapon? I bet it uh, could be used as a weapon. I think it's a very effective weapon, but that's not what its intent is. This was made by Imminent Threat. You can make these yourself, but this was a really good one, and I believe it's waterproof. You can fit something inside there and oh, then bury shoot. it in the ground. Okay, and so at that point, uh, all you need is an agreed upon location. There doesn't even have to be some kind of obvious place. It could be as precise as a set of coordinates. And I assume totally buried, you would just look for that little bit of leather poking out or something? A little bit more than that. You have to have a generalized area that you've told your contact where it's going to be. And then you narrow it down with a prearranged signal. Aldrich Ames, the double agent uh, from 1993, okay. he worked for the CIA and Russia, and he would use a chalk mark on a mailbox, and that would indicate where he had dropped something. I assume it's the kind of thing where they had multiple dead drop locations, and just at a totally different area, he could just indicate on a code, there's something at A, B, C, whatever. Precisely, you would give someone some general coordinates, they would look around those coordinates for the chalk mark, and know that there was something hidden nearby that they needed to get. Okay, so we've got the spike, we need a secret message, and you need to pick a location. Yes, I'll send you some coordinates, and I also have some chalk. Oh, perfect, perfect, okay, okay, great. Yeah, 15 minutes, I'm gonna yeah. get a beer. All right, I got a good one. Brian and I think loyal fans are going to love it all right got that sealed up pretty good let's find a good spot for this okay I got a place and again the trick is putting it in plain sight but nothing too obvious I'm gonna mark this post right here and we'll put our spike in right here there we go Okay, and I figure an MR is something that he will definitely recognize. Maybe right here, too. Now I'm just gonna text him some coordinates. All right, so San Antonio, fourth, uh, between fourth and third on San Antonio, uh, looks like a parking garage, so we can do this. You get the coordinates? Yeah. You know, you can send actual coordinates instead oh. of a picture. But this is nice, it's like a treasure map. I like communicating in very basic, <laughs> primitive ideas. I wanted to send a raven. All right, so in real life, I would not have you here to help, so I don't want you to help me at all, all right? Okay, maybe I'll even impede you a little. No, please don't impede me. How you feeling? Uh. Good question mark? I mean, this is, it says it's, it's definitely in this parking facility, but it's an acre and a half large. The good news is since I know it's a spike, it's gotta be in the dirt. And so there's like, I don't know, like 20 or 30 patches of dirt. Right. And I should have given you this before. The chalk symbol? Yeah. MR. Oh, right on. Yeah, that would help. Although that would be fun to discover randomly too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it looks like it's halfway up right along San Antonio. 
Yeah, exact coordinates probably would have helped. Where's the fun in that? No, it's fine. Look, you picked a nice square place, so looking at the map, it's very clear what area it's going to be in. Yeah. You know, so, we're not seasoned spies, so... Yet, yet, yet. We're not seasoned spies yet. So here's the part that's messing with me. It looks like we're on the spot, but there's no dirt, unless unless this is broken or something, but I don't think so. I'm gonna scour just the entire possible area that you have highlighted here. Okay. And I also know you made a chalk mark. Correct. So I'm gonna assume the chalk would be on the ground, but it occurs to me that it might not be. All right, now I feel like I'm too far up. See? Yeah. You're taking so long. Beep, beep, beep. The Soviet Union already won. I don't need the pressure, boss. <laughs> Listen, old double O douchebag. <laughs> I'm gonna take my sweet time. This is chalk. I was thinking that would mislead you. Ah, I so th not. this is not you. That's that's a different spy. It looks like somebody wrote turtle. Somebody likes turtles, and they decided to write it down there. Uh, wouldn't it be funny if we found a completely unrelated dead drop spike? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? If you didn't chalk the ground, maybe you chalked uh, this wood. It genuinely looks on the map like it's around here. Son of a bitch. Still no hints? It's no hints. All right. Tradecraft is hard. It's going to be more obvious than you think. OK, so <laughs> what just happened? You were looking at it, but right when you looked at it, a car passed by. No way. OK, so we're OK, so I was back here. I'm trying to lose the deep focus and instead just kind of shallowly see everything. Oh shit! <laughs> Sorry, hi! <laughs> Sorry, I, I was really excited. I found a thing. There's. <laughs> <laughs> you, you totally frightened them. <laughs> they, said, they said congratulations. <laughs> They're very proud of me. <laughs> Good job. All right. I give it. Man, uh, wow. I just sorely underestimated how far in. I was convinced sure, it was sure. on the side. Okay, so there's actually two chalk markings, which gives me a lot of area, but I, I'm assuming it's not in any of the asphalt here. I drove but that sucker right into the asphalt, this Brian. This one I'm is not gonna perfect lie. because I could see it from super far away, but yeah. then once I got here and started looking, I saw this one. So I'm gonna bet that that was like a beacon, and then this one was to pull me in. That's what I was going for. I, I assume I'm looking just for that little bit of leather. You wanna look for that leather strap. Like if you had the launch codes in there, I don't know that I'd find it in time. <laughs> ah. Come on. Oh, oh, oh! Hey! Wait for it. Oh, and, and it's got a nice loop in there. Yeah, it's it's gonna be tough to get out of there. Uh, yeah. Wow, yeah. I had to stand on it. Oh, geez, yeah, no, it, I'm afraid. Oh, there it is. <laughs> there it is! There we go. Now, I can find out what secret message. Did it strip all the paint off? Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, it's just aluminum. Aluminum doesn't really hold paint super well. I guess not, finally. And here is the important super secret Tradecraft spy message bit.ly slash 2EP, capital P, capital L, lowercase p, I. Secret message just for you, Brian. No, it's good. It's of good. grave importance. It's good. I, I'm actually excited. It, it must not fall into the wrong hands. <laughs> Thankfully, I have saved the universe because I get to watch Netflix's example show. <laughs> well played, man. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> that was freaking epic. That was so much fun. And to think, I mean, that's, I wonder how many secret messages are passed that way, like, and every day, everywhere, you don't even know. Yeah, it's a lot like geocaching, only the stakes are much higher. Because otherwise, you won't get to see Netflix's example show. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. We got candles, we got spooky lighting. What else do we need to summon the forces of darkness? We need... A board game from Hasbro! <laughs> the modern road meets the mystifying oracle. How does this go from a genuinely haunted talisman to a board game? Well, the first written record of what they called planchette talking or spirit boards or talking boards was in 1100 AD in China. There's record of it being used all over the world in Rome and Greece and so forth. But in 1890, in the rise of spiritualism in the United States, it was patented by William Fold and Elijah Bond. Now, this is back when everyone had talking to dead people fever. Exactly. It was an actual medical condition. <laughs> yes, it was like Pac-Man fever, but with dead people. 
Now there are a lot of knockoffs, but Ouija is the one that is used by Hasbro. Now I've heard that Ouija at some point they were saying it's a fusion of we and ya from uh, German and French, but that's not true. That's like retcon. That's right? not true. Yeah, that's just something that these guys made up to sound kind of exotic. Mysterious. Originally, it was one of the guys that they worked with, and he was saying that Ouija was an ancient Egyptian word meaning good luck. Oh, but even that's BS, right? Just yeah, made up. Exactly. It just sounds spooky. God, man, those days must have been great. Anyone could just make anything up. There's no internet to correct them. Oh, God, <laughs> you could just lie to people and make money off of it. Unlike now, where we know that's totally ended. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, look, we got someone. What are we going to ask? What are we going to ask? Oh, I, I didn't read the rule book. Should we read the rules? Yeah, oh, wait, yeah. Yeah, what are the rules? Are there rules? For decades, players have brought their questions to the Ouija board. What you do with the information it reveals is between you and the mystifying oracle. Man, those are some carefully selected words. Yes. <laughs> and then the tagline, Ouija, it's only a game, isn't it? Monopoly, it's a quick game. Is Isn't it? it? <laughs> <laughs> I had always heard when you were a kid that like, you never use it alone. You always have to do a figure eight. We built up this mythology as kids. Let's do a real quick thing. Okay. All right, okay. right. Uh, hands on all the way. <laughs> Is YouTube's content ID policy a pain in the ass? <laughs> <laughs> You're pushing it. I'm not. I know you are. I'm not. I'm barely <laughs> what, touching what are you it. What talking about? I'm barely touching it. You're pushing it. <laughs> no, I'm not. I swear. Yes. It feels to me like you are pushing it. Uh, it feels to me like you are definitely pushing it. I'm barely touching it. All right, you want to try it again? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, different question. What's, yeah, yeah, what what um, question are we going to ask? Uh, yeah, focus, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Drop it in, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> what domain should we register? <laughs> <laughs> It's definitely moving. Uh, D? D. <laughs> okay. It's very slow. <laughs> I just wanted to hurry up. Oh, I know. <laughs> because I'm sorry, spirit. I'm sorry. <laughs> it feels like you should be doing something. Respect the spirits, damn it. Uh, uh, DT. <laughs> Not liking where this is going. <laughs> it's an alcoholic synonymous. What? H? H? <laughs> U? DTHU? <laughs> DTHU? I, 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 I broke the connection. Register DTHUI. It's a company. DTH user interfaces. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So now we have to make a company. <laughs> Sorry, this was fun. Traditionally, you would sit there and everyone would focus on it. And then you would say, is someone there? And let me guess. It said yes. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or it, go, it no. Was to know. <laughs> yeah. It's like you were supposed to build like a bond with the spirit. Like, what's your name? How did you die? And then sometimes it would get angry, you know, and then go to goodbye. Like it didn't want to talk to you anymore. It is really remarkable the sensation of feeling like the thing's moving on its own, and it, and it does feel like the other person's moving it. But you know how all of this works, right? Idiomotor response. That's right. And the best demonstration is one you could do that will actually fool yourself. It's called Chevrolet's Pendulum. Uh, do you have a ring on? Okay, good. This is one everybody should try at home right along with us. All you need is some kind of string. In fact, I've used my earbuds before and some kind of weight at the end. So I'm going to use my ring. So go ahead and tie this off and we're going to create what's called a dowsing pendulum. You know what dowsing is, right? Uh, that's where you use something to try to find water, right? Correct, correct, correct. So we're going to summon an actual spirit from Atlantis named Bob, right? So I want you to hold it in your right hand, kind of up here, your left hand underneath to kind of summon the energy and ask him, imagine you ask Bob a question, and this will work for everybody trying at home as well. And Bob's gonna answer by moving the ring forward and backwards to indicate yes. So I want you to just, with your mind, imagine it going forward and backwards, and it will actually start to move. Even though there's no conscious way you're manipulating it, it'll actually start moving forward and backwards on its own. There it is, there it is. Now watch this. Wow. You could get him to change his mind and say no by moving it in a circle. Just picture it moving in a circle now. <laughs> is that amazing? <laughs> That is incredible. So the way this works is the ideomotor response is all those tiny micromuscular movements that we don't consciously know that we're making. But when we imagine something, you eventually make those movements in accordance with it. You kind of set up a resonance where all those little movements kind of tie together to cause it to move the way you imagine. This is what all forms of dowsing boil down to, is dowsing shows you what you expect to see. You're picturing something right about here, and then of course the ideomotor response takes over. So when everybody puts it on here, this is super 
slidey, right? You got these, these felt things on here. So as a result, it takes virtually nothing to move it around. And so when everybody puts it down, we all expect it to go to yes. We're all having those tiny micromuscular movements and then eventually this, this kind of consensus happens and we all move to yes. It's kind of a snowball effect. So when you see it heading in a certain direction, it reinforces, it reinforces the it. idea. In fact, it could get so big, this is what causes table tipping. You remember the end of that movie, The Others, when they're, the ghost's getting mad and it's throwing the table around? That's something that would happen during seances. Everybody would put their hands on the table and no one person realizes that they're moving around. But as it starts to jostle, everybody's trying to stop it. And by trying to stop it, they're knocking over candles and creating a health hazard. <laughs> Let's see if we can get a third host on here. A ghost host. The ghost host? The ghost All right, host. We, we gotta find out the name of the ghost. Better not be okay. D-T-H-U-I. <laughs> D -T yeah, let's see, okay, is someone there? God, it really feels like it's moving on its own. Uh, yeah, I'm barely touching it. <laughs> <laughs> Believe your hands floating there. It's like a cartoon, like, it's like you just ran away with the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Dude, the margarita is the king of mixed drinks, right? Is it? No. <laughs> Modern Road makes a spicy Texas margarita. If you're in Texas and you're drinking and you're not drinking beer, what are you drinking? It's gotta be a margarita, right? It's a margarita, yes. Now, okay, now when I think of a margarita, it's always like you pour in the tequila, you pour in the mix and you're done. It's a margarita. A lot of people would do that, but Trevor is going to show us the error of our ways. Oh, by the way, yeah, back again in an undisclosed location, the best secret bar in all of Austin with Trevor. Yes. How you doing? Now the history of the margarita, again, no one really knows exactly where and when it was conceived. Everyone has their own story, but one of the most commonly accepted ones is that in the early 20th century in Ensenada, Mexico, there was a bartender, he was experimenting with drinks, and the daughter of a German ambassador walks into this bar in Ensenada and tries out one of these experiments. She likes it, and he names it after her the margarita. Oh, so it's like a fairy tale, but with alcohol. My it's favorite kind. the best kind. kind of fairy tale, yeah. Yes. Okay, so have I been making margaritas wrong my entire life? You don't just use the mix? Like, I don't know how to make one from scratch. It's pretty easy. Really, all you need is tequila, lime juice, a little bit of simple syrup, you want a little bit of sugar in there, and some salt, and maybe a little bit of orange flavoring, you've got a margarita. But we're in Texas, so today we're gonna do a spicy margarita. Spicy margarita, I'm in. There are a lot of, like, heathen recipes for this, where it's like, Take limeade, pour in tequila. You have a margarita. I mean, technically, right? Did you see the, did you see the <laughs> sneer on his face? <laughs> it, it was like somebody just pooped their pants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he was like, exactly. Ugh. All right, walk us through it, man. I've got some pre-cut uh, serrano peppers here, and you want to cut them thin. You don't want them too thick. It can really add too much spice to the drink. So you want to take two to three. We're going to put them in the tin. We're going to pour just like about a quarter ounce of fresh lime juice here. Just a dash, essentially. And now we're going to muddle it, just to try to get those oils. Now, how muddled are you making You're it? You're just pressing it. Just, just enough to kind of squeeze out those essential oils. Yeah, you don't want to crush it up too much. Then we're going to add uh, one and a half ounces of silver tequila here. Today we're using Espelone. What is the difference between gold tequila and silver tequila? The way it's aged, there's barrel aging and yeah. the amount of sugar that's also put in it. Now, does it matter the quality of tequila that you put into the margarita? Yes and no. Once you get into like higher levels of tequila, you don't necessarily want to put it in a margarita because then you're just, you're spending $20 on a margarita. Something like this, you know, this is kind of a mid-level tequila. You can get this just about anywhere. Sometimes when I get a margarita, they'll ask if I want top shelf. I intentionally take the house because otherwise if it's too high a quality alcohol, it stops tasting like alcohol, at right? Some, at some point, yeah. Like Don Julio 1942, it tastes like you're sipping caramel. It's amazing. I would not want to waste that in a margarita. Oh, that makes Okay, so we've got the muddled serrano peppers, we've got lime juice, what else? And we've got one and a half ounces of tequila in there. Now we're going to add this Texas orange liqueur. It's just gonna give a little bit of flavoring to it. What are some of the other more common uh, liqueurs that you can put in there? Well, uh, the other one we're gonna put in is Cointreau. Oh, you're gonna do both? Yes. Okay. Right on. So you're, this is gonna have a blast of spice and orange in it. And again, we're just putting about a half ounce in there. We're gonna shake this all together. And like any time that we uh, make drinks with citrus, you know, we're gonna shake. Now, now I noticed you're shaking longer than I would expect, so I assume that you want the ice to break apart and dilute the mix a bit. Yes, essentially. 
rinse this out. Now here's the important step here. Because of those serrano peppers, you don't want those seeds to get into the drink because it, it, it will really just overpower the drink. Yeah. So we're gonna double strain this drink. So you take a fine mesh strainer over the glass. So this way we just get that kind of yeah, essence that, of the serrano peppers. None that way of the no actual pepper stuff. or seed come in there. And if you look. Yeah, wow, I've we cut a lot. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we are going to add ice to the drink. And to top this off and add a little bit more flavor, we're gonna take some main root ginger beer. Oh wow. Oh wow. And it's gonna add even more spice to the drink. So how much ginger is there in the ginger brew? Have you never had one of the main root ginger brews? It's spicy. This is delightful. <laughs> right? This is gonna be an amazing margarita. And it's so gingery, it will knock the fillings out of your teeth. That's great. So this is a much more elaborate margarita than I would have expected, but I'm gonna try it. Yeah, go yeah, for it. I'm not afraid. Now this is interesting. Does it matter whether or not you use the straw? I put the straw in there just in case you don't want the salt. Wow. It's almost like a Moscow mule. This is gonna sound super pretentious, but that is a really diverse flavor profile. All right, I'm gonna do with the salt. That Serrano hits you right up front. Yeah, I then you taste the ginger. That. Yeah, It's like it's all there. That is a much more complex tasting margarita than I've ever had. If you did not tell me this was a margarita, I would not think it's a margarita. All I know is that it's spicy, it's got some bite up front, it's got just enough sweetness that it's easy to, to process. Uh, you don't taste the alcohol. Like that little bit of Serrano completely masks the alcohol side. Wow. Okay, so we have some lime juice, muddled Serranos, tequila, some Contro and some orange liqueur, topped with ginger brew. I, I don't think I've ever tasted a margarita quite like this. Does this have an official name? Gary's Fire Crotch Margarita. Wait, what? Wait, is it really? Is it really Gary's Fire, Fire Crotch, Crotch margarita? margarita? Smart move to wait until after we drank it to give us the name. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, God! <laughs> Let's throw some knives. Nope. Well, I threw it technically. Oh, well, that was close. Not really. Aim wise, I was. The modern road throws knives at stuff. All right, back again with John Maverick with more dangerous stuff that we shouldn't be doing. Talk to me about throwing knives. Is there anything special about them? Basically, no. They are knives. They're solid. Properly balanced, roughly in the middle, right? Should be in the middle. If they had a handle on them, they'd be a full tang blade, but I hate throwing knives with handles. Why is that? Well, you get two of them right next to each other, you cut the handle off of it. I don't think I'll ever have to worry about that amount of precision. Yeah, yeah. I'll be happy if I hit that thing. The biggest thing I don't understand about throwing knives is that it, it just seems like I would bounce the hilt off of everyone. Like, how do you know how many rotations you're gonna get? There's math. Your average throwing knife's about, uh, this, this one's about a foot. Okay. And because of that, it does one full rotation every six feet of being thrown. I, I, yeah. I had no idea. Neither did I when I first started. From the moment you let go, mm -hmm. every six feet, it does one full rotation. Exactly. That doesn't give you a lot of variance. It doesn't. Okay, so you would not throw a knife in an actual life or death situation, is what no. you're saying. That's why Batman's got two points in the battering. Well, I, I would manage to hit with the ears of the bats. <laughs> <laughs> the guy would laugh at me. So like I said, every six feet would be one full turn. But it's not six feet for every knife. Exactly. This knife is about a foot, a little bit less, and it's a six to one ratio for the knife. So if the knife was 18 inches long, it'd be nine feet. Throwing machetes, I'm a 12, 15 feet. Uh, now you're at five feet. I'm at five feet here for two reasons. One, I'm not gonna throw straight. I'm gonna do a half a turn. Like, are you, are you, you're not worried about cutting yourself? I'm not worried about cutting myself. Okay. They're not very sharp knives. Got it, got it. But they're just very pokey at the end. Yeah, but they're very pokey at the end. Not too blunt. I'm not resting my thumb on the blade. I'm just going to throw and just sort of let it fly out. I'm not even opening up my hand all the way. I'm just letting the momentum pull it out of my hand. Okay. The one thing that I hate, every martial arts movie has a guy taking the knife, and throwing and it, almost flicking like it. flicking it. Like adding his own wrist. extra momentum on there. Spins it faster than it wants to spin. Right. Totally blows the equation out. Right. And you're pulling back on the knife. It's not gonna have the momentum. So it's mostly elbow and shoulder. It's just throwing a knife. It's really just. I love that. You just throw it. You just yeah. throw right. it. Like, show me, go, go. Okay. I'm just gonna back, <laughs> back, yeah. back away. Oh, that's it. Well, that looked, uh, all right. So can I, can I give it a you try? You can, I plant. One foot forward, right at that five foot mark. Got it. Okay, my other one goes back. And it is a little bit of a full body motion. I'm going to spring off my foot just a little bit. Uh-huh. Off my back foot, 
put the whole body in. Sure. Just take it. Throw it. All right. All right. That's You're doing like pinching. a pinch grip. Okay. Uh, he was doing more of like a hammer grip. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so grab this whole thing. Get right here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, here's what's really neat. I'm happy seeing you mess up, but here's one clue. Your knife hit like that. Yeah. Take a small step back okay. because you're in rotation. So yeah. as it's coming. So just realize that the rotation is going to be constant and it's up to me constant. to adjust exactly. my distance. So what that means is that you are leaning forward a little bit more than I was. Okay. Because it's not really too much where your foot is, it's where the knife ends up. So if it lands like this, step back, it goes like that. If it lands like this, step forward. Got it. If it lands like that, well, you're halfway between. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. All right, here we go. Ready? You're going to get this one. One, two. Oh! It's stuck. All right, let, stuck. Me, let, me, let me try it one more time. Now, are you doing it like blade up or blade down? Blade up. That's why I'm throwing this one blade here. Blade up, okay. Because then it's going to come around and stick in your traditional blade down curvy yeah. configuration. Okay. Got it. What's the stance? Is the stance good? I, I'm totally digging on the total wide, you know, superhero uh, stance. Well, you, know what, you know what it is? Doing some lunges Th there? This is from the fire eating because it's so important. Uh, oh, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't want to, like, when you tilt your head back, it, you don't want to be, you know, trying to keep your balance. Okay. You flicked your wrist. I did flick my wrist. I caught Busted. you. I've learned so many okay. bad habits from movies. You're going to have to undo all of them. Ready? Yeah. That's yeah! It, okay. Look at all right, all right, all right. So, so, so yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be like Brian. What was that flick? I totally saw a flick there. Yeah, yeah I flicked. Yeah, you yeah, flicked. Yeah, I did. Little, you little flicked. Flick. Little flick. You flicker. Okay. Okay. You hit with the back of the knife. Yeah. Look at where your foot is. You're at six feet. We're doing five? Try to five. Just in your mind, you, you're going to end go. and then point. Yeah! A little bit more power, that was stuck in. Go back about half step, half step back. Uh, boy, I, that's actually really good advice because once I start thinking of that, like you could definitely see it was kind of almost rotated. Yeah. Yeah. You just had a little you more just room. You need a little bit more room to rotate there. So it's all in the distance. I never thought yeah. it was that simple. Yeah! Oh, come on, stay! <laughs> <laughs> That's yes! it right there. Oh, Dude, right that looked away. amazing. All right, here, I gotta go one more time. All I right. like your tip of just acting like you're gonna point. Yeah. yeah. That really that helped me through. out. Because you're holding it so far out. Got it. Try choking up just a little bit. So like that. I, here. Nope. Bring it up and back. You're going right. all the way around, up and back, up and back. Got it. So, okay, so don't overdo it on the... Oh, yeah. yeah. No, that's different. You were doing a little bit of sidearm. Yeah. yeah, you're just, blah, it's not baseball. It's like... I, I could feel the difference, though. I could see what you're talking about. Yeah. There, there we yeah. go. Boy, it really helps to be going one after another like that. Yeah. yeah. You get adjust. Here, you try it. Uh, you were about five and a half is, what I think, where you, where you were throwing this. Oh, like right there? Yeah. That's it? Yes! Oh! That's it, yeah. Bad ass. All right, so it feels really good. It's super <laughs> satisfying. All right, so now I guess we have to do a full rotation. We're gonna try. Hold on, how far? Three it's, feet. Yeah, for three, a half rotation. Three feet from the one we let go for a half rotation. Six feet for a full rotation. Okay, so we're gonna back which up. Which means I'm now at eight feet. Got it. Wow. Wow. Yes. Oh! 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 <laughs> you killed the board. Holy I think I'm cow. just gonna make the quick note of why I keep these boards in here so. Loosely is because I mean I'm gonna replace these after today, just us throwing. That's a good thing. So it matters the materials. Like you got a soft pine wood here, yeah, right? Yeah, these are just regular two by sixes from Home Depot. Okay, so I'm gonna move my hand. Yeah, please. <laughs> uh, all right. Take a look. Does that look like six feet from the moment I let go? A little over, but a little okay. over, but yeah. the, right, way, the way you throw. Ah, uh, take yeah, a step all back. Right. Scary. Scary. It's just <laughs> scary to throw knives. Like it just like my advice would be practice with nobody around, so there's n you could focus only on the throwing part. So you're still kind of pinching. Is that is that how you would hold a knife? Yeah. No, I guess not. No, yeah. it's not Wingardium Leviosa here. Well, you know what it is is when you, when you throw a card, you want to hold as little of the card as you can. True. So the momentum flings itself, but but that's not the case with these. This right? is not a card. You are threatening this board with this knife. You have it here in your hand. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> Take that, you board! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> that first knife hit hilt first. Yeah, okay. Go up seven foot. Okay, got it. I'm gonna get you. Damn! Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> I can't wait. See, that? holding it like this, <laughs> holding it like, 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 like full on, you're, it's hard for me to time. You're still just letting it go just, out yeah, of your hand. Because I, like, your, yeah, because if your hand is down here, that's where the knife's gonna go. Sure, sure. Aim okay. up. All right, ready? One, 
two, three. Closer. 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 All right, good. Here you go. <laughs> now remember, you're gonna you want to release at about six feet. So okay. I normally stand between eight and seven feet. All right. Try this time. Uh, when you let go, just your hand freezes the entire time, like you're gonna shake hands yeah. with the board. Truck. So close. So close. You have a sticker. Just something we can make so you actually have a target. Because sometimes simply aiming at the target is gonna help you a little bit. I'm calling it! That counts! That counts. That counts! Yeah, you know, we're gonna try something a little bit different with you guys. So these are some axes Jason got on Amazon. Yeah, they were like $13. Dude. You got this nice spike back here, so if you do land it like that, it'll stick. Uh, these are also at about a foot. So the same length rules matter. Technically same should dynamics, apply. Same dynamics, yeah. Okay. yeah. That hit, boop, like yep. that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go forwards a little bit. Wow! Now I can already feel the paracord on this trying to give away. Oh, sure. So that's probably not gonna last. Well, for $13, I'm surprised they didn't just explode into shards of yeah. metal. Oh, one thing I will say about these, I just like this. Whoa! Because <laughs> it got the little hook Slow down there, cowboy. Ha! Dude! It's fine, it's fine. It's fine. Mm. I mean, your accuracy is like spot on. It's amazing. Right there on the target, your king of uh, backwards hatchet throwing. Brian. Uh, okay, I'll give it a try. Maybe maybe I was born for these. Yeah, it hit the with the butt every single time there. How? Can you throw multiple ones at one time? Yes. <laughs> We're not getting there now. These have a lot of bounce back. We're about to have to wrap this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. I want to try something. All right, what you got? You're gonna do three at once? Yeah. Oh, there's no way this goes well. Nope. It's not gonna go well at all. But I gotta try it. <laughs> it's great. It's great. Here, uh, you know what? While we're at it, we're just throwing trash everywhere. Why not? All right, here we go. <laughs> so the big takeaways is I'm surprised at number one how much a tiny variation in your throwing technique or your posture makes a huge difference. Well, there's a lot of things that go into it. It's force, it's the technique of your throw, it's how you're holding it, it's the distance that you are from your target, your posture. There is a lot that goes into the consideration of this. I would imagine it's the kind of thing that nothing but just lots of practice and training will get us to consistency, right? Exactly. It changes with the weather even. It's not as easy as I'd hope. This is gonna do it, it's gonna be amazing. Just get ready, right? Uh, okay. Very close. It was close. very close. To us? To nail it. Uh, yes, okay. Maybe there's people walking past over there. Yeah. Uh, Hi, how you doing? I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen on the deep web? <laughs> the modern road explores the deep web. So the deep web is different from the dark web. Yes, the dark web is a subset of the deep web where you find Pornography that's illegal on most planets and sorcery and drugs. Pain, yeah. So if the content is not illegal and generally frowned upon, generally frowned upon, that's not harsh enough. <laughs> evil. <laughs> evil and frowned upon. <laughs> but the deep web itself is just like, it's an internet under the internet. Yeah, it's not indexed by any search engines. It's not on a DNS server. Uh, like, it's not like you go to badsite.url or something. Correct, yeah. You can't click a link to go there. So how do you get there? You have to have a specific browser called the Tor browser. All right, now this is the one, if I remember correctly, it's it's relatively anonymous. It keeps everything highly diversified, right? Yes, it's all about privacy and avoiding censorship. So if you're in an economically unstable area, like during a war or something, or there's an uprising, almost everybody's using the Tor browser to connect with each other because the other side can't find them, right? Exactly, or maybe a fascist government has cracked down on internet access. You can use the Tor browser and a few other little things we're gonna show you to get around that. So this is the thing, is I think about using using my desktop computer to, you know, you get Tor and all this stuff, but I would love it if everything was perfectly encapsulated and I knew it was totally divorced from the rest of my main system. Yes, so we are going to install the Tails OS. I'm assuming this is some kind of Linux thing? Yes, it stands for the Amnesic Incognito Live System. 
oh, this is great. So that means it forgets it, it doesn't show who you are, yes. and it's alive. It does <laughs> it's not. A live system. <laughs> yes, it's an AI. No. It doesn't leave any sort of footprint on the device that you're using it on. So this entire thing, it's like having a, a miniature computer in a USB disk, you put it in and you boot to it. It's a self-contained environment, you browse anonymously, and when you take it out, there's no trace. Yes, and the Tails OS comes with the Tor browser. All right, where do we go? We're gonna go to tails.boum.org. All right, so this is it. We just download this. Yes, but yeah, you just go to this install. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, this is definitely holding your hand, making this as easy as possible. It is so simple. So all you need is two USB sticks, a couple two of hours. hours. It does take a long time to download the ISO, which is the full program encapsulated in a single file. Now you're gonna wanna download it from Firefox or from BitTorrent because there's an extension on Firefox that validates that the ISO is legitimate and you're not downloading a bomb onto your computer. <laughs> that would be an impressive feat. Someone set us up the bomb. Install Firefox add-on. This is easy. Deep web, here I come. Now we can download the ISO of Tails. Yeah, right on. Save. 100, 200 minutes, we got some time. <laughs> oh boy, Wi-Fi, am I right? It will walk you through a USB installer to put the Tails OS on a USB drive. This USB drive. So we just need to boot to this. Now most computers don't default to boot to the USB device, so we're gonna have to go into the BIOS to change that, Correct. right? Hurry, feds are outside. Oh jeez. <laughs> I was like, what, what do we got? <laughs> that explodes in 20 seconds. Yeah. Ah! This first, save changes. There we go. This is the moment. It's flashing, I think that's good. Ah! There we go. Boot tails, go live. Yes. I, mean, I really hope we did all this right. <laughs> oh my God, we accidentally ordered the drugs. <laughs> I cannot believe how svelte this operating system is. The fact that everything's running just off of a 16 gigabyte thumbstick. I think it might actually be eight gigabytes. Oh really? Yeah. Jeez. Dude, D uh, welcome to tails. God, I feel like we're in some foreign land. And here it is, right? And it's just so lean and sleek. Yeah, all right, so I'm gonna assume that whatever I want is in home. It says Tor browser. Is there something in there? No. Well, you can go to applications and pull oh, up. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. Tor is not ready. Start anyway, just yeah. go. Nothing will go wrong <laughs> here. Oh, we're not connected. Oh, yeah. Smart. Smart. Yeah. You have to be connected to Wi-Fi. You have to be connected to the I'm internet. I'm gonna do this little uh, this little thing here. Whoa, 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 whoa! We're connected. What? We're there. Uh, okay. I assume we can surf regular sites. The regular internet is still there. Yeah. It's... Google doesn't know where we are. Correct. It's not tracking us. There's no cookies. It can't find us. I mean, I suppose if we had committed a crime, they would help find us. But but basically, we're invisible as far as that matters. I believe so. Look at this. Look at this. What is my IP address? This one says we're here. This one says we're 66249. Speed test is 17125. Okay. Is it spoofing IP addresses? Well, that's the thing is it distributes it. So the question, what is my IP address? Each request goes from different places. This is all the surface internet because we're still using uh, uh, DNS services, right? Correct. Now, most of the sites that we are going to want to look at on the Tor browser are dot .onion sites. Okay, how do you find the dot .onion sites? That's a little more tricky. You have to use some of the more clever search engines like DuckDuckGo or go look on Reddit. I have an address for a hidden wiki that has a lot of sites indexed on there that oh, you can great. go to. Yeah, what, what is that one? <sighs> okay. Uh, D-I-R-N-X-X-D-R-A-Y-G-B-I-F-G-C <laughs> dot onion. Mm. Does it like it? I don't know. That's a hell of a onion name. You, you don't call them URLs, right? Or I guess it is a URL. Yeah, I guess so, right? All right, all right. This is new territory for me. This reminds me of the old days of being on CompuServe and 2400 baud modems when it right. was all just person to person. Oh, oh, oh! Hey! Onion directory, deep web link directory. Yes! So we can go to DuckDuckGo, Onion Wiki, Tor Projects, a non-net web proxy. Bitcoin sites. Of course. Oh, here's one that's called Project Evil. I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> oh, man. Discounted electronics goods. Think about it. If you're in a country where you can't import certain things, you can now access it. Here's one that's uh, UK guns and ammo. Hitman, Hitman Network. Who oh boy. Tor Betcoin. Gambling's illegal a bunch of places. Marketplace drugs. Jesus Christ. Marketplace this drugs. is all dark. You said we were going to the deep web. This is dark web. We took a, we took a wrong turn. Now we're talking. 
Look at these blogs. Deep Web Radio, Encyclopedia Dramatica, Scientology Archive. Yeah, because Scientology, all of their stuff is copyrighted. This is an archive of stuff that will not get shut down. Wow. Smokables, buy this organic cannabis. Forums and chans. I'd like to avoid all chans oh for now. Email messaging, political. Yeah. Now we're talking. Bugged planet. Erotic. <laughs> <laughs> Kerosene! Yeah. No! There's a lot of nefarious, terrifying things going on here. Marketplace, let's take a look at Marketplace commercial services here. No. Are you hi? I'm, what do you think is in there? I'm just, I, I don't know. Like, no. Rare issues of Power Man and Iron People who never want to be found. Out of print Spider-Man comics. All right. WikiLeaks! WikiLeaks. I never thought I'd be so happy to find WikiLeaks. <laughs> I'm like, what are we gonna see? Yeah, why can't we connect to anything? Tor browser is way slow because that's the trade-off for security. You can't do the cached local things. Right. It's gotta send it all the way to France and over to India and then come around. And Deep web radio's up. All right, all right. See, there we go. I don't know what's forbidden about any of this. See, that's just it. It's not about what's forbidden, although that's certainly a part of it when it comes to the dark web. But this is about maintaining your privacy. And there's lots of really good reasons people want their privacy. You have people who are in abusive relationships. You have people on the run from stalkers. You have people whose sexual orientation isn't acceptable where they live. This is a way where they can connect with other people and feel safe. Ah, so it doesn't involve buying guns or drugs not, or people. It doesn't necessarily involve but that's, uh, in fact, you know what? I'm gonna go back to safe land. You're missing the point. This is safe land. I wanna go to fast land okay, where I can enough. get stuff immediately. Should we have Trevor for this? <laughs> I feel like we should have Trevor for this. Let's promise that we never ever tell Trevor what we're doing. He'll be so disappointed he in us. He will be sorely disappointed. <laughs> the modern road makes prison wine. All right, so I suppose safety warnings right out the gate. Nobody should try this at home. We are not telling anybody that this is safe, smart, or something they should try. This is an awful idea, and it's gonna be real gross. Oh my God, uh, yeah. All right, so we're making prison wine, AKA Pruno. And there are a bunch of other names, but Pruno is the most popular one. Now we made our own homebrew beer using the Rogue's Brew Kit. And for that, it was a case of, you know, you had the wort and the mash and the, and the, the yeast and the hops. And basically yeast eats sugar, poops out CO2 and alcohol, right? Yes. But this is not the technique we're using to make this alcohol? No, because in prison, you have far fewer ingredients. This is basically just rotted fruit and sugar. Oh God, what yeah. are we doing? Yeah, it's like those videos you see online of the raccoon that ate all of the fruits on the vine. Sure, yeah. And was drunk and stumbling around. Yeah. That's what we're gonna do. Right, okay, so let's get started. It is a lengthy process, but first we're gonna start off by putting 10 peeled oranges into a Ziploc bag. Okay. Is this gonna fit That's in there? That's it, no, let's, jeez. <laughs> These are already pretty ripe. Yeah, it's almost full. So 10 peeled oranges. Right. An eight ounce can of fruit cocktail. With all, with all the syrup and everything? Yeah, sure, why not? That's where the good stuff is. I don't even eat the fruits in fruit cocktail. You I just, just drink, drink the, the syrup. Goop. Ugh. All right. Now, I don't know why. No, no. <laughs> Six teaspoons. Six teaspoons? Of ketchup. I'll bet that it's for the, um, the vinegar in there. Oh, sure. The vinegar probably helps to keep it from getting super infected or something. Keeping or level? Does it matter? And this is supposed to be good? No, it's not. But it should result in something that is anywhere from 2% alcohol by volume to 14% alcohol okay, by volume. Okay, all right, all right. Is that six? Yep. And now, more sugar. Of course. 50 cubes of sugar. Are you kidding me? Yeah, not on the diet at all. Oh, uh, okay. This is all just pure sugar. Oh, there you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven. And that's six more. Now the most popularized recipe for this comes from a poem called Recipe for Pruno, written by Jarvis Masters, okay. a death row inmate in San Quentin. 30, I wanna hear it. 45. This is Recipe for Prison Pruno, a poem by Jarvis Masters. Take 10 peeled oranges, Jarvis Masters. It is the judgment and sentence of this court. One eight ounce bowl of fruit cocktail. 
that the charged information was true. Squeeze the fruit into a small plastic bag. This doesn't rhyme at all. No, it doesn't, but oh, I'm gonna okay. stop I there. I don't wanna hear the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It's kind of depressing as well. Uh, okay, great. All right, so then now what? Now that we have most of our prime ingredients in here. Prime, that's the phrase. We're gonna zip it up, okay? You want to be careful not to puncture the bag, but we're going to start mashing it up. Okay, well, here, let's get rid of some of this air because I don't want it to oh, to pop, pop it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be Just... tough with the sugar, though, right? Well, here, once we start mashing, hopefully the liquids will dissolve we'll the sugar. We'll break down the sugar, yeah. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you got to get in there and, and really knead the sack. <laughs> knead the sack. Oh, God, you smell that ketchup. Like, it starts to smell good, and it's like, no, no, it's not. This is going to be tasty. I don't even know if we should ferment it. I think we should just drink it right now. Uh, you, you know what? I'm thinking right now is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> it is not going to get any better in a week. I think that looks good. It looks like a good consistency. Uh, okay. You really want to mash it up until it's like a paste. And now we're going to add 16 ounces of tap water. All right, do we have another bag? Yeah. Okay. We're adding how much? Two cups of water? Uh, yeah, 16 ounces. That is our batch. Now what we're supposed to do is heat it up. We need to run it under warm water for about 20 minutes or so. Okay, and we're trying to get it how warm? <laughs> Not hot. Not like it this, okay. Yeah. All right, warm it up, and then we're gonna wrap it up and store it away in darkness. That is important. I'm gonna start running this under warm water. All right, we got warm pulpy goop. And we don't have yeast, but there is bacteria in there. And what is that bacteria called? <laughs> Zymomonas mobilis okay. is one. I don't know if it's in there. I assume it is. It's one of the bacteria that will. There's also a fungus who has a name I cannot pronounce. But apparently fungus, bacteria, and yeast are able to create alcohol. So I'm going to assume bacteria is the agent in this one. And what does bacteria like? Sugar, uh, food, and, yes. and dark. Uh, yes. Because otherwise, uh, light has a sterilizing effect, it right? It propagate in warm, dark places. So we're going to wrap it up in this tarp. Okay. To keep it both warm and dark. And we're going to tuck it away. And now, every day, you're going to come out here and burp your baby and reheat it for about 15 minutes under warm water. I didn't realize I was in for the long haul on this. Now I have a commitment. You're going to do that every day for nine days. And then, I'm going to come back out here and we're going to toast. Uh, yeah. Uh, then we're gonna this, die. This, uh, okay, let's say, nutty idea, you're not a fan of the bacteria fermentation. You want something cleaner, you want something faster. I've heard there's an easier way using just yeast. Now, you're supposed to use champagne yeast, but I believe, theoretically, it should work just fine with baking yeast, so I figure we'll do two batches. This yeast is the yeast from a brewing kit that we have over at Scam Stuff. This yeast I just grabbed out of the kitchen, and you can use any fruit juice. You can, as long as it has 20 grams of sugar per serving, orange juice has like 45 grams of sugar per serving, so there should be plenty of sugar for the yeast in there, and if you use something like, a, you know, Welch's grape juice, that's like 35 grams per serving. So I got two containers, we basically just fill up the containers with orange juice. You don't want it filled all the way up because it will increase in volume as the yeast eats the sugar and releases CO2. You'll get foam coming out the top, so you want a gap up top. This one's gonna be so much easier and less illicit, isn't it? It's also gonna taste great and get us actually hammered and not send us to the hospital. Now, theoretically, if we're actual brewers, we should know exactly how many teaspoons of this stuff to put in. Mm -hmm. I just wanna experiment. This is what happens when an idiot tries it. Here, you try that one. Okay. Let's try a, qu a quarter teaspoon in there, and I'll do two of these for this since it's a bigger volume. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. There you go. All right, now you notice it's floating right on top, so we'll kind of get it mixed up, spread throughout. Okay. All right, now here's the thing. Over the next two or three days, that yeast is going to start eating sugar, pooping out alcohol, but it's also going to release CO2. Mm -hmm. So if you leave this sealed, it'll eventually explode. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways to handle it. We're going to do the fancy way with one of these proper valve stoppers. We're going to put a little bit of water in there so as the CO2 goes out, no contaminants get in. Oh, good. Okay. All right. And same thing with that. But let's say if you don't have one of these, you could just take a balloon and put it over the top. That latex barrier will keep outside things from corrupting the inside, and then also all that gas will just inflate. Now that stopper here, as this fills up with CO2, watch, the gas bubbles will uh, start letting it out like that. Oh, sure. So as soon as tomorrow, we should start seeing bubbles coming up, meaning it's fermenting. How long does this one take? Two to three days. Oh, really? Yeah. Much more easy. Yeah, safer, better. Get your hands on yeast. I do not trust that bacteria doing the job down there. And now we wait. Yeah. Ten days. 
burp this thing like a nasty, filthy, petulant, diaper-soaked baby. You didn't. You had someone else do I it. I did it like half the time. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Did, you, uh, did you dip into the stash? No, oh, God. No, okay. No. There were flies buzzing around this thing. Really? And every time you open, I want it's double bag. You burp it and just, just take a little aromatic whiff. Okay. Whew. It's, uh, stings the nostrils. It may, uh, it's pungent. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> it's just a bunch of rotted fruit that's been in ketchup that's been kept warm. Okay, what do we do with it now? What do we do with it now? Okay, we gotta run it through a strainer. We have to run it through some cheesecloth. All right, well, let's yeah. get to it. All right, cheesecloth strainer coming up. Okay. Oh, God. I'm just gonna dump it. Okay, let me make sure I hold it. Yeah, tighten it up. Oh, there we go. Good, God, good, good. Bowl Got it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, God. Oh, it's splashing on me. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I can't escape the stench. <coughs> well, you know what comes next. Do you have a rough time? Uh, a little bit. Because that's going in our bodies. <laughs> yeah, do we need to squeeze it? Grab those opposite edges for me so we can okay. lift up like a bag. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna get in there and do it, man. It's a thing. I'm just doing it. This, this is probably the worst thing oh. that we've done on this show. Yep, yep, yep. More than we'll ever, ever need. Here, uh, put it, there we go. I just don't want any of this to splash anywhere. That's where I have to be very, very careful not to spill any. Oh. See, it doesn't look bad. Holy crap, man, we did it. We made prison wine. We did. This is authentic prison grade hooch. Is it safe? No. <laughs> what do you mean, no? Considering that this is a lot of mold and bacteria, it's rotten fruit. You can get botulism and die. Right. Uh, that was a good experiment, and we made some damn fine prison wine. If this was a laboratory, if I could vouch for everything being clean, I might be tempted to give this a try, but I definitely saw fruit flies crawling in and out of that thing as it sat in a corner of this warehouse for 10 days straight. And if you're telling me that botulism's on the menu, I'm gonna say good on us for having made that. But I am super stoked to try these. The Pruno fermented over 10 days using bacteria and mold. This is using yeast, so it only takes two to three days. So I came back two days ago and remade this. The big one has the brewing yeast in it, the small one had the baker's yeast. And I don't know if it's just the container size, but look at the difference in how much outgassing is happening on the fancy yeast. Yeah, this one's practically percolating and this one's really not doing it much at all. Yeah, it's hard to know how much booziness is right. in there. I'm guessing that this will taste just like old warm orange juice. This one I expect to have some kick and actually be pretty good. Okay. All right, you down for this? Yeah. Now this one, unlike the Pruno, is perfectly safe. <laughs> you ain't gonna get me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far, as far as I know, two day old orange juice with some yeast in it, I don't think is gonna kill us. I don't recommend anybody try any of this at home. Do your own research, don't blame us. But I do know that there are commercial products that are intended to do exactly what we're doing. So I have to assume it's not that bad. What a ringing endorsement. <laughs> I have to assume it's not that bad. Put that on the label. <laughs> yes. Here's to swimming with bow legged women. Oh my God. Just tastes like orange juice. Tastes like orange juice. Yeah. And you can taste the yeast. You can definitely smell the yeast. Yeah. I normally have an okay palate when it comes to tasting when there's alcohol in something. If you gave this to me, I would just assume it's sparkling orange juice. Meanwhile, this guy's a roiling cauldron. All right. They're singing to us, Jason. Now this looks clearer. I'm tempted to think. Oh, it's fizzing. No. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, wow. You can smell the hoochiness. Oh yeah. <laughs> that, this really doesn't smell much different than that. Not to me. It, it, it smells way, way different. Yeah. Maybe, I'm, maybe it was the notes of ketchup I was getting from the other <laughs> one. This one seems fine. It has a good nose on it. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, very different. Yeah, so uh, way more bubblier. Mm -hmm. This is super sparkling orange. Not as sweet? Not nearly as sweet, which tells me that this yeast has been doing its job. Right. Munching up the sugar, pooping out the alcohol. Uh, these guys are lazy bastards all just hanging out of the bottom. I'm not feeling it yet, but 
I mean, it seems to me like if you're gonna go to prison, might as well smuggle some yeast up your butt <laughs> for when you're there. This gets a huge thumbs up. So I'm gonna say, if you wanna do this at home, Number one, do your research. Number two, get some champagne yeast or brewer's yeast and uh, go to town. This was this was exactly two days, and I, I put a whole bunch in there. I wanted to make sure that this was working. And it's easy. It doesn't require any babysitting. No, uh, this one required nothing. That one was uh, demon scary, but, but this one was great. I don't think Trevor would approve. <laughs> we want to bring him a jug. <laughs> Hey, are you digging the Modern Rogue? Well, you can support us directly by buying a t-shirt at shop.themodernrogue.com. We got three designs. So what do you think of when you think of nunchucks? Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. I always think of that in like Chinese connection. Yeah. Also Michelangelo. Oh, I thought you meant the painter. <laughs> no one thinks, oh, the painter anymore. The Modern Rogue makes nunchucks out of magazines. All right, you told me we're making actual nunchucks, but I'm looking at cardboard paper tubes, I'm looking at magazines and a bunch of bookbinder clips. You pinky promise this is a legit weapon we're making. Yes, this is the recipe from John Austin in his book, Mini Weapons of Mass Destruction, Build and Master Ninja Weapons. Okay, now we made the Millwall brick and we've made a prison spear, so I know enough to not just laugh out of court this idea of a magazine being a weapon. Exactly. These are gonna hurt. They might not be as formidable as something made of compressed wood or metal, but they are going to be dangerous. All right, walk me through it. Now you want to get the magazines where they're roughly the same size for each of your sticks. We'll have these two magazines match with these two. And you wanna get them lengthwise on the spine Roughly even. There you go, let's use these guys. Yeah. So I assume we roll this up? Yeah, roll it up as tightly as possible. Look at that. Holy crap. Mm. You, did, mm. yeah, you did really well. Master roll it. Here, hold this, I'll roll yours. All right, here, why don't we tape, tape it first? Oh. And just wrap it up really good. Keep it as tight as possible. You just twist around, twist around, twist around. Got it. Other side. Look at that. Ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Swap me, swap me. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Wait, really? Yeah, no, that's okay. serious. All right. That's serious. Good. All right. All right. Now, another one of these? Yeah, well, yeah, let's go ahead and do the other stick. There you go. Okay. Got it. All right, now we've got these. Pretty sturdy, right? Sure. Now we're going to take these and we're going to cut them lengthwise. And this is going to act as kind of a sheath for these. Okay. Right? So, and that's assuming that this isn't, yeah, I guess this will It's fit. not going to fit all the way around. Got it. Right? We're just going to cut it right up the middle. And then just. Like a wrap around? Yep. See how that works? Yeah, and then just what? Run run then, tape down the side? Then, well, probably want to wrap it tightly again. Oh, yeah. Wow, this is gonna yeah. be menacing. You see? It's the world's deadliest candy cane. And then we could just put a band at the top and the bottom? Yeah. What do you think? Dude, it's so looking, far, looking right? great. Looking great. Yeah. Feel that heft. Yeah. Okay, all right. right, wow, wow. Yeah? Sorry I hit you as hard as I did. All right, we got another sheath? Uh, yes, right here. Here, I'll hold it, you wrap. All right, got it. Okay, right. now this part gets a little bit difficult. We gotta get the drill. Yeah? With the quarter inch drill bit. You want thicker or? Let's just do a pilot hole with this. Okay. The instructions say to drill in at angles that intersect. Well, what size are these? You have the two inch binder rings that you wanna thread through with the hole we're going to drill. Here, do me a favor. I'm gonna drill in. You hold this kind of right there. Okay. So I can see roughly what I'm trying to get through. Oh good, once again, I'm holding something while Brian wields a power tool. I mean, name one time we got injured on set. Just one. Wow, it is harder to right. get through than you would expect. All right, that's all the way through. Well, yeah. Tougher, tougher than you thought. <laughs> well, here, we have a shortened drill bit now. Okay. All right, line it up again. Yeah, look. That's why you always have a backup drill bit. And probably goggles. <laughs> We've got oh, them. oh, oh. Yeah? Yeah, you can feel it poked all the way through. Nice. So now the question is can we line it up on this other side? Ideally, 
you'd like for the connector part to be on the outside yeah. so that you can tape them together to make sure that the clasp doesn't come undone. Easier said than done though, yeah. right? Yeah, here, tell me how you like that. Oh, Jesus. Well, this is what we're gonna have to do, oh, okay, right? Okay, all right, I didn't know. You just had the intense, you had the eye of the tiger. I know, stop, it's terrifying. It's pretty sturdy. Right? This isn't the right way, but I mean, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call that. That's on yeah? super hard, yeah. right? I mean, I was giving it some decent swing. Okay, we'll do the same thing again. Okay. This is not a toy. And you we should tell them it's not a toy. You thought it was gonna be a silly I, like children's I, party I activity. Totally did. Oh, it's close. I could, yeah, I can feel the vibrations on the uh, the ring as it gets closer. All right. What do you think of that? Okay, I'm gonna put it through the test again. All right. Probably shouldn't have taken the goggles off. <laughs> oh no, it's too close. I don't like it. I don't like it. Ooh. Oh, it did come up? It okay. Did. So if we're doing this properly, it should go all the way through. You should be able to thread yeah. it all the way across. I think our sticks might be a little too thick to pull that off. We also could have used a bigger drill bit. You want to? We could. All right. That'll do. So what we actually have is we have one going all the way down and then one going all the way down, crisscross. So I would imagine it should form a tunnel that this could go all the way through, right? Here, I'm actually just gonna kind of warp it a bit. Okay. Ah, there we go. There we go. Nicely done, Just sir. like in the movies. And you wanna get it around so that we can tape it really good. Oh, really? Yeah. There we go. Look at that. That will work. Do we wanna do the other one? the same way or, or we feel good about this? Well, let's go ahead and tape that clasp yeah, so closed. Let's start with super tiny. I'm yeah. gonna thread this in. So if it's tight enough, it should keep that hinge on there okay. All right, dude, that thing is bound right. on there. We've got the two inch rings threading through the top of our sticks. Okay. And then we're going to connect them with three of the one and a half inch rings. Got it. And you can buy a giant box of these on Amazon. So I assume we want to tape these clasps shut as well, right? Yes, absolutely. Should we name her? Oh, Loretta. Loretta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, I want to believe is silly, but I don't think it's about to look silly when you use it. I believe you're set. Go for it. No, Show you first. Show me your skills. No, you first. What? Please. Oh, geez. Wow, these are heavy. Yeah. These are heavy. They're a little bigger than I'm used to. What? Uh -huh. Oh, see, yeah, see that you go like here? Yeah. And you, but the problem is you stop, right? Like, and you gotta get accustomed to the weight and the balance of it. You've got this. Right? I know like, like, like you I don't, forward I don't. and back if you wanna look like you know what you're doing. I've never taken any martial arts classes, but. But this looks that pretty looks like much. looks like good form. This looks, yeah? Let's see, let's see. Okay. Show me your goods. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> yes! So that answers our question from before, whether or not we should finish drilling it with a bigger drill bit. The yep. answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, science, people. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. All right, you got a, one of these that's a little less broken. <laughs> So I guess we should encourage people, just go ahead and buy the box. You're gonna need them. Yeah, we've destroyed three of them so far. Oh, oh there it is! Got it! Bada bing bang. Boy, that's a, that's a bigger pain in the butt than you would expect. Right. And it, it, it does get a little bent on the way through, yeah. but you can kind of bend it back into shape. Same trick, we'll seal it up. As everyone dons their helmets. You feel like that's sturdy? I think so. Do you want to take it for another spin? Sure. If I could show my hilariously slow it's, motion skills. Oh, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's good. <laughs> what? What? All right, take it away. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. You and me both. We made those extra deadly. Yeah. Dude, you've got real? We need to glue oh, the it bindings. Was, no, it was, this was actually one of the smaller ones. Yeah, now. I know. It's like we got to figure out a way to clip those extra hard. So the problem is, is we have too much mass swinging around. Yeah. And these guys aren't up to the to the stress. So the tape itself just 
broke. Just tore. Yeah. Double up all the way through. Double, double, double. Two. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then two. And then two. With them bound like that, we could even tape them individually and as pairs. Yes. This is why true ninjas don't make nunchucks out of duct tape. Yeah, they go to... Like, the, nun, the nunchuck store. The nunchuck store, They go to yeah. Jimmy Nunchucks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jimmy Nunchucks. You tired of using duct tape for magazines? Come on down to Jimmy Nunchucks. You can beat some ass like a pro. And then now, I'm gonna bind them together. This has to be it. Has to be it, right? We can't mess it up three times in a row. Show me your ninja skills, sir. I'm not, I'm not great. No, right? give me your chuck skills, bro. All right. Oh man, I deep. Ah, they're heavier than I thought. <laughs> I deeply, oh! <laughs> I will never, okay? I will never break into your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're far heavier than they need to be. You think that's our problem? I think that's a huge part of the problem. You wanna try making a small one real fast? Let's try making a small one Might real even fast. be faster? Yeah. Uh, all right. Two sticks. Oh, with just these? Yeah. Oh, all right, we're taking up individual magazines this time. You know what, that does work. That'll be just fine. And once it's in there, it settles and it opens itself up. I'm thinking that maybe we should have cut it so they would be smaller because uh, as it unfurled and it would be smaller and tighter. All right, this is much, much tighter this time. And we'll get the ends first. Yeah, that's gonna work a lot better. So the ridiculously overmassed ones, not so good. Yeah, that's actually more like nunchuck size. Much easier. Yeah. You still want a double link? Yeah. Seems like it couldn't hurt, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. I think you have a set of real chucks here. Feel better about these? Yes. 2.0. Yeah. Loretta 2.0. Take right. it away. You, you want oh, to? Oh, you want yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that feels much. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. See? All right. All right. So it's like I'm feeling. There we go, there we go, okay. All right. All right, take it away, boss. Okay, they always break with me. I know, it's because your skills are too tight. I don't think that's the case at all, right? Boy, you really do, you swing them hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I never can get. Oh, I just know it's yeah. gonna break on me. Woo, 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 woo. Wow! Oh, holy cow, I, I, I give up, I give up, I give up. I, I, you can have your stereo back. <laughs> People who know how to use this oh, are looking at me their like, ass off. Look That's at fine. this asshole. All right, here we go. We gotta do one test. Oh, yes, All yes. Right. All right, hold on, out of the way, out of the way. Yeah! Look at that! Yes! That's amazing! <laughs> oh my god! All right. That's brutal! Let's just All go right. straight back. Yeah, okay, great. A new challenger approaches, Brian. Ah, my old nemesis. Stay Come on, get up. <laughs> okay, all right. Oh, wait, I'm come on. I'm gonna hit the... All right. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Look at this, we're hitting so hard, it's pulling Ooh. the magazine part out. So that's interesting. So you wanna make sure that the duct tape's over the top too. Yeah. All right, so we could do that. I should probably hit it like in this direction. Let me just hit this one more time. All right. You forgot this, you have to do this. Oh geez, you know what? I forgot to <laughs> get away is what I forgot to do. All right. Wow! <laughs> you can see the individual ridges and folds as it rippled in there, that's amazing. Super effective? Super effective. Oh, okay. <laughs> what is one? Nice! All right, I gotta, was, I gotta take another smack. It was super fun. Yeah. The neighbors probably not enjoyed this. Well, they can come over and take it up with us if they want. You're like, is there a problem? <laughs> oh, were you noisy? Da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> 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 wow. 
And we're done. And we're done. Man, I miss the Cold War. No, said nobody ever. <laughs> No, there was something you felt alive when you were worried about. No, you felt scared and alone because the world was going to end at any moment. The modern road intercepts the signal. I can't remember the first time I heard of a number station, but I was fascinated by the idea the moment I heard it. Oh, yeah, I actually found one. I was about 11 years old. I said, let's go to the place where none of the songs are, but all of the weird noises live. Oh, of course, because you had those giant 1980s jam boxes with shortwave radio on there. Yes. I thought, is this the launch codes? Because I was watching War Games. Games. Of course, Cloak of course, and dagger, right? you know. <laughs> so if I understand correctly, shortwave number stations are one-way communications to field operatives out there doing espionage stuff all over the world. The idea is you send a message that the whole world can hear, but there's only one person that it's impactful for. That's the prevalent theory. Now, no government has ever even acknowledged that they are in any way affiliated with any number stations. They started to appear after World War II, and they were all over the place. There are still many of them that are active. You can find some of them from Cuba, Korea, what used to be the Eastern Bloc in Europe, wow. all over the world. They're still active. How they work according to an alleged ex-CIA operative. An operative out in the field will have a one-time pad or an OTP. All right, so a one-time pad is a set of pages with random numbers on there that there's only one copy of, or I guess two copies of. The sender and the receiver have one. Exactly. And they know that this is page, we're on page 53, we're gonna do it, and I'm gonna encode it with this pad, you have that pad, nobody else in the world knows, now we're gonna tear up those pads and they're gone. Right, because shortwave radio, anyone can pick it up. Sure. Even the bad guys, but they won't know what they're listening to. Well, dude, I wanna hear some of this. Where can we find out where the number station are. We have a shortwave radio. Okay, all right. I assume that somewhere on the website, yeah. on the website, the internet. Yes. One of the more prevalent ones is HF Underground Spy Numbers Forum. Look at this. Look at all this activity just yeah. in the last few days. They're a little difficult to decipher when you're first looking at it, but a lot of these number stations have designations like E11A or, or S11A. And then you have like your date. Now, UTC is a U universal the, time code, right? Exactly. So these are people logging the times of the messages and recording the messages and sharing them for the purpose of trying to decode them? Or maybe this is just a hobbyist, like a, a cool curiosity? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Everyone always hopes that they're going to be able to decode it or something like that. Yeah. But I think rational people understand the futility of that exercise. Sure. <laughs> Let's find something to find on the shortwave radio. Okay. So here's a log that says unknown CW number station. Uh, <gasps> Oh, that's, that's FM. FM. <laughs> <laughs> I got excited. We got for one. A <laughs> like, you know, now that the Cold War's over, they're just having a good time with this. <laughs> they're still celebrating yeah, 30 years later. Exactly. <laughs> the wall came down. <laughs> so, one of the things about the number stations is that they are always broadcast at regular intervals. Like, there's one out of Cuba that broadcasts on four different frequencies. It'll do one, and then five minutes later, it'll do the next one. The exact same message. Yeah. And again, then it won't do it again for another two hours or another four hours and it only does it on Tuesdays and Thursdays or only on Wednesday mornings at 6 a.m. UTC, that kind of thing. Got so it. there are very regular schedules because the spy has to know exactly when it's coming well, on. And if he or she misses the one opportunity, he has to know where he can go to get it in the next, uh, you know, four or five opportunities. Exactly. It's a little difficult to find one. Plus, there are atmospheric conditions because the way shortwave radio works, it broadcasts from between 1.6 megahertz and 30 megahertz. Yeah. Right above the medium wave AM band. You can actually bounce these off of the ionosphere through something called skip propagation. If you aim it at the sky when it transmits, and it can go, depending on atmosphere, atmospheric conditions to the other side of the world. Wow. So someone in, say, Spain might be able to pick up something that's broadcast out of Japan, but we may or may not be able to hear it. So that's the problem is all of this is super iffy. And this is what, like a $20, $30 shortwave radio? Yeah, any shortwave radio will do. You can even build these yourself. Well, let's see if we can tune something in on the shortwave. Okay, we'll start over on uh, the first band, way down at the end of it, at 5.7. This is like the worst white noise app ever. Yeah. 
So I got to be honest, it's going to be very difficult to catch something on this. We don't know exactly the frequency. We don't know what time. It's a poor antenna, uh, imprecise controls. This could be an exercise in futility. I can't help you with the time, but I can help you with the precision, the controls, and the antenna. There is an online, totally free, super precise, high quality shortwave radio available to everyone. Okay, let's see it. Beep, beep. This is a shortwave radio anybody can use through their web browser, sponsored by the University of Twente in the Netherlands, and it is freaking amazing. Check this out. This waterfall shows you the entire spectrum of what's being transmitted all over the world right now. So here, let me... Uh... So right now we're dialed into kind of nothing, but you can see there's lots of activity down here. So here, I'll just click down here, and it's tuning in, and then check this out. You can zoom in. And it gives you, you can see, see all those different bands right there? Oh, wow. Those are individual transmissions from, uh, we'll call them legitimate sources, right? And it's so easy to use because you can even put in the frequency. Sure. So this is uh, Radio 1 Umbria in Madrid. This is a transmitter that was lowered into the deepest well in Siberia where they could listen to the sounds <laughs> of hell. Oh, hell, yeah. <laughs> So some of these you have like talk sport and so on, but you can actually intercept data transmissions over shortwave radio. So right now, all of these fine lines indicate these are discrete stations transmitting nonstop. These are like CNNs of radio basically, right? But check this out. If we go to the less populated parts of the spectrum, the stuff where stuff is a little more sporadic, like let's jump all the way up to some of this area. So here we go. In this case, we had something that was transmitting, but then it stopped and now it's starting again. So when we tune in over here, we don't know what that is. Something is transmitting and then stopping. So listen to this, and I bet you recognize it. Is that a slow scan television transmission? Yeah, this is data being transmitted over shortwave radio right now. It, it's astonishing. Just poking around in this thing has been a blast. It's like a black hole. I could spend all day just... This really helps you visualize all of the secret world that is all around us all the time. Well, and so much of the spectrum is being used at all times. That's the part that blows me away. So haunting. Is this when you start getting into the EVP frequencies where you can hear ghosts? <laughs> this tool alone is its own amazing wonderland. I would love for people to post in the comments anything of interest that we should check out yes. on the shortwave man. Yes, there's probably so many cryptic, weird, and fascinating bits of information. So as you tune into stuff, you hear the tones change based on your frequency. Mm -hmm. It sounds as though they're broadcasting those as beacons to let you know you're getting real, real close to the actual transmission. Ah, so we're very much dilettantes. There are people who dedicate their entire lives to understanding every little nuance to all this. Dude, I'm gonna dedicate the rest of my day to understanding what a dilettante is. Uh. <laughs> oh, that's the other thing. You can set how specific you want the tuning to be, whether it's kind of wideband. So if you narrow in on it, it's going to get more clearer and distinct. As long as it's a precise signal that you're receiving, sure. yeah. So weird. Now I can't find <laughs> oh my god, it's like you're tuning in an alien transmission. I feel like my nose is about to start bleeding. Across shortwave, you've got legitimate broadcast stations doing content of all varieties, whether it's talk or music or propaganda. You've got these slow scan television little data pulses going out. And if you're very, very lucky, the right place at the right time, you could run across a number station. What do they actually sound like? If you go back to the HF Underground spy numbers forums, sure. you can find where they've archived them because a lot of people will regularly listen to stations because they have the schedule. They know what frequency and when they're going to broadcast. Got it. And they'll wait and listen, and then they'll record what they hear, document it, and post it up on SoundCloud or YouTube. In fact, the most recent post here has an archive. This is an archive of uh, S11A. <laughs> And sometimes it's not even numbers, sometimes it's nursery rhymes or weird phrases. Like in the movie Red Dawn, when they're out in the woods and you hear them say, The chair is against the wall. Exactly. The chair is against the wall. Now let's find out what S11A is. Look at this, at uh, priam.org. S11A is called Cherta. It, uh, it's got several frequencies. It's active. It's a female automated with Polish accent voice. 
This is amazing. If you are prone to getting obsessed with unraveling mysteries, hold on, here's another audio sampling. That's so weird. Are we gonna do any more modern rogues or are you just gonna be obsessed with this? I don't know, I'm, I'm just gonna dive in. I wanna live in the short wave wonderland. This is incredible stuff. I mean, this is the haunting reality of being connected in a visceral way to the rest of the world. We understand theoretically on the internet that yeah, I guess we're all talking to each other, but this makes me feel it when you can just tune in and listen to everyone. This makes me feel that there are dangerous secrets happening all around us at all times. Uh, yes, yes. Awesome secrets like this. Didn't we hear this when we used the Ouija board? Yeah, yes. I could do this all day. Yeah. I could do this all day. Yeah. Get out. Get out of my basement. <laughs> I'm moving into Shore Wave Land. I'm going to get a ham radio license. <laughs> Call me KDK512 from now on. All right, KDK512. I'm going to go shoot the rest of the episodes for today. Bye. So I'm coming up on 20 years of drinking beer, and I still sound like an idiot every time I talk about it. Yeah, you sound really stupid. <laughs> All right, so that's too much. <laughs> the modern rogue knows how to talk about beer. All right, for all the beer that we drink, you and I, still don't really know a lot about it. Dude, this is why we got the experts. We got John Rubio and Grant Davis of The Beerists. Yes, award-winning podcast. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. It's a tasting show. We taste five beers every episode. There are four of us, and we describe the beer and give a recommendation of whether or not we think it's worth buying. I know you brought a lot of beers. Teach us how to sound smart about them. So beer is comprised of four ingredients. You got water, yeast, malt, and hops. And then there's two categories. You're gonna have lagers and you're gonna have your ales. Ales have a higher fermentation temperature, so you're gonna get a lot more esters, like fruity flavors, floral notes. And then lagers are gonna be a lot more malty and they're they're fermented in a cooler. Man, it sounds like I'm team lager. I, I never even knew I had a team until just now. What's the first one here? The first one's a Pilsner. You should expect this one to be crisp and lively, a little bit grassy and crackery in the flavor. It's a really refreshing beer. Firestone Walker's out of California. This one will be closest to the world we know of, oh, you mother <laughs> Yeah, crackers. That's good. So Pilsner's is gonna be closest to what most people think of when they think of American beer, right? Correct. This is like a yellowier PBR or something. Pilsners are what a lot of the American beers are modeled after. The Bud Miller Coors are modeled after those German Pilsners. I don't know how to properly taste beer. What are we looking for here? Put it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's four steps to see what you're liking about it. First is that you look at the color. You hold it up to the light, see if it's clear or hazy. This one has a golden straw color. Then you can check the aroma. Take a big old sniff there. We have these glasses because they're a lot better for aroma. You really want to smell the beer as much as you can because smell is the biggest part of taste, yeah. you know? And right. you really don't get the same amount of flavor when you drink straight from a can or a bottle. It's got a little bit of a grassy, crackery profile when you smell it. It's like light white floral notes in there. Mm -hmm. A little bit of honey. Then you taste it. Favorite part. <laughs> That's the best part. And then you can just kind of list off what you're tasting there. And then there's the after, because I'm because I because it's a different experience when you're tasting and then when it's over with. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> called the finish, actually. Okay. The finish of the beer is what is left over in your mouth after you've swallowed it. What are some of the other most common pilsners on the market? There are a lot of great pilsners from Germany. Pilsner Kell's one of them. Weinstefaner makes a bunch of them. It's, it's the most available beer style that you can get in Germany. Most of your German imports are Pilsners or Hefeweizens. So it's really easy to just stumble on to one of you go to the store. Jokes aside, what do you think of when you drink this? Refreshing. Yeah. But it's just really crisp and light and easy to drink. This is one for during the game. Yeah, and it's not heavy on your stomach. Yeah. It's good when you're hot. Goes great with pizza. Oh yeah. Like, really. This is the this, this is, is the, the beer you want for pizza. All right, what else we got? It's an IPA. It's Ballast Point Sculpin out of San Diego. I love IPAs. Yeah, that's a really good one. It's good to get very fresh. IPAs are very hoppy beers. They're ales and the amount of hops in there make it a pretty delicate beer as far as how it can be affected by time, by temperature, by all those things. Hops tend to degrade over time, so you really want an IPA as fresh as possible. It's a great gateway beer in order to move into a lot more of the stronger flavored craft beers. I had heard an IPA is an India Pale Ale because it has a higher alcohol content so it could make the trip to India, is that true? That was wrong. Damn. And also, <laughs> the thing that you're trying to say is that it was hoppier because hops are a preservative and it helped the 
the beer survival Same boat trip. I'm gonna drink to forget but that. But that's also a, that's also a myth. It's a widely held myth. Apparently, IPAs sprung up because people started enjoying the flavor of hops. This is a really good IPA. No, it's, oh wait, wait. So I remember. I paid attention. Oh, First, the color. Right. We got kind of a, a nice cloudy golden. Yeah, really rich golden. It's very saturated. Right. Then, then, then the nose. You can smell those hops yeah, for sure. Very citrusy, piney, a little bit of pineapple. Grapefruit. Taste. Yep. I don't actually get much on the taste. That's much smoother than I would expect from an IPA. Yeah. I mean, I still think this has a pretty good hop bite for the bitterness. It's like a lot of grapefruit pith, a lot of rinds, and then a little bit of caramel and pine in there. You mentioned this being a pretty smooth one. It is. That's why this beer got popular. Back when IPAs were first being brewed, they tend to be very bitter. Mm -hmm and kind of hard to drink. I like those beers, I like those flavors a lot, but over time, people started to learn to use hops for their flavors and aromatics and less for the bitterness. So a lot of the new IPAs coming out now are more centered on the flavors that that hop can give to the beer. And so what about the alcohol content, more or less? That's 7%. Jeez, <laughs> hi. So it's starting to get <laughs> a little bit higher. Yeah. For an IPA, 7% is right in the middle. Mm -hmm. no. Navigating beer styles is kind of difficult. They're all sort of on a continuum and a lot of them blend into each other. Especially when you're on your eighth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also brought a pitcher if you want to dump beer that you haven't finished into I it. I feel bad wasting it, but yeah, no, no. at the end of the episode, Grant will drink this. It's called the King's Cup and he has before if we have video of it. Oh my God! <laughs> I'm so doing it. As soon as I said it, I thought, this has already happened. What's next? That is a stout. It's Founders Breakfast Stout. This is a little different from a normal stout because they're adding oats, chocolate, and coffee to it. Now we're getting into the grown-up territory. This is one of those that's gonna feel like, like uh, it's gonna be super dark, right? Yes, very, very dark. Okay, what makes a stout a stout? Stouts are using a darker roasted malt so that it's gonna make it a lot heartier, a lot chocolatier. And coffee, it's gonna be a little bit thicker in body and delicious. My God, it looks like I'm just pouring syrup. It's like this, motor oil. This is actually not even the darkest stout you can find. There are some that are jet black. I assume everything is more intense and rich at this point. In this one, yeah. All right. Oh, the color, uh, uh, I see nothing. Yeah, it's completely <laughs> dark brown. I and see the, the darkness of my soul. <laughs> and if you look at the head on top, it, it's really the color of chocolate milk. You yeah. don't really see head yeah. like that in very many other beer styles. To the nose. Wow. It smells like coffee. Well, and yeah. it's got oatmeal and, mm -hmm. and certainly the chocolate. And normally for stouts, you don't add those things. Those are just additions to this particular beer to pop up those flavors that are naturally occurring in those malts already. I just feel like it's gonna reach out and punch me. You smell waffles? Oh, it's gonna love you, actually. It's gonna kiss oh, you on your sir. forehead. All right, all right, here we go. <laughs> it's very thick, the body. I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. It's like, if you like coffee, you'll like this. This one seems to me like you would be a mysterious stranger in the corner of a medieval tavern about to slay everyone who touches your table. Yeah. Also, it goes really well with pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, this with some pancakes and some maple syrup, perfect. I'm not a big fan. You don't like chocolate, though. That's true. Oh, as a matter of fact, when we did the Miracle Fruit, that was your complaint about Guinness. It's chocolatey. Yes, yes. I hate chocolate. Well, that's the thing. Guinness doesn't even have chocolate. But yeah. those those malts still give the impression of chocolate. Okay. I don't hate this, but it's not going to be my go-to. So you mentioned they added chocolate. Is there like a backlash against that kind of thing? Is there kind of a purity of just the four ingredients of beer? Yes. I mean, there are certain groups. I, I went to a certain brewery that does primarily German lagers, and they were very adamant that you should only use those four ingredients. And they actually prided themselves on the fact that they only use water, hops, malt, and yeast. But it kind of is a throwback to this purity law thing that, what was it called? The Reinheitsgebot. Yes, which was a legal mandate that beer was only constituted of those four ingredients. What's it called again? The Reinheitsgebot. It's a German purity law oh, that they use for taxation mostly. And it's a, it's a cluster of different laws that pretty much mandate that you can only make beer from, at the beginning it was three different ingredients because they didn't know what yeast was. Oh geez. So they changed it to be four different ingredients and it's kind of different now. It's a little bit more loose, but the Reinheitsgebot is still alive and well in some German breweries. Man, who would have thought Germans into purity? <laughs> what do we got? This is actually a Belgian quad. I have never heard those words used. So Belgian beers, a lot of the traditional Abbey style beers are either doubles, triples, or quads. This is, 
These are monks who have nothing to do but get totally f These guys actually aren't monks, but uh, it's the same kind of beer that a monk would brew. Okay, this says ABT 12. No, this is 10%. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, Belgian quad, so it's Belgia. <laughs> Of, of Belgium, yes. Belgium. Yes. I've yes. had a couple. Yes. Belgium. Yeah. Uh, and four. <laughs> yes, I don't know what that means. Brian uh, said he'd sure. never heard those words before. So, <laughs> doubles, triples, and quads are really just the amount of malt and fermentable grain they're using, which results in a higher alcohol. A higher alcohol beer for oh a quad. God. So yeah, Belgian quad. St. Bernardus Abbott 12, one of the best beers in the world. So Belgian quad is yes. the category. Mm -hmm. What should we be looking for? This is a very good example of a Belgian beer. Belgian yeast tends to throw off a lot of really great fruity and spicy notes. Uh -huh. So you're gonna get something like baked pears, baked apples, but also cinnamon, clove, things like mulling spices. I just realized plums. I'm involuntarily grimacing at all of those things. I don't know, I think this might be the first beer I met that I didn't like. Okay, I, I it's got this sort of creamy, spicy quality and also something like baked or poached pears. Like, a, it looks like a dark amber, right? Yeah, pretty much. Dark kind of hazy amber. I don't know how it's gonna taste, but it smells sweet. It's a, it smells sweeter than it tastes. Okay. It has a sweetness in the flavor, but it ends pretty dry. It doesn't taste like I would expect it to taste. It's really crisp. Were you thinking it was just gonna fruity. be a sugar bomb? Yeah. Yeah. It is still thick. It's got a pretty substantial body to it, but it's not, it, it's not, Coyingly sweet. You don't like it? I do not want to. Oh, wow. I could drink this by the gallon. Isn't this great? This is just one of those beers I want all the time with like Thanksgiving. Meal. This is remarkable. I found out something new about myself. There's a beer I don't like? We have two more chances to find more beers you don't like. <laughs> all fruits are too intense and too sweet for me. Sure. And this is like that made into a beer. <laughs> Get ready for these ones. It's actually not bad on the second, now that my palate is set and I know what language you're talking about. You do have to calibrate between beers. It's good to not write a beer off after the first or second sip. Even sometimes it'll take a couple more tries with the beer for you to clue into it. So when I first started drinking beer, I noticed that it was almost impossible for me to switch from one beer to another beer. Whatever beer was second was awful. Even if you switched the order. Your palate's primed, yeah, yeah for yeah. something else. Is that something that you learn how to pivot quicker? Because on my third sip of this, suddenly it's not nearly as, as, as intense or, or off-putting as it was the first time. I think you had problems with that too when we first started the show. When we first started the show, he was a brand new guy to craft beer. But now we're experts and alcoholics. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think expectation plays a big role in that. Yeah. If you don't know what you're tasting, it's harder to, to find your bearings and to find things to enjoy about the thing you're tasting. It's like when your body doesn't know what's coming, it just says, poison, this is poison. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> it's all about expectation. Yeah. And the more examples of a thing that you have, the more you can taste differences between those examples. I really like it. Wow. This might be the favorite that we've had so far. Well, this next beer is a Saison, and it's a Franco-Belgian style of beer that tends to be a little bit farmy and rustic. There's a lot of grassy notes in there. It tastes like the springtime. I think that's the best way I can put it. Like walking through a meadow. Yeah. And the name Saison actually means uh, seasonal farmer. They used to give it out way back to all the farmers that would come help and till the fields, and then in the wintertime, they would have them actually help them make the beer. And this is a pretty temperamental style to brew. It's pretty temperature sensitive. I was surprised when we were doing the uh, Rogue's Brew Kit, how much it mattered that you'd be like at 72 degrees and so on. And when I tasted mine versus when I tasted the Brewmasters, they were very different animals. Yeah, for a very long time, you could only brew beers during certain seasons that matched up to the temperatures that you were able to ferment these beers at. Whoa, I didn't expect this to look so light. Yeah. It's almost like a champagne. It's a beautiful style of beer. It's actually one of the best beers to drink with food. So I'm assuming that means it's more mild? It's kind of mild, but there's a lot of nuance to it. Spice, you're gonna have a lot of spice character, but it's a light and body beer, so it's easy to drink. Look at the amount of head on this beer. I was about to say, I was gonna blame Jason and his pouring, but no, I guess it's just over carbonated. No, that's part of the beer style. Actually, let me, let me take this one. I'll let you take that one. It'll be easier for you to navigate okay, through that head. Okay, so uh, color? So this is like a cloudy golden, and you can see what looks like particles, but I guess that's just all the carbonation? But that can also be a little bit of yeast in suspension. Yeah, a little bit of sediment, funkiness, yeah. yeah. Sometimes yeast doesn't flocculate all the way out of a fluid. Oh, it smells really good. Yeah. 
Am I the only one detecting like kind of a sour tang in there? It's a little, it's a little tart on the nose. There's a bit of a rotting wood thing yeah, going yeah, on. Right. Oh, it's my favorite. A little bit of like lemon peel in there. All right, here we go. That was so much smoother than I expected. This is a beautiful beer. Very crisp, Imagine very fruity. The flavors that you're getting in the mouth, that hay-like thing, a little bit of something mushroomy. There's something kind of lemony and grassy in there. Imagine drinking that on a farm. I mean, it's constantly sunset on the farm <laughs> as I drink this. Yeah, wild it's flowers. just so botanical. Grass and flowers and... It really tastes like the springtime, like what you would imagine the springtime to taste like on yeah. a farm. Beer can taste so differently, John. What's up with that? All these beers have been so different from one another. And the great thing about beer is that when, when you ask somebody, do you like beer? And they're like, no, I don't like beer. A lot of times what they mean is they don't like Bud Miller or Coors. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like asking somebody, do you like music? You're like, eh, I heard music once, wasn't for me. Right, exactly. <laughs> There's so many different styles of beer that we're not even covering here, like literally hundreds. Some that are fruity, that taste like wine, some that taste like a, a sandwich. <laughs> I've had a beer that tasted like a sandwich before. All right, so we had Pilsner, IPA, Stout, uh, quad. Saison, Quad, uh -huh. and now what? Now, this is a Goose. A Goose is a Belgian style of beer. It's a blend of three different Lambics, three different years of Lambic. A Lambic is a sour beer. It's spontaneously fermented. Pretty much what they do is they brew this beer, put it in these vessels to cool out in the air, and whatever's in the air falls in and inoculates the beer, the bacteria and the yeast that are naturally wait everywhere. Wait a minute, wait a minute, because I've heard you want to like not have outside bacteria or you won't get a consistent beer, right? That's why they blend it. They blend three different years of this beer to get something that falls in this. This sounds like that weird ass shark food that they bury in the ice tundra and it's pee on it. Kind of like that. I, you, you know what I'm talking no, about. No, you're just making this up. No, now. that's a thing, right? This beer is going to be very, very sour, very funky and farmy. It's going to stink a little bit. It's going to smell like mushrooms. It smells like Willy Wonka's factory caught on fire. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. This is seriously one of my favorite beers. Are you, are you, uh, okay. He used to hate this style. It's pungent. It smells like a burning tire factory and I love it. Yeah. Let's <laughs> color. <laughs> it's kind of coppery a little bit. A little bit hazy and coppery. It's very hazy. Yeah. Because of all the it's kind of brass particulates. Nose. Tell yeah, me what, what are you guys getting there? Okay, rubber, it's, burnt hair, maybe? Yeah, burnt rubber, it's sour. Rotting peaches and oranges. I mean, I'd hate to say it, but almost vomit. Is that is that bad to no, say? No, that's fine. Like you kind of- But in a good yeah. way. Vomit in a good way. Uh, sure. <laughs> a little bit like prison hooch. Oh God. Oh, it's splashing on me. This oh is one of God. those beers that I would never pour okay, to a newbie. And, and you're not joking when you say this is your favorite? Oh no, I love this beer. You haven't even taken a sip though. When we started the show, like he was new in a beer and he hated these beer styles. Hated. Hated. And it's something that he acquired a taste for. This is called uh, the Gooch? Goose. <laughs> the Gooch. <Yeah>. <laughs> no, this is the Gooch. No, it says here, brewed in a toilet in San Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the cool things about this particular Goose is that they don't actually brew their own beer. They just blend the beer together from four other different breweries in Belgium that make their own Goose. And lamb. Are you saying that we've been making our own goose? That's a different thing. This is a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a king's cup. Smell it again. You had no it. expectation when you started. Okay. You know what it smells like now. You're gonna notice a lot of those unpalatable aromas kind of fade into the background a little bit, and then you start getting more of a lemon, kind of fermented peach, peach aroma. And apricot. I'll be damned if you're not right. Like, like it's one of those things where it's very intense to switch from one beer to another. And one tip, uh, take a small sip when you first start. That's always what you say about something delicious. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. Yeah. I like it. The types of acid in here that give it that really sharp tartness and sourness are acetic acid and lactic acid. Acetic acid is what you find in vinegar. Think pickle juice, think that sort of thing. But then you have lactic acid, which is the same kind of acid that you find in sauerkraut. And Sour Patch Kids. And Sour Patch Kids and yogurt. Mm. This actually tastes a lot better than it smells because it smells horrible, but it tastes really good. So how are you feeling about this one? <laughs> Glad it's last. You just, you, you take turns staring off into nothing and then cringing. <laughs>
I honestly thought until this moment that I was a fairly accomplished beer drinker, but I just realized how little I know and how bad I need the Beerists podcast in my life. I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any more time? Because I can I can pull out a little Trojan horse I brought. Wait, do we have a surprise? Are we gonna drink from a condom? <laughs> I have a bit of a surprise. Murphy might not like this one. Oh God. But I do have a bottle of Bourbon County mm. Stout. What is happening? From 2015. I do like bourbon. Wait, is there bourbon in here? Oh, Goose Island. They brewed this incredible Imperial Stout that they age for almost a year in bourbon barrels. All right, what is an Imperial Stout? An Imperial Stout is pretty much like a stout, like the one that we had like that the breakfast stout. Like the right, right, But right. Darth Vader makes it. <laughs> <laughs> but with uh, like twice the ingredients sometimes. Oh my God. Um, so this one clocks in <laughs> at 14.3%. Let me get the shot glasses. <laughs> so aged in bourbon barrels, I would assume significantly alters the flavor profile. Absolutely. Just a little bit. You get a lot of oak, a lot of vanilla, and then a lot of the, the bourbon character. And so aging it is what causes the alcohol content to be so high? No, that's because they're using a hell of a lot more malt than they usually use in a oh. regular stout. Okay, all right, so color. This is a, kind of, yeah, it's a stout, right? You can yeah. recognize it's like noticed, coffee. And if you notice, how it sticks to the glass yeah. when you rock it back and forth. It just seems syrupy, right? It's syrupy and it is pretty alcoholic. It's like a liqueur. I gotta imagine this is all the calories, right? <laughs> this has all the calories. It's also very sweet and very alcoholic. Oh my, holy cow, hold on, that pro... Yeah. Wow, that's intense. Yeah. It was like bourbon and brownies. Yeah, I don't like brownies. I'm really glad you gave the advice of going back multiple times. Cause the first time I'm like, ew. Second time like, get ready, not so bad. And the third time like, oh, I can see why somebody would like this. I brought this beer just for fun because it's pretty much the furthest away you could get from the first beer we had. Yes. <laughs> it tastes like caramel. Caramel and fudge brownies and a little bit of vanilla like poured in. The more I smell it, the more I detect the bourbon. Oh yeah. I totally missed it the first time. So forever, whenever I had switched from one beer to another, it was always whatever beer was second was terrible. But I think this is a decent little hack to prep your palate in advance. I never thought about smelling the beer in advance oh, yeah. and getting yourself excited and ready for the new flavor profile. It's getting yourself prepared in a way that gives you an expectation for what you're about to drink. All right, here we go. Not a fan. You know, certain beers aren't for everyone, but we always encourage you go back and try it again and again and wow, again and suffer. <laughs> yeah, drinking this beer is really like drinking a port wine. It's a very big, sweet, decadent experience that you don't drink a lot of. You don't ever want to drink an entire bottle of this by yourself. That Pilsner, I felt like I could finish, you know, running a mile and then drink that. Um, this is, you have to treat it as though you're actually just drinking straight bourbon. You yeah. have to let a little bit of it in. Sip it, savor it. This is wonderful with a cigar. Also really wonderful with some desserts. If you drink this with a cheesecake, that's amazing. This one has the best finish of all of them. Yeah. But the problem is you have to get through the drinking <laughs> to get to the finish. <laughs> <laughs> I feel guilty when I don't like a beer. Why? Like I failed the beer. Wait no. a minute, wait a minute. Are you having my experience? Are you tapping out? Yeah. You, wow. you should yeah. never feel guilty about not liking a beer. I like this better than the breakfast stout. Uh -huh. Strangely enough, because this one is more chocolatey. Way more intense, yeah. Yeah, it, but I'm not a fan. This is perfect. Remember our whole point was to sound like we knew what we were talking about? You don't sound like you know what you're talking about when you talk about how you like everything. You sound like you know what you're talking about when you say, oh, Oatmeal stout is a bit much for my palate. I personally prefer the goose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, perfect. that's you. <laughs> I, I'm convinced you know what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> nailed it. All right, let's get hammered. I think Grant has something to do first. Oh, shit. I what? thought you were gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it. The King's Cup. Uh, I don't wanna Grant. pour this into the King's Cup. Where no, we can I? pour a little bit, there's plenty. Yeah. Uh, is there any goose left? Pour some of that in there. Oh, let's God. tart this thing up. Oh. It'll always be the gooch. <laughs> well, it's in there, you're gonna have some. Yeah, well, is this why you guys invited me? Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Where can we find the beerists? Thebeerists.com, we're also on iTunes. Oh my God, he's doing it! <laughs> on the Amazon or Play Store, the Google Play Store, that one. Yeah, we're there. We're on Stitcher. Oh my God, it's running out his, oh, oh my God. Gross. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Life! Hold on. Oh man. Actually, Oh, that's horrible. This kind of some good stuff going there. No, it doesn't. It honestly smells like pesticide. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
what? I don't even know you. You've become one of them. How do you like that? It's not that bad. Yeah. Oh. Give it back here. It's really gross. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, here I, you go. I can't, you know. Brian's been sick, so he's last. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. I mean, it's not good. There, I did it. <laughs> when I say Russia, what do you think of? Kamchatka vodka. For a vodka as smooth as its name. Did you make them a vodka? Kamchatka is the cheap stuff. Really? It's named for the Kamchatka Peninsula. Why do you know this? Because I went to college. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? How do you know? The modern know this? rogue is going to pump you up. All right, so no lie, you've been getting fit lately, right? Uh, I wouldn't say fit. I've lost some weight. How yeah. much? Wait, what are you doing? Uh, right now, I've lost about 18 pounds. Right on. From just avoiding carbs, sugar, and dairy. And it's awful. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, living your life now? <laughs> I thought you were going to say how great it was to be healthy. Not so much. No, though. it sucks, man. <laughs> but right. my clothes fit. <laughs> okay, good. But here's the important thing. There are two steps. One is you got to lose the weight, but then you got to build up muscle mass. You have to do sculpting or whatever, right? You could go to the gym and get a trainer. You can actually do stuff or you can cheat and get big results in two weeks. I want to cheat. I want to <laughs> cheat. <laughs> okay, well, it's not entirely cheating. So like 15 years ago, somebody gave me an article from like a men's health magazine about Pavel the Evil Russian Satsaline and this insane two-week push-up program. It's called the Evil Russian Hit the Deck program. Now, the thing is, is it didn't actually make you stronger, but it would add one to two inches on your chest and it would bulk out your arms by doing just an insane amount of push-ups. This sounds awful, <laughs> but if it's a shortcut, I want it. In two weeks, you will look fundamentally different. How does it work? How is it a shortcut? Well, it's short in that it's only two weeks long and you're actually not allowed to do any other upper body workouts during this time. So if you are doing bicep curls or all that, you press pause on all of that while you do this program. At the end of it, you will inflate your chest a good one or two inches. But the weird part is that you're going to have to stop, drop and do push-ups no matter where you are at timed intervals for that two week time period. So high potential for embarrassment. Uh, yes, but if you're the kind of person that could get over looking like a goofball in public, this is gonna really work. So if you're Brian Brushwood, basically. Well, or Jason Murphy. <laughs> okay, you're, you're in it, right? That's true, I'm in. So you start on day one doing a 100% test. You do your maximum push-ups. How many push-ups can you do? Probably like at least two. <laughs> no, no, seriously, do you know? Do you have I have guess? no idea. So that first max you get, that is your baseline. And you're gonna do a percentage of that baseline every hour on the hour for the rest of the day. So on day one, you max out, let's say it's 50 push-ups, then you're gonna do 30% of that every hour for the rest of the day. So okay, what about when I'm sleeping? You wanna stop about an hour before you go to bed because otherwise you're just gonna be working out and it's gonna keep you up. Tuesday, you're gonna spend all day, every hour, doing 50% of your max. So it's probably like 25 push-ups, no matter where you are. Uh, Wednesday, it's 60% of your max every 45 minutes. Thursday, it's 25 of your max every hour. So there's heavy days and then there's easier sure. days. Friday, it starts to get intense. 45% of your max every 30 minutes. Saturday is 40% every 60 minutes. Sunday is kind of like a day off. It's only 20% every 90 minutes, which which feels silly. It's like you'll probably drop and do, you know, seven push-ups or right. whatever. Week two, you're going to set a new baseline. You're going to find that your max is much, much higher than it was the first time. Then after that, it gets really intense. 35% every 45 minutes, followed by 55% every 20 minutes, 30% every 15 minutes. You're going to do a thousand push-ups in a day. Thursday, it goes to 65% every hour, 35% every 45, 45% every 60, and then finally you have an easy day at 25% every two hours. And then finally, you do one more test and you'll probably double the amount of push-ups you can do. So it's only two weeks. <laughs> only two weeks, right? You can do this. You want to start right now, don't you? Yeah, a little bit. You, you can do your max. All right. Wait, well, here, before we even start, let's actually take measurements so we can know how well this is working. Yeah, so with you re relaxed, I would say 39, and then bicep, let me see bicep. And bicep is just under 13 inches. Okay. Don't laugh! Now do me, do me. <laughs> We're just two bros measuring chests. Yep, that's, that's, that's all this is. Don't make it weird. Okay, relaxing, it is 38 and a half. All right, and then bicep. It is 11. All right, so let's let's see your max. How many can you do? Remember that a proper push-up, you're gonna go all the way down to 90 degree angle, and you're gonna go all the way up. Don't worry about doing those super slow tantric push-ups, you know, just, just do like regular, <laughs> regular okay, push-ups. Okay, okay, tantric, what kind of exercise is this? Okay. There you go, ready, and go. One, two, three, four, five, Push the max, flex the envelope. 18, 19, 
20, 21. Wow. Oh. Uh, wait, is that it? You're, you're not a failure. Am I doing more? I think that's it. I think it's good. Uh, I think we're good. 21? 21. 21. Yeah. And you should go all the way to failure to where it's like you're trying, but you can't quite. I get to failure pretty easily, <laughs> yeah. actually. You're like an, an advanced achiever when it comes to hitting failure. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. We're good. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. All right, that's it. That's impressive, sir. All right, how did it feel? Oh, it was pretty miserable, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of want to die right now, and I'm not even sure that my arms are attached. The good news is that when you stop and drop a do push-ups, you're only going to be working out for 30 seconds at a time. So it's like even when the buzzer goes off, you're like, here we go, one, two, three, and you're over, just like that. That's good, because a lot of the thing about working out that I don't like is the time commitment. On the one hand, it's a massive time commitment because you're committing to all day, every day. But on the other hand, each time, it's very, very quick and easy. Yeah. So your max was 21. Yeah. That means on day one, you're going to do 30% of that. All you have to do is stop every hour and do six push-ups. You could do that, right? Yeah. For me, it's 13 and a half push-ups. So okay. I'll do like 13 or 14, right? So here's what I found. You can do some kind of lap timer that just buzzes every hour or every 45 minutes or whatever. I worry that it'll buzz. And if you don't do it right that minute, if you're on a phone call or whatever, you forget instantly. Oh, so, what sure. I, so what I do is I actually set individual alarms for the rest of the day. I go to bed at like 7 p.m. I'm gonna okay. stop at like okay. 6. Okay, all right, yeah, that's good. But that means you gotta start early, right? Oh, right. <laughs> no, I, I gotta get about 15 to 16 hours of sleep a day. <laughs> So I guess from here on out, it's just commitment. Are you committing? Are, you, are we gonna pinky promise? Are we gonna be accountability buddies? I know how serious pinky promises are. I know, are, yeah. I don't mess around. Two weeks, bro. Okay. Two weeks, all right. Yeah, I should've put one speed, like I said, one speed. Oh, all right. Everything hurts. Go time. Yeah, do it. It's time. All right, two weeks in, number one, did you do it? I did it. You were diligent? I was good about it. How yeah. hard was it? At first, I thought, I'm never talking to you again. <laughs> but then it became really tolerable and the pain stopped. It becomes more of an inconvenience. Like you wake up and you're perpetually sore. You know you worked out the day before. Yes. But every time the buzzer goes, it's like, Ugh, all right, 30 seconds and then you're done. But it's not like you're dying. Maybe some of the tough days by the end of the day, it's just like, I'm like eight, nine, and I, that's enough. I've, I'm done. For me, the first couple of days were the worst because everything hurt. Yeah. The second week, was way better than the first. So this is my problem. My second week, I missed a couple of days because remember I warned you about getting sick? Some of my kids were sick and just dropping wherever I was in the house meant I was rolling around in their germs. So for a good two days, I missed out. So, But I did see a big increase from first week to second week. Has, has your lady noticed anything? She says she did. I don't know if that's true or not. We'll get the measurements. We'll find it out. I damn well better see results. <laughs> All right, so your original max was 20. And then the beginning of week two was 33. Holy cow. So 50% increase like that. Yeah. If you were going to bet, how many do you think you could do? It's going to be pushing it. I think I can do 50. This is the big test. This is your graduation gift. Take two. I think I can do 30. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 35, 36, 37. 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, keep going, keep going, keep going. 50. Dude, 50. dude. From 21 to 50, come on, get up, get up. If you can lift your arms, you got double high fives waiting on you. Come on, you got this. Boom. <laughs> I did. You did 40. 45. Yes. And then week two, I did 65. Nice. So it's tough because I know I really slacked off that second week, so I'll be happy if I get past that 65. Okay. All right, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 15, 20, 25, 
30, 35, 60, 75, Five, seven, eight, nine, 80. Oh, Jesus. Oh, shit. Herculean, <laughs> sir. Oh, my God. Well done. Oh, Jesus. All right. Oh, my God. Dude. Uh, Nicely done. Where were you hurting the most? When I first started, it's always in my abs. I never expect it in the abs. Right, yeah. Uh, it was certainly in the pecs, but but also like my triceps. Mm -hmm. And you can feel stuff really does kind of fill out on you on your bicep as well. Most of my pain when I was doing it was on my forearms. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And all that typing wasn't and the, yeah. strong enough. <laughs> right. And my uh, my stomach, yeah, and the abs too. Yeah. I kept thinking, oh, did I give myself a hernia? <laughs> yeah, did I break something? Yeah, I kept thinking that a lot. Okay, well, so, all right, so obviously it works in terms of number of push-ups, but let's take measurements. Subject, Jason Murphy. Chest size, no change. Bicep size, three quarters inch increase. Push-up maximum, 138% increase. Subject, Brian Brushwood. Chest size, 1 inch increase. Bicep size, 1 inch increase. Push-up maximum, 78% increase. All right, so you give it a thumbs up or no? I think it's effective. Yeah. And at the very least, I have more stamina, and now I can actually make the bed without getting winded. <laughs> yeah, right, right on, man. Well, good job. Thanks, evil Russian. <laughs> yeah. Explain to me how there's a sequel when there was never... F what was the first one? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> The modern rogue is not vulnerable to sequel injections. Most modern rogue episodes, I feel like I at least have a toehold on what's going on. This, I am totally out of my depth. I need to rely on a programmer like you, Jason, or UT's very own Jagor. Thank you so much, hacker extraordinaire. So, sequel is used everywhere. Right? That is the most common database management application. Anytime you have to enter information or retrieve information using a website, it's interacting with SQL. So every time you're typing something in an open box, odds are this is SQL structure in the back end. And you're saying there's a flaw in SQL full stop. SQL injections are the most common type of hack. They are used everywhere. You can see them hacking the United States government, stealing credit cards from online vendors. In fact, any hack or data breach that you can think of in the last 10 years, most of them are gonna be from SQL injections. Explain to us just the general concept of how it works. Sure, so uh, SQL, or structured query language, is just a way of querying a backend database and pulling out just the information that you want. So it's kind of like a programming language. You're defining a, a string of commands and it knows what to do with those commands in order to retrieve what you wanted. Problem is, some of this is commands and some of this is data. So like the data would be when I type in, my name is Brian Brushwood and the commands are, you know, I don't know, like load this website or whatever, right? Yeah, so Brian Brushwood is the data, but that's put right in the same string as all of these command sequences. Wait, so the system doesn't know whether it's listening to a command or the data. So if my name it. was Brian, go to line 20, uh, repeat yes. this command, do X, Y, yes. Z, the other thing. Exactly. And then when yes. it reads it, it does it. Essentially, that's exactly it. Yeah, we're telling the, the backend system to execute exactly what we want after our data. Now, this vulnerability is really widespread, but it's also exceptionally easy to protect against. Okay, this is the part I don't understand. If it's so easy to protect against it, why isn't everybody insulated? Well, uh, you do have to learn a little bit about how the mitigation strategies you're supposed to use, and some people just aren't willing to put in that extra step of effort to learn how to do it the right way. Most people don't invest in their IT security until it's too late. Got it. So they're just like, the thing works. I'm not worried about it. I don't see any problems. Just keep on running it like it is. It's never a problem until it's a problem. Okay, legally, we have to be very, very clear that the very act of attempting a SQL injection is to the best of our knowledge, we are not lawyers, but the very act of attempting any of this is a felony, correct? Yes. Again, not lawyers, but don't do it. Yes, okay, but what might one look like? So say we have a login page. You got your username and your password. Uh, if they're not protecting against that separation from the, the command and the data, our username, the data, we put a tick and suddenly everything after that becomes commands. So 
We just say, all right, stop checking here. Let's not check the password. Wait a minute. Are you telling me there's fully functional websites out there where all you have to do is add a tick mark and then at that point you're executing code on their website? How? What percentage of websites are vulnerable to this? A it's, lot. We could Google something right now and I could almost guarantee you that something in one of those results would be vulnerable. Well, <laughs> that's very tempting. However, I know that would be a felony to test. And so we're not gonna do that. What's it like to actually do a SQL injection? Uh, so for example, if we go to, uh, let's say demo.testfire.net. This is a security tool that's set up specifically so you can test either your security tools or your security knowledge and understand how the attacks work. It's Altoro Mutual, it's a, a fake credit union or bank of some sort. We've got all the typical um, functionality of a bank. So wait, this is a website that's not an actual bank that I assume has actual accounts that nobody ever uses to check bank accounts that don't exist, but this is all here just for you to try to penetrate. Exactly. Okay, all right, go on. So we have this sign-in functionality here at the top, and I happen to know one of the test accounts. Jay Smith has an account at Altora Mutual, and his password is demo1234. Okay. So we can log in, we see that we have our checking account here, we got our savings account. I'm gonna sign out, and we're gonna try signing in again. This time, let's say all we know is his username. We know Jay Smith has an account on this bank. It's going to get mad at us if we don't fill in the password field, so I'm just gonna type a bunch of random characters here. But it doesn't matter, because up here in the username, we're gonna put tick. And when you say tick, that's the, uh, the, that's single, the quote. single quote. Got it, single quote, got it. Yeah, and at this point, we have ended the user input, the, the data, Jay Smith, and now we're gonna start tacking on our own SQL commands. Now we could get as complicated as we want here, but the simplest one, is just to put a SQL comment character, which is dash, dash, and then usually a space at the end. What that does is it comments out everything else in this command sequence after the username. One so, of the things that comes after the username is this password check. Okay, okay. So, so if I understand this correctly, um, it's running code and it gets as far as like, uh, enter username, it sees the username, then by putting the dash dash, it assumes whatever is next is a comment. Unfortunately, the next text is also make sure to check for a password. You got it. And so that becomes a comment and it does not run that part. Exactly. And, and so does it work here? Give it a shot. That's deeply disturbing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now imagine that you can take these SQL commands and just do whatever you wanted to this site's database. I would assume in order to do anything of value, you would have to understand the current layout, the structure, the things that this is most likely to do so that you punch in commands that will actually be meaningful, right? Now, if we were doing that by hand, yes. We would have to, first of all, traverse through all the database names, table names, column names, and figure out exactly what we would wanna pull out from the database. But this has been around so long and it's been so polished and perfected that there are tools that'll do all of this work for us. All we have to do is know that this page is vulnerable. We point a tool at it and it will pull out every single piece of data from that database. Wow. Okay. Including credit card numbers. No, hold on. How, how does it do it? Does it just keep on running like random code to see what, what it gets back or? It first of all identifies the vulnerable behavior. It knows what to look for. For example, you put a tick in there and suddenly the page contents change maybe. And we put a tick or one equals one, and now the page has gone back to its legitimate content because one equals one is always true. So once it confirms that vulnerable behavior, it knows certain strings to inject in there to say, okay, now give me all of the list of databases names, all the list of table names, all the list of column names. Here's a nice pretty list of them. Wow. And one of the things that they do is they will intentionally throw up errors in that they'll enter some information and SQL will come back and say, this bit of data is incorrect. Well, now you've told me what that bit of data is. Right. So if this is such a widespread known vulnerability, what is being done about it? Like, are there, are there best practices that are being propagated or, or is there some kind of new uh, backend that's in the works? Or is this just like, whoopsie doodle, everybody should be better about locking their doors? So we do know how to address this. You uh, best practice state that you should use prepared statements or parameterized queries that specifically identify, okay, this is our command structure, command structure, this piece is data, so never treat it as part of the command. 
It's just developers have not taken the time yet to follow these best practices. They just naively put a uh, everything in one string and say, okay, go ahead and evaluate this one. So it's not like this is gonna fix itself in the next 20 minutes. If you're making a website, you need to make sure that you are actively going out and finding out what best practices are to make sure you're not subject to one of these. And likewise, anytime you are using a service, you need to ask them, what are you doing to protect against a SQL injection? Yes, this is very much a training on the side of the developer. They need to understand the risks and then know the, the proper way to do it. What's funny is that when this was discovered, it was like the mid to late 90s and it was first written about in a zine called Frack. And when it was brought to Microsoft's attention, Microsoft is the developer of SQL, Microsoft denied it for 15 years. And the problem itself hasn't changed and it's still around and it's still very widespread. So be careful about what information you put out there. Uh, yeah, no, also get out of my house. Filthy hackers, all of you. I don't trust any of you. I'm not comfortable with any of this. Go. Okay. I don't like it. I've never had a Negroni. I don't know what it's gonna be like, but I propose that when we drink it, we call that act riding the Negroni pony. Giddy up. <laughs> the modern road makes a Negroni. Back again at our favorite secret bar in all of Austin with our favorite mixologist, Trevor. I don't know what to even expect from something called a Negroni. I assume it's rich and robust. I think of black coffee. No, not at all. Well, okay. I'm going to act all superior even though I've never had one either. <laughs> <laughs> so the Negroni was allegedly created in 1919 in Florence, Italy by, and you're gonna love this, Count Camillo Negroni. No way! I knew you were gonna love this that. This is the Count's Witch's Brew. I'm so excited. Count Negroni's yes. Folly. He went to a bartender and wanted an Americano, which is like a refreshing drink, but instead of the soda water, he wanted to put gin in there. And instead of garnishing it with a lemon, he garnished it with an orange, and thus the Negroni was born. Okay, I'm already deeply intrigued. This sounds nothing like what I expected the Negroni to be. No, this is amazing. Because when you put gin in there, it's usually much more refreshing than something dark and mysterious like you were expecting. Yeah, no, well, first of all, the name Count Negroni does sound like a vampire demon. <laughs> it does. <laughs> but then he's like, I like a light, refreshing drink, my <laughs> friends. All right, how do we begin? Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start with a chilled coupe. I'm sorry, this is called a coupe? Yes, this is a coupe glass. And they say that this glass was fashioned after Marie Antoinette's breast. That's where that whole saying about anything more than a champagne glass is a waste. This is pre-chilled. But what we're gonna do with Negroni, we are going to do an absinthe rinse inside of this. Oh my God! So today we're using Pernod. Now, when you're doing a rinse, if you don't have an atomizer to actually spray the glass down, you simply just want a dash of it in there. And we're gonna swirl the absinthe around in there to kind of coat the glass but the absinthe is not gonna stay because when it's a rinse, it's dumped out. Got it. But that flavor- So this will just give us a little bit of a hint of an anise? Yes, and it'll it adhere to the glass and that flavor's still gonna be in. I don't want anything that tastes like anise, I'm sorry. <laughs> so making a Negroni is pretty simple. There's only three ingredients and it's all equal parts. We're gonna start with uh, one ounce of gin. Today we're using Moody June, which is a really good Texas gin. It's not too floral. It really doesn't overpower the drink, but it gives a nice consistency. Then we're gonna use one ounce of sweet vermouth. We've used vermouth a lot before. Uh, you're gonna find this in most classic cocktails. Vermouth is just like nuclear wine, basically. Yeah, yeah it's just a fortified one. And it's something you wanna use sparingly. Yeah, typically you're not gonna use more than one to two ounces of vermouth in any drink. And in fact, you're gonna dash it a lot when it comes to drier vermouths. And then the last ingredient we're gonna use is Campari, which is an Italian Amaro. Oh, I'm sorry, that was a lot of words I don't understand. First of all, you said the name. Cam Campari. Campari. Campari, which is an Italian, I understood that Amaro. word. Amaro. Amaro. This is going to act, this is a bitter spirit, and this is going to add bitter to the drink. Got it, but they're not bitters like we would put in a Manhattan. No. Campari is really common. You can find it at most liquor stores. Okay, so now we have all the ingredients in the RI. And like other stir cocktails, we're just going to add ice. And we're going to give this about 20 to 30 revolutions here. Really just going to chill this entire drink down. So again, you're stirring so that we don't dilute it with water, Correct. but we are chilling everything. Correct. So it was Campari, gin, and vermouth. And vermouth. Uh -huh. And now, you're gonna take your glass with that absinthe that's been sitting in there. Right. You're gonna dump that out. Oh, and the absinthe rinse, right. Boy, you could smell that absinthe from yeah. here just now. 
So I guess by coating it with that absinthe, you get the aromatics for yes. sure. Traditionally, you can use an orange. Uh, I like to use a lemon. It just kind of gives a uh, more balanced flavor. And we're gonna express the oils out of there, kind of rub the rim, set it right on there. And there you have. You're a Negroni. Man, I don't know what to expect from this. This was traditionally used as an aperitif. What, what uh, is an aperitif? An aperitif is something that you would drink before your meal. An appetizer. Oh, got it, got it. Like an appetizer meal. Um, Brian, I'm interested to see what kind of flavors you're getting out of this. Well, and so this is all alcoholics. Yes. Everything in there is alcoholics. There's virtually no water it's because we stirred. Booth. I'm trying to figure out what I'm expecting because I'm thinking about the hints of the absinthe and then the gin and then the bitters and all sure. that. Sure. Probably really crisp. First off, that rinse with the absinthe makes a difference right at the beginning because the first thing I tasted was that hint of the absinthe. I still don't perceive that I've tasted the gin. It does taste very, very clean and the aftertaste uh, really lingers. I, I, I don't know, it's got that bitter aftertaste for a long time. And that's the Campari that you're uh, tasting there. This is probably one that'll sneak up on you, right? Oh my God, I would imagine, yes. right? That's, that's what, three and a half ounces of alcohol mm -hmm. in there. Oh, that is really unusual, right? Yeah, it's got this strange dry bite to it, but also like a really rich, sweet upfront taste. The gin that I used in this drink kind of takes a back seat to the rest of the ingredients. Yeah. Depending on the gin that you use, you're gonna get different flavor profiles. Because if you use, say, like a gin called The Botanist, it's a very floral, very potent gin. You're gonna taste the gin more if I were to use that. Mm -hmm. But traditionally in the Negroni, you're gonna use a drier gin. Wow. You can really taste the Campari in this. And now I can really feel it, that warmth <laughs> in the belly. Yeah. And that is straight up. And that's why it's an aperitif, because it actually expands your stomach. Wow, I didn't know that. So is a Negroni always this color? Yes, because of the Campari. Got it. So it's an absinthe rinse. Yes. On a chilled glass. On a chilled glass with gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari. And then just a little bit of essential oils around the top. Yes, sir. Which there's almost like a, a soapy bitter aftertaste. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, I would. And I feel weird saying that because like, why would I drink it if it, it tastes like soap? Campari will hit people's palates in different ways. Uh, some people don't, I mean, some people will try Campari for the first time and never drink it again. It is an acquired taste, mm -hmm. uh, but once you get used to it, you're gonna find that it becomes very versatile. I wonder if it's like cilantro. You know how some people taste cilantro Nothing just but as soap. soap? Yeah. The curious thing to me is that you get the sweetness up front but then that wave of bitterness hits a good two or three seconds after you swallowed, which yeah. is strange. And then you've got this lasting dryness in your mouth. Yeah. No, it's uh, really complicated. It's a lot like the uh, margarita in that way and that there are a lot of different flavor profiles that you're picking up on. The experience has changed as we've worked our way down because all the absinthe is now gone. Mm -hmm. I'm not detecting that absinthe hit right You really only front. get that, it usually lasts about halfway through the drink. Yep. Here's to the count, to you. Salute. <laughs> May you ride the Negroni pony in heaven forever. Wake it, shake it, Negroni pony. <laughs> Come on, Moni Moni. I know, I know no, yeah, I got, got it. it. Come yeah. on. Yeah. It. Sing it along. Leave me out here with my ass in the wind. <laughs> uh, Tetris, can you do Tetris? <laughs> That's one. That's one for one. What you got? What you got? One I know he can play. Panama, Van Halen. Oh. How did you make a David Lee Roth kick look like a Sig Heil? <laughs> what? <laughs> There's a little bit of this up in there. <laughs> the modern rogue can play basic guitar chords. I have no musical ability whatsoever. Wait, none whatsoever? None. I played trombone for a few months in junior high. You know what a chord is. Have you, Not really. have you ever in your life played any musical instrument where you strike more than two notes at the same time? Does Guitar Hero count? No, no. No. That's why we have Mario. Thank you so much for joining us, man. This is gonna be amazing. All right, so Mario, you're an expert guitarist. I feel comfortable saying that. You don't have to say anything, just kind of there we go. <laughs> yep. Okay. Mario, every party I've ever been to, there's been a guitar. I have not had the courage to pick one up and try to do a goddamn thing because I don't know anything about guitars. What is the easiest way for somebody to convince a pretty lady that he knows what he's doing as he pretends to play guitar? You can actually like put in a little bit of time and learn some open chords. Okay. Or you can learn power chords. Well, hook me up. All right, cool. So if you want to do a power chord, there's two ways to do it. 
One of them is you use one finger. That's the easiest. I like this already. So you'll do it with an open string and then the string next to it, the second fret up. So these are, these are the frets right here. Right. So we're talking about like, let's say we're gonna do an E power chord. So this is the E string. And then you're gonna place your finger on top of the second fret on the A string, which is the next string over. So right. you're playing these notes, but you're playing them together. So you're going like this. And so if you wanna rock it out, you just hit that several times. You're just going. And then Damn. we're good. Thanks, Mario. We got this. <laughs> So Starting the band. <laughs> but then you got to go somewhere afterwards. So, you know, you have two routes to go. You either go down to the next strings and do the same thing. So you're doing. But then eventually you're going to want to go somewhere else. So that's when you use two fingers. Okay. Whoa. All right. It's the same principle, except that now you're going to go ahead and use this finger down here. And then the next finger on the next string over, two frets over. So you're going, and then you can go. Feeling the rock. And you can use this, these two fingers, you can use these fingers, it doesn't matter, it's just two fingers. All right, JC, you wanna give this a try? Jason, do it. See, here's the moment in Modern Rogue where I wish I was secretly an expert and I can just blow everybody's ass out. All right, let's hear it. He's a rock god. So right now you have an open string. Yeah. And then you're doing the one that makes it a power chord. Yeah. Now let go. This one's the open string. And then this one will be the one to make it a power chord. You got to hit these two. Oh. Oh, I gotta be like accurate. Yeah, yeah, you got it. I thought I just like did no, this. No, 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 no. You gotta, you gotta know what you're doing. You got it. I, uh, now, I now, now go say back I to the first. It. Now go back to the first. I know that if you do that, like all of the sounds stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, so, so now, as Mario explained, if you want to be able to take it all over the map, this one all the way up, this one to... Use your ring finger. Yeah, drink. there you yeah. go. I got these giant hands, though, and they're, yeah, they're made for love, not music. <laughs> now, here's the thing. You could take that all over the board. Go up and down. Good almost, almost. Good almost. Good almost. Make sure you're two apart. You're you're one apart right now. Oh, two, two frets. frets. Yeah. Two frets. Two frets. Two frets. Okay. Yeah, that's tough. That's something that you're just going to develop as you're playing. But you know, as long as you understand the principles of where your fingers go, yeah. then everything else. So comes you always keep them two apart. And see, one of the things that I was doing was I was taking care not to hit these other ones, and it doesn't right. matter. Yes okay. and no, because even though you're not hitting them, just the, the sheer impact of you playing something yeah. on the guitar might cause them to ring out. So the trick to that is when you're placing your fingers, you just lightly rest this on top of the other right. strings. And so this is what happens. You can hear that one. Yeah. You can hear this one, but yeah. these are all muted. Yeah. So, so you can even go. And you're See, only that's what you want to do is that thrashing, right? Yeah, yeah. So here's the beautiful part about learning that power chord is you can make up songs on the fly. And in fact, I don't even know how good Mario's improvisational skills are, but I bet if you name one subject right now, he can make a power chord ballad based on it. Grilled cheese all right. sandwich. All right, grilled cheese sandwiches. Let's take it away. Grilled cheese, you mean so much to me. Grilled cheese, you're so mean. You bring my cholesterol to my knees. See, we're already getting laid. What are you doing? You're applauding. Me? <laughs> yeah. 
Once you get the power chord down, you're just all over the map. You can yeah. always do those those bass uh, major chords right. all over the guitar. But you were talking about open chords are the way to go, so you have a little more diversity. Yeah, absolutely. An open chord just means that you're playing open strings in addition to fretting some of the strings. So uh, when you hit all the strings, all of them sound right. Right. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You get to do the the Jason Murphy thrash thing. Exactly. Yeah. The the yeah the Jason Murphy Pete Townsend. <laughs> you know. I you get them confused pretty yeah. easily, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for example, when we were playing the E power chord over here, we were just playing these two notes. Right. But now if we want to take it up a notch, we'll also place another finger over here. And now we have an E minor chord when we hit all the strings. So that's nothing, two, two, nothing, nothing, nothing. Exactly. Got it. Okay. And then after that, you know, we can learn the C chord, which is essentially nothing, three, two, nothing, one, nothing. So zero, three, two, nothing, one. Exactly. And then after that, we take it to the G chord, which is three, two, nothing, nothing, three, three. And then right. the last one is gonna be the D chord, which is gonna be, uh, you can just not play this the first string, but it's gonna be nothing nothing two three two All right now it looks like you're muting yes. this. So if you even if you have bad aim down here Your thumb is kind of just muting that yes. first one Got or it. I could fret it with my thumb, but you know, that's for another yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, all right. you know, I can that's go advanced yeah. stuff. So we're going So then the progression would be And that's in everything. Did you hear that? That's, that's everything. the sound of panties dropping all <laughs> over the universe. <laughs> or you can take those same chords and you can just start at the G and that's like a completely different song. <laughs> we should be recording this because I'm going to watch this over and over if we were. Oh, oh hey, we are. Hey, we are. hey, yeah, look at good. this. So with just those four chords, you can mix and match the order of everything to tell all different kinds of stories musically. And, Absolutely. And, and play 80% of the pop songs on the radio, something ridiculous like Pretty that? Pretty much. You know, all of your favorites, like Eagle Eye Cherry. Stay tonight. <laughs> Rock the break of dawn of tomorrow. <laughs> I hate that song. I hate that song. But as it soon as he said like it, as soon as like he said it, you heard it. it. You heard it because you just heard it. It flipped the switch. Yeah. Oh, oh do, do I have to go do you for play it? Some, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Give it a try. Oh, I'm going to get it. Okay. I, I actually have a guitar at home. I've owned a guitar for 15 years. I have no idea how to play so, it. So a G is a uh, three, two, zero, nothing, zero. nothing, two, there are three, three, right? That's right. Like, like that, right? Dude. Now I know a D, and it's just a triangle at the end. Bunch of nothings, and then two, three, two. Exactly. Right? I kind of want to make out with you right yeah, now. Yeah, that's fine. C is, I remember it's like this cascade. So oh, that's right. it's like nothing, three, two, nothing, one, nothing. Yep. Right? Right? Oh, and E, e minor? E minor. E minor is a... You always want to prepare to how you're going to go to the next chord. So for example, if you're in E minor here and you're going to go to C, so you see how you lifted up all your fingers there? Yeah. There's actually an easier way to do that where this finger is going to land in the same place. Oh, so you're right. So just move these two fingers. You're right, because I'm thinking like, you know, E minor, E minor, E minor, and I'm like, stop and then reset. Oh, but, yeah. but this one's mean, meanwhile going to the exact yep. same place, right? And that'll bridge it to the next chord like okay. even more seamlessly. So what should I be doing instead? So you're thinking, it's like, I'm about to make this change, but this is gonna stay here. So then you do that. Got it. Exactly. Got it. Now that's not always gonna be the case. So for example, if you're doing G, you're gonna move all your fingers again. Right. But let's say you're going G to D. Everything's gonna change here, right? Because not everything is gonna change if you go to D. This finger is going to stay in the same place. You're just going to move these two. Oh, you're right. I never would have noticed that. That's amazing. Yeah. So if you do a little bit of planning, then you get quicker in, in your position. Dude, that's fantastic. I have a guitar in my office, and people ask if I know how to play. And the answer is always no, 
I only know enough to impress my daughters. <laughs> and if you want to be able to impress like, you know, your girlfriend or daughters just enough, I mean, it seems like uh, just knowing the open chords would be the way to go, right? That's right. Uh, all right, here, show us some stuff. So we got power chords and we got open chords. What can you accomplish just with what we learned in the last six minutes? You can start writing songs right away. You know, you have, you have more than enough information to create a chord progression, and you just have to put words to it. So after you learn power chords, after you learn open chords, why don't you play something and see if we can figure out what it is. Uh, that's the one by the sad Smashing guy. Pumpkins. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, there right. we go. All right, all right. Disarmed that's by the Smashing Pumpkins. All right. Uh, that's Nirvana, uh, Come As You Are, or is it? Yeah. It's about a girl. Oh, about yeah. a girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, right. sorry. About okay, a yeah, girl yeah. by Nirvana. Eagle Eye Cherry. Okay, right, yeah. right. Got it, got it, got it. <laughs> Save Tonight by Eagle Eye Cherry. Woo! Play some Matchbox 20! Uh, Woo! No, thanks. Oh! Oh, that's a uh, bush. <laughs> oh, yeah, glycerine? Yeah. 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 Uh, the fact that I requested Matchbox 20 and new glycerine immediately, <laughs> I'm probably going to get a divorce. Uh, not my choice. <laughs> glycerine <laughs> by Bush. Mario Alvarez, is it true that people can learn this magical skill from you face to face? A absolutely. I do lessons. You can find me on Facebook under Mario Alvarez Guitar Lessons. Okay, now. I believe that. What I don't believe is all the different bands that you're in. How many <laughs> bands are you in? The last tally was five. Oh, you got, you got, I know Thunder Hag. I know Karaoke Apocalypse. What else? There's also Calling Jack Burton, yep. which is an 80s tribute band. I've got a blues band called Asleep in the Desert. Yep. And I play in a band called Recovering. I usually only play with them when we do Van Halen songs, but they do full albums cover to cover. So you realize, now's our one chance to come up with the Modern Rogue theme song. <laughs> oh. So all you have to do is just figure out some musical parts and we'll figure out the lyrics. I'm a man. I can steal a van. I got a plan. But I don't know if I can, so I gotta have a partner. A demon haunted partner with a beard. That's me. <laughs> Cause I'm a modern bro! Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Thank Give you. Your ways, Steph. Thank you, Austin. Good night. See, I think the future is not subliminal messaging. It's sublatant messaging. Sublatant messaging? Buy stuff at scamstuff.com! That's horrible. <laughs> no? <laughs> That's the equivalent of a pop-up ad. <laughs> yeah, a verbal pop-up ad? It's like a human <laughs> pop-up ad. Because I'm a modern... Subliminal messaging. When was the first time somebody used the phrase subliminal messaging? As I understand it, it was 1957, a man named James Vickery, who was a market researcher, and he spliced in drink Coke, and eat popcorn into the reel of a movie, and apparently there was a big uptick in sales. Okay, now I had heard that that was completely non-scientific and it was completely self-reported, which is kind of code for not true. It was a hoax. Oh, it was? It was a <laughs> hoax. Yes, but it introduced it into the public lexicon. It made everyone afraid that advertisers were controlling their brains. So what's not a lie is the fact that laws were passed forbidding the practice of placing subliminal messaging into advertising content. Yes, but that didn't stop people. Oh, what? Wait, what? Yes. Wait, but, but there's a law. <laughs> there are lots sorry, of laws, sorry. Brian. Look, hello, Brian. I'd like to introduce you to a show. It's called The Modern Rogue. Yeah. So the whole question about whether or not subliminal messaging works is complicated because there's so many different types of alleged subliminal messages. You could do sub-audio messaging where something's very, very quiet or backmasking, which we figured out is largely total BS. But most people tend to think of sub-visual messages. This is stuff that's flashed so fast that the conscious mind can't read it, but that some part of the brain seems to pick up a statistically significant impression 
from the messages that are embedded. They also have things that are hidden in still images that you won't notice right away, but is allegedly worming its way into your subconscious. So you're talking about like the hidden arrow inside the FedEx logo. Yes, or in the Tostitos logo, where it's two friends enjoying a bowl of salsa or maybe a ritual sacrifice. I See, I know. like that better because I was afraid you are going to say TIT. It was like a sex sells thing. Of <laughs> course you were thinking that. But it's funny that you mentioned that because a lot of the times people find subliminal images where there probably wasn't anything intended by the advertiser. Stuff like the Lion King sex uh, star thing. Yes, or sex in the Pepsi cans from the 90s when you stack them. See, there's two questions. Number one, is this intentional? Number two, even if it is intentional, does it work? And I think that just like the back masking, a lot of those examples are just a case of being primed to look for a certain thing, and then you find it. Precisely. So everyone was afraid of it from the 50s, and especially in the 70s onward, up until maybe around the early 80s when a bunch of research came out and they said, this really doesn't do anything. Now that's not to say it's not possible to affect your purchasing decisions beyond the conscious level. They call that supraliminal advertising. Stuff like when you go to the grocery store and you hear French music playing, there's a statistically significant increase in French wine sales when that happens. Same thing during the holidays, whether it's holiday music or high intensity music, they're playing the flight of the bumblebee and you're just running around buying stuff. That is all very, very intentional. In fact, when I worked at a movie theater, we had orange countertops installed because in thousands and thousands of AB trials, orange countertops outsold magenta or lime green. I guess you could tell this was Cinemark in the late 90s. I don't you ever bring Front Row Joe up to me ever again. I love again. Front Row Joe! Gonna, no? I will cut him. I will cut his face. face. Do I? There's actually recent research indicating that, oh, maybe there is something to subliminal advertising, but it can't control you, it can just influence you. So when you say there's something to it, we're not talking about forcing people to do things they don't want to or buy things that they normally wouldn't. We're talking about in large scale trials, a statistically significant difference between using subliminal images versus not. Right, one example has researchers giving subjects a brick and they have to think of how many uses that they can get out of this brick. People that were subliminally flashed the IBM logo got this many uses out of it. People that were subliminally flashed the Apple logo this many uses No out. kidding, so it activated this thought of like, be creative, be original, think outside the box. Precisely. Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that where it's evidence that it doesn't create a need, but it does influence you trying to fulfill a need. Now along those lines, I would imagine that much more effective than a subliminal image would be for me to say, be really creative, think about Apple. Like that's something that's not subliminal at all, but I suspect would have an even larger impact. You would imagine so. I don't know though, because okay. I've never seen any research about that. Yeah, well, I just made that up. <laughs> that's, that's called a hypothesis. <laughs> Some of the other examples, if we look at this like uh, SFX magazine, the magazine is clearly SFX, but look how they've posed these models. What do you think of when you see that oh, title? Of course, no, it com you complete the image and you see the word sex. Whether or not this actually works, I don't know, but my guess is out of the corner of the eye, if I saw this magazine, I'd say, like, is that magazine called Sex? I would like a subscription to this primitive form of communication. Yes. One that I thought was particularly interesting is the Marlboro Formula One car. Yeah, I'm guessing for whatever reason they didn't want to put the actual Marlboro logo because I'm sure in different countries there's restrictions about advertising. And so instead you have this arrangement of barcodes that visually out of the corner of your eye as this thing is speeding past is going to look pretty much what a highly blurred out Marlboro logo would look like. Yeah, and that's an iconic image. It's been around for decades. And so it immediately makes you think, oh, I gotta have a smoke. <laughs> there was also a simplistic board game called Huskerdoo in the 60s. Huskerdoo, another fine product from Pick'em. They were actually in trouble with the FCC for planting frames inside their commercial that said, get it. Really? Yeah. In the 80s, there was a cartoon based on the show ALF, and they had one explosion. And for one frame in there, it showed this image of just Americana. It had the flag, it had the Statue of Liberty, it said the word America, and they busted them. They said, they're like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, it's an explosion, we just wanted something that would maybe give a little bit of extra pop. And it wasn't illegal, because it wasn't an advertisement, but it makes you wonder how many other cases like that are out there. Let's find out ourselves right now with our unwitting subjects. Yeah, right here in this video, we put a whole bunch of subliminal messages that hopefully have primed the folks at home to either think of the head side of a quarter or the tail side of a quarter, because they're gonna be given a choice right now now, 
Go ahead and fill out this poll. Choose either heads or tails. Don't go necessarily with what your favorite is, but just whichever one feels right. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not the priming, the subliminal images that we've used makes any difference at all. Once you guys have voted, then go out and you can actually scour through the episode and find all the individual messages that we hid in there. Then you will understand just how much we control you. <laughs> Which is donut, maybe. Which is zero, <laughs> absolutely zero. <laughs> Hey guys, if you dig the Mono Rogue, you can support us directly by picking up one of three awesome Mono Rogue t-shirt designs. Vanguard, Silverton, and Amendment 21, they're all at shop.themonorogue.com. What was the best arc in the Iron Man series? Uh, the one in his chest, the arc reactor. No, okay. <laughs> Bam! Cause I'm a Mono Improvise about the armor. All right, so let's say it's the apocalypse. All the zombies are uprising. They're demanding minimum wages. And meanwhile, the vampires are eating the wolverines that are punching the Professor X's. And all this guy wants to do is go steal some Gatorade from across at the Quickie Mart. How is a middle-class Joe like me, a gentleman, a warrior, and a scoundrel, supposed to pull that off? First of all, this sounds like a really bad Dungeons & Dragons session from junior high. I'm waiting for Mad Max to show up. Also, Mad Max shows up. Also, Mad Max shows up. <laughs> but he's got a lightsaber. Oh, my God. <laughs> How amazing would that be? Yes. Well, uh, you're gonna need some body armor. Yeah, dude. How good is body armor? And why aren't we all wearing it all the time? It's a little cumbersome. It's also Texas, and it would probably be very uncomfortable. Okay, but in my mind, body armor means one thing. We all think of Kevlar, which of course this is a super tough material that law enforcement use. But that's not the only way. The average Joe, I can't afford your highfalutin Kevlar. I'm too busy hiding underneath this sink, hoping that none of the clickers figure out I'm there. Clickers are there too? <laughs> yes, they're all there. It's a really rad story. The power of books, Brian. You're gonna make me read and learn. This comes from 100 Deadly Skills, a book written by an ex-Navy SEAL. Okay, how uh, how reliable? I assume this is like the Bible of taking care of yourself? Uh, we're gonna find out. Ooh, boy. There's some right. stuff in there that's kind of questionable if you ask me, but that's all the more reason for us to try it. So what can happen? You could get stabbed, poked, shot, and this will save you from how many of those? Yes. Wait, really? That's the idea. It's not your first choice, but when you're under fire, there's like John McClane, who's also in this universe, meets up with MacGyver and he says, I don't know, man, we gotta take these guys out. And MacGyver's like, hold on, I've got books. And then they team up, but they're also Voltron. I'll be over here. <laughs> and then, got, no, all you need is what you see right here. Uh, you got books, you got a cardigan that looks delightful and you've got duct tape. Am I missing something? Yes, we also have some cheap ceramic tiles. <laughs> try to break it. You want me to try to break yeah, it? with your hands, just try to break it. Well, the problem is ceramics, when they break, they oh, break bad. That's a good point. I mean, the problem is like, like I, like, I mean, right? The plan, I'm, I have much less confidence oh, in you know it. What? Oh, all of a sudden you're not sure you're gonna be Iron Man after this. Cause you, nah. before we started, you're all like, no, nah, it's fine, put it on <laughs> done. me, let's I'll do just it. just fly, you can fix the hole in the roof later. That, you didn't even hit that very hard. No, no, it's brittle, it's brittle. And sharp. I took a weapon and I made more weapons out of your defense. <laughs> this was for peace, Brian. <laughs> so you could get Gatorade for your family. All right, first step. You need at least like four hardcover books. You could probably use like phone books or something like that, but those are pretty sturdy, right? right. Reasonably. Yeah, yeah, uh, but we've done this show a year now and I know everyone's gonna roll their eyes when they say it, but I sincerely mean it this time. When it comes to stopping bullets, it doesn't seem like paper would be that strong. Oh, Brian, be of little faith. <laughs> can, can I get an idea? Yeah, do it. Okay, all right. Do it, yeah. yeah. All right, let's find out. Yeah, I mean, we, I, saw, I, we saw the ceramic shatter. Yeah, right? It's like, so so, so, so far, Hatchet is the, the hatchet winner, right? I'm suddenly way less gung-ho than I was going in. After you just kind of smacked the tile and... <laughs> I mean, yeah, again, it's brittle. All right, yeah. and I'm gonna go as hard, uh, ooh, eye protection. Eye protection. I am not gonna hold back. I am going to genuinely try, and I'm not gonna go flat on, because I know that that won't get down very far. I'm gonna try to hit it with that corner, so oh. it just goes ka-chunk, like, like okay. in all sincerity. I wanna make it all the way down into that second book, okay? As okay. deeply as I can. Okay. Give me something to shout. Uh, crumb. <laughs> all right, one, two, crumb! Bull <laughs> Bull the power of paper! Goddamn paper, my nemesis! It made it down to, like, you barely see a dent, 
on chapter four. What, not even halfway? Yeah. You want to try as hard as yeah. you can, as yeah. hard as you can. This time the line from Krull, power is fleeting, love is eternal. And then, Jew. Can I hit you instead? I'll just, I'll be back here. Power is fleeting, love is eternal. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah. I'm, bu I'm buying it, I'm buying it. About about the same. Yeah, and and it felt like as hard as you possibly could with that, right? Yeah, that was, that was, that was hard. Uh, all right, what about stabby things? Cause that's a choppy thing. See, that's not bad, but I mean like as hard as I can. Yeah, it's not getting anywhere. So you ready to uh, start building? Uh, yeah, I'm feeling, right. I'm feeling much better. Can I tell a secret? Yeah. You know, on my stage show, I take that 30 pound concrete brick and break oh, yeah. it over my head. Yeah. This is the same thing. The reason I can do that is because the sledgehammer, every time it hits the ceramics, it creates thousands of micro fractures. And so the bulk of the force is absorbed by that giant brick. You just see the same thing in the physics demos where they have the sledgehammer laying on them and they go boom, like, yeah. that's, these are actually meant to break. Ah, uh, so it distributes the force. Correct. Super effective, not reusable. Correct. So like here, take this insulation, soft and gushy like you, right? Just a blunt force object. Yeah. That's what that looks like. Sure. Try with the tile now. Oh, with the tile on top? Yeah. Right there. Same thing, look at that difference. Oh yeah. This one is your brain no longer works. This one is you've got a fighting chance. That's the power of all that fracturing. That is pretty remarkably different. I'm still disappointed that these broke so easily. They'll always break. That's yeah. what they are, they're made to break. That's, That's why they're there. Yeah. So the first step in building these is we're gonna make two separate plates, a taping, two books together on top of each other, Roger right? That. So you want that definite thickness. I would imagine that uh, anything less than an inch and a half, two inches, you risk. Because at this, I would suspect you might be as much as bulletproof. From some small caliber fire, like yeah. a 22 or something. 22, I think it here, would definitely. Here, you roll these, I'll roll this. There we go. All right, so you just need a brick. I'm gonna just hold this and you could just yeah. roll it. There you go, there you go. All right, let's do the other one. Okay. So just as long as you got two bricks, you're good. Yep. <laughs> I could just hear Die Hard MacGyver over in the corner and the bad guys are like, come out, come out wherever you are. And then they hear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Those are bricks. So we got a couple of bricks. All right, so now what? Now we're gonna put them together and make another Larger so, one? Oh, make this into a whole. Yeah. And this is a good point, right? Because when you are shooting at someone, there's only two shots. You got the head shots and then you got the vitals right here. Yes. This is 100% of your vitals covered to some degree, right? Exactly. You probably don't, don't want to <laughs> run around. Like that. You can't get a head shot. It's a little suspicious. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we'll make these into one brick. Okay. And yeah, you're, there's no reason to not be super generous oh, with the duct, duct tape. tape. Yeah. Plus also like the duct tape itself, I would imagine has that, that tensile strength, you know, yeah. it's gonna have that kind of rebound effect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and then you were saying you need ceramics? Yeah. Now, maybe we should scale it like armor? I don't uh, know, what do you think? Here's what'll happen, right? And the shattering is important, but the moment these shatter, they become dangerous, right? Yes. So let's do kind of like a low tech safety glass where- Do we want to do- Yeah, like yeah, that? I think it's great, yeah. So it's like, they're gonna shatter, but all the pieces are gonna be in there. And I'll put them on the- Just, it's fine. And so, yeah, I would say we probably want it to be all the way completely covered, right? Uh, yeah, especially since these are going to shatter and you're gonna have all of these, the duct tape will ideally, I already cut myself a little bit. Like it's super safe, great armor. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> The duct tape will ideally hang on to all of the little sharp particles. Okay. Dude, uh, these will shatter for sure. Yeah. Um, that I assume will have some effect at stopping blades and bullets. How do you attach, you make a harness? Yeah. We're gonna put it like right here. You're gonna wrap it around me and then go over my shoulders again. Got it. This is why MacGyver and John McClane are a team. Are they? They work together, yeah. That's, how oh. else did they defeat Kroll? Come on, man. More of your, yeah. Tiamat, and the yep. chick from uh, Stranger Things shows up and she's all levitating and she goes, let's do this, boys. And they're like, we got armor. Here, spin. I, go, uh, keep going. I would read this out of more, this if it were a comic book, out of morbid curiosity of just how bad it is. Uh, pfft, how bad ass, you left I out mean, the word ass. 
I lived through the Clone Saga and 90s image. Oh, you're talking about the, the Peter Parker? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, God. And it really can't be worse than like Youngblood, so. All right, here we go, here we go. And then, oh, the nice thing about these is they give something for this to hook on so it becomes a proper harness. Oh, yeah. So you kind of hook this underneath. There we go. It was way cleaner and neater in the book. And I'm intentionally gonna not cover up much of this other stuff because I don't want to get the visual illusion that this is safe to strike. Oh, like we, yeah. want, we want it really yeah, clear. Yeah. In fact, hold on. You, you, my friend, are a new breed of superhero. Target man. <laughs> oh boy, I see what you're doing. <laughs> We're gonna next putting the sweater on. I mean, if, if you want to ruin a sweater too, I'm, I'm down for all of the above. Pretty sure this is actually your sweater. It's good, it's a pro job. <laughs> you feeling it? I like it. I feel like the sweater may give you some protection if I miss. Mm, it's fine. All right, now how do you feel right now as far as mobility? Good. Yeah? Yeah, it's like I could dance a little bit in this. <laughs> I still got moves. I could fight. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Grab the nunchuck. Oh, oh yeah, actually, okay, all right, let's do this. Show me the Jason Murphy we all fell in love with. Remember what happened last time? <laughs> I know, so I'm just, uh, yeah. I'll be over here. I wonder if I, yeah, I think I got mobility. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I don't have one of those. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. No, it's a little weird. Okay, well that's fine. Around. Do you want to whack me real good with the nunchucks? Yeah. Ready? Do it. Oh, it stung, but it, it works. It's effective. I'm gonna do the super Oh, the big one. Did you know that when it came to self-defense, that police had two sticks? There was the day stick and then the night stick. Really? The night stick was the longer one. That's where that word comes from. Wow. <laughs> I felt like I was sucker punching you, and even as it was happening, I was thinking like, shouldn't do, shouldn't do, feels good. The only thing that sucked was on the follow through, you got my arm. Yeah, you okay though? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Okay, all right, all right, back, yeah, but back, this back is, right, yeah, this right, is nothing, right, man. Right. Ah! Whoo, whoo. Got me worse than it got you. Yeah. Okay, so so for bludgeons, objects, we're good. Because a lot of times when you see someone pull off the body armor or something like that, they're still bruised underneath, yeah, like yeah, really yeah. badly. Wait, but you didn't feel nothing. It stung a little okay. bit. All right, so I suppose if we were wildly irresponsible, I could try stabbing you with the full on knife, but I've already proven to my satisfaction that the knife will not make it in there. Yes. But I do want to know if it's, the likely to slip to the side or anything, or, or what, if a glancing blow. So I'm gonna use the the butterfly bottle opener. Fair, okay. I, I, I was... just I just want to experience the sensation of just dropping a shiv and letting you have it. Can, okay. can I, may I? I think so. Hey, you uh, you that modern rogue? Trevor sends his regards. Wow, you did that with vigor. I well, I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I, in my head, since I've known you. When you're scripting, <laughs> when you're scripting out action sequences for your fan fiction. Yeah. Okay, all right, call that. Um, yep. You remember this bad boy, right? Yeah, how could I forget? <laughs> so obviously, it was the pellets that made this thing terrifying before. The they were tear gas. really hard, too. Yeah, well, not as hard as rubber bullets, which is what I got for you this time. Oh, good. <laughs> you want to test them out? Like you're suppressing my protest or something? <laughs> yes, exactly. Here, uh, let me get some eye protection. So obviously these bullets are gonna kill you, but let's say you were just this guy, then. <laughs> look at that, look at, look at that. So do you believe I can hit that many for that many? Do it. I'm ready. Really? I'm ready. Really? Yes. All right. Round two. Hey, buddy, I don't know who you think you are, but you can't go running around like that. Not no crazy armor in this town. Oh, what? Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Okay, now I'm more scared than you. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to grab you by the throat and raise you up, but do you remember the push-up thing? Yes. It didn't work out so well. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Wow. And this is nothing on there, huh? One final test. Ah, oh, geez. Full on hatchet, huh? Who <sighs> oh boy. Just don't slip and like hit me in the face or well, something. Well, that's, I mean, that's where we're irresponsible, right? I mean, we got to test yeah. whether or not I can chop through it. Absolutely. I already, both of us, 
tried to get through one book as yeah. hard as we possibly could. Can we just call it and say it's choppy proof? No. I, I just... Okay. Still got to do it. <laughs> don't miss. I'm going to practice with the blunty side okay. first, okay? okay? I'm going to give it to you as hard as I can. Also, don't miss with that one. One, two, blunty side test! Yep. Oh. I mean, it was it was a formidable blow. Yeah? Yeah. Well, I heard it ring out, and I assume that it shattered the... Oh my gosh. What? There's still bullets <laughs> in you! <laughs> <laughs> you are a T-1000! Oh. This is amazing! Okay, I'm, I'm gonna give you choppy side. All right, do it. You trust? I do. This is so bad, so bad. Oh! I chopped you! Yeah, it, it stung. It felt morally bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a point in my brain, I'm like, I'm chopping my friend. I'm good, man. You're, you're done? It, yeah, I think the biggest pain was... Basically punched you. It, I, it was like the one inch punch. I think what it was was the space between the book and my stomach. And so when it hit, it was basically just the book like slapping against God, me. God, it stung, but that was about it. Plus I was tensed up. Yeah, sure, sure. And my abs could already pretty much deflect hatchets and bullets uh, anyway. All right, all right. We're gonna dissect you and see kind of how much of this survived. So outside of the gut punchingness, it felt not bad? It wasn't even so much a gut punch. It was just this flat surface slapping against my stomach. Holy cow. I don't even think the tile Busted. Actually, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did. Yeah. So, so again, that's that mi micro fractures. Yeah. The absorption of that energy went into fracturing this thing rather than fracturing your ribs. Look at that. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't even put in multiple layers of the tiles, which is something we totally could have done. Oh yeah. But I mean, but the, like, just you're made of. You're more machine now than man. If I had to choose between having that and not having that on my kid, I'd be having that on my kid. Yeah. That's amazing. What are you gonna do now, Mad Max and I'm gonna, zombies? I'm gonna run fast right now. <laughs> get out of here, get out of here! Ah! Okay, that stuff is still really sharp. Oh, okay. <laughs> by the way. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Back again in an undisclosed location. <laughs> Wait, hold on. This is, where are we? This bar sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm a modern bro! All right, you've got nothing. What should every modern rogue's bar have? Dude, I don't know, but I know a guy who does know. His name's Trevor. Thank you for coming out of your dark, dank, secret oh, cave. absolutely. And joining us Thanks all the way out of the homestead. So what should every modern rogue start his bar with? I like to start off with a nice, good whiskey. I chose Buffalo Trace, which is a Kentucky straight bourbon. All right, now when you say whiskey, I get all intimidated because there's scotch and rye and bourbons. Do I need to know any of that? Just stick with a straight bourbon out of Kentucky and everything should go fine. The reason I chose this is because it's smooth and you can mix it with just about anything. Or you can just drink them straight up. Right, that's <laughs> what I thought it would look like. Sadness. Yeah. Okay, camaraderie. I'm sorry, I was mistaken. Sadness, you mean joy. <laughs> joy. Uh, I like to start off with a good vodka next. Uh, this is Tito's, a handmade vodka out of Austin, Texas. So every time I hear about vodka, it's all about how many times it's been filtered, right? Is is vodka so inherently nasty that what you want to do is filter out all the vodka-ness? Well, it's a neutral grain spirit, so the more that it's filtered, the more that it gets all that kind of nasty junk out. But quite honestly, you don't really have to spend a lot of money on vodka to find a good vodka. So there's two different types of vodka, right? There's grain vodkas and potato vodkas. Right, and you're going to see more grain vodkas on the market. What it boils down to is preference on that. Uh, I t typically like a grain uh, vodka, and like I said, you don't have to spend much money to find a good one. In fact, all of these are in the sweet spot of price versus taste. None of them are gonna break the bank, and uh, none of them are well drinks. Next up, just a, a simple Blanco tequila. I chose Espelon. This is becoming more and more popular. You're starting to see this kind of all over the country. They're really starting to explode. So is this one you would drink straight or mainly for mixers? A lot of people like do shots of this quite honestly around here, but it's good for mixers. It's good for margarita. This is actually the tequila that we used in the spicy Texas margarita. Oh, so good. This is the tequila for Gary's fire crotch. Right on. <laughs> yeah, the, the, again, we gotta talk about that name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't name it, it's not me. Next up, gin. Ah, the old pine needle serum. <laughs> 
And that's actually why I chose Boodles, because Boodles is a very neutral, dry gin. Wait, really? Mm -hmm. It's that juniper that really makes it pop and, and makes me think of Christmas because it's like you're eating a Christmas tree. A lot of people think that gin smells like hairspray. Really? Yes, I love gin. No, I do too. You know what I love about gin is that every time you drink gin, you know you're drinking. It's There's no fooling yourself. You're yeah. like, oh, I'm having a cocktail. It's a sweet little treat. Now, Boodles is not one of the more floral gins like Hendrix, right? Correct. It's, uh, it's more neutral, like you were saying. So is it, this is good for mixtures, but can you drink this straight as well? Yes. You can drink any liquor straight if you really oh, want to. Man, if you're a committed alcoholic, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> That is way more neutral than I would have expected. Mm -hmm. It's all in the aftertaste. You'll you'll taste nothing on the upfront. It'll all be just um, in the mouthfeel afterwards. Oh, that's good. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that is. I like it. This will splash a little right there. <laughs> it's so clean smelling, you know? Just, oh, love it. And to round out our core hard alcohols, what do we got? We got rum. And I chose Appleton Estate, which is a Jamaican rum. Yeah, okay, so there are dark rums and light rums. I assume mm -hmm. that's, is that just all coloring or is that the nature of the rum? It's the distillation process. It's how much sugar's in it. It just depends on where it comes from. Uh, Jamaican rums, you're often gonna find a little bit sweeter. Okay. And that's why I like this rum. It's a good mixing rum. So on a spectrum from like Bacardi Silver to Myers Dark, where would this end up? Fall in the middle. Okay, right on. Mm -hmm. Not quite like a uh, Captain Morgan. No, no, <laughs> not, not at all. Would you prefer this oh, to Captain man. Morgan? Oh, absolutely. This is this is real rum. I mean, Captain Morgan is a cartoon. It's all branding, right? It's, yeah, yeah. It's all about the spicing. Well, if you want to feel like a pirate. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, it's got a real fresh bite to it, but then it's also got that sweetness. It's a very interesting taste. So, all right, so we got the core alcohols covered, so you can make most drinks using these five different hard liquors. Talk to me about the extra stuff, the stuff that's too fancy for me to understand. <laughs> okay, well, first up, we've got just our regular sweet and dry vermouth. And these are gonna be for our martinis, our Manhattans, things like that. And vermouth is basically a supremely condensed white wine, basically? Fortified wine, and the sweet vermouth has sugar added to it. Got it. So what do the vermouths make possible? The dry vermouth is going to be for your martinis, gin martinis, vodka martinis, sweet vermouths, uh, drinks like the Manhattan that we did earlier. Over here we have a bottle of simple syrup. You want to add this to certain things just to take bitterness away from some of your drinks. This is just sugar and water. You can make this yourself, or if you're lazy like me, you can buy it in a bottle. So I guess this basically saves you the time of pouring sugar into a drink and then muddling it or mixing it enough for the sugar to dissolve. This is all just pre-dissolved sugar. Exactly. Next up we have Angostura aromatic bitters. Okay, now this is one that I guess has been at bars all my life, but I've never really noticed or whatever. Don't let him drink. I, no, 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 I just want, I might have to drink this. <laughs> I knew it. I just want to know. At least he uses a glass. Well, and if you remember when we made our Manhattan and right. when we made our old fashioned, we involved a lot of bitters in there. Yeah. It's got that tanginess and, and it's got that, um, I don't know, all I could describe is that the sides of my tongue feel electric yeah. now. As we've discussed before, there are lots of different types of bitters, but right. this is one of the most popular. You can get them in various flavors like orange and peach and blueberry and et cetera, et cetera. So what does this do to the flavor profile of most drinks that you add it to? Well, I mean, with it being bitters, it actually makes the drink a little bit bitter, but it also makes it just a more complex drink. So if you are crafting a drink and you can tell it's just too sweet in general, that will offset it and add a more robust yeah, and you texture. only need a couple of dashes. And then we've got our old standbys here. Well, uh, club soda, I think we all are familiar with, but Tonic water, uh, look man, I ain't got malaria. I don't need quinine. <laughs> Explain to me why I need sugar in the bitterest drink on the planet. I mean, really, that comes down to preference. Uh, I've noticed a lot of people moving to soda these days over tonic because less calories and people are more health conscious. So it's all not how sweet you want it. You can actually go out and buy diet tonic now if you want, so it's less sugar in your drink. Confession time, when I want to feel like I'm drinking but I'm not drinking, I drink diet tonic water. <laughs> <laughs> because it's hard to drink. I'm just like, ooh, oh, oh, this must be a drink. <laughs> That's so sad. That's so sad. All right, look, you got your core kit. What can you make the moment you pick all this up? Well, how many times have you been in my bar and I had to make you drinks? I'm in your bar now. Oh, so you're saying we're the one who has to. All right, what's something we can make with this? I think you can make our Manhattan right now. Okay. I, I remember 212. It was 212. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, two, two, two bourbon. Uh, 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 Dash of bitters. Uh, yes and two sweet vermouth? Yes. No? no. Uh, oh my God, what was it? I'm gonna watch the episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, see, so, so, so we need this. Mm -hmm. uh, we need the, the bitters for sure, and the, and the bourbon. All right, do you wanna do the chilled glass and all that? Here, I'm gonna chill the glass, you watch the rest of this. Okay, two, one, two. 
two, one. Two. Oh, I, I got the I got the ingredients right. Yes. I got the ingredients right. I just got the the proportions wrong. All right, look, we're gonna start off. We're gonna chill the glass just like we were taught. Boy, I I didn't realize we were up for the bar exam. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I think I can pass this. Does this mean we're lawyers now? All right, so I've chilled the glasses. Let me get ice inside the shaker. Team effort, dude. This is an open book yes. exam. Yes. The bar cops are watching us. They're here. All right, so I have ice inside the shaker. Okay. I've chilled the glasses. I seem to remember after the glasses are totally chilled, we have to dump those out. Yep. Uh, and it's two, one, two. Yes. What, are, what are the parts? Is it sweet or it's, dry vermouth? No, 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 it's, it's sweet vermouth. It's two, one, and then two. Okay, all right. Well, then we're gonna use the bartender. We'll do, uh, here, g give me give me two parts uh, in here, right? Yep. All right, so that's one, two for me. Now one, two for you. Got it. The one is right here. Okay, got it. All right, this is uh, the sweet vermouth. Mm -hmm. right, right. I'm just don't, don't look at him, don't right. look at him. We're taking our exam. There you go. It's one for me and one there you go. for you. And then what? Uh, dashes of aromatic bitters. So we got about four dashes yep, totally. Th there you here. go. So dash, it's just two. Dash so. it up. One, two, three, four. four. Got it. Okay. All right, like here. So. You, you okay. stir that gently. How many rotations? 20? Uh, I think it was 20 rotations. Sure. I think I'm, that's what he said. I, I, I just remember I'm supposed to ditch this on the ground, <laughs> but I'm going to do it in the sink. One, right. two, five. Six. So excited. Smart Stupidly excited. We good? No. How about now? Now we're good. All right. Here you go. Don't shake it. Hold it. I will not. I will not shake it. Because okay. we don't want to dilute it. We don't want to break up the ice. There's no egg in there. There's one. There's two. We don't have any cherries, but that's okay. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay, real quick. What the hell are these glasses anyway? What are we? Shut up. What are we on this deck of the Enterprise? I don't judge you. Was they this, were free. Did you get these from the Ten they Forward? They came with booze. Did Whoopi Goldberg serve it's them to fine. you? It's fine. It's <laughs> fine. Welcome to Ten Forward. <laughs> Here you go. I get to be the judge here. Not bad, guys. Not we got bad, the right. nod. Bad when last all. we met, I was but the learner. <laughs> now I, I am the master. master. Trevor, thank you so much for joining Absolute us, man. Awesome. This is amazing. I, I, I have a bar now. This is awesome. <laughs> well, you have most of a bar. <laughs> we are a fan, mother <laughs> Get back here. <laughs>
Uh, if everybody was deleting your files, you would know to use a virus cleaner, but if they're quiet, discreet, kind of like actual human viruses, you know, something that makes you, gives you a little bit of a fever, makes you cough a little bit, just enough to propagate throughout, it, it makes them a living host. Exactly. What are the things that they did uh, to use these numbers to attack a single DNS server that took down Twitter and Spotify and Netflix and Reddit for about six hours? was taking advantage of the Internet of Things. Uh, so Internet of Things, um, very popular in recent days, is basically giving an operating system and a networking stack to a small embedded device, like your refrigerator or your toaster or your thermostat. They're all running a full operating system. They're running full code the same way that your laptop or desktop would. So like right now, even in the studio, we have Philips Hue lights everywhere, but these are actual miniature computers that are running, and we think of them in terms of soldiers that take orders, but they could give orders orders because they're connected to the internet. Absolutely, yeah. So what's kind of terrifying about this is that anyone with even rudimentary coding abilities can access these applications and wreak widespread havoc. Absolutely. So there's a commonly available tool out there right now, Low Orbit Ion Cannon, that you just download this application, fire it up on your computer, and now you're a bot who's able to launch deadly traffic against a particular victim, along so, with everyone else running this same tool. So if I'm hearing you correctly, every computer you install this software on becomes kind of a full-time job of doing nothing but ringing the doorbell of a certain server. And if you get enough computers running the same software all on the same target, they can't possibly keep up. Yep, that's the idea. You're overwhelming their ability to respond to you so that they can't respond to a legitimate person trying to buy something from their website. That's fascinating because you don't actually shut anything down. All you do is create a big enough crowd on the outside of whatever this establishment is that nobody can get in. Yes, it's a very temporary attack. Your goal is just to interrupt the availability of this site for a particular window of time. So one common attack would be, for example, uh, let's denial of service a sports wet betting website right before the big event. Oh shoot, so you place a bunch of bets early on and then you affect, you see that it's like, okay, uh, maybe maybe some fact has changed in the game and now you know this guy's mom died or whatever, you expect him to perform poorly, it changes the betting spread, so you're like, hey, no, block everybody from oh, getting wow. in there. I got in when the betting was good. Or even just say, come to the sports betting website and say, I'm gonna take down your website during these peak hours for your business model unless you give me these Bitcoins. On so the this side. is straight up extortion. Yep. So we have a very basic illustration of that, right? Yes, all right. For our illustration, because we don't want to actually engage in any kind of malware attack, we're going to do a virtual one. I will play the server. Right now, we have a live chat room. Hello, live chat room. Hello, there world. Are. There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, good, 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 good. So let's consider this a miniature ask me anything. Hi, I'm a server. I'm here to answer the questions you have. I'm going to do as fast as a Brian Brushwood can answer questions. And in fact, uh, let's go ahead and start that right now. Everybody in the chat started asking me questions. I'll answer as many as I can. I'm sure I can. How tall am I? I am five foot seven inches. Got it. How do I juggle work and family? Uh, it's hard. You skipped one. Uh, what's my preferred Nick Schwood? Why is the sky blue? Because uh, what is three plus three six? Send me the files, please. Will do. Pickles as a hamburger topping? No. Who's your favorite co-host? Jason. There you go. Next. Who is your daddy and what does he do? Uh, is Al. And what does he do? Uh, uh, he's my dad. How many displays are in your studio? Ah, oh, jeez, one, two, three, four, yeah, a lot. What's the longest bike ride you've ever gone on? Uh, 100 miles. Were you a straight A student in high school or a troublemaker? No, B plus. Who's your third favorite magician? David Blaine. And what's your favorite fast food restaurant? Oh geez, Sonic. No, no, Taco Bell. All right, this is not bad, but I feel like I can kind of get through all of these. Uh, no, you've been skipping a lot of them. What, what, I, a, I'm getting through them. That is very poor I'm a performance. very popular server, Jason. I'm doing my best. So what does a DDoS look like? How different from that normal flow is it? You'd be getting thousands and thousands of requests from all different places, and you have no idea how to tell which one is a real person interested in the answer and which one is just a bot moving on to the next question as soon as they answer. So it might be one of them is somebody actually offering money, and then meanwhile I can't find them in the sea of thousands of nonsense like, hey, are you there? Are you awake? Are you alive? Yep. Let's see what that would look like. Commence the DDoS attack. Are you there, Schwood? Uh, Have you yes. ever had Taco Bell Cantina that serves beer? Uh, yes. Is your no, belly no, button in here no. or an Audi? Any? What, uh, the windows 
Mr. Mack, have what? you ever been denied of service? Uh, Are you there, Schwood? No. Uh, have you tried the Taco Bell Cantina that serves beer? I am. Have you tried the Taco Bell Cantina that serves beer? Uh, How many seagulls can you fit in a Mazda Miata? Uh, How hot lot. is the sun? Uh, Did your 12-year-old do a, a good lot. question babysitting? Uh, uh, what's yes. your favorite beer? How much does Justin's uh, beard weigh? What is the best thing that's ever happened to you? Right, Who's I'm your sorry. third favorite magician? Windows or Mac? Uh, Are you there, Schwood? Windows, <laughs> which one have you ever considered bathing in Jello? Have you ever tried the Taco Bell Cantina that serves beer? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Where are the files? Have you tried turning it off and on again? Are you there, Schwood? Are you there, Schwood? Because Why is your hair spiky? Are you there, Schwood? Are you there, Schwood? Why is your hair spiky? I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm shutting down the server. I'm shutting down the server. There's no way. This is inhumane treatment of perfectly fine servers. Oh, uh, did we just waterboard the Schwood server? Yes, you did. I'm not okay. Also, what is this Taco Bell cantina that serves beer? Oh, there's one in Austin now. Okay. All right, hold on. Let me find out. See. This is a civilized conversation we're having now. <laughs> I feel bad for the server. That's very stressful. You know what I feel bad for? The IT person who has to answer for what's happening. So if you find yourself in the middle of a DDoS attack, what, what do you do? Is there anything you can do? It's basically already too late at that point. So with DDoSs, you want to prepare for the attack and have your mitigation strategies in place before it happens. You'll need to partner with a DDoS mitigation service. They'll usually have very huge pipes to the internet, uh, as well as some techniques like of work that causes the client to prove that it's a legitimate request. Basically, they're going to route you through their own connections to the internet so that they have control over the upstream before it gets to your server. So I think we learned something very valuable here today. You are a terrible server. Okay, yes, well, you're a terrible intermediary, but you're a bad API. Bad API. You're like a trash 80. Oh yeah, you're like an Apple IIe that I pooped on. <laughs> no, no, sorry. <laughs> How many fire extinguishers do you have in your house? Oh, it's like three. I have seven. I have seven? seven. Well, okay, three of them are these rinky-dink ones. It's literally called Fire Be Gone. <laughs> it's a little can. I have them in the studio and everywhere. Super soaker? Shh. Yeah, Fire Be Gone. For when the safety of your family matters, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a modern bro! I saw this on an old Mr. Wizard. Oh my God, I saw that one too. Don Herbert was the man. We're gonna simulate an actual real deadly phenomenon. Silo fires are a real thing and they are no joke. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Check this out. This is from FEMA, 1985. Three firefighters were killed trying to extinguish a fire in a low oxygen silo. That's ones where they have no windows or ventilation or anything. They start blasting in the water. The water has enough oxygen that they end up feeding oxygen into the silo. It explodes, the concrete roof rockets up four feet, flinging everyone off and killing them, creating a giant explosion. That's terrifying. Yeah. I'm not doing this episode. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> I think we're in the same boat here. The biggest explosion we've ever seen was done with a gasoline fire. When we blew up the car? Oh, yes. The modern road gets a copyright strike. There were some other explosives in there. That's right, but those were trigger explosives. The bulk of it was the, the exploding gasoline because right. you got that vapor combination, right? So here's the crazy thing. All hydrocarbons, whether they're benzene, naphtha, or wood, all burn at roughly the same temperature. That's where the whole meme of fire can't melt steel beams comes from. So in the case of like gasoline explosions, what they do is they get a bunch of gas in there, they let it vaporize, and it's the vapor chain reaction. It's the same way the fire blast works when you see sideshow performers doing it, right? It's a lot like our episode of alcohol flammability. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because the flashpoint matters, how much of oxygen is in there, how rich it is. But it turns out that works even for substances that we don't think of as explosive hydrocarbons because they can hang in the air so that you, they make this giant chain reaction that goes nuts. In fact, if you get yourself some non-dairy creamer, you can actually make a flamethrower by getting a suspension. Look at that! It's a tremendous surface area, so it burns much more quickly. Right, and it's oxygen rich and it has a lot of fats in there. Those lipids are super combustible. What? <laughs> That's a little bigger than I expected. <laughs> A 
And it's not just flour or coffee creamer. It can happen in like coal mines. Another hydrocarbon, right? Exactly. Anywhere where there's a lot of fuel waiting for oxygen. That's interesting because you think obviously coal is super combustible and there's an entire mountain of it, but you don't worry about it because there's no oxygen. So what are we doing here? Because if I take this fire and I put it in this bag, like nothing's happening. Oh Except God! <laughs> <laughs> there was that brief flash where I was like, no, I thought that that was the, oh dear. <laughs> but my point is, I can't get this to burn. I mean, if we if we do right. a little a little powder here, th there's no way I can get that to do anything. It has to be suspended, right? Now, one of the common myths with dust fires was that it needed to be in a contained area. That's not it at all. However, if it is in a contained area, like in a silo, it could build up pressure, which makes it much more explosive. So like right now, just trying to light this stuff on fire, I can't get anything to happen, but right. I'm gonna assume that if I do like a ninja powder thing, something will happen. I should. It's <laughs> <laughs> one flaw in my plan. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> A little bit. So I guess it does matter the type of powder you're dealing with because this wants to kind of clump together and it doesn't fall in that fine mist the way yeah. that the coffee creamer did. Some of them are going to be much more flammable than others, of course, but the best way to do it is have a simulated silo environment. Okay, so like this? Like that. Actually, here, you wanna start with the tiny one first? Yeah, let's do the tiny one. Okay, pop off the lid. Just gonna drill That's a, a hole in the side. Wiggle, wiggle the drill. Yeah. Our viewers love it when you wiggle the drill. <laughs> oh, did, did we hear about that? We heard about that. Also, we don't have a vice. They're going to be all over this. Whoop. Okay. So how much do we have to worry about like an airtight seal in here? I don't think you do. Okay. And if it doesn't work, then we'll tape it up. Okay, so all we're doing right now is just putting a little pile of it right over that tube inside there, right? Just in the bottom, really. Oh, really? So as yeah. long as it all gets stirred up, it should work? Yeah. And then for the source, we'll just light one of these matches and let it take its time? Yeah, you just light some of the matches, you drop it in there, we're gonna put the lid on and then blow into the tube. It seems like we, eye protection. Do we want to try blowing this once and see what kind of cloud comes out? I don't know. Maybe. Don't know. Let, let's, let's see. Yeah, so sure. it, what I predict will happen is we'll see a puffy cloud of pretty much what that stuff looked like. I don't even know if that's going to happen. Really? Yeah. Oh. Sure did. Okay. Sure did. I stand correct. That's great. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go to hell, Brushwood. <laughs> Nickelodeon gag! I know! <laughs> <laughs> you jerk. Okay, so theoretically, that's gonna give us the perfect cloud to get a nice combustion on this, yeah. right? So I'm just gonna drop that in. It looks like it's out. Yeah. It's, it's so weird because I want to think of it as fuel and I'm like, oh no, it's going to be near that flower and do nothing. Right. So we're gonna create the volatile mix mm -hmm. inside the yeah. sealed thing. We're gonna create the, the mix. We'll have oxygen. Okay, let's, let's try it open and just see what happens. <laughs> I'm gonna bend this all the way over so it s sticks straight up like that. Okay, so it doesn't right. get buried and, yeah. and put out by the flower. Right, so we want the flames above where all the flower is sitting. All right, come on, Mr. Wizard. Do you want, do you want to try with, the, with this stuff yeah. instead? Yeah, yeah, actually. Okay, well. Yeah, it seems like this is a much finer grain. So that's interesting. So the fact that the flour is clumpy is problematic. This non-dairy creamer is a lot closer to, if I remember correctly, he used lycopodium powder. Did he back really? In the day. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, obviously flour can happen. There are documented cases of, you know, horrific explosions with it. All right, non-dairy creamer, get back. Yeah. All right, let's try it with the lid on. Whoop, all right. All right, well, let, let's do, it does smell like something happened. I don't know if that worked or not. <laughs> let's try it with a big one. Yeah, yeah. And then that way we could get a big mixture, fuel air. Actually here. Hey. Do you want to start with the flour? Or do you want to go straight to the uh, let's go. Uh, let's go creamer. to the stuff we've already seen yeah. work to some extent, All right. right? And I think we need a lot of it. So I've got a single lit match over in the corner. I'm gonna seal this up. We got a little bit of time. Ready? <laughs> I think we're on to something though. We're real close. Yeah? Do we need the candle? So here's what a candle would do is it wouldn't blow out so much. Yeah. Whoa, hey. There it is. Let's clean all that up. 
So here's the thing, if it's taller, I'll bet that the flame stays undisturbed as everything swirls around and finally it connects with the cloud. It's good in theory, let's try it. I feel like it's at the right height. I feel like we're not gonna blow the candle out. I think this is it. If we can't pull off something that Mr. Wizard did 30 years <laughs> Don't ago. Don't you, he's so much better than we'll ever be. Get it real sealed, real sealed. Bang, bang, bang. All right, back up, back up. Oh, oh, that was it, that oh, was it. Oh, oh, it's happening. That was a success. Okay. Oh, and it's still Candle's going. Candle's still burning, yeah. Okay, no, so that we, was just, a, we need more you of... You think we need more creamer? Yeah. Because that was not just you blowing. No, 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 that was definitely kind yeah. of a combustive thing. Yeah. You want to do the honors? <laughs> I farted. <laughs> you blew, and it kind of built up, and it goes... <laughs> <laughs> so do we need to uh, tape? Yeah, we, I think we should tape everything down and get a real percussive burst yeah. so it just all goes in there. All right, so matting tape to get a good seal down at the oh, bottom. Okay, I brought some. Also hopefully keep it positioned the same direction. Do you know that non-dairy creamer is what space ice cream is made of? Really? Yeah, it's just straight up this because it's so efficient. It's pure calories and oh, nothing else. Okay. You know who told me that? Richard Gary. You ah, I yeah. knew it. His dad, his dad sold that when he was, when he was a kid, or his really? family did. Uh, this is what I heard. All right, I'm gonna give it one good percussive pop. It's gotta work, right? Okay, three, two, one. <laughs> yes! <laughs> so much more metal Woo! than it looked when I was a kid. Yeah. That was big. <laughs> that was big. I don't know what we hit up there. <laughs> oh, that was, was an explosion. It was way better than I thought. We, we made an explosion thingy. Let's do it again. Okay, so, okay, so it, you could tell it mattered because I banged it and got it sealed on yeah, there and yeah. you could see the puff came out, the mixture was there, and then there was so much of a combustion that it, it could no longer leak out here, but instead just boom. Yeah. Wow, wow. You, you want to go outside? For safety? Oh. Nah, it's fine. And, okay. All right, you go this time, blow it hard. Okay. Like, give it a good pop. Ready? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I didn't seal it. It, it kind of worked, it. but yeah. Okay. Oh, it's cooking that stuff. Yeah, you yeah. can smell it. I'm, I'm positioning all the stuff so it flies. Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, there you go. I'm, I'm gonna retape it too. Don Herbert is shaking his head in heaven <laughs> at our shoddy craftsmanship. Uh, to be fair, he was doing that in life as well. <laughs> he did that while we were eight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so this one, oh, man, we banged this up pretty good. Best you I'll can. Do, I'll do the best I can. All right, here we go. Feels okay. pretty solid. Ready. Woo! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh my god! Super successful. That was amazing. That was so fun. And terrifying. I will never go to a farm again. <laughs> Silo fires are what did no I tell you? joke. Oh, that was great. Okay, so at this point, we have a 100% success rate with coffee creamer. Nope. There's only one problem, and that's that nobody has a silo full of coffee creamer. Do you think we could do it on flour? What would be different? I think we are obligated to try. All right. So yeah, it really mattered having the position just right on that candle, because obviously, like, all of these were just garbage. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put a pile of it right on top. Oh yeah, right on top of the hose. So the only thing that could screw us up now is if the top has become so dented that it doesn't get a good seal. Right. Because that seal definitely seems to matter. Here we go. Okay. Huh. It's leaking out to the okay. side. All right, all right, so we'll seal it off. Better. Any of it that's not in the right place is just not gonna burn. Right. It's only the air fuel mixture mm -hmm. that's gonna go up. So I bet we could go a little bit nuttier on the flour. I'm gonna seal it. All right. Tight all the way around. Do it. All right, ready, set. Whoa! 
flower fire! Yes! Woo oh, wow! All right, we gotta stop. We've got yeah, a problem. Uh, this is an addiction. I can do this all night. Let's do something safe, like, like booze. Like drinking! Yeah. <laughs> The modern rogue a hundred years from now is just people used to do a thing called smoking and then our great grandchildren's clones walk up they set up the bozo dummy they light the cigarette and they run away and they're like oh i can't believe it it's doing it it's it's smoking so cigarette. much cancer because <laughs> i'm a modern rogue all I see is a bunch of disposable lighters from litterers. This is garbage and you have garbage in my warehouse. These are miniature flashbangs. It's really, really simple, not at all practical. All right, you have my attention. What's the story? This is in 100 Deadly Skills, mm -hmm. written by an ex-Navy SEAL, and it's billed as a diversionary flash device. Something that you can distract the enemy while you run away. That's right, okay, again. Smoke bomb! Again, all right, so so you and I are hold up the, the Nazi ninja uh, clones of Hitler running around, and this is, and you bust out, you're like, Brian, I've recently taken up smoking. I have a lot of lighters. Talk to me to the theory of what we're trying to do here. Essentially, what we're trying to do is extract the flint, heat it up, and then throw it at the ground and it makes an explosion of sparks. So it doesn't even use any of the fuel? No, the butane is untouched. It's way safer than it sounds. So, I, I, no, I believe you. To be honest, I thought for sure, you uh, you know the trick to, to make the flame go higher than it's supposed to, right? No, I know that's something you do, but I don't know how to do it. I do it for the stage show because oftentimes for safety, they have these set to where it's like there's dead and then super dead are the two settings that they have on there. You'll notice that you got the butane and the valve and then you've got the steel wheel and the flint. If you take off this casing, and when you're pushing the more than less than button here, like mm -hmm. that, so right there, it's very, very low, and then you turn it to allegedly high, and it's still very, very low, right? That's pathetic. So what you do is you turn it over to maximum, then you push it up, and you're gonna feel that it's not biting as it goes back, and then you're gonna lock it back in, so you're essentially over rotating. So now you're getting a proper second turn. <laughs> nice! Right? That's actually pretty cool. Well, and it makes it more reliable of you, of course, burn through the fuel a whole lot faster, but also you it's good for, uh, I don't know, keeping away gremlins. It's like you unlocked the upgrade to the lighter. It was safety locked to the point where it wasn't even usable. Well, and that's the reason I do it, because on the stage show, if I'm in the middle of talking and doing the fire eating, I light the torches six, seven, eight times during the course of the five minute routine, and it's awkward every time I have to go ch -ch 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 -ch. So I make sure to kind of loosen them up a little past the default safety settings. All right, that is super cool. Also not what we're doing. No. Not what we're doing. All right, take one of these lighters, pry off the casing again. Okay, same deal. We're not messing with the fuel. See, it took me forever to do that and you just <laughs> cracked it right open. <laughs> Part of it is having the right tool because it used to be like, you know, somebody would take a pen in high school or whatever and I had just a, pop it off. I had a steak knife. It took me like 20 minutes. Why would you use a steak knife? It was, it was a bad idea. It's really irresponsible. You used the proper tool. Now we have to get the flint in the spring. Okay, so I'm gonna peel off the safety cover. That's another thing, man. Those the safety covers make a pain in the butt. Great. There you go. So we have the cover, the safety, the wheel, the spring, and the flint. And flint, this is just rock, right? Yeah. Looks like a tiny bit of lead that you would put in a mechanical pencil. Basically, lighters work with the spring just keeps pushing the flint up, and the flint scrapes against the steel, right? Yes. So this is just constantly grinding it down, but the spring is always pushing it forward and forward. So now what? So now you want to stretch out your spring a little bit. Oh, this is getting good. You're going to want to hold it by one end. Yeah. And thread the flint through the other end and wrap it around. And this part is a kind of a pain in the ass. So I'm gonna hold it here, and I'm gonna do kind of a winding motion. Does it matter how far deep it is? No. Okay. No, I mean, you want it towards the end a little bit because you wanna hold one end of it. But the purpose is to hold the flint away from you. Yes, perfect, Okay. perfect. To me, this is the this is the montage where it's like, uh, I have an idea for a diversionary tactic. <laughs> oh! oh! What, what happened? Oh, you did the <laughs> I pinchy just, thing. I, did. I told you, don't do the uh, pinchy thing. That hurt. 
which is oh, I so broke crazy. It. You gotta be careful when you're prying that wheel off because you'll break that flint off. In fact, I recommend don't try to pry it off so much as break these sides. Yeah. Just peel them back and then this will fall right off. Oh wow, that's a that's tougher than I thought too. <laughs> What are, you, are you king of the pinchies? What are you doing? Yeah, it's this tiny damn thing. You're not allowed to use that. Looks like the safety thing just blew. Oh, it, it, it. Felt something hit my head. Yeah, you gotta be careful because that flint yeah. is spring-loaded. Oh, lost the spring. You're like one for 12. I know. It's, it's fine. It's oh, wait. Fine. Oh, we've got, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I made a bunch while yeah. you were <laughs> doing whatever it was while you were doing. I was doing. mangling while my hand. Were... <laughs> I'm bleeding to death. I made five. I broke <laughs> so many of the flints. <laughs> All right, listen, we're gonna move real quiet outside. I'm gonna create a distraction. Then you steal all the orphans and run across America. I've always wanted to steal orphans. I'll die at the hands of the clone Hitlers. I've always wanted you to die at the hands of clone Hitler. Let's go. <laughs> we, we Scooby Doo walk. Dun, 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 dun. So we got four. Sorry. Listen, man, those orphans, you better get them out of there. We only have four chances to make this work. All right, it's gonna take about 30 seconds to heat that up. You I, want the flint to get red hot. Is there a chance of it exploding in my hands or something, or? You know, that's a really good question. You <laughs> Yeah, you want it to start glowing red. Yeah, you can see it glowing red. Whoa. There it is. Right, and? Yep. Whoa, go yep. away, bad guys. Whoa! <laughs> Oh, oh my god! <laughs> and I got to use my new catchphrase. Go, Go away, away, bad guys. guys. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good one. That's that's right up there with up, up and away, and it's clobbering time. <laughs> Go away, bad guys. <laughs> wow, that was awesome. That was See, that was actually blinding. I don't know. As far as diversionary flash devices, yeah. Well, but it's a cool party trick. Oh my god, yeah. Let's do it again. Yeah. You want to try two at once? Yes. They're so entangled, I can't get them apart. Oh, so yeah. So I'm gonna make them into one. Here, hop, hop in on this. It's like s'mores on the campfire, but way more cool. Yeah. This one's ready. Do it. Uh, but it's only one. Oh, it's doing it on its own. Uh, go away, bad guys. Oh, damn it, Brian. Stop that. Uh, go away, bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still got it in. Well, it was getting brighter and brighter and brighter. It genuinely looked like there was like a. Ch it was oh, like sucking. it was gonna pop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I don't know if it was just absorbing all of the heat from the wire because you notice the wire doesn't yeah. stay red. So there's enough heat energy in the wire, which is a great series. Wow! Now that's how you make a distraction. <laughs> Go away, bad guys. I should have. I should have run. You like, should have run. You'd be like, oh. Where did he go? What? <laughs> Dude, super effective. That was amazing. And in fact, I don't even know how good Mario's improvisational skills are, but I bet if you name one subject right now, he can make a power core Here we go. based on grilled cheese sandwich. Grilled right, cheese sandwiches, let's take it away. Grilled cheese. You mean so much to me, grilled cheese. You're so mean. He does not remember what today's episode is about. I should have should have said grilled cheese again. Cause I'm a modern bro. Surveillance tools. Nowadays with technology. I think most people assume that if they're under a federal investigation or something, they're carrying microphones in their phones and they're, they're, they're looking at webcams on their computers. They have to just think that everything's gonna be cyber style, right? And I think that's reasonable, but there's gotta be a situation where law enforcement just uses low tech surveillance. Or if not law enforcement, criminals. Or because criminals. That, that's the other thing. If you don't have the tech know-how, if you don't have the ability to penetrate a virtual private network, then you know, old school bugs yeah. still work. Well, well, we're not law enforcement, Brian. So this is an experiment that we're doing on our own property? For demonstrative purposes. For science? Yes. All right, what do we got here? This is an FM transmitter. I got it off of Amazon for about 12 bucks. This is like I'm touching a holy relic right now <laughs> because like this was the trope that fueled so many fantasies and dreams of knowing what other people were up to. Well, it's antiquated technology, but it's so simple. This is straight up just a power source, which we plug in a nine volt battery. Mm -hmm. So you got an antenna on there, you got a microphone, and I don't see any controls on here. So I assume what happens is you plug in the battery and it just starts transmitting as long as the battery has power 
And that's that? That's that. How far do they go? I don't know how far they go, but the fidelity is surprisingly good under the right conditions. So here's what I've heard, is when it comes to bugging, you either need to have a very strong transmitter to blast the signal a very long way, or you need to have uh, finely tuned antennas and maybe be close to the location. So this is the kind of thing that you would plant on property and then you would have, that's the, stare, the trope of the van parked around the corner with people listening in live at all times. Exactly. Those people listening in are going to have an FM receiver or just like your regular radio. You were saying that nowadays, a lot of them will be encrypted. Uh, my guess is that the days of, of high-end intelligence using unencrypted analog FM transmission are probably over. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some of them now are Wi-Fi driven. You tune in on this one to 100.0 or around there. Yeah. And you'll hear what this is broadcasting. I gotta turn it back on. Frequency mode. Perfect. What? So even if I'm really super quiet over here, yep. and I'm talking about cutting off your fingers. Yeah, don't do that. No, I'm just talking about it. I would never do that. I, I use all of them. <laughs> all right, yeah, I'm, just, I'm gonna hide this in here. So this is just a bug. Ah, so the so the antenna placement matters for sure. Yeah. I cannot believe how clear that is. It's better when you're quiet. I think if you weren't as close to it, we would get much better fidelity. Well, here. So I guess the idea is you set one of these in a lamp or in a smoke detector or something, and the microphone is sensitive enough that, like, can you hear me right now? Yeah. On, on there? Mm -hmm. Holy cow. That's a little scary. Yeah, you sound great. Wow. Yeah. This is shocking to me that this is $12 and is the top of the line Cold War era bugging. Yeah, and it works great. It's super cheap. You can get it off of Amazon. So audio, I'm totally screwed. Anything I ever say or do, whether or not I think I'm alone, somebody could be peeping. Let's talk video. Yeah, this is actually simpler and a little bit more modern. And it's a little USB rechargeable and it just shows up as a thumb drive. You grab the footage right on over. Exactly. When you first held this up, I thought like it's a USB thumb drive and I'm like, well, that's not a very good disguise and then you pointed out that you can replace the button and actually set it up as a button on your shirt and then I became terrified because I realized that I could be dash cammed at all times. Exactly. This is the one that we actually shot the opening segment on, right? Yeah. That footage of you in your car singing about grilled cheese right, came look, off of that I'm camera. I'm just a very big fan of grilled cheese. I get it's You're fine. a very big fan of your own voice is what it was. Yeah. In fact, when we were doing hacking the system, we found a keychain that has uh, similar stuff. Not quite as good a fidelity as this though. I know there's best practices to defend against the high tech stuff, you know, people taking over your phone and so on. But is there any defense against an FM transmitter? Well, you always see in the movies how people search for bugs. Yep. This is how. This is a real thing. It's a real thing. This is something that I think runs about uh, 10 bucks, again, on Amazon, super cheap. I'm gonna guess that there are fancy ones and less fancy ones. Wait, why is why are there LEDs on this? What I'll is explain that? that in just a second. Yes. Why is there a compass on this? I don't know why there's This is compass. $10, this is amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and all it is is a radio frequency detector. Okay. So it picks up the FM transmissions from this. It will pick up Wi-Fi signal coming from your router or a Wi-Fi enabled bug. And it has various levels of- <laughs> Okay, so we've got this. <laughs> it's freaking out with our with yeah. our mic packs and everything. Oh yeah, we've got the mic packs too. That might be a that problem. That might be a problem. <laughs> so there's two different settings on there. There's one that just makes a sound. Got it. I, oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, it works just like in the movies. And if you switch and it up on the next like, setting, yeah, it'll just do vibrations. Oh, that's surprisingly sensitive. Yeah, and the red lights on there is the signal strength. Yeah. Uh, okay, so like it, like right there, if I turn it on sound. Okay, this one, the battery's plugged in, so it's transmitting. Yep. You can adjust the sensitivity on here, right? Oh, got it, got it, got it. So you say, okay, perfect. So you can you can set this, the squelch as it were. Yeah. And it goes just by proximity? Yeah. Now the problem is that with so many Wi-Fi enabled devices, so many like routers that are just ubiquitous in our everyday lives, it's gonna pick up that too. Yeah, sure, so sure. So you've gotta set the sensitivity really low and be very thorough when you're searching. I am very glad I have one of these now. Super cool, right? <laughs> yeah. Now, take off the video camera. Use. Now the video camera doesn't even have to be running, right? Okay. for you to find it. This is actually a super lo-fi trick. You've got your lens on there, push the laser button. It's just a blinking red light. And you look through there and you can see the reflection of the lens. That's how you find the camera. 
Oh my God. Oh, wow. Super low fi so right? This, yeah. So just an array of LED lights and looking through it, boy, it really does just pop. The lenses on the, oh my God, look at the lenses on the cameras. Oh, wow. Yeah, it just blinks. That's brilliant because when I see a pinhole like this, I don't bother to think there's a lens on the inside. Yeah. That's a brilliant trick. Super simple, right? So you can understand why this thing is so cheap. So we have to test this. What's the scenario? The year is 2021. Oh, the future. President Kardashian <laughs> is visiting the modern rogue oh, warehouse. My goodness, Madam President, what an honor. I bet I surely hope nobody has bugged the place. Let's hope not. Wait, but wait, guess what? Who they totally it? have. Yeah, I, know, but, but, but I did. I know, but you work for who? me. Uh, I, I'm in TMZ. In Cobra. <laughs> Cobra, TMZ, it's a joint TMZ yes. Cobra operation. Yes. <laughs> and me being secret service for Madam Kardashian. Uh, yeah, no, in. All right, I'll it's go. Good. It's a good narrative. Hide them, hide them good. This is Delta Echo Foxtrot 275 DNA 2 calling the president. Hello, Madam President. The motorcade is on its way. Ah, Bizarre Magic Inc. headquarters, it won't be prepared in time. I've got to sweep the area. Of course, you hired the best. I'm science man. <laughs> Murphy, Mr. Brushwood. <laughs> Today, <laughs> President Kardashian will rue today that she crossed Cobra. And TMZ. And TMZ! <laughs> well, I'm gonna find the bug, but where is it? <laughs> is, it is, is it in the... Uh, right. No, it's in the other room. Okay. <laughs> What are the only hints I get? You have 30 <laughs> seconds! Oh, you'll murder 30 seconds? Jesus! <laughs> uh, okay, uh... Just somewhere in the room? Somewhere in the room. All right. Yeah, well, this is gonna be hard. We're gonna be here all night. Well, oh, look at all this sound equipment appears to be <laughs> inhaminating <laughs> radio signals. <laughs> <laughs> Were we done doing that? There's definitely, I wonder if I'm picking up the camera equipment. Oh, the, the mic? Probably. Man, having the mic packs makes us hard. Yeah, I think the mic pack is really throwing you off. Is that code for I'm not close? Oh, wait, hold on. Okay, oh, so if you use this as a wand, if I turn up the squelch a lot, oh, dude, it's just screaming at me. You, you, it's very ineffective right now. Okay, hold on, is it, is it not over here? It seems to think something's over here. Oh, hey! I just well, you weren't looking. supposed to find it that way. <laughs> I just found it. <laughs> but here, let me let me let me see how whether I would have caught it. You <laughs> succeed only through your incompetence, Brushwood. <laughs> oh, you'll not get us today. Cobra. I like make, how to make more fists when I talk. It's really only from one angle you could see the. Uh, it's very the lens. very narrow. That's one that's, nice that's try, one. Cobra. I'm gonna here. I'm gonna go off mic. All right. I'm gonna turn off my mic pack. He's picking up these phones. Yeah, that's the phones. Wait, maybe it wasn't the phones. Oh. 
<laughs> Is it just a one? Oh no! <laughs> but you have not found them all. <laughs> Mr. Brush. Yeah, you, got, you, I, got, I, you got two out of three. Uh, turn that oh, one off. Oh, yeah. President Kardashian will be spared the indignity of a public scandal. <laughs> you win this time, Rushwood. That was awesome. That was legit badass. You like that? Yeah, it, cool, it, to right? it totally worked. It totally yeah. worked. I don't think it was as effective for the uh, for the cameras as yeah. we would have liked. I got lucky on the camera, yeah. but the other two I definitely found purely based on this uh, this reading. Ten dollars. Yeah, it's, you can find them super super cheap on there, and there are so many of them that are the same thing but with different labels. Go with the cheap one. Yeah, right on, man. I don't want to spoil anything, no jinxies or whatever, but there's a little bit of royalty. Might have a little bit of money. And for a nominal fee, be able to get a cut of a pretty big pie. Really? Yeah. You going through with that? Uh, Guy Fieri says so. Guy Fieri? Yeah. The chef? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to make a joke about eating an actual pie. It doesn't matter. Because <laughs> I'm a modern Four one nine scams. Nigerian email scams. Four one nine, right? Yes. You know why they call it the four one nine? That's the uh, penal code thing, right? Like uh, the the cop code. They're, yes. They're, like like they kick in the doors and they got mustaches and, and pistols. They're like, looks like we got another four one nine over here. More or less. I like your version. It's way more exciting. <laughs> it's the Nigerian penal code for fraud. And these four one nine scams, they call them that because they originated in Nigeria, but a lot of them aren't even in Nigeria. That's anymore. the whole thing, right? Everyone thinks that. They're like, oh, I got another Nigerian spammer or whatever. Like, sometimes I think there's actually a prince who's just screwed <laughs> because he's imprisoned in Nigeria. Everyone... And he's like, no, guys, I'm serious. <laughs> Why are they always speaking in broken English? There's actually a very good reason for this. This is a heuristic that maximizes their input. Keep in mind, the 419 scam, of course, is you have a prince who claims that he's imprisoned and he's got $300 million and he's got to move to the US. He doesn't know you from Adam, but he just got to get the movie over and he's happy to give you, oh, I don't know, a million or two million dollars, right? Not a sophisticated scam to begin with, which means you don't want smart people responding to you because smart people will waste your time, they'll mess around with you, they'll report you to the police. So the way you eliminate those people is by writing it in language just dumb enough that the only people to respond are people who might actually believe that they're about to become millionaires. And a lot of people, when they read that broken English, they think, there's no way that this could be a scam or that they could take advantage of me because I'm clearly smarter than Which they are. Which is the hallmark of all the best cons. You let the mark feel like they're the one driving things. Yes, most of these originated in Nigeria in like the 80s and they were written letters. Of course, with the advent of the internet, they became much more popular. Holy cow, I remember the first time I got an email and they, there's that brief glimmer of like, oh my God, is this my ticket? But I can't imagine how much more valid it feels when you get a telegram or something or some kind of official correspondence that feels like a telex dispatch from the other side of the world. Yeah, and of course, what is the one thing that all cons have in common? That one moment where they say, and that's why I need the money right now. Yes. You create the sense of uh, ownership of something bigger. You promise a big, big prize and you act like they already have it. Congratulations, you've won a trip to the Bahamas. Congratulations, you've inherited a billion dollars or whatever. And only after you let people sit with that idea for a little bit, do you suddenly take it back and all we have to do, little paperwork, you billionaire, you. Just, yeah, if you could just wire over enough money to cover the transfer of all the billions of dollars, 
That'd make things real easy. Yeah, and usually it's a long email with lots of documentation. It sounds very official and formal and urgent. Right. And they're only asking for $100 to get this paperwork moving and you get $2 million. I think it was W.C. Fields that said, you can't scam an honest man. And what this all relies on is two feelings. Number one, the feeling that you're about to get a payday. And number two, the feeling that you're a part of something less than legal. I fell for a proto version of this 20 years ago. Really? So I'm at a Home Depot. There's some guys in a, a van driving around and then they're like, uh, hey man, crazy thing happened. We went to this uh, uh, booby club down the way and we installed all these thousand dollar studio monitors. Well, here's a picture in a catalog of the studio monitors and you can see where it says they're $1,200 each. Anyway, turns out we had two extra. You want to buy them for only $300? Keep in mind, this is pre-internet or whatever. I'm looking, I'm like, I'm like well, those are the same monitors. That does say the word $1,500 or whatever. I'm thinking, ho, 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 you guys can't fool me. These are stolen speakers. Also, let's go to the ATM so I can buy these stolen speakers from you. And of course, what they are is they're just garbage speakers. Yeah. That they go around telling a story that ropes you in and I assume that's pretty much why the 419 works? Yeah, there are hundreds of different variations. Uh, some of them you've won the lottery. Some of them they bought a bunch of oil at below market prices. Some of them are inheritance. And so you just need to pay a small fee to get your inheritance and to unlock it. So it sounds like no matter what version of the story that it is, there are three key elements. One, there's a lot of money to be made by you. Two, it's slightly shady, which is why you should not tell anyone about our conversation. And three, in order to complete the transaction, the tiniest little bit of monetary transaction has to happen. Exactly. And that's the most important part in there. This is just another iteration of what's called an advance fee scam. Okay. So they get this fee from you and then they say, okay, we're going to go ahead and move forward. And then there's another slightly larger complication where they say, we need this paperwork and it's gonna cost like $1,000. <laughs> so what you're saying is, is they keep paying dividends in terms of conversation as far as moving things forward, but financially they're bleeding you dry. Yeah, you have these escalating investments that you need to make. And that's part of the problem is that they hook you for a little bit yep. and you think, well, I've already invested this much. I need to keep going and see it. Through. So this is the hidden fourth phase of the 419 scam, the sunk cost fallacy. This idea that it's like, well, I mean, I've sent over $5,000 so far. I mean, what do I walk away? Then I'd really be an idiot. The smart thing is to just handle this next $200 payment yeah. and then finally I'll be a billionaire. And then to further entice you, they up the stakes on both ends. They'll say, now we need $8,000 from you, but guess what? We've unlocked more funds. It's actually $26 million that we can get to you. I'm sorry, just real quick. What was the guy's name? No. <laughs> you in? Yeah. You in? I, 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 Let's I do was, it. I was, I was. But then comes the con within a con. There's a threat to the entire operation. So you got the promise of money, you know it's shady, you invest, you get a little bit started, they keep stringing you along, you don't wanna mm -hmm. be a sucker, so the way to not be a sucker is to continue to give them money, and then the moment you wanna stop giving them money, then they say the entire operation is in jeopardy, we need this much money for plane tickets to go meet these associates to convince them. Or better yet, some totally other person calls you, detective so-and-so yeah. investigating a Nigerian 419 scam. Mm -hmm. And they say, listen, we need this much money to bribe this guy so he gets off of our trail. That's amazing. Now, a lot of times they ask for your banking information. That doesn't really give them anything. They don't use it, but it lets them know that they have a valid mark. Wow, I never put that together because yeah. I always wondered that. The bank routing information is on literally every check you've ever written because yeah. it's 1987. Yeah. But I was like, what can they yeah. do with that? That lets them know that you're willing to play ball. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, okay, uh, tell me some ghost stories. Terrify okay. me. Okay, got some old factoids. How many emails does a scammer have to send out to get one response? In the early days, pre-internet, to market my stage show, I would I would send out uh, two to 4,000 postcards saying, hey, Brian Brush, is in Atlanta, Georgia. Would you like to book him at your show? And I get four or five calls. So that uh, usually in what they call direct response marketing, 
you would expect hopefully a 1% return. I'm gonna guess it's worse and say one tenth of 1% for every thousand, 2000, you get a response. They get one response for every 12.5 million emails they send out. I need to talk to their marketing team because that's <laughs> not great. Uh, there's a lot I could do to up their return on investment. But it's emails, it doesn't cost them anything. They send out billions per year and these larger organizations make around $2 million a year. After the fact, I have to imagine that virtually nobody wants to admit that they were suckered, that they were scammed, and that they got taken for a ride. Exactly, the numbers are actually much, much higher than the government knows because people are too ashamed to admit that they were taken advantage of. So uh, famous magician Penn Jillette had a laptop stolen and there's some sexy photos on there. They tried to blackmail him and he went to, and he was like, well, what's the worst that can happen? There's sexy photos of me out on the internet. Well, I'll go to the FBI. He called the FBI and said, they're trying to blackmail me for the stuff on the laptop. And he's like, well, how much money have you given him? And he's like, none, I called you. And he says, that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> like the FBI goes, uh, literally nobody calls us before they've they're already given up too much money or whatever. The moment you start is the moment you're totally screwed. It ties back to that, I don't want people to know that I'm a sucker and maybe I'm not, so I'm gonna keep investing money to prove that I'm not a sucker. That's the insidious brilliant part of this, is you participate because you don't want to be the sucker who had a chance to become a millionaire but didn't bother to send $100 in. You don't want to be the sucker who has spent $5,000 and, and gotten nothing in response, so you send a little bit more. And you most certainly don't want to be the sucker who goes to jail because you're being told yeah. that you're involved in an investment scheme that's going to yes. end you up in the Congo. And you don't want to be Janella Spears, a nurse who lost $400,000, gave all of her money, took out a lien on her house and her car that were already paid for, and then finally realized, oh, this is a scam. So the crazy thing about this is that this scam is actually growing. Even though you would think that people are No becoming, way. Right. No way. Yeah. Everybody knows it. The most recent number that I found in 2013 for worldwide losses to 419 scams. Worldwide? Yes. Worldwide. I don't, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. $12.7 billion. Wait, in one year? Yeah, and it was increasing by hundreds of millions of dollars every year. In spite of email programs filtering out most of this spam, yeah. it's still working, it's still getting better. Now, if you wanna have a little fun with these scammers, go to your spam folder, go to your trash folder, your junk mail filter. It's a bad idea. It's, it's a not. bad idea. It's so much fun. There are entire websites that communities have sprung up around that all bait these guys okay. to waste their time. And you're right, that is the only way to punish them, so to speak, is to get them to invest heavily with their time and then give them no reward. My favorite story was the P -P 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 power book scam where somebody got a Nigerian scammer on the hook and said, hey man, yeah, no, I, I don't have money, but I, I've got this brand new power book. It's from Apple, it's normally $2,500. Can, can I just send that to you instead of the $500? And the guy was like, well, yes. And then little things that, oh, by the way, um, you know, just as a courtesy to me, would you list it as something besides a laptop? Otherwise, I'll have to pay a big old value added tax when it comes in. He's like, I'll make sure to do that. Uh, and sends it, lists it at a full $5,000 power book, sends a box of rocks over to this guy. And the guy had to pay like a giant duty fee in order to receive nothing. Brilliant. Right? I actually was corresponding with a couple of them in preparation for this episode. Wait, whoa, 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 you mean you personally? Go yes. On. All right, go on. I went into my spam filter and uh, I spoke to the governor of a bank. I didn't know they had governors. Money's gotta come from somewhere. This is a billion years long. Also, it calls you, hello, dear. I know, I was touched by that intimacy. He's very friendly. <laughs> I apologize for sending you this sensitive information via email instead of certified mail, post mail. Which by the way, this is something that they call anchoring. The mere fact that he said certified mail, post mail, and he said that's how he should have gotten in touch with you, lends legitimacy that is not there. Russell says, you're owed 9,850,000 United States dollars, which he makes sure to spell out for you, literally. What did you do? Uh, I emailed him. Okay, so first I emailed him back. Now there's there are techniques to bait these guys that I learned after I screwed it up. To Russell Nelson said, uh, Mr. Nelson, this is quite a surprise. I had no idea that I had relatives in London. I will of course do all that I can to assist with this matter and I'm incredibly excited. Half of that money is mine. What a fantastic bit of news, Jason. Russell comes back with 
essentially what is the first email reworded. I want this information, full name, contact address, profession, nationality, etc. Here's where I ruined it. Russell, this is all very exciting. I'm very interested in participating. You said that this money comes from my deceased relatives in London. At first, I didn't know who you were talking about, but now I'm thinking it was my cousin, Dan. We haven't heard from Dan in a long time, which is fine. After that one Thanksgiving where he drank an entire bottle of Amaretto, we couldn't be happier that he disappeared. He always talked about going to London to open a fish and chips business. I thought that was weird until I found out that chips are actually french fries. Isn't that crazy? In this guy's mind, all he heard was this giant flashing neon sign saying, smart, 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 smart. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Dan was a drunk and is probably the one who died. But if he's got all of this money he's leaving to me, then I guess the fish and french fries business really worked out for him. So on to your questions. I see that you're asking me for my profession. That's a hard one to answer, TBH. I'm kind of a free spirit. I don't appreciate the confines of employment. I just consider myself something of a rogue. Should I just put rogue there? Thank you, Jason. I did not think it was possible, but it turns out you're the bigger a in this story. <laughs> How dare you? I, I mean, lost my cousin <laughs> to alcoholism. I mean, I, I, he, he sends you a gift certificate from Am Amaretto. Is that what it is? <laughs> Russell's so insensitive. Who's your favorite ninja, like ever? Wrong, it's me. <laughs> me, <laughs> me. Cause I'm a modern Homemade shuriken. All right, so we're making shuriken, right? Sure, you can pronounce it that way if you want. <laughs> they called shuriken, ninja stars, throwing stars, Chinese stars, what is it? They're certainly not Chinese stars. Kind of racist. Yeah. They're <laughs> Japanese in origin. Okay, all right. They're called shuriken, but that covers a broad variety of things. We're gonna make hika shuriken, I think, or okay. shuriken. A shuriken, as I understand it, is any small bladed object that you have in your hand, right? And oftentimes it would be like maybe like four nails and a cross, basically, that you could uh, you could jab someone with or or make caltrops out of. Yeah, they didn't get these at a kiosk in the mall. Oh man, but that, we did when we were kids. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could have been anything. They would make them out of coins or or nails fused together. They couldn't buy them at the mall or at a machinist or anything like that. These things were disposable weapons that weren't meant to kill. Well, and that's the thing I didn't, never understood is movies go out of their way to act like they're deadly weapons and you have to hit the eyes always yeah. from a distance. Because the blades are usually like this and throwing a blade that small that will pierce someone's skull or into their heart uh, Pretty tough. Probably not gonna happen, yeah. So yeah. this is a weapon of harassment, a way during kind of guerrilla warfare for you to dis distract attention. And the, the story that I heard is that when it went by and sliced you, because there was no person there, it was as though an invisible swordsman. And whoosh, that's the translation for shuriken, is sword that is hidden in the hand. Right on. All right, how do we make one? Okay, it's so easy. And I know, yes, that I always say that, but it really is. <laughs> it rarely has turned out to be easy. I know. Every time you say it. These are uh, grip right fasteners. I think you use them in roofing. You hammer a thing through and then this uh, locks out all the rain and stuff on oh, there. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, you can get these at your local hardware store. Just little silver discs and they're really flimsy. So these stars are gonna be flimsy. They're not gonna be deadly, but they That's are- okay because I too am flimsy and not deadly. <laughs> <laughs> what okay. shape are we doing? So you're just gonna take your disc here. Don't cut all the way into the center. Joey, start cutting. I, I did, give me another one. <laughs> Damn it, Brian. <laughs> so you're gonna cut it at four different places and you're not going to cut into the center. You still need to leave a center mass, right? Okay. So just do four cuts at 90 degree angles. Oh, got it, Your perpendicular cuts. Yeah. Oh, and you know what? There's this natural grain on there too that, you, that makes it easy to follow. Now, on these four wedges, yep. cut another wedge into each of those, right uh, in the middle. Just bisect it, basically? Yeah. Okay, where'd you find this? This was an instructable, actually. And again, these aren't gonna be effective weapons. Well, first of all, the shuriken itself is not an effective weapon, right? right? 
super disposable and lo-fi, just like these. As a matter of fact, katanas you can find nowadays because they're well preserved, because they were valued and handed down through generations. Because shuriken are disposable weapons of harassment, the ones you find, they're all rusted and banged up and no good. Really? Yeah. We're gonna make one of those uh, one of those things that uh, you put candles over and it spins oh, around. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like hey, Sorry. you know that thing about throwing stars? We're yeah, not doing that forget at all. That. <laughs> all right, what am I doing? You're just taking every other tab and folding it in. All right. Dude, just like that and it's done? You can go with that or cut little points into them. Oh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a curved blade. Oh, good call. So these aren't even like fancy scissors. We're just using garbage, yeah, regular just paper scissors. Regular one, yeah, because these things are so flimsy. And those points, you can actually get them pretty sharp, right? You know what? My curved thing is not working as well as I hope. It's a little difficult. Like that, look at that. Look at how tight, it's, how sharp that is. There's just, there's no heft. So maybe our next build should be like two stacked on top. Or, or maybe or... put a coin in the middle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To be honest, this feels to me like it wants to be closest to card throwing. Because there's a whole technique to card throwing that I think would apply to a paper thin okay. shuriken. I'm going to say, I actually think. I use the hammer. I just want to be. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Um, I was gonna I say, often narrate my own actions. Uh, use the hammer. Use the hammer to flatten down the other tabs as you fold them in. Is that oh, right? that's cool. Is that, is that right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so when you're throwing a playing card, you want to keep it kind of loosely gripped between your first two fingers. Mm -hmm. And you're not you're not actually throwing it and trying to time it. That's the mistake everybody makes. Instead, you're going to hold it loose enough that the very act of your motion will cause the momentum to fling it forward, right? Yeah. And then you get, oh, that bounced. It went right in. That's amazing. That's cool. <laughs> All right, let me, let me try again. Here, I'll try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try that one. Here we go, right? Uh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay, that's actually pretty fun. I mean, these things are super light and flimsy, but... Yeah, and I guess this one has kind of a swirl pattern to it. So, you picture this. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is. it does get bent up pretty fast. I'm a bad ninja. Oh! Whoa! I'm afraid of hitting you. Oh, uh, sure. It, all right, right? Yeah, blame me. That's good. There we go. I'm calling that that good enough. I poked an eye out. That's good. So these guys are super flimsy. This one has a little more heft. Feel the difference in the material yeah. on this stuff, right? This is just sheet metal cut into the shape of a card because I'm more familiar with throwing cards. Whoops. Oh, that's got the heft. That was a pretty Try, satisfying here. thwack. Try all of them. Try all of them. Okay, I, I'm, I'm probably not even gonna hit the damn thing. Your grip is right there in the middle. You're not gonna be able to get it. Okay. You want to barely bite the edge. And then you're just gonna do this sidearm thing. You're never gonna let go. Imagine you had mm -hmm. goo on your hands and you're trying to like, get it out of your mucus. That's what you wanna do. Probably twice a day. <laughs> okay, uh, you're throwing it like a Frisbee, which ah! you don't wanna do. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you want it, you're flicking off goo. There we go. It was a terrible shot, Should but not, it was a much so better throw. Here, try it with this one. Try it, yeah. try it with the card. Oh! Right here, right here. Now you're talking. That felt good. So if we were to do a weighted one, would we want to double these up or just put coins in them? How about you just try to throw one as is? Oh, geez. <laughs> Dude, these are dope. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. That's pretty cool. I didn't as expect is. that. I, just as is. Oh, oh man. Dude, this is better. If you just want target practice, no. Nice. Wow. 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 Oh, that's satisfying. Why are we bothering to even make them shirk? These are amazing. These are called uh, grip right fasteners. And plus, like, feel the weight of them in your hand. Put on the goggles. Hold, just hold, just hold it. Let me go to town. Well, let me get out of the way. How no, about I, that? I, 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 no? No, I mean, you hold it. Physically oh. hold it. Be in the way. Jesus Christ, are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> in your hand, it feels like a slinky. That's about the thickness of the metal here. And it's like, I, it's, I feel like I'm holding a circular deck of cards. I feel like I was meant for this moment. Yeah, and me too. I, I don't think any of these will cut you, but I think they're gonna feel really good to throw at you. <laughs> All right, ready? Ready. Oh. Oh. Thanks for waiting. Oh. 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 oh my God, I'm Gambit. <laughs> I was meant for this. Oh, God, shit. 
Oh, damn it! Wow! <laughs> did, did, did that hurt? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this is a million times superior to even bothering to make them sharp on the edges. That is amazing. We're good. All right. I have a challenge for you that doesn't involve throwing stuff at me. You want to see if you can hit some moving targets? Ooh, yeah, why not? So what do you think is going to happen on balloons? I think these can still pop them. Yeah, right? I think so too. But, but these, these definitely, definitely will. Yeah. yeah. Right. By the way, inflate the balloons nice and big if you want them easy to pop. That's a trick that the old carnies would use, is they would underinflate the balloons. Oh, yeah? And so when you throw a dart, they would just bounce off of them. Really? So here's the challenge. I am much more confident and precise with the circular ones, okay. right? But these are definitely gonna be able to pop the balloon. Yeah. So yeah. it'll be a contest between my aim and the pokiness uh. to see if I can get it. Which one do you wanna do first? Let's do the pokiness. Okay, all right, go for it. Oh, <laughs> all right, try it again, try it again. Damn it! Ah. Awesome! Yes! That was great! <laughs> I'm really surprised, despite getting banged up a lot, they're still effective. I'm using a hammer. I'm using a hammer. <laughs> okay. Yeah! Dude, <laughs> that's really satisfying. <laughs> that's great. You'll try the... <sighs> yeah, we'll try the discs. I think it, I think it'll work. Oh, no. Try another one. Oh my God. <laughs> it missed, but it's embedded in the wall now. <laughs> Whoopsie. Oops. So we're not going to tell the landlord about the. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. No one's watching. All right, here we go. What the heck? <laughs> it made that wicked ass sound, too. Did not see that coming. I know. Okay, what if we just added the ridges? Yeah, yeah. Like the initial cut, right? That'll give Offset. it some points. Right? So now I got like a whirling pinwheel type thing with just enough pokiness that it'll pop balloons. Yeah! That did the trick. Do you want to try something else? What, what else do you got? That's not a good idea. <laughs> That's... This seems like it set up the target. Um. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing, is there actually is a trick to fling playing cards. You just pinch it in a rubber band and then it flies just like that, right? Very cool. So I would imagine the same thing works with this metal card. You think? <laughs> not so much. Maybe not. Works, right? Cool, yeah. And then, uh, and so now I guess we should try that with the stars. <laughs> we're, all, we're all fine here. <laughs> I will just use the rubber band. Pull it back like that. <laughs> not so much, not so much. Nope. <laughs> not feeling it. Is it too it. light? Part of it is that it's difficult to figure out where you should line it up to. I'm gonna put it way on the edge this time. <laughs> I'm just gonna put it right in the middle. Closer. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Oh, there it is. That's what you do. I'm pinching it right in the middle, like I'm slingshotting a quarter is what I'm thinking of it as. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, okay. We'll just call it that one. I mean, we'll try the slingshot, but it just feels like it's going to be so chaotic and wild. You're not going to get that precise spin. Especially since we're dealing with things that are so light. I guess we'll try the discs first. A bunch of them at once? Yeah. Now this, I do feel like, has a chance of working. A brick of them all at once, so it's closer to yep. regular shot, and it's the discs. I feel like it's gonna be a ridiculous disaster. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty great. It's pretty great. <laughs> All right. All right, can you do it with the shuriken? <laughs> Try it with the pinwheel. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, see if it's possible with just one to hit that balloon. Bladed. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, wow. Now, that, that was the bladed one. Yeah. Yeah. All right, hold on. Let's try the target. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Boy, that does get a lot of force. 
I'm surprised it doesn't just bang into your hand. Me too. Yeah. Mm, it doesn't get that spin here. Try another. Did that embed itself in there? What happened? Oh my goodness. <laughs> that is so deep. Feel how deeply embedded in there that is. Wow. <laughs> it's all warped. Okay, let's do it with the Sharpie ones. Okay. You wanna try? You wanna uh, no, I don't try. Yeah. I'm, I'm scared of this. Uh, there's plenty of brute force in this, but there's, there's so little control it makes me nervous. And you're just doing it right in the middle. Yep. <laughs> that was pathetic. Now I know with the rubber band, it is important that it not be exactly in the center. Jeez, that doesn't look like that's gonna work yeah, at all. Try it, try it. Holy cow, you <laughs> took out the lights! You took out the lights! Holy freaking cow. Whoa. Look at how deeply embedded this was. I stand 100% corrected. This thing utterly blasted straight in, almost went through the entire target. That was surprisingly effective. Yeah. I like it. And surprisingly sharp. So, Shuriken, they don't seem like a toy anymore. Yeah, no, I think we could actually hurt somebody they with one They seem like those. genuine weapons of harassment. It's almost as though warriors of old actually had a good reason for using them. Now, there are a billion different variations on how to make these. I've seen people use X-Acto knives, thread cutters, Disassembling those razor and reassembling blades. Them. There's a good tutorial. Razor blades, all sorts of stuff. Now these are just like roofing discs. I'll tell you what. The roofing discs by themselves, if you know how to throw cards, they're astonishingly precise. It's really the best way to go. But I would imagine that with a little bit of practice, you can get the same way. You'll want to make all of your stars exactly the same, so that you you get a get a rhythm to to know how to throw it just right. Yeah, and you also have. The actual bladed ones here, which take all of 45 seconds to make. Then we have the halfway in between the, the pinwheel thing. This is the one I'd like to see people experimenting with because that pokiness is going to definitely injure. And considering that the whole purpose is to harass people, it just seems like that's got the precision on there. Then there's the sheet metal card. Sheet metal card might, to me, be the most dangerous of all of them. It's got a little more heft and got insane penetrating power. But I will vouch for all of these were much more dangerous than I originally thought. None of this is a good idea to muck around with. Don't do this at home. In fact, our whole show, let, let us do it. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. Now it's time for the next part of the game, the most dangerous game. Run. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> no, no! Hey man, if you're digging the modern road, you can support us directly by picking up one of three sweet ass t-shirt designs at shop.themodernrogue. You'll find Silverton, Vanguard, and Amendment 21. My favorite, for obvious reasons. It's because I'm an alcoholic. All right, I feel like if I'm gonna be drinking this all the time, I need to know more about it. I mean whiskey. I mean, if only there was a magical wizard's tower with a vice chancellor who was willing to teach us and it was right behind us. I'm intimidated. Cause I'm a modern bro! Defining whiskey. I feel like we should have swords and like walking up really with determination. Does, right? I'm pointing over here. It's this one, right? Yep, yep. Nicely done, <laughs> sir. Holy cow, Jason. I am unbelievably excited about this. We have Daniel Whittington, sir, the vice chancellor sir. and co-founder of the Whiskey Marketing School at Wizard Academy. Thank you so much for joining us, man. It is my pleasure. I may cry. <laughs> it's okay, we have Irish whiskey for that. <sighs> am I understanding this correctly? You guys are the very first and currently the only whiskey sommelier program in the world. Officially, yes. Wow, and you get, you get yeah. Sweet ass medallions. Yeah, from Flavor Flav. <laughs> How many wishes do you get when you rub that? I haven't capped out yet. Does it deflect so bullets? No one, no one knows. So what do you learn in the whiskey marketing program? Well, the priority is to help contribute to the community of whiskey drinkers and anti-snobbery and innovation, and then also to teach people how to talk 
market and present and tell stories about whiskey in a way that makes them a lot more money. So you teach people how to be cool drinking whiskey and tell rad stories. That's right, and make more money from it, right. most importantly. <laughs> right. Because otherwise, we're just drinking whiskey. So we're in the whiskey vault, a hidden room inside a library, inside of a wizard's tower filled yes. with amazing whiskeys. Yes, we passed all of the trials. <laughs> we have slain the Hydra, and now we will take his booze. Where Wait a we, minute. Where do we begin? Walk me through okay. the basics of whiskey. So, let's just talk about what whiskey is first, but we're not gonna do that with empty glass because that's just wildly inappropriate. I like your style. We're gonna try a few things. So I'm pouring you small amounts of whiskey because otherwise we won't make it to the end of the video. <laughs> All right, Red Breast 12 Irish Single Malt Whiskey. Cheers to you, gentlemen. Or All as right. they say, slancha. 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 Mmm. Okay, I'll explain to you later what you're drinking, but let's just talk whiskey first. So whiskey is a generic categorical term like vehicle. So a Hummer is a vehicle. Right. But so is a Prius. So whiskey just means grain alcohol aged. How you age it? Depends on the country, how long you age it and requirements. And what grain country, is negotiable what as grain well? grain changes the name. So okay. the name is gonna change where it's by, based on where it's from or based on what it's being made out of, the name will change. So first let's say American whiskey, and by the way, the E and not E, it has to do with the country of origin. So Scotland was no E. And whiskey just comes from the term uh, uskabetha, which just means water of life right. in Gaelic, right? And so it was shortened to uski and then whiskey, Boy, and it was no E. That's appropriate. It is appropriate. <laughs> I like that. And then uh, the Irish, in order to distinguish their product on the market. That's us. Added an E. <laughs> I forgot that's us. We, we I found um, out I'm Irish recently. We just uh, added vowel? Yeah. Well, you're standing, <laughs> you're surrounding an English Scotsman right here. We oh, don't go to outright <laughs> warfare. It's, it's we get an oil combat. combat. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> e just was added as a marker and marketing differentiator. That's, that's it? it? That's all it is. And so if the country making the whiskey has its origin in Irish whiskey, then they'll add an E. American whiskey adds an E. If it's based in uh, Scottish whiskey, then it's not. Japan, no E. So when you say grain alcohol, is mm -hmm. there a particular type of grain? Is it always... It, any type of grain. Now, traditionally, almost all whiskey is made from four grains, right? The majority of... There's the one-offs doing weird things. But the majority of whiskey is either corn, barley, rye or wheat or any combination of those four. Now, if it's malt whiskey, it almost always means all barley. Now in America, there's no legal requirement to have all barley in a malt whiskey, but it very often does mean it's all barley. In Scotland, it, if it's a malt, it has to be all barley. Grain whiskey, traditionally in the UK, just means a mix of grains. Okay, not now, a grain. Help me out here because what little I know about this is that uh, when you get alcohol out of that, you know, you're creating ethanol basically, mm -hmm. That's that's moonshine. How does it become? It's only called moonshine in America. Okay. It's just it's just yeah. clear alcohol. It's just a right? clear spirit. Looks like vodka. It's we've got some examples of it back here. Just totally clear. It's only when you add age it in wood that it gets all the color. And now different countries have rules on whether you can add things, fake coloring or not, and what type of wood you can use yep. and so forth. See, that seems remarkable to me. That 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 the flavor and the color of this is just from the wood. It doesn't seem like now wood. Scotland will allow a little bit of caramel coloring. Who's the most stringent? American one. Well, ironically, America has more strict rules than just about anybody. Really? Yeah. Not on what you can make, mm -hmm. but on what you can call it once you've made it based on how you made it. And that's enforceable by law, yeah. right? For a while, and this has probably happened with a variety of whiskeys, things were calling themselves scotch, mm -hmm. even though they weren't made in Scotland. Oh, yes, yeah, that's no, all pre-prohibition. Right, yeah, let's talk about the words here, because you got scotch, I know bourbon is a yeah, thing. Yeah, let's hit this. I know, yeah. So real quick, the way that you describe, remember, was vehicle, whiskey, just means whiskey. Whiskey, right? yeah, got okay. it. So how you call it, it either has to do with where it's from, yep. so scotch can't be called scotch unless it's from Scotland, or it has to do with the grain recipe. Now, distillers will call this a mash bill. A mash bill is a definition of the recipe you use of your proportions of grain. 5% malted barley, 60% corn, and you know 20% rye, so on. So if you have a bourbon, legally, it is at least 51% corn. Okay. Oh. If it's under 51% corn, it can't be called bourbon. So, okay. So if, if, I, if, if I'm sorting out all the secret code words, scotch equals from Scotland, bourbon equals 51% plus And corn. American. Okay, and American. Bourbons are only American. Now. Got it. Now they are. What's, what's Not up? Kentucky. You can make a bourbon anywhere in the United States, although most people from Kentucky will argue that with you. Not what, true. That's what about, the law, though. What about rye? Uh, rye means 51% rye. 
All That's right. it. So let's try a bourbon. I'm, I'm drinking slower than you can. Uh, <laughs> so uh, maybe we should do a different one. This one's 100 proof. We'll do one of my favorite classic bourbons. Uh, that's totally affordable and, in my opinion, way underpriced. Okay. Way underpriced. Henry McKenna? This is a 10-year-old Henry McKenna, bottled in bond. I'm not gonna go into what that means, but that means that this is at least 51% corn, and it's aged by law in new charred oak barrels. Here's what little I know. You could buy old barrels that were used to ferment sherry or something. Wine, or whatever. Wines, right, yeah, wine. Absolutely. Yeah, and, 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 and then that will color the flavor in a yep. certain way. And, but these are brand new barrels. Uh, what kind of barrels? Uh, American oak. Uh, oak, okay, great. So this will taste vaguely oaky, I guess? Yes, cheers to right. you. That's just a good bourbon right there. Yeah. Just a good, simple. Do you notice the difference? Rolls. Yeah, I definitely detected the higher alcohol content. Now, it's Irish got a little more whiskey bite. traditionally, which we started with. I, now, remember, it's single malt, so that means it's all barley. Single malt means one single, not a blend of grains, but yes. one type of grain. That's how nerdy we're going to get right now. Great, great. okay, good. Okay, so. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna draw a little sketch that this is a sort of a device I use to understand the five kinds of Scottish whiskey, and it also defines a lot of other whiskey terms at the same time. Okay. So in Scotland, you've got five different kinds of labels that could be on a bottle. You also have five regions of whiskey in Scotland. That's a different thing. So we're just gonna talk about the kinds of Scottish whiskey, right? Now I break it down into mom, dad, and the three kids. So we're gonna say dad, mom, and the three children. Now, dad, we're going to call single malt. And that is one type of grain mm -hmm. distilled and then aged in a barrel. That's right. Now, in Scotland, it has to be a used barrel, not okay. a new barrel. Now, this is an important thing, and I'm gonna do this right here. Single grain, single is not a descriptor of grain. Single malt, single is not an adjective describing malt. There are two words talking about two different things. Oh, single simply means one distillery. Okay. Right? Malt and grain refer to the recipe of grains used to make the whiskey. If it says malt in Scotland, it's all barley. If it says grain, it's a mixture of grains, which is closer to an Irish whiskey or an American whiskey, actually. And the single, so I, I guess I am now learning that you will take uh, alcohols from multiple distilleries and blend them. Yeah, That's what blended scotch is. Hey, hey, hey I can hey. be taught. That was fun watching that realization. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if you understand that, single grain doesn't mean one grain. Right. It means one distillery grain whiskey. So all we do if we add multiple distilleries is now there's only a three other products. Yep. So here's two kinds of categories. You got a single malt and a single grain. If you have a whiskey that's made up of two dads for equal opportunity, <laughs> then you have now a blended malt, right? The only thing that changed was single and blended. Mm -hmm. If you have two moms, you have a blended grain. And and grain is code for multiple different uh, grains. grains. Yeah. Got it. yeah. Uh, if you have a one mom and one dad, you're now a blended scotch, also known as the cheapest category of Scottish whiskey. That's, that's because anything goes. you can basically get it from anywhere you want. No, no, hold on, but it has the word scotch, which it's means- It's still made it, in Scotland. It has to, okay, And got it's it. still at least three years old in used oak. So that's all you need to know. Now, the terms that we just learned, single and grain and malt, those all apply to a lot of other countries as well, but they're just not as heavily enforced. Like for example, American have a malt whiskey like Balcones in Waco, and they can do a single malt. Well, they can't call it single malt scotch. It's not from Scotland. Right. And legally, it's not even required to be 100% barley to be called a single malt. They could have corn in there, they oh, get some wheat to flavor it up, right? Mm -hmm. But but mostly when you find a single malt, it's them doing a Scottish style whiskey in America. Okay. Most of the time. What we just tried now, Ireland, There's, and this is why I described this. Ireland has a very traditional way of making whiskey that's a single pot still and single malts. And then the blended grains came later in history. But one of the things that is a trademark Irish whiskey flavor, which I think is awesome, is a percentage of unmalted barley. And that results in a very unique flavor, shows up, I've only ever experienced it in Irish whiskey. And historically, it was their way to cheat the English tax system. So the English tried to tax them out of existence the same way they did everybody. And they started taxing malted barley. And so the Irish said, well, Screw you, we're gonna start using unmalted barley percentages to cut down on the tax liability and make the same amount of whiskey. Okay, unmalted barley means? Now, malted means that you have gone through the process that 
lets the grain trick it into growing and breaks down the starches. It gets super nerdy. Okay. Right? Unmalted just means you took it straight from the plant and you haven't done just anything but grind it up. Right off the vine, so to yeah. speak. If you malt it, it's a process of tricking it into growing and germ and, and cracks its shell Wait, and it's all this stuff. So the iris just added some, some unprocessed original pieces. That's all it was. Now it results in a really amazing flavor that you got to try in red breast. Okay. But let's talk about rye. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, wow. Lot, lot to I know. We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm rocking I'm, I'm, I'm here. getting the words. As a matter of fact, uh, let's talk about rye and then we'll finish with scotch. Okay. Is that fair enough? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. You know what? We're going to go with whistle pig. So whistle pig is made in Vermont. There was a lot of uproar originally because they were sourcing their whiskey from Canada before they were old enough to have bottled and aged their own. Oh, okay. Right. So that was their runway before they could. That's right. Now this is very common in whiskey distilleries, which is you open today. Well, yeah. What happens when you can't label a straight whiskey straight unless it's four years old? How's that for an outlay? It's like, hey, we opened. When can we have a bottle? Four years. <laughs> wow, I never even thought about right. that because you want to launch a brand, you start right away, and, and it's like you already know the flavor profile that you're going for, so yeah. you just yes. buy the right parts from other people. Think or, about how much money it costs you to start up a distillery yeah. because most businesses fail within the first year. You've got to go four, And you got a million dollar years. outlay. Wow. Yeah. yeah, no big deal. Before so there's two ways that distilleries solve that problem. The first is they make something else, vodka, gin, rum, something that they can Something age that doesn't have to be aged. aged. Okay. Right, so now you're bringing the capital while you sit on your whiskey. The other way that's, is. That's, that's an old Irish uh, invective. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> sit on your whiskey. <laughs> that's right. Hey, you, it's like go fly a kite. <laughs> yeah. Go sit on your whiskey. So the other option is you buy already aged whiskey from bulk producers or other distilleries. Mm -hmm. You age them a little bit longer, but not four years. Yeah. Or you finish them in a different barrel than they would have originally done it, and then you bottle it and sell it immediately. Now, there's a company called MGP, and this is gonna start a lot of fights. Sorry about this. No, I'm ready. There's a company called MGP that's responsible for about half the bourbon brands on the shelf in the store oh, at any given time. They're like the Budweiser. They're a massive bulk facility. They're amazing. They know exactly what they're doing, and they're creating great whiskey. That's what's gonna start fights. Oh, okay. yeah, everyone because wants to believe. Whiskey snobs will argue to the death that MGP is a, a hellhole of yeah. non-creativity. Like, is there something on the label you would look for? That's another thing that'll start a fight in the comments. <laughs> so, <laughs> legally, they're not re required to say we got ours at MGP, but they do have to say where it was distilled. And MGP is located in Indiana, so you'll see a thing on the back of the ball that says, distilled in Indiana, uh -huh. in the heartland of America, or something like that, right? It's code. And what that means is, oh, it's an MGP whiskey. But they're all still different. They're all still different. Okay. The cool thing about MGP is, now here's how I argue with those people. If you go out to dinner at, say, Sullivan's in downtown Austin, you order a steak, are you disappointed that you didn't raise and kill and then butcher that steak yourself? Uh, no. Right? Are you disappointed that Sullivan's didn't do it? Yeah, no. It's like, hey, Sullivan's, this steak is not legitimate. Yeah. Because you didn't raise it, kill it, and butcher it for me first. I want to see the chef come out with a <laughs> giant <laughs> scimitar. Just blood yeah. all up his hands. It's like, how is your steak? <laughs> it's fresh. <laughs> That's right. He put up a noble fight. <laughs> it was a good death. <laughs> I lost two life yeah. wielding a rapier. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you need more mashed potatoes? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So Wh wait. So pig. while we drink this, this is rye whiskey, which means it's at least fifty-one percent rye. Got it. This is now. Uh, now Whistle Pig is doing everything in one location: growing the grain harvesting the grain, making the whiskey, aging it in barrels they've made. And the made. benefit of all that is that you get a more consistent product and that your brand is stronger because everyone knows local, exactly what to expect. And you appeal to purists. And yes. you get featured on Portlandia. Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> no, maybe. Notice the kind of this black pepper so spiciness. Much, yeah, it's so yeah. smooth. Mm -hmm. This one doesn't have the kick uh, or the bite of that last one that we did. Yeah, it's a little sweeter. A lot of bourbons will use a higher percentage of rye grain to mellow out the corn. Okay. Right, so you get a high rye bourbon. And all high rye means is the next most grain was rye. It's funny because uh, uh, the, the second one was a lot more smooth than the first one. Than the oh, other. I just mm -hmm. agree. That first, yeah. what, that that hundred proof one was the second one. That, yeah, that one, that, that one. Making, it was a little punchy. I think the Irish was smoother. Really? But okay. this is my favorite thing about whiskey. 
is it's so subjective that you can have completely different opinions and everyone is absolutely right. And, yeah. and this one is uh, definitely sweeter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Man, Thank you, Whistlepig. That's smooth. Smooth. Okay. This we're going to end with and call it a day. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Yeah. All right. Wait, hold on. This is a way for you to understand it. Were you listening? I was. I was. This uh, is a blended malt scotch called Monkey Shoulder. Okay. So. What does that um, mean? Uh, it, it blended means it came from multiple distilleries. Yep. So you, you bought a bunch of alcohol and got a mix that tasted the way they wanted it to taste. Malt uh, means it was barley. Yep. 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 And uh, uh, scotch means this comes from Scotland, mm -hmm. right? Now, wait a minute. And you know it's at least three years old. Oh, and, it, and sure enough, whiskey is spelled without an E. Because That's it came right. from Scotland. Yeah. Okay, good. Boy, man, Scotch whiskey with an E, like that just screams counterfeit now. <laughs> now I know. Have you seen one? <laughs> no. You, you have really rude friends. <laughs> I got you this amazing present, Ryan. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Scotch whiskey, Scotch spelled with an just X. Say, man, yeah. come on. Let's. Yeah. Uh, some of us are on a limited budget. <laughs> all right. All right. So just right. enjoy right. blended malt Scotch, sort of a butterscotch finish, light smoke, and let's be friends. Uh, what, what's the thing you said? Sriracha? Sriracha. Cilantro? Cilantro? You yeah. animal! <laughs> You're not Irish. Wait, wait, wait. He just found out. Yeah. <laughs> did. Literally, like, literally a last week. He's still a wee baby Irish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's slancha. Slancha. Yeah. And, and what does that mean? It means basically health to your okay. health. Slancha. Yes. Slancha. To your health, dummy. <laughs> yeah. All right, today we're going to see. If we can T-1000 your hand. Oh, no, 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 no. I was already the victim of a drone strike. I don't plan to go back again. That hand might be immortal now. <laughs> it's fine. Because I'm a modern Shattering frozen locks. All right, so real life, we're going to T-1000 these locks, right? Yeah, you always hear about getting something so cold, specifically locks, that you can just shatter it with a little bit of blunt force. And so I guess the thinking is we're going to chill these so much that they become much more brittle, right? Yes, it all comes down to toughness. You can shatter diamond with a hammer, but you can't cut through it. You can cut through a chain made of rubber, but you can't shatter it with a hammer. So from a practical perspective, if you want to get in a lock, I assume with a door lock, you would shoot the cold stuff in the, to the cylinder and crack it, right? It would be right. equivalent to drilling it. So it seems like the first thing we should do is establish a baseline of how at room temperatures, these things react to various, geez, okay, baseline achieved. It's good. <laughs> Would have preferred eye protection, but uh... oh, it's fine. <laughs> it bent. It didn't break. We didn't do anything. Okay. Well, here, let's do, let's do, let's do it for real. The most sensible way to pop something like these would be to get these giant guys and just pop it like that. Yeah. Right? Look at that. That's that because... is super effective. Yeah. Plus, I look good doing it. Yeah. Here, try that. And it may it may come to the point where we can freeze these and shatter them, but it won't be the most sensible solution. Right. It's like butter. Right? Yeah. So let's do this. As our baseline at room temperature, I'm gonna slam this thing right on this corner to try to break this part as hard as I can. Should I use the flat side or the, the point, pointed side? Seems like it'd be more. Well, that's gonna require more accuracy, but it'll probably work yeah, better. Okay, so here we go, here we go, yeah, here we go, here we go. sure. So like one. Did I get it? I missed it. <laughs> let's try it again. Try it again. Yeah, you yeah, you totally missed it. All right, Ray. Okay. That worked. That worked. That was enough to pop it right open. Yeah. And that's what it looked like at room temperature. So I guess that's our baseline. I'd always heard this as a Freon thing, but nowadays Freon is like, you can only buy like illegally in Mexico. Yeah, Freon's highly regulated. It's difficult to get your hands on because it hurts the environment. A good alternative is difluoroethane or the keyboard cleaner you get in compressed air. Difluoroethane. Yes. Dude, I used to mess around with this all the time. Here, take a look at this. So if you hold it upside down, it leaks out the difluoroethane, which has a bitterant in it so that people don't abuse it as an inhalant. Mm. Once you get a puddle of it on there, take a deep breath and you go. <gasps> hey, it's like a special effect in a movie. I'm Mr. Freeze. That's the second Schwarzenegger reference in this episode. Oh, we're just getting started. I'm gonna yell Crom next time I slam Let's off down. some steam, yeah. Bennett. <laughs> All right, so when this stuff comes out, it's what temperature? Negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so it's like what, negative 25 Celsius, right? Correct. So, and then that means eventually this gets to that cold, which theoretically means it's nice and brittle. Although this is a very nice challenge coin and I don't want to mess it up. So let's try it on one of these. Okay, so same deal, right? Now, do you want it? You, you don't want to just blast air 
just because that's uh, that's dumb. The way <laughs> the way I've seen it done is yes, it's upside down. You're gonna want to put your gloves on because your hands are probably yeah, gonna get pretty cold. Yeah, okay. We're gonna try to hit that same spot again, right? Yeah. I didn't see it done like that. It was actually sprayed when oh, I saw really? it. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be judicious in my use of it. Okay. Because you can just blast it all out really, really fast, but it's like right now that stuff is just boiling off and that evaporation is getting everything super, super cold. I'm gonna do... You gonna try it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That's not an outrageous amount. Same deal. Oh! Hmm, it looks like the same thing. Yeah, that was really not an Oh, no, 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 no. Look at that. This one. Oh, yeah. The cheaper metal was not able, it, it totally cracked. In fact, I'll bet this thing would full on shatter if you hit it on the cheaper metal. Well, I assume it's a cheaper metal. Here, try right. this one okay. without it All right. first. All right, room temperature. Okay, there we go. That's, that's, a, that's a full on hit at room temperature. We got a minor chip. So now, oh, this is gonna be good. Because look at how much more surface area. It's gonna be a giant brick of brittle coal. Oh, missed it. What happened? Nothing. Well, I think I missed it again. I'm gonna be a little more aggressive on release. So I guess aim matters. Funny. I guess the air yeah. causes that evaporation to happen faster. I'm sure this is getting it super cold. Uh, I'm feeling good about this. You say go? Yeah, let's do it. Set. Oh! Nothing. All but, right. but also, that doesn't feel... It doesn't feel particularly cold. I mean, so, it's cold, but let's do it full blast. Okay, I think we do need to focus on these edges, right? I think sure. that's the spot. God, it just kills me that we're wasting so much. Keep it, keep it going, keep it going. You gotta keep it going. See, the problem is, while it's liquid, I don't think it's cooling anymore because it's the evaporation that causes right. the rapid cooling. So I think you want it to evaporate. Okay, that's pretty cold. All right, here we go. Oh. Oh, that was not, it, it doesn't break. No. Let's just use the rest of this bottle. Just blast it all out. Because I guess to see success, what, what are we defining success as here? I think we'll know it when we see it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's got to shatter. We, yeah. we, we, we're looking for T1000. So there's half of one there. I guess part of the problem is that metal doesn't like to stay cold very long too. So we don't have very much time. Okay, that's like almost a full bottle. Hey, that worked, <laughs> that worked. That worked. Okay, so we just need to use a lot. Yeah. I wonder what's different when it's chilled. So when we use the bolt cutters at room temperature, you can see where it kind of like dug in, like a knife into hot butter, right? Yeah. I wonder if on the cold stuff, it'll react any differently. Try the bolt cutters on this. So you can see the one side, the hard impact just fractured it. The other side, the bolt cutters, you can see the cutting action right on there. Mm -hmm. All right, so we had the rinky-dink padlock. What about something a little more realistic? All right, let's see how this works with the bolt cutter. Just do that right in the middle. Just right there? Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> nothing. I, see, again, the superior solution is to have bolt cutters. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if we're gonna do this like by the rule book, I mean, I guess we want to pick one spot. Yeah, like right there, like probably not the lock itself, but the cable, that seems like it would be the weak point, yeah, right? Yeah, I agree. Here, take it away, boss. All right, so upside down, you think? This is a very expensive way. Is it? I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how much these cost. They're, they're not free. I swear this better work. <laughs> let's see, let's yeah. see. Do it, hurry. Whoa! Oh, this is crazy. So It broke the rubber. Yeah, the plastic immediately chipped right off, but really the metal was surprisingly resilient. I mean, I feel like I could have clipped that a 
few more times and nothing would have changed. But meanwhile, this stuff is cracking. Yeah, and yeah. it definitely did some damage to the cabling inside the tube. I think you do need to take your time and let it dribble out and really yeah. let, let it get cold. Yeah. So far, I think the best solution, the bolt cutters. Of course. But we're gonna try something a little experimental. Oh, hold on, so here's my theory. If all that matters is that this gets super cold and brittle, this is negative 25 degrees Celsius, and it's difficult to handle, and it's liquid, and it gets all over the place. A CO2 fire extinguisher shoots out dry ice that's negative 75 degrees Celsius. So in theory, we should blast this thing and maybe it'll work. I think it's worth a shot. I've never seen this done before. I've never tried it. It's, 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 this is why it's called a theory, sir. Do you want to do that one? Okay. Well, well, because we know for sure this didn't seem to work on it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll find out if doing it colder. <laughs> Whoops. Hi. You're going to want to get some gloves and some goggles, Mr. Brushway. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Whoop. <laughs> Oh, it's cold. It's cold. It's refreshing. It's pretty cool. Here, just do it. I feel like we're taking off into space. Yeah, do it. Keep going. OK, well, we, we could let it sit there, because right now it's just covered in dry ice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it still feels like it's warmer than I want it to be. Unleash that thing on there. You Unleash think? it. You yeah. All right. Just like just the whole thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. I, we're out. Okay. All right. Man, I hope we get something. Me too. Okay, ready? Ready. No. No! No. So I think we traded one demon for another. The yeah. powdered form is even more difficult to handle yeah. than the liquid form because you can't get that surface area on there enough. Right. You don't think it would be bad to mix these, do you? No, go for it. Really? I mean, whatever. <laughs> oh, see, look, yeah, look at that. It's melting the ice on it. It's conducting all that warmth out of the lock. Look at that. Oh, listen to all that boilage. All right, that's all bubbling and boiling off. Just hit it with that flat side and with see the if flat we can yeah. All right, I'll do my best. I mean, as hard as you can. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a terrible aim. Yeah, yeah, you know. All right, all right, all right. I don't trust myself. Oh! Uh, yeah, that worked. That worked. Wow, wow. <laughs> I felt particles hit we me. We eventually the got face. there. Yeah, dude, it totally shattered. Oh, oh and I think they're in my uh, pants. I cut my knuckle. Mm. What's that? I banged my hand down. Oh hell, it burned through my shirt. Oh geez, that was a bad idea. It's kind of oh, held that's, together, dude. Yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of nasty. Oh damn. All right, final analysis. Did it work? No, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and it's kind of dangerous. Yeah, that last one, when it split, it definitely tore a hole in your shirt, yeah. and it definitely cut my knuckle. That yeah. was BS. I felt super cold particles tearing into my face. The worst part was, after I felt my knuckle get cut, I put it in my mouth, and I tasted that nasty bitter. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Just use the bolt cutter. Yeah, like a responsible thief, <laughs> or somebody opening your own shed, right? <laughs> yeah. It's fine. I'm gonna go to the ER. Jason, it's happening. We're gonna learn jujitsu here at the Aces Jujitsu Club featuring Coach Luke, Coach Mikhail, and Coach Ty. Thank you guys so much. All right, now, Coach Mikhail, tell us a little about yourself and your qualifications. I've been wrestling since I was six years old. Uh, travel over the world. My father was Golden Gloves boxer. Really, really fortunate uh, to train with some awesome units in the military. First Ranger Bad Sea Taf, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and after getting out of the military, I uh, was able to work with some awesome contracting outfits. Went on to become a professional fighter. 
uh, one around the world and opened up Ace's uh, Jiu Jitsu Club when I fell in love with coaching and helping other people get really awesome. All right, so you buried the lead because out of everything I know you do, the one that impressed me the most is that you, all of these are real world skills because you spent so much time as a bouncer, right? I did, as a bouncer and yeah, and bodyguard. I, I finished uh, Punch Out when I was 12, Mike Tyson's yeah. Punch Out, yeah, that was good. You know, it's really misleading because they called it Mike Tyson's Punch Out, but I never saw any Mike Tyson in my game. <laughs> no, you this suck. is the last character. <laughs> Oh, maybe that's why I never saw him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so in the real world, you're gonna encounter people who wanna kick your ass by punching you, and you're gonna wanna punch them. I assume that I don't know how to throw a punch, and I certainly don't know how to dodge one. So what do I need to know about punches? They hurt. Yes, I, I know that much. Besides the fact that they hurt, it's really important to understand that punching inside of a street fight can get you in trouble because the other person knows how to accept that punch. Now. The most common punch inside of a street fight is a haymaker. What does that look like? Haymaker, if I'm here with Coach Ty, and Coach and I, and I decide to throw a haymaker, <laughs> a lot of times people come from the back and throw that punch over, and then they hit people and, and knock them out. It's a horrible punch, but it's a really common punch. Why, what makes it horrible? It's not really supported as a structure. When you're throwing a proper punch, a straight punch, let's say, right? In this situation, I want to make sure that I'm throwing it, oh, boom. And, I, and I, my body is reinforcing the control of this punch, right? I can put some serious leverage behind that. That's not to say that there's not another punch called an overhand right. Boom. That is way more technical than just, I'm upset with you. Uh, or some kind of sucker punch try to set up that way. Right. Right. And that's commonly known as the haymaker. So the haymaker equals bad. Bad form because you telegraph what you're doing. Yes. You don't have any force behind it. Uh, uh, show, uh, explain, to, teach us how to throw a good punch. Just, just the basics. So basic. There's a lot of punches. Let's talk about the cross, for instance. I'd say that's one of the more common power punches, and it's really, really effective punch in a lot of ways. So when I'm throwing this punch, I want to make sure that I have a good wide stance. I want to make sure that I use my hips and my knee to rotate and throw the punch. I'm gonna make sure my arm is tight so I don't end up chicken winging, right? And then I'm gonna rotate. Now, notice if Coach Ty takes a step back from me, I'm not leaning on him, right? And this is how a lot of people get in real trouble. They lean forward mid-punch, and if they miss, whoa! And that puts you at a huge vulnerability. Huge vulnerability. You end up falling down, you look silly, they don't wanna fight you anymore, they take pictures, you're a meme, it's horrible. And again, there's lots of different punches. We have a jab, bing, we have the cross, Right, we have, we okay, so, wait, so, so a jab is defined as punching with the same leg that's forward. So if I'm throwing a jab, I'm, I'm throwing it with a, my lead leg. You don't throw a rear jab. Okay. So here I am, my lead leg, boom, there's my jab. A cross is always comes from the rear. Yep. Right, so here I am on the rear side, bing, there's my cross. Now, you can throw hooks on either side. These are looping punches, bing, right, looping punches. You can throw overhands. Being, which is very different again from the many different iterations of the haymaker. So many ways you can mess that up. Okay, so there's always a jab button in the video games, and I'm like, why bother with the jab? Yeah. Always do uppercuts. You know, it's it's. Yeah. But I assume, uh, what do you get out of performing a jab before a cross? The jab is defined by its purpose, and the, and that purpose would be several fold. One important thing is to measure distance, right? Because if I throw my punch and I'm too far away from him. Or, inversely, I'm too close to him. And because my punch is what we call caged, mm -hmm. right, it's too close, I'm not able to realize the maximum force that I could by standing at the end of my punch, right? So I want to be able to measure my distance. Another thing I want to be able to do is to hide footwork, right? So when I jab, bing, bing. Wow. I can knock him out. Quick yes. little shift. That's correct. So basically, jab gives you an opportunity to take measurements and to set up for a more powerful cross. Absolutely. And it seems yeah, like it's a bit of a distraction too, right? It definitely can be. Uh, I don't know. I was in the military. We used to, when you ran out of rounds in your sidearm, right? You'd throw a cap right inside the guy's eye, you know, and then and, and then pull out your knife. Similar concepts, right? I used to use this one quite often. Right, end up putting the hand in front of his face, right, and then line up and come oh, over the top. Oh wow! Right? That seems yeah. more effective. Yes. Uh, okay, now now you guys being uh, trained in jujitsu, and we're going to learn about the grapples and the chokes and and, yeah. and non-punching ways. But I assume that part of what you need to know to even get into that stage of the human chess match is how to block a haymaker when it comes at you. I say it's really important to self-defense. I like not getting hit. Oh, that's that, one that of my works. favorite things. Likewise, likewise. You know, I get guys who come in all the time. And they're like, I'd be a great professional fighter. They all sound like that. <laughs> that's <laughs> great, right? Like and Tony the Tiger? Like Tony the Tiger. <laughs> Great. <laughs> exactly. So obviously all those moves are when you are answering punches, but when that first haymaker comes at you, when you suddenly realize like, oh, this is going to be a fight, are there blocks? I would just yeah. run away. No, okay. So running away is actually not great because I can sometimes increase the distance 
Ah, uh, and I just increased the force on accident. Got it. Right, which is why it's better to instead he throws it, move in. Oh wow! And then boom, and then whizzer. That. That's what this is called. The it's called whizzer? a whizzer. Whizzer, right? Like when you're whizzing on snow. Yeah. Because America. <laughs> yeah, right. America. So here Good I am. Good justification. <laughs> it is my favorite. It's called the it whizzer because America. It's called the the America justification. If exactly. used correctly, can be no defense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is happening on your hands right here? So you just got this looped around. Are you grabbing it with the nope. other hand? Bringing my hand to my chest. Okay. Because America. Oh, got it. Oh. That's why the, your hand on your heart. So now once I'm here inside of this position. I have a lot of awesome opportunities that are available to me, right? One of which. Whoa! That's a that's a thing that you can do. Yep. Okay, now for, forgive me. That flippy thing. Every time I've ever seen it, it's always been in a martial arts movie, and it's been clear that they're working together as a team. Oh, and they are because it's television. Y yes. Right. But in reality, you can the technique still works using. Science. Television Go is on. totally real. Go right, on. Brian? Well, like, it's science. I'm waiting for this. All right, so the concept is centered around leverage, right? So if you notice, if you come yep, yep. real quick and you throw that big haymaker. Yeah. Boom. Okay, yeah. All right, right. right. Uh -huh. So once I'm here, yep. I want you to notice something really interesting. Huh. When I You're bring these die. legs in, yep. whoop. Uh, okay, yeah. All I right. can easily lift you up. Uh, okay. And that didn't require any. In fact, I want you to resist. Okay, all right. Okay. I'm going to try to resist. You ready? Yep, yep. You ready to resist? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I, yeah, okay. I'm resisting. I'm resisting. I'm resisting. Resist Jeez. harder. <laughs> you didn't resist hard enough, Brian. <laughs> okay. All right. Tap it out. Tap it out. Oh, that was amazing. <laughs> all right. No questions about whether it's real. Uh, <laughs> can, can we learn that whole maneuver or is that too advanced? No, you can learn the whole maneuver. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, let's uh -oh. do this. You're, you're great guys, and because we're great coaches. Yes, absolutely. Here at yeah. Aces Jiu Jitsu Club in North Austin. First, let's talk about how to throw a poor punch. In this situation, notice that Coach Ty, he comes over the top, like he reels back, comes over the top, and I just send my arm in. By, by moving in forward. Look how quickly he went, and look how slowly I went. Now, once it, you ever use those snap bracelets? Yeah. You guys were in the 80s, yeah. right? Yeah. Bam, they're they're right? totally rigid until they flex just enough and then they just snap forward. Absolutely. Yeah. It's that same concept. So when he throws that punch, bing, right? In fact, if you do it with enough force, you bring him all the way down. Wow. Right? Now you do have a bunch of other options to either hit him, knee him, right? Or even do a fun little cattle catcher. Wow. Boom, and then bring him through. It's like a dance. It is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fighting is like a decision tree. So in this situation, he's gonna throw it, boom, right? Here I am, my wizard comes through to touch my heart. I bring my head down so he can't headbutt me. I grab his wrist, boom, and now I'm in a good spot. Now I wanna load my hips up under his hips is one option, or I can just step over his leg. I'd say that's the easiest one. Boom, one step, two step, and then I turn, right? Wow. So the split second decision, because oftentimes a haymaker will be a sucker punch at the beginning. Yeah. So as soon as you see that- Whenever you're ready, Coach Ty. Uh, what's that? Keep going. <laughs> Wait, what did no, I do? Keep going, oh, okay. keep going. All right. So uh, haymaker- <laughs> That was amazing. So I guess, I guess that's the impulse, is the moment you see this, that's like a fight's on, and you immediately respond by diving in, in on it to cut, to cut it off, right? It's actually a- uh... You want to look kind of center line. It's not his eyes that are going to tell you what's happening. It's not right. his shoulders even. Right. It's like his center line and hips. Okay. They're going to let you know when he's going to throw a punch first. So here you are with me. You're going to throw this big haymaker. All right. Boom. Okay. All right. I want you to throw it faster and don't let me know oh. when you're going to start. Okay. Go. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go again. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. It might, it might seem like I'm faster than you. It does. But I have a less complex movement to make. You're also and faster than he is. <laughs> And I just have to be in the way. Yeah, I'm gonna try so, again. So, okay. Ooh! <laughs> right. So, once I'm here. Okay, all right. Boom, and I wrap around. Okay, and now you're, you're doing America, right? Yeah, America. Okay. Wizard. Right. A wizard, right. touching my heart. Right now I'm in a good spot, in a good position. Yep. Now I'm gonna step, step, yep. Yep. and then okay. turn. Okay. Oh, that seems very doable. And now oh. you got all your weight on me. Absolutely. There's a weight. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. It's about to pull the mountain. That's like, we should do a whole episode just about like tapping. 
don't forget to tap. That is a good point. I, I totally did not tap. I just sat there like, this is novel and yeah, it's, it's like, getting worse. This is really cool. I could totally do this. Oh, I gotta go to the hospital. Yeah. Well, sometimes you uh, think like a position isn't gonna like hurt you, but like we do neon sternum here. Like he'll break your ribs yeah. just from being in position. So you gotta be ready to tap. Yeah. Here, show, show me how tapping works. <laughs> So, uh, try to surprise him with a haymaker. Oh, this, yeah, that's not gonna happen, <laughs> right? right? Here we are. Yep. All right. I'm just gonna take a bit. Now, you're crossing your feet, which means you're gonna fall down. Oh, Let's yeah. Give you a more supported stance. Okay. And you already feel like the pain the in the arm. Right? Numb. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I'm here. Mm hmm. Boom. Step to the other side, and I'm gonna look over my shoulder. <laughs> and now I'm in a good spot. Tap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hear the. The, the Jiminy Cricket voice, tap. <laughs> Don't forget to tap. You guys are about to do the exact same thing I'm excited to share with you. Oh. Are you ready? Yes, yes. Now Coach Ty is going to be throwing a haymaker. Okay. And all you're going to do is, is put your arm out. Whoa, whoa, calm, calm down, third right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey, okay. Hey. Let's bring that back. Got it, I'm got like it. like somebody said it. Yeah. Really? <laughs> so we're going to put the hand up in a non-threatening way. Got it. In a very inclusive way. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good, all right? <laughs> So now a hand goes up, he throws the haymaker, boom, and then immediately wraps around and touches right. your heart. Wait. Now you're gonna turn your shoulder. Whoa, oh, look, that turns him down. Wow. You're gonna bring your five head. <laughs> okay. Boom. Right. Right down to his head. And this is a preemptive strike. Not That's only does right. it help you control him, but it also keeps him from headbutting, right? That's correct. Okay. Now you're gonna grab his wrist. Okay, got it, because he's going on punch. Step forward with this leg. Yep. Nope, this one. Oh, sorry. Now yeah. step forward with the other one on the other side of his leg, and then turn. Wow! Whoa! That Boom. felt awesome! Dude, that was great! Felt uh, awesome for one of you. Let's do it again. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, roger that. Non-threatening, inclusive America, grab thing, five head together. Step, take step. a step, uh, no, no, yeah, take a step. No, 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 that was right. You got it, you got it. Step, step, and down. Yes, that's it. Wow! Wow! Yes. That was awesome, dude. Good job. Good you gotta job, try sir. this. You gotta try this. So Luke is gonna throw. Remember, inclusive. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh. And then an America. There you go. All America. the way to your chest. Right here. All yep. right. Excellent. Bring your head down. Head down. Mm -hmm. Grab his wrist. Wrist, oh, wrist. 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 There you go. Yep. Step with the lead. This leg first. Now step with the other leg. And lead and turn. <laughs> and you almost fell. Get over here, man. Save yourself. <laughs> hey, nice. There you go. Let's do it again. He throws. Yes. Oop. Lean forward. Oop. Yes. And step, step the other step leg. Again. And there hey, you go. That's it. Wow. And there's a lot of pressure, like right here. You can you actually. Land? I can teach you a technique later to break that arm. <laughs> just. Okay. So, I, I like the fact that there's just these in, individual discrete moves. Oh! oh! Yeah. Get it. Five, five head. Five head. Five head. Five head. Yeah! Hey! <laughs> oh, With the sucker punch. The head is key too. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh no no no. I mean, because, like all of it is, like we were talking about. Yeah. Yes. So the interesting thing is you have all these different details and you have this crazy thing called probability, right? Yeah. And each detail, how you perform it inside of the matrix, inside of that system, it increases or decreases your probability. Like, yeah, it'll work without the five head. Right. But against somebody who's larger, you're going to need the five head to increase your probability or without it, it can decrease your probability if they fight back in this X, Y, Z way. I feel like we have to have a grand championship now. Wait, like, it's, oh, <laughs> I got you. Yeah, you did, you did. I was, I was in the host mode and you're like, no, it's a street fight. <laughs> All right, so how about you guys come over here real quick and you guys gonna do the same technique? I'll, I'll, I'll punch you. Uh, okay, hold on. I'm I'm on a different nope. side. No. <laughs> uh, hey, you did, did the I? technique. Okay, good, yeah. good. Okay. Yes, All right, come on, right, man. All right, go for it, go okay. for it, go for it. Uh, do, uh, wait, no, 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 okay. I'm doing it backwards now. No, no, you're, so here's the deal. If you start, you gotta finish. Okay. All right? Yep. It doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to get to the end. Okay, got it. Yep. Go, begin. Wait, oh, that, are you right? I switched up. You f I switched. That's what was happening. I'm like, this feels all wrong. I don't understand. Okay, all right, now I'm ready, I'm ready. Go all ahead, right. go ahead. All right. Uh, 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 I'm together. Five head, five head. Five head, uh, uh. Turn, uh, just look over uh, your shoulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Like that. yeah. Uh, I don't think I did that right. I think no, I- No, you didn't. I, yeah. All right, so, so uh, let's, let's, go, let's go back real quick for okay. a second and let's walk yeah. you through it. It seems like you're trying to overcompensate. Yeah. Right, so when he kind of tries to bring this through, yeah. boom. No, you kept trying to touch his heart. Yeah. Instead of touching my heart, absolutely. So I think we can agree that Brian has touched all of our hearts. <laughs> he has. So here we are, boom. We're yeah. in good position. 
Now from and here, I, I should be facing left his or, shoulder yeah. into his head. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. And so I'm still gonna go forward yeah, that's here, correct. right? Step, step. Yeah. So step, step, like that. Oh. <laughs> that felt good. Yes. Having you break my fall. Uh, let's, okay. do the, let's do All the right. full thing. We All got right. this ready. Now. Ready. Uh, uh, nope, nope, nope. Look what, you, look what you're doing. Oh, God damn it! I did it. Okay, all right, all right, for reals. Oh, yes, dude, finish. Get on top, get on top, get on top, get on Get on, get on. No. All right, so. Do this one again. Open up your leg, uh -huh. start in a good stance. Okay. Right? He's gonna throw the punch. Yep. You're gonna immediately go to your own heart. Right. And you're gonna continue. You're gonna bam, 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 bam. One, Step. two, three. Yeah. Uh, and does it matter arm or forehead first? No, it doesn't. Okay. Just great. Go, go with the beats. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> That was sloppy footwork. That was sloppy footwork. Because I should have taken one steps. step around and then stepped yes, down. That's yeah. Uh, far, no, leg, far leg, far leg. One, two, three. Oh, like that. That's yeah. it, yes. Get on there. Bah, 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 bah. Okay, all right. That looked sexy. I feel like with some practice, I could get that rhythm down. No, you. yes, you look okay. great. Okay, ready? Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm good. Do you, you have context? Good. Yeah, so I do. It's all right. We'll do, we'll do it slow motion just to walk through sure. it, right? Like, whoa. Oh, and then. And then five, five, five ahead. And I'm like, oh no, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I just have to <laughs> turn around and get on him. That's, yeah. Yes, I, I yes. forgot that's the that's You the always want to finish the way. Absolutely. Yeah, you got to yeah. finish the job. Yeah. He's not just going to laugh and yeah. high five you. And be like, look what I did. Right. Did somebody get that? I got to send it to Aces. Dude's got a knife <laughs> out. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 that also that was, works. That was that great. Works. That was great. Oh, okay. That no, works. I was saying no. I was like the villain falling it wasn't, to my doom. It wasn't the way I taught you to do it, but it also is legitimate-ish. <laughs> so here's the important thing to understand. In a fight, these things need to be on purpose, guys. Yeah. And if you just leave it to chance, right? Chance, oftentimes, is not a movie. Or yeah. It just takes your favor because you're the lead hero. And the other person's story, they're the hero too. So it's important for you to create a path. And you choose that and you, and you do it. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Right? And I'd say one of the biggest important things that's difficult for a lot of people making adjustments is making decisions in cadence. Yes. Right? If you've ever played music before. Can we see one more time a proper takedown so that we can model that? Absolutely. Uh, go, all, right, all right. Absolutely. In this situation, Mr. Luke's going to come help me out. Boom. Here I am. By the way, you can rest here for a second. You don't have to hurry up too much. Right? Once I'm here, right, he's fighting. Whoop. And then I step through. That's good all to right. know that there's a break because, like, thinking six steps gets my gets me too much. But if all I'm thinking of is 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 block America, five head and yes. wrist, and then I have a moment to reset and think, what do we do next? When I was in the military, we used to like. I know this goes against Call of Duty rules. Sure. We used to run in in th like three to second burst to try to get to cover. Camouflage. You can't see me. Cover. It's harder for you to hit me. So it's that same concept. I, in a fight, am rushing to a, my, neck, my best next safe place. Right. Right, that's what I'm rushing to. Once I'm in that best next safe place, I stop for a moment. And that's how we create a beat or a cadence. Yeah. Right, my cadence to move. Uh, boom. All right, I'm safe for a second, and then I keep going. And boom. Right, and that's what a lot of people, I think, don't think about. They're so busy creating this aggressive narrative inside of their mind, inside of the fight, that they don't give themselves the opportunity to think. Right. right. So let's take a break in each of these positions to give you the opportunity to think about what you're supposed to do next instead of just like hurrying yourself. Because you want to do it on your time, not his time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, perfect. Here I go, boom, right? This is a place where I can stop. Now, I'm here, I'm gonna step, step, boom, right? And I can come down with him, right? All right, good, and there's another place I can stop. Now, if the fight was to continue, I can start striking him here, I can break his arm, all that kind of stuff can happen right there. Got it. But I gotta hurry to the position where I can stop. And then uh, this is, I'm gonna come at you, right? Face him, face him, yes, can't. stop. No. Now think about your next move. I'm Don't just do it, it. Yes. I'm gonna get you, sucker. Yes. <laughs> yeah! Oh, 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 tap, 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 tap. Oh my God. Are you, a machine. are you alive? Yeah, oh. dude, that was amazing. Oh, that was great. Oh, that was good. Dude, I got I, full I frontal see, Murphy. I could see the gears turning. <laughs> yeah. 
Dude, that was great. And, and the pause was very helpful. Yeah, dude, and you're scary now. Congratulations. Hey. That was Likewise, amazing. Sir. Thank you, McLeod. That sir. was amazing. Dude, Luke, Ty. Yeah, look at, yep, here. Ah. <laughs> Turkey. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paper covers wrong. Oh, oh come on. Oh, what are you going to do? Look, you know Stale. this one? A ah. jellyfish. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was like a bigger jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> a bi oh, sh**. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Brian's tapping before it even hurts. <laughs> He's like, I've lost. I've lost. <laughs> If you were to do an impression of me ordering a drink at a bar, what would it look like? Hey boss, uh, can I get a, um, yeah, can I get a Bud Light? Thanks, man. A Bud Light, fuck you, Because <laughs> I'm a Bud Back again at Wizard Academy with the Rock Vice and Chancellor and co-founder of the Whiskey Marketing School, Mr. Daniel Winnington. Talk us through the experience of how to order a whiskey and sound like a badass. Okay, so there's only one rule to start, and that's the definition of good whiskey is whiskey you like to drink. And the right way to drink whiskey is the way you want to. And anyone who argues with that is a pretentious asshole. Okay. <laughs> and if you weren't sure, now you know. There's a mantra going through my head right now. All whiskey is good whiskey. Taste is subjective. And you can't, if I said, what's your favorite food? I like shrimp cocktail. Okay, well, I've had a shrimp cocktail. You're wrong. <laughs> okay. that's, that's a cheap way to feel superior to someone yeah. else. Yes, exactly. Right now, in that interaction, who looks like the uh, It's not, not Brian, me. Not right? Me. Split the difference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, so I asked the God of Brian World, what's something you love? He tells us, shrimp cocktail I have spoken. And then we try to argue with that. That's insane, because that's a subject of reality. So the same thing goes for whiskey. This is actually a really good point, because the first step to ordering drinks like a boss is to know what you like. Yeah. And if you like it, then you are above reproach. Yeah. Now, anyway, the point is, no matter what we talk about right now, that we're not defining good and bad, we're just defining what it's gonna do and what you're gonna get. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. Four ways to order whiskey. Neat or a shot. Neat and a shot are basically the same thing. It just means a whiskey with nothing in it. Got it. Now, neat means you want to sip it. A shot means you want to get drunk quicker. Yep. <laughs> right? Okay. Or maybe you've had a long day. The second one is ice. That's called whiskey rocks. Yep. Right? Or give me a whiskey, uh, two ice, you know, if you want less ice and so on. And that's fine. And we're about to experience this. Are you ready? Yeah. Now, I can't make you a cocktail. The third way is a cocktail, right? Whiskey in something. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make you a cocktail right now, but essentially... We, we have a guy. Un yeah, you do. And my hands are clean, by the way. Unlike vodka, which just exists to make other things alcoholic. Yes. And I'm really going to offend a lot of vodka drinkers all of a sudden. It's true. So what we're doing, whiskey, when you add it to something, adds an actual flavor. So you don't, like any recipe, you add it based on what flavor you want to add. You can't just add any whiskey to anything. A rye whiskey, as we learned in the last video, tastes very different than a scotch. So that's cocktails. They're off the table. Add whiskey to something based on what you want to drink. Now, ice does two things when you add it to whiskey. First, it waters it down like crazy. Mm -hmm. And second, it changes the temperature to a point where you can only taste about 60% of what's happening. I never thought about the fact mm. that the colder a drink gets, the less you're able to taste it. That well, makes sense though. Why do you serve wine at cellar temperature? Mm -hmm. Or good beer at cellar temperature, right? Why is the shittiest beer in the world advertised as the coldest beer known to man? So you don't have to taste it. Whatever that beer is. <laughs> well, <laughs> your tongue is not equipped to taste extreme temperatures. So if you've ever had a day when you broke down and had break room coffee because you just ran out, but you yep. desperately needed coffee, and the first sip is like, oh, it's not good, but it's gonna do. Five minutes later, it's cooled down a little. Your next sip is like, oh my God, what have I done with my life? This is a horrible mistake. I should have had water, <laughs> right? That's because now you can actually taste it. The same thing with whiskey. If you make whiskey cold or you put your alcohol in the freezer, what you're doing is burying 60 to 80% of the flavor. Wow. And if you have cheap whiskey, maybe that's not a bad idea. It may help. Remember, this is not about good or bad with these eyes, right? Yeah. The second thing you're doing is watering it down so much that you end up, say I go to a coffee shop or I'm hanging out with you and you say, let's get a coffee. And you're like, do you like coffee? I love coffee. Well, what do you get? 
well, like a triple white mochaccino with extra whipped cream yeah, and a yeah. caramel. It's like, well, the, it's not really coffee. Yeah. It's more like I'm a, sorry, I thought you wanted coffee. Uh, it's yeah. like a coffee-flavored dessert beverage. Yes. Right? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you bring that person a, a, bla a red eye or a great shot of espresso, you're going to ruin their life. So when someone pours a ton of whiskey on ice and it's all they drink or whiskey and Coke, well, they don't like whiskey. They like whiskey-flavored things. Whiskey-flavored water, whiskey-flavored Coke. That's fine. Except that if you poured that someone a straight shot of whiskey, you're gonna ruin their life. Some lives need to be ruined. I Some agree with they that. deserve it. Now I drink whiskey on the rocks in the summer because in Texas it's damn hot. Here's how you choose your whiskey on the rocks. You choose knowing what you're about to do. You're about to water it down and bury most of the flavor. You guys are gonna have to share these, but remember, 45% alcohol kills all that ails you. That's so right. You'll be okay. Okay, so Buffalo Trace, this is bourbon on the rocks. And as we learned before, bourbon means corn. Kentucky ish well, corn. Yeah. Like American. Yes, but, yeah. it means American. At least 51% corn. <laughs> Got now it. for our scotch on the rocks, we're doing Glenfiddich 12. Mm. Right. Uh, That's it, a good oh, one. We never talked about what the numbers mean. Uh, oh, I, I'll I, tell you about that. Okay, yeah. so 12 just means in Scottish whiskey, and this is less true in others, but it's still common in Irish. 12 means the youngest barrel was 12 years old. It doesn't mean it was all 12. There could be a 20 year old barrel in this whiskey. Oh, wow. If I it's did a not blend. know that. But no, 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 they're blending from their own stock at their own distillery. Okay, so single malt means- One uh, location and all barley. That's right. But if they have, uh, like say you have Glenfiddich 12, you could have 80% of it could be 12 year old barrels and then 10% could be 18 year old barrels and 5% could be a 25 year old barrel and they mix it according to get the flavor profile of Glenfiddich 12. And all of that just implies that the higher the number, the, the stronger the barrel flavor profile the, is? The or? more the barrel, the lower the alcohol content in Scotland and America, the alcohol alcohol content goes up, it's the heat difference huh. and huh. Uh, temperature difference. But for us, all you need to know if, is that means it's at least 12. Got it. It doesn't mean it's all 12. So you're not gonna get any like 10 barrels. These are getting watered down, let's drink this shit. Oh yeah, yeah. All yeah. right, and for our Irish, we're doing bush milk. Oh, I didn't even think about the fact that there's a timing issue with this. Oh yeah. Like, you, yeah. like Give the us, flavor will yep. taste different Give it three, three minutes, minutes. And this won't taste like whiskey anymore. I think when it comes to ice, bourbon and smoky scotch stands up to ice a lot better than Irish whiskey because Irish whiskey is so pretty and friendly that when it gets buried, it just vanishes, hmm. right? So bourbon will still taste like bourbon, the scotch will still taste slightly smoky, and the Irish whiskey will taste like super watered down whiskey. Well, let, let's let's go in Give it a try. increasing order here. Yeah, so we'll start, start, with, start with the Irish. Okay. It's like water. It's like water. That's because Irish whiskey is already so pretty. Oh yeah, that's already almost gone. It I mean, as far as really... the flavor goes. Now try your Glenfiddich 12. Okay, this is the scotch. This is the scotch on the rocks. Definitely more flavor, right? Without question. This one tastes um, definitely like alcohol. Like this one did not even taste like alcohol. This one does though. And the bourbon. And does the bourbon have a, a, a smokier profile? No, 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 no. There's not gonna be any smoke in a bourbon. Well, I don't know that I've ever heard of a smoked bourbon. That's a sun. That's an interesting experiment we should do. <laughs> See the difference? Yeah. It's much sweeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little more smoke. But all of these, I didn't expect it, but but you're right. It's as though you turn down the volume yeah. on it. So if you are an inexperienced whiskey drinker, I guess On the Rocks is the safest, easy, I guess yeah. as a cocktail is the or easiest. if you're just in the mood for a drink that's not, you're not gonna have to work at it. And I need to relax. I need to not think about what I'm holding. I just want to drink. Yeah. Give me a whiskey on the rocks. So you mentioned there were four ways. And so far we've talked about neat yes. on the rocks so let's uh, clear as these, a cocktail. I'll show you the last one. Okay. I'm gonna give you new glasses and I'm gonna take this one for myself. First things first is this is already an aggressive whiskey. So we're doing this experiment with Brooklach, which is an Isla Scotch that's extremely smoky. Okay, that was a lot of words that went <laughs> way over my head. Yeah. Break them down one at a time. Okay, first, Isla. Scotch. Now we know that means it's made in Scotland. Isla means it's on an island just off the lower west coast of Scotland, just off of Campbelltown. It's uh, spelled I-S-L-A-Y and pronounced Isla. Okay. Not Islay or Islay or Islay, it's Isla. Uh, Isla is where all the most famous, smokiest scotches that people know of tend to come from. Laphroaig, Brooklodic, Cow Isla, right, and so on. Two questions. First of all, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like, I guess different regions of Scotland have different flavor profiles. Yes. Like basically they're branded differently. Like yeah. we like to be more smoky and stuff. Second of all, uh, where, where does the smoke flavor come ah, from? Ah, so. It comes from Pete. P-E-A-T, not Pete, a guy who lives in Scotland. Yeah, just one guy yeah. that's yeah. got the recipe. Yeah. That guy, him and Doug, between the two of them, eat. 
they handle everything whiskey. Yeah. No, uh, peat is like peat moss or peat bog, or it's essentially it's swamp. a bunch of decayed it's decayed uh, matter moss, and it accumulates between one to five centimeters a year, which is really slow. It's just condensing. And uh, when you cut out the condensed mud, you cut it out in bricks, long, narrow bricks, and you set it out to dry. Traditionally, this was firewood in Scotland. Okay. Right? Well, and, and so w at what point do they, do they smoke it? Remember when we talked about malting last time when yeah. you have to let the grain crack and open up? And, well, you got to stop it at some point because if it goes too far, it eats all its own sugar. Then there's nothing to ferment. Traditionally, the way they stopped it was by smoke drying it, like the way we smoke dry barbecue or smoke cook barbecue, right? Sure, sure. Indirect smoke, not direct heat. So not like cooking it, like roasting it, but like starting a kiln fire with peat, redirecting the smoke across the barley and drying it out. Well, while the barley is wet, it absorbs smoke. Once it's dry, it stops absorbing smoke. But where, what you're burning and where you burn it and how much you burn, how much smoke ratio to grain, all of these will smoke the barley. And then when you make whiskey from it, it's now a smoky whiskey. That's astonishing. In America, they're doing this with things like mesquite, oak. They're making Scottish style whiskeys using mesquite instead of peat. So the original grains get malted. To stop the malting, you smoke it. That right. smoke becomes part of the flavor profile when you, you later uh, throw that it. all in water and you make a mash yeah. and, and that flavor persists as you make All the uh, way to the end. Is it is it wart? Is that what they call uh, it? Well, wart once it's the, yeah, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. And that's part and, of the process. God, wow. And wow. then there's still the barrel. Yeah, and yeah, even and in the then, barrel. Then you take the alcohol, put it in a barrel, and you adjust the flavor profile. How do any of these companies maintain any kind of consistency? It just seems like everything could go sideways. Is one uh, bottle of, of anything as consistent yeah, as the other? Yeah, just look at you have guys in charge of making sure it is, right? So you're not working with a barrel and hoping it turns out right. It's like, no, we have uh, a thousand, and we have another thousand. And they're all different ages. We've got thousands of barrels in here. We're gonna pick from these barrels and mix them together until they taste like Glenfiddich 12. Wow. But yeah, they're very, very protective of all the processes and, right, to do, and as a matter of fact, one of my favorite things about whiskey history is that often things that seemed like superstition turned out to be absolute science. You have a copper still and it's old and it gets banged up and dented and, you know, and kind of beat up. Well, now it comes time to replace it. Well, historically, sort of superstitiously, they would take the new still, design the new still, they bring it in, set it next to the old still, and they would proceed to go around and bang it up so that it matched to the old still because they were so protective of like, there's something magical about Everything the still. Everything has to be exactly you gotta the same. You got to replicate it, right? Yeah, you got to scare the, the ghosts out of the still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would have all the dents. They would dent it like with hammers and things so, so it looked beat up like the old one. And then they would swap them out. Well, that was superstition at the time. Now what we know is scientists have proven that is absolutely crucial and effective. When you're distilling, which means you're evaporating alcohol out, every change of surface area changes how the evaporation recondenses. Ah, wow. And so it absolutely affects the flavor. And they were absolutely right to do it. But they didn't do it because of science originally. And so yeah, you end up with a lot of these things like don't change this process. We always use this water. We always distill when the sun is at 3 for 30. And now over the years, they discover why it's happening like that. And then you can replicate it without having those specific instances and know what you're doing. A virgin must walk amongst the stills that's during right. with, with the first fawn of spring. <laughs> yeah, that's Lefroig. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or Lagavulin. Uh, all right, so we're experiencing the fourth way to drink. Yes. Now, this is called adding water to whiskey. <laughs> that sounds very technical. <laughs> if you go to a really fancy whiskey bar, you'll regularly find that they serve you a glass of whiskey and then a still water in another glass with a straw. Why are they doing that? I assume to dump, you just dump the one into the yeah. other, right? Yeah. <laughs> totally. You monster. <laughs> yeah, you Sorry. go back and forth with the straw. Yeah. Um, no, so you have a whiskey and you can add a little bit of water to it to open it up. You're basically creating a chemical reaction. This is different than adding a whiskey water which is like, hey, I want a whiskey, but I don't like whiskey, so I want a lot of water in it. Which is pretty close to what now we were doing with On the Rocks. Now we've moved to truly exploring a neat whiskey. Okay. This is already gonna be kind of aggressive for you if you're not used to drinking Isla whiskey. And, and by aggressive, I assume it's gonna be very smoky. Very smoky, very, very rich. Okay. Okay, take a smell of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Right? Now I want you to take a sip. Stings have the your nostrils. little reaction, and then, and then I'm gonna take it up a notch. All right. Ready for All right. it. So, so, Wait, uh, cilantro. 
uh, sriracha. <laughs> Cilantro. I love scotch. Scotchy, scotch, scotch. <laughs> Yeah, that's intense. Down it um, goes. That's like biting into an atomic fireball. Like, it's, wow. it's just at that 100%. Back now. Yeah. To quote okay. Brian, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I never thought, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when you start serving people whiskey. I know, I know. <laughs> well, they get really punchy. What we're going to do is we're going to add a little bit of water to each. You're going to watch this whiskey get about 40% more aggressive than it was before. Really? That's counterintuitive. Yes, it is. Yeah. Now, here's why. Remember, this is all science and chemistry. This is a decade-old beverage sitting in barrels for a decade to condense into what you see here. So that is a chemical composition. Right. In this chemical composition, there are some things that are water soluble and there are other things that aren't water soluble. The things that aren't water soluble are things like oils, right? And when you have at least smoked whiskey with a lot of carbon and there's a lot of oil in these whiskeys. Wow. And so what you're doing when you add about this much water, that's it. What? Just like three drops? Two to three drops. Now what you're doing is you just created a mini chemical reaction in here and all of the things that were water soluble absorbed and all the things that weren't tried to escape the chemical reaction by going to the top of the glass. Right. And so now your next sip is all of the things that aren't water soluble and are oily and heavy and aggressive. So you gotta be careful not to shake it or stir it or disturb it too much. Yeah, well, I mean, you can sort of, but yeah, if you leave it too long, it won't experience it. So there's yours. Cheers to you. Even the smell is more aggressive. Wow. <laughs> I did not see right? that coming. I know. I <laughs> thought it would turn it down yeah, a little bit, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. But see how you now have this clingy feeling on your tongue? That's because the oils are coating your tongue now, and they're remaining behind while you everything else goes down. You weren't kidding when you said aggressive. This yeah. is serious. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, remember, that doesn't work if you keep adding, then you keep getting more aggressive, because eventually the chemical reaction is, okay, think of it if you have your car in a driveway and it rains, and you got a big puddle in your driveway and your car leaks just a little enough oil that you can see an oil sheen. That only exists when you only have a puddle. If you, if it rains again, right, that overwhelms Eventually the oil washes content, it away. disperses it away. So yeah. same thing happens with this. If we keep adding water, we're eventually going to overwhelm the oils and go back down the other side of the curve. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so absolutely. Let's show you what I mean by that. So let's just, without a doubt, take it back over the other side of the curve. And we're gonna do the equivalent of about two half glass straws. And this is important. If you're at a bar and you wanna try this, there are two things you have to be careful of. One, make sure that the bartender gives you still water, not sparkling water. Oh yeah. Oh right? yeah. Two, make sure, and I learned this from Richard Patterson from Dalmore, make sure that you test your water before you add it. Because every once in a while a bartender won't be paying attention and they'll give you hot water from the hot tap by accident and you'll pick up this glass of water and add it to your whiskey and it's like boiling water. Oh. And you don't want ice. When you say, give me a whiskey and a water, just say, still water, no ice. Wait. Now you're gonna look like a snob in any bar that's not used to this. Yeah. But it gives you a chance to explore a whiskey. I would imagine also like location matters because like uh, whenever I go to Florida, they always have that kind of well watery taste or smell yeah. to it. Well, I would ask how for spring water if you can get it. Yeah, how do you bottled know, spring water. How do you know what whiskeys to add it to? Oh, oh, that's a great question. I'll tell you. The answer is you're not gonna see this effect if the whiskey has low oils. If significant portions of the whiskey are all water soluble, then the reaction's gonna be minimal. That's pretty much a question of just doing your research and knowing what Try whiskey it. you're ordering. You'll never know. Yeah, okay. some bourbons will do it, some won't. Some ryes will do it, some won't. Okay. The only way to know if it's right for a whiskey is to try it. Yep. And what you will discover is every whiskey you like slightly differently. So I like this whiskey just straight out of the bottle. This one I like six drops of water. This one I like two drops of water. This one I like a lot more water. This one I just don't like. So this <laughs> one is now officially overwatered. Now let's try that and you'll see the difference. Now we're into a little bit more mellowed Isla whiskey. Notice oh, yeah. that you still get the sour notes in there, but you don't get the punch in the, the throat. The bite is definitely turned down a couple of notches. Right. So now what we've discovered is there's three ways to drink this one whiskey neat. Which do you like best of those three? That's up to you. And I yeah. guess it depends on the whiskey, right? Yep. It's, like, it's yeah. like there's the whiskey and there's you, and you've got to figure out how you can meet in the middle to get the best experience. Again, that there's no right way. It's whatever you prefer. That's now, right. do we have time to test this on a bourbon? Absolutely. Yeah, you make okay. a very compelling okay. argument. I'm going to do a Texas bourbon. Okay. Okay. 
Ranger Creek, 36, small batch. Houston, if I, if I remember I, correctly. Now, 36 makes me think it's 36 years old, but that's not the no, case. No, that's that, their name, like 36 caliber. It's, uh, okay. Right. That's a small this is bottle. nine months old. These are really expensive, too. I don't doubt it. But this is a nine-month-old small barrel whiskey. Now, if you want to talk about small barrels while we drink this, we can. If I was going to guess, I would guess that a small barrel matters insofar as there's a larger proportion of contact to the barrel. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. More now, what you'll find with smaller barrels, in my experience, is that a smaller barrel has a much faster wood effect, but it doesn't have a subtlety effect. So you can rush the coloring of the whiskey really fast, but you have a hard time replicating the subtleties and nuances that a large barrel and time give you. It's hard to cheat time, if okay. not impossible. So we're starting <laughs> straight up. Starting straight, take a small sip and we'll add some water to this one. Now that's a classic high rye bourbon, oh. kind of spicy at the end. Yep. Kind of chocolatey. The or, difference between this one and this one so is different. so far. Yeah. Night and day, yeah. So now we're going to do the same amount that we did to the scotch. And what you will find, and I don't actually know the answer to this. I haven't done this to Ranger Creek. What you'll find is whether or not there are oil components in this whiskey that are heavy. Science. No, it just got mild. Yeah. Yeah, yeah just watered it down. Notice the difference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what that means is the oil, the oil components in this whiskey are low, or the components that are non-water soluble are lower. Okay. But I still like it. I actually liked it better without the water. Yeah. It was more interesting. Yeah, then you had to ruin it. Yeah. Okay, so we've got the four ways of drinking whiskey. In a cocktail, <laughs> hey, no, no, no drink shaming here. Yeah. <laughs> Any way you want to enjoy whiskey is a good way. I'm sorry, right. Trevor. <laughs> so cocktails on the rocks, neat, and with a tiny bit of water. That's right. Which counterintuitively can kickstart a whiskey. It really can. I had no idea. Does the same thing work with like when you get it on the rocks? Uh, do you get the same effect? No, or no, because the, the temperature, the, the amount of water happening all at once oh, is sure. way too much, way too fast. Yeah. And the temperature will destroy any subtlety differences that you would have found anyway. All right, let's toast to Daniel. Get on. To Daniel and the Whiskey Academy. I like that kind of toast. Any tank of pressurized gas in any cargo warehouse ever. A red box with TNT on it. Yes. Uh, oh, a uh, glowing barrel, uh, barrels with glowing stuff, either yellow or red. Always red. Anything red. Cars. Anytime you shoot a car. Cars always blow up. Yeah. They're very explosive. Uh, I don't even know how people drive them without dying. You know what? As I'm discussing this, it makes me glad that we live in real world, not video game world. Otherwise, everything explodes always. The modern rogue explodes propane tanks by shooting them. Holy cow, dude, it's happening. We're here at Stunt Ranch with StuntScience.tv's Steve Wolf. Because we're going to get to live a fantasy, man. I have always wanted to shoot something and blow up the bad guys. Yeah. Just a massive explosion from a single bullet. Yeah, don't tell me there's no Santa Claus yet, but tell me <laughs> under the right conditions, does Santa Claus maybe look real? Under the right conditions, you absolutely can shoot something and cause that to lead to an explosion. Okay, yeah. so now in the video games, you got like the, the propane tank that you beat people up with and then you shoot it to explode. Is this just wild fantasy or, or not? Don't break my heart. Okay, as an impact tool, a propane tank absolutely works. <laughs> just as well. <laughs> That's, That's good enough. I, I, I can verify that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, propane is, of course, is a highly flammable gas, which when mixed with oxygen in the right circumstance will burn or detonate. So I do fire eating and normally I use yeah. Coleman Campule, a liquid that's liquid at room temperatures. Right. But oftentimes I'll show up and people will buy the wrong stuff for me. They'll have uh, propane. I know propane comes out as a gas, but when I shake it, it's, it sounds like there's liquid in there. Right. Is that just when it's so, pressurized? So there is a liquid, but only when the molecules are being squeezed together under a lot of pressure. As soon as you release the pressure, they turn instantly into a gas. Got it. And so the gas in there, I assume, is not an oxygen fuel mixture already. It has to mix with the oxygen it's outside. Straight propane inside. Okay. So depending on what type of a fuel air ratio you get, mm -hmm. you'll get different colored flame. So when you watch the flame on your stove and it's blue, that's because oxygen's been added into it before the chemical reaction of creating flame. But when you light up a, a, a blowtorch, you know, you might see yellow flame because the propane is having to scavenge for oxygen from the air. You know what? I noticed to create that, that yellow effect. Uh, that was an old trick that if you had a propane torch, when you had it full going, it was that clear blue jet. Right. But if you covered up the oxygen holes, yep. it does this kind of uh, a nice candlelit That's yellow. right. So when you cover up the air intake, yeah. you get a less efficient flame. So the less efficient flame is actually creating more free carbon particles 
And because those carbon particles are hot, they glow red and yellow. That's where that color comes from. Got it. It's the glowing loose carbon in the flame. So with the appropriate tools, we could create explosive flames of any color? Of any color, yeah. Well, of, of, of a wide range of colors. Mm. So depending on what additives we put into the fuel, you can create blue, yellow, green, red, purple. Fuchsia? Fuchsia. Aquamarine. <laughs> and taupe. Taupe. I'm, I'm still working on the puce. taupe. <laughs> I've got puce down though. All right, so today we got a whole bunch of propane canisters and we're gonna shoot them with what kind of guns? Well, we're gonna shoot them with a few different guns to see if the gun is the deciding factor. So in science, you change one variable at a time. That's right. right so we're gonna use the same propane canister each time, a one pound camping cylinder. And I like the wider ones rather than the taller ones just because it's easier to get them to stand up. And got you it. can get All these right, anywhere. You get a little bit wider, you can get them at uh, Don't any, try this any at retail home. store. Yes, 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 let's go Jeez, shoot these. The Super exciting. All right. <laughs> this is some heavy duty gear, Steve. What are we looking at? Well, we're looking at a few of the types of guns that you might see in your average video game. We have right. a 12 gauge shotgun. We have a 300 blackout AR. We have a small concealable nine millimeter. We have a typical carry size 45, and we have a 357 Magnum. Between those, we should be pretty well able to see conclusively, you know, does shooting at this stuff blow it up? You gave a lot of numbers. Can you basically break sure. down the general differences? Sure, well, basically a gun is nothing more than a drill with a really long bit. So people think because of the noise that guns have all kinds of power, but really all they do is they give you the ability to make a hole in something far away. The diameter of the bullet is equivalent to, you know, the size of the drill bit. Are we making a 5 8 inch hole? You know, are we making a 22 caliber hole? I've been going to the so. wrong Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> right? So when we talk about things in caliber, 45 caliber, 40 caliber, 38 caliber. Caliber means hundredths of an inch. So that's just 45 caliber means 45 hundredths of an inch, or basically a half inch hole. Okay. 22 caliber means, you know, two tenths of an inch. How have inch. I gone my whole life without ever hearing this fact? <laughs> like, right. I was like, well, I guess caliber is its own maybe, thing. Maybe you grew up in Europe and it was metric, oh, you know? Right. So, <laughs> so nine millimeter would be the equivalent of 30 caliber. Fair enough, fair All enough. All right, so. So I'm gonna assume that we're gonna expect to see uh, different size holes, but are we also gonna see different types of exit wounds? Or is, will there even be an exit wound? There'll absolutely be an exit wound because every bullet that goes into a propane can is gonna come out the back. Okay. It doesn't have enough mass or strength strength to withstand a bullet coming through both sides. You might see a difference though in the number of holes. When we shoot it with a shotgun, we're gonna create multiple holes at the same time. So the video game logic theory is hole goes in, but at that time, either it creates enough heat with friction or creates a spark to ignite it, right? That is the theory. Okay, we'll find out. We'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not very optimistic. Okay, and then there's different types of ammunition because you mentioned we were going to play with tracer rounds as well. Yeah, so so our, our best likelihood of getting ignition is if we start with something that's already burning. Is that how those work, that they're actually burning? Yes. Am, am I right in remembering? I thought I heard that tracer rounds they did like every fifth round just so you could get a general idea, or do you do every round? Well, if you have a box with nothing but tracer rounds in it, then every round is tracer. Okay. But Typically in a machine gun, it'd be every third round or every fifth round, just to kind of keep you in the ballpark uh, as a substitute for aiming. Got it. How, there's how, not a substitute for aiming. Got it. How do those work exactly? So at the back of the bullet itself, there's a little chunk of magnesium or phosphorus. Okay. And it's ignited by the gunpowder reaction. So what happens is when you hit a gun, there's just a little piece of metal in there that pops out and hits the back of the primer. Mm -hmm. And the primer is full of a shock sensitive chemical called lead azide. When you crush lead azide, it blows up. When that blows up, it pushes fire into the main area of the cartridge here where there's gunpowder. That lights the gunpowder. The gunpowder is a solid where all the molecules are close together and the, they turn through a chemical reaction into a gas where the molecules are spread apart. So now you have all these gaseous molecules spreading in all directions, creating a tremendous amount of pressure. And then that pressure acts against the back of the bullet to push the bullet out. So really, in a sense, all guns are air guns. The question is whether the, the gas came from a chemical reaction or came from pumping your, your red rider. Gotcha. But they all are just pushed out by gases. Since we learned a bit ago about the importance of flashpoints of various substances, uh, it seems like this one's definitely going to be hot enough that at room temperature, it should be able to ignite the, the propane. My only question is, if let's say it goes through, you have that decompression, it's going to get cold, right? Just the same way that when you let all the pressure out of a can of air, it That's gets right. cold. Yep. It's a matter of which happens first. Correct. Right? Whether we get enough temperature with enough m propane that's mixing with oxygen all at the same time, and that ignition point happens right when we need it and has sufficient heat to start the reaction or not. Bullets are already super hot when they come out of the barrel. These are even hotter. Well, these have got a 
piece of burning phosphorus at the yeah. back. And it's bur just burning at the back because that's the angle that you see your bullet from. When you shoot it, you're looking at the back of it. So if you shoot a lot though, you actually can de develop a sensitivity where you can actually see your bullets. So these aren't necessarily wow. used to ignite things, they're used so that you can see your rounds. That's what they're for. They're not incendiary rounds, which whose purpose would be to start a fire. Okay. These are simply so that you can see your bullet more easily. Gotcha. But it will be burning all the way up to the point of impact and beyond. Right. Okay. So I don't know. That, that makes me optimistic. Yeah. I want to yeah. believe. Cer certainly at the range we're testing it. Right. Like if we shot this at 45 degree angle, it would go up and it would burn arc for a mile out. and a half. I'm sure it would be out before it landed. Okay. But yeah. Science, science, science. Let's shoot stuff. Yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, Steve, what are we starting with? Gentlemen, we're going to start with a Smith & Wesson 357. Perfect for personal protection. All right. right. And so we have no doubt this is going to penetrate. So it's a question of whether or not it's hot enough to set it off, right? Right. We're going through and through. It looks like a very aggressive propane tank. So I think we need to put it down. All right. Fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Firing in three, two, one. Wow! 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 That was... <laughs> that thing was a damned rocket! Took off, but no fireball. Yes! <laughs> I do feel like that would scare away all the bad guys. It might. <laughs> oh, that was so satisfying. I didn't expect that. It went higher than a rocket. It was amazing. It was tethered and everything, so I thought it was going to stay put right there. Yeah, Not well, so much. You could have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of PSI in there, which creates quite yeah. the rocket effect. Holy cow. So we have a, a, a nice clean entry. We have a nice messy exit the way you hope for. And as you, you may be surprised because it's propane, but this, this tank is frozen. You can actually see condensation forming on here. That's feel here. Feel that. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> so if nothing else, this that. is a good way to, wow. to cool a drink in the summer. <laughs> It's a way to cool a drink. I don't know that it's going to be my favorite. You smell that, that smell coming yeah, out of that? But not the fiery conflagration that we were hoping wow. for. No, not at all. Plenty of explosive force, though. Wow. So this time we're going with a 12 gauge shotgun. All right, see that to me is code for it will disintegrate and send shrapnel everywhere. I feel better that we have a blast shield. I, I, in fact, I, I've always wanted a blast shield. <laughs> well, dreams do come true. <laughs> All right, take it away, boss. All right, coming up. Well, good shotgun. Fire in the hole in three, two, one. Wow! <laughs> wow! Can we stand? Yeah, can, can, can I see it? I'll bring it out to you. Uh, man, that smell. That, oh. that propane smell just everywhere. Well, it looks like the aim was okay. Look at that. Oh my gosh. So this is, this is exactly, oh, the pellets are in there. So weirdly, like this one didn't rock it because it had such a big exit hole. Yeah, it was all able to just pour out. Right, and we had more weights on it. Yeah, we had it secured a little bit more so it didn't fly around, but it totally would have. But again, not the eruption of flame that we were looking for. But, and, but yes to the explosive force. I would say video games have the right of it. It does explode out. It's just Absolutely. not on fire when it does. Right, and a lot more of the gas stayed close because you had more holes for it to escape from. So oh, yeah. less, less escape velocity on each hole. So we know for sure that just shooting it just does nothing but poke a hole in it. I wanna know if the incendiary round is enough to actually trigger it to actually fireball. Only one way to find out. I yeah. agree. All right. <laughs> All right, this time we're gonna try a nine millimeter tracer. I believe in Santa Claus. I believe in miracles. I believe this is gonna work. Please work. Let's see what happens. Fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Three, two, one. Wow! Ah! Uh, uh -huh. Wow! <laughs> I'm glad we had the blast shield. So thankful. <laughs> Me too. I'm glad it was. It stayed tethered too. Yeah, it did. Um, I can't believe it didn't ignite. I, I guess it's just too cold on that initial ignition. Just not enough heat. At the moment when you have the most heat, right, is the friction that's created as the bullet hits the outside, right? That's when the bullet has the most speed. And at that point, all the gas is on the inside and all the air is on the outside. So at the moment when you have that spark, you don't have combined fuel and oxygen. Right. right. 
So what you really need is for your ignition source to be outside and for the fuel and oxygen mix to get to it, not for just the so fuel if, to get to if it. If we were gonna simulate something that would be in a video game, let's say a puddle of gasoline is burning and then you shot it in there, or if, or if there was a, some kind of other sparking thing, like an right. electrical fire or something nearby. Right, because then you've got the fuel and the oxygen. You need to have fuel, oxygen, heat, and a chemical reaction, all three of those. The way any one of those things, you don't have fire. Seems like we have the technology. I think we can make this happen though, right? I believe we may be able to do something like that. All right, let's do this, let's do this. All right, so the game plan is based on the idea that in order for this propane to ignite when it's shot, it has to escape towards a heat source. And we're gonna use a few sparklers burning right underneath it as the heat source. So when the propane comes out, we're hoping that it's gonna mix with the oxygen, find the heat source, start the chemical reaction, create the huge now fireball. Now for the, uh, when we use the shotgun, we got that nice exploded back yeah, where it I released very your quickly. Best, best bat. The least likely to be a flamethrower shooting or towards becoming us. becoming a rocket towards yeah, us. Yeah, right. a flaming rocket, yeah. no less. Jeez. I'd All seen right. that too. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I know, <laughs> hopefully you'll get to see that. Get ready right? for sprint position. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's your prediction? Uh, I think it'll be a reasonably contained fire, like within the little alcove, right? I, th I think it's going to be like a grenade, just pop. It'll be much louder than you expect. Oh, I was thinking just like, and then it was done. A flurry of uh, spouting flame, and then it's over. I sincerely don't think you're prepared. I'm so yeah? excited. Yeah? All right. All right, gentlemen. There's just one question left. Do you feel lucky? <laughs> <laughs> I feel terrified well, as all do I feel. You, ready, punk. sir. All right. I'm ready. All right, fire in the hole. Dude, it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. Like this is already terrifying all right. and nothing's happened yet. So we've got ignition sources all around. Fire in the hole. Three, two, one. Wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! Metal! That was amazing! Yes! Right. That was incredible! Good job, gentlemen. Oh! That paid off in every possible way! That was awesome! Very cool! Oh! Yeah, you weren't kidding about the flying right. rockets landing all around you. Yep, it's just experience that tells me like where the people should be and where the shields should be. Sure, sure. Uh, otherwise, it would be dangerous. But I'm going to bring this thing over here. Yeah. There we go. So it just finished burning out. It's not as hot as you would no. expect. I assume it got cold and then real hot again? <laughs> yeah, it did both. It actually only feels about as hot as it would be if it was sitting out in the sun all day, it's, right? Strangely, yeah. it's not all destroyed. It was amazing because you saw it, you saw it decompress, and then you saw the fireball all happen at once. Okay, so so now that's a full-on success. That's a video game scenario. Shoot one of these near an existing flame, and it really does blow up enough to kill the bad guys. But the one thing we have not seen is that awesome chain reaction barrel explosion thing. Yeah, I think we can hook that up for you Hollywood style. Yes! <laughs> So when we when we want a guaranteed fire and we want to control exactly how much fire, how much smoke, the whole picture, we tend to go more towards gasoline. Uh -huh. Gives you a much more colorful fire because it's a more inefficient burn. More carbon, more soot, more red, more yellow, more excitement. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's get started. All right. The gasoline is lit. He's lighting the sparklers now. This is really happening. Yeah. <laughs> All right, dude, you're about to fight the end boss in a junk heap. You see <laughs> Between all the fires, I do ears, man. I oh. think it's coming. Yep, it's okay. done. Fire in the hole. Action in three, two, one. Wow! One. Wow! <laughs> Did you feel that blast of heat? <laughs> It felt like just a, a, a lightning flash. Woo! That was... Wow. That was incredible. Dude, everything is on fire. My world is fire and blood. That was extraordinary. 
that delivered on every dared hope and expectation. Now, every modern rogue has to end with an explosion. <laughs> Hey, Steve, yep. that was a great run through. We'll do it running okay, this great. time. Okay, great. This time we're rolling this time, all right? <laughs> Holy cow, look it's at hot. that. Ooh, it is hot. Who would have saw it, right? <laughs> yep. Dude, nice shot, by the way. Thank it's you. almost like you know what you're doing. We could feel the heat wave from back here. I watched it on a YouTube. Yeah, it really was, man. It was like this flash, this wave of just hitting you all at once. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you had us move back. That was intense. Even though I was ready, I wasn't ready. Okay, so as far as our what we care about, does video game barrel explosions work? Features under the right conditions. Right. Let's say you had an electric drill next to it, spinning, or a, a motorized pump, and there was a spark in there. And that you conceivably, are, yes. you very patiently asked all of the bad guys, like, hold on, we're not ready. Safety, people, come on. Right. All right, everybody gather around the barrel and fire in the hole. Fire in the hole. Right. I like to think of video game bad guys going, don't stand next to the red barrel. Somebody will shoot it and explode. Actually, I watched <laughs> I the Modern Road video. Advice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, Steve Wolf, cannot thank you enough. My we could pleasure. get so much more at StuntScience.tv, right? Absolutely, Brian. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, Steve. Jason. Great. Great working great. with you guys. I know this looks like hard work, but this is my job. Oh, I know. Yeah, respect. Stop having so much fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you remember the Johnson Smith catalog? What is the Johnson Smith catalog? Dude, it was on like the back page of all your magazines as a kid. Oh, with x-ray glasses yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. They had a parabolic mic. It was like, hear a dog bark from a mile away. Hear the wings of a bird flapping. Do you not remember this? No, I don't remember that specific one. It was $100, so I never got it. I got the fake turd instead. Oh, well, wise choice. Because I'm a modern bro! Parabolic microphones. First time I ever heard about a parabolic microphone was on 321 Contact, and they talked about how it was used in production to actually hear what was being spoken in the center of the football field. On oh, what are you wearing? It's it's science. It's for science. Okay, that's fine. I think I saw it in like some sort of spy movie from the 60s and 70s. They were always like clear plexiglass. Yeah. Someone with sunglasses perched on a rooftop. I always wanted one of those spying devices. Not because I thought I was going to get sensitive of information or collect blackmail just so I could go up to people and go, I heard everything you said. You, you wanted to be that guy who had the upper hand. You realize I wanted everyone to know. You can just lie and say you're that guy. That's true. That's less fun, though. Speaking of less fun, uh, let's talk about your hat here. Okay, we are going to make a parabolic microphone. Tell me if I'm following this right. If I just had, let's say, a microphone by itself, then it is gathering this much, let's say an uh, inch and a half worth of sound, right? Right. Whereas when you put it in a parabolic structure, all of this gathers and focuses on here. The same way like a, like a solar power facility takes a whole bunch of light and focuses it in one spot so that you're able to boil all that water and so yeah. on. You're doing the same thing with sound to get greater fidelity. This is why we have the very large array. We have the uh, Arecibo, Arecibo giant. in Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, we're gonna make a parabolic mic that should drastically increase the sound quality using this novelty hat, uh, a paint roller, and a cheap uh, lavalier mic. We are like the MacGyver of garbage. Yes. <laughs> Trash Giver. <laughs> Trash Giver. Forgive me if I'm jumping ahead here, but I assume that the theory is a parabolic microphone is going to focus all the sound on here to a microphone to give us greater amplitude, but it just seems like there, there's no, oh wait, I stand corrected. Try this experiment. Okay. Like, keep in mind, this is just fabric. Fancy parabolic mics are made of plexiglass. They're they're super precise or whatever. Sure. But try just talking and then talk into this and listen to the way your voice sounds different. <laughs> the parabolic umbrella is approaching my face and, oh yeah. Oh wow, it sounds dramatically different. Right? right? Yeah, okay, it's just and simple. This works on the macro and the micro level. For example, there are things called whispering galleries. They are rooms shaped in such a way that if you stand in a particular place, you can hear very precise sounds from very far away. The story I heard is that there are negotiations that take place in whispering galleries where like, let's say the French delegation shows up and the Americans are able to listen to them whispering to each other because the two negotiation points are precisely set up at the foci 
of the ellipse of the entire room. The Mayans actually created something like that as well at the Great Ball Court in Chichen Itza in Mexico. No kidding. Yeah, you could do the same thing and stand 50 yards away or something like that and hear everything with perfect clarity. Okay, so the idea is, is that it's very powerful to, man, I, even just now I grab this and I hear my voice changing when I aim it the right so way. So it should work, right? I think so. First thing to do is get our base. Let's just test the lav okay, so and this, see how well it works without this. What kind of lav is this? This is the cheapest you could find. I got this on Amazon, super basic. We're just gonna plug it into the phone. Okay, so if I hold it, let's say let's say one unit, and we'll define a unit as my hang loose distance here. So at this level, it's receiving a certain amount of volume from me. The inverse square law, because we live in a three-dimensional world, means that if I go out one more unit, you would think it would be half as loud. Right. But that's not the case. It is the inverse of the square of the distance. So instead of being half as loud, it is one fourth as loud. And similarly, if we went out two more, it would be one sixteenth as loud. Because we're in 3D space, it dissipates so much with the sound wave that it drops off very, very quickly. So instead of being whatever this is, like a three millimeters wide of a, of a sound aperture, it's gonna take all of this and focus it right in there, right? Theoretically. We'll see. Let's get our base, and if you go stand over there, I will point this at you and record you, okay. and we'll see what kind of fidelity All we right. get. All right, done and done. Uh, you know what, if I were to talk, it would probably be very variable. I might think I'm being loud or quiet or whatever. Okay. So I'm gonna play something from over there. Oh, okay. So you're about 28 feet away. And I've got my phone, I'm gonna set it to one level, and I'm gonna keep it the same, both tests. Okay, I'm gonna hold it here at arm's length, pointed directly at you. Okay, and I'm gonna point the phone so the speaker's right at you. You ready? Recording. All right, set in three, two. There it is. That's good. I like that a lot. Okay, so uh, uh, how loud did that look like? Uh, not very loud at all. You could barely hear it over the sound of the AC. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's definitely there. But it's working. So now we'll make the antenna. What are we doing? We're taking our parabola. Yep. We cut off the head strap. Yep. And we're gonna use a paint roller as our handle. So is the thinking that a paint roller just by dumb luck happens to be right at the focal point of all this? I hadn't considered that, but you're probably right. I'm thinking we cut off all of this right here and just use the bar oh, inside. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here, let's get the, uh, where's the sledgehammer? Let's figure out a way to also set it on fire. Or we could just cut it off with the bolt cutters. No. No? Just a little, just a little, right? Just just a little, little bit. Okay, that went everywhere. We're good. There. Now, whoop, get that away. That's Jeez. bad. It's fine. There's literally no reason to do this. The internet! Well, that was easy. Why didn't we do that from the beginning? <laughs> oh, no. That was dumb. Uh, great. <laughs> that is a fine stick. Yeah. We made a stick, Jason. Okay, where's the, we need a knife. Where's a knife? I got a knife. I'm gonna cut a tiny hole right there near the center. Just one? Yeah. Okay, and then we thread that through there. It, se it seems like the focus would be right around here. This is the part where you totally have to kind of guess. So let's do this. What if we did? Ugh. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, cool. Right? So now Very it's cool. farther out. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Let's just use all gaff tape. Gaff okay. tape does everything. You just keep giving me tapes. We'll keep taping. Does that look right to you? Oh, it totally does, yeah. Right? Okay, so yeah, now yeah. let's just reinforce everything. And we're gonna have to leave a little room to get the mic threaded through, though. Some damn fine craftsmanship. I think so, yeah. Looks pretty good. Shockingly good, actually. Yeah. Uh, okay. So here, if we ran this through. Through the hole that we cut. Yeah. <gasps> cool. Clown Spy, coming soon to a theater near you. America, you're not prepared for the terror unleashed by the Clown Spies. So we point this down towards the parabola, I assume? Dude, that looks shockingly legit. Look at that. Okay, so I swear, if this works, I owe you a, a cheeseburger because this looks so ridiculous. All right, you ready? So for this one, I want you to try to aim it directly at the speaker and then and we'll just get a clean take of the whole thing. You ready? Okay. Uh, up a little. Perfect. Ready, three, two. Oh,
All right, so let's do it again. This time, I want you to do a sweep from the side to eventually pointing at me and then and then beyond. Because I gotta tell you, I'm kinda thinking we probably need to reinforce it with something that will bounce back the sound a little bit better than umbrella material. So here's the original. So you can see it barely makes an impression on the waveform there, right? Yeah. Let's go parabola mic in stationary. A little bit, little bit louder. And here is the sweep. I think this one will tell whether or not we're getting focused audio. So that's off. And you can hear it definitely getting louder. And you can hear it fading out. Yeah. There's definitely a difference, but it's not as big as I yeah. expected. It's a little disappointing. I got a feeling that the fabric is our big problem. So we've got these plastic cards from a new thing we're doing over at scamstuff.com. What if we scaled this? Because it seems like sound would bounce off of the cards much better, right? Sure, yeah, uh, okay. makes sense. Then let's do this. Here, you keep tearing off okay. little bits and I'll just start filling all this up. So you're basically just making scale mail. Correct, correct. But with these fancy gold playing cards. Right. I think we're rapidly approaching the moment at which it makes sense to just buy an actual functioning parabolic <laughs> microphone. <laughs> yeah. I got my fingers crossed. I'm skeptical that we're gonna see much of an uptick in sound quality. Well, we know that the real things work because people pay tons of money for them. It might be that the precision required is just more than we're capable of doing with our setup, you know? Mm. Or it might be that uh, we just had the wrong material. Because the other thing that matters is like, it does matter that the microphone be placed right at the, the focus. Yeah, that's key. Right? Yeah. All right, let's tape it on the backside as well. We're actually extending the range of the parabolic microphone by a little bit because we went wider than the original umbrella. Oh, sure. But more importantly, we've got a more sound reflective material. Okay, dude. Think we got it? If nothing check, else. Check, check. <gasps> Listen. Check, 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 check. Oh, yeah. Wow. Right? Weird. Right? If nothing else, it's going to look good on the shelf with the rest of the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> All right, from the same spot. Oh, come on, grilled cheese, do me right. Recording. Three, two, one. Cheese. You can hear the air. You can hear the air conditioner more. Much louder. But you're actually quieter. Man, I wonder if we just had it aimed wrong. Try this. What happens if you back up? No, it's definitely collecting all that light and focusing it right here. Let's try it from a shorter throw. All right, let's try it attached. Dude, you can see the waveform changing when I change positions on this. That is not a big difference. No, it's really not. Obviously a right idea. There's a reason that those microphones exist, but I think it requires more precision than, than we're able to get with a novelty yeah. umbrella hat. <laughs> you think? How did the novelty umbrella hat fail us? I, I don't know. You Are what. you bummed? I'm kind of bummed. You know what? I'm relieved because I almost spent $120 on the Johnson Smith catalogs <laughs> parabolic hobo antenna. It's not too late. We want to give this thing as fair a shake as we can. So we replaced the cheap mic with a good mic that we use for production. We're using the zoom instead of the phone because it could be the phone does some auto gain stuff. And also instead of using the grilled cheese song, we're going to use bars and tones so that we can actually get true math numbers on exactly what kind of effect is happening. Because clearly, some kind of amplification is occurring, but just we don't have sophisticated ears to hear it. This is about as scientific as I care to get on a DIY <laughs> umbrella hat parabola mic. Okay, I'm gonna go to the same spot. I'm gonna play that uh, bars and tone. Okay, you ready? Ready. We're starting with naked mic by itself with bars tone. Okay, same spot. This is bars and tone with the parabolic mic and go.
Okay, so after controlling for everything, it looks like our tests showed that there was a marginal increase in quality, a Very decibel marginal. or two, but there was a vast increase in the precision because we got a lot of, we got birds chirping up in there, we have the AC. It's much more directional using the parabolic mic. <laughs> So does it work? Yeah. Is it worth it? Probably not. Well, certainly not the way we did it. Keep in mind also that we did not use directional microphones. We used omnidirectional microphones, which probably affected the results. But the point of this build is that the idea is that you can cheaply and easily create a high precision instrument. And I gotta give this one a fail, right? Yeah. I mean, it looks super cool. It and looks badass. It looks kind of like a psychotic person build it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes these DIY builds are shockingly good, like as good as the pro equipment. In this case, I'm gonna say for the fidelity of instruments and for the level of precision you get, probably not worth it. Do it the old fashioned way. Dress up like a ninja and hide in the shadows. Is that what you recommend for invading people's privacy? I mean, that's what I've been doing at your place for. So on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank your choking game? Like my ability to choke under pressure? No, no, I mean to take your fingers and wrap them around someone's throat and just squeeze the life out of them. You hear their trachea pop and you can hear their last gasp. Their very soul escape from their lips and the light leave their eyes. You're fully erect right now, aren't you? I don't judge you for your weird things. All right, Coach Kyle, who are we meeting? Two of my awesome coaches and champions here at Aces Jiu-Jitsu Club, our program director, Luke Ware, and one of our awesome champs over here, Ty Strang. Am I hearing this right? We are going to learn how to, as you put it, choke out a hipster? Yes. This is an episode I have wanted to do for a long time, and I thought it was going to be just me and you in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> really glad it's not. I saw something on YouTube and I thought, I'm gonna do that to Brian. Just by trial and error. <laughs> yeah, we'll have the phone, 911. So in this case, we are all wearing a, a gi, which is a, a, an important part of choking out. How does that work? So it's an important part of choking hipsters. Right? And it's okay. also an important part of jiu-jitsu, right? Okay. Uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu often classically is using what's called the gi or the kimono, right? Which stim simulates street clothes. Oh, that's right. It's got like a jacket and, and loose fitting pants. Absolutely. It's like, what are those crazy pajamas you're wearing? Well, actually I'm simulating a jacket and pants, all of which become encumbrances, right? Things that get in the way during a fight. Or things you can use to, in this situation, strangle someone unconscious. Yeah, that's something amazing, because I would never think to use someone's own clothing against them naturally. Yes. And, Except and I, in insults. <laughs> yes, exactly. You should read our comments section. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to show it on you? Oh, or you show it on one of our... Yeah, no, go, go You do ahead. it to me. It's, all right, all right. <laughs> then I do it to you. Okay, so uh, so in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm what? I'm, am I hostile, or I'm just uh, minding my own business? Is cracking there any open difference? a PBR? So in this situation, we're just, we're just tra practicing and training it, so I just want you to like to, to get into a what's called a combat position. Okay. Right? So, Boom. Very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. It's like we're striking. All right, so here we are. First things first, I'm going to stand in a good position in my own self, and I want to make sure my head is close in case they start trying to punch me. Right? Oh, which, oh that's right, because I can't get up. Absolutely. It's really difficult inside of this situation. I'm really tight, right? And if they do hit me, um, these punches aren't really going to work very well. Right. Inside punch isn't because my arm is in the way. Okay. All right? Yep, I'm yep. zippering and opening that collar. Okay. Right? I'm going to send my hand all the way back. Most common mistake is when people don't go all the way back. Right here, you can move around a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> Pretty yes. much right behind his head. Yes, yes. 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 And, and I feel it just super tight all along here yes. already. We okay. call this got your spine. It, yes, it, right? and it does. It feels like you're about to do a, a scorpion's finishing move. Sub zero wins. Yes. Good night, Brian. <laughs> so now, a lot of when people teach this, a lot of tech, times they teach it facing the person straight on. I don't like that. Yeah. In my experience, I like to stand off to the side so oh I can get what's God. called a blood choke. Okay. Now let's remember when you feel 
especially uncomfortable, yeah. it's important for you to, to tap, tap me tap. three yeah. times and say tap, tap, tap. Ready, go. Okay, got it. Uh oh, tap, tap, tap. Excellent, that okay. lets me know to let you go. Okay. Right. So right. once I'm here, a lot of people teach to go all the way back behind that ear, yeah. but again, that doesn't work as well in a in a live situation. Okay. So I'm just gonna grab right here, yeah. and I'm gonna motorcycle and bring my head in. Oh. Oh my God, I, the world went away. That was astonishing. And all you're doing is you're just using like a scissor motion to, to grab and fulcrum in. Okay. That's not what I'm doing. All right. Right? I'm motorcycling my wrists. You're accelerating. Bringing my elbows in. And by the way, when you motorcycle, it's actually vroom, right? Oh, not but, but, you're, okay. but I call it that. Sure, right? sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> okay. So anyway, once I have them here, I am vroom, right? Bringing them in, and then I'm bringing my elbows into my body and using my head to create counter pressure. Does that make you, sense? You have to experience this. this so let's bring one leg oh, forward. Sure. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so here we are. I'm just gonna open up the collar first. Okay. I'm gonna stay really close. I'm gonna slide in. Grab the spine. Yeah, that's like, I'm already mostly immobilized. And so, and you're, no. and you grab underneath. Yes. <laughs> Now let's talk about why it's called a blood choke. <laughs> I'm good. And I'm also, good. How, good. how dangerous is this? So there's two main ways you can strangle someone until they're unconscious and uh, potentially kill them. Like, 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 yeah, like no, that. no, no. You always see that in movies, by yeah, the way, and yeah. that offends me. It offends me on like a visceral level. Like it's right? just such a wrong, it's dumb way to do it. It's just such a wrong way, like years of teaching people to choke people incorrectly. So the two main ways to strangle someone unconscious are an air choke and a blood choke. Right, an air choke restricts the oxygen right. going to your brain. A blood choke restricts the blood going to your brain. I would imagine that the blood choke would be faster because the whole reason you breathe is to oxygenate your blood, but if you just stop the blood, you go out faster? Way faster. Okay. Right? There's a pro and con to both, right? The air choke is more painful. It takes a little bit longer, and by a little bit longer, I mean eight to 10 seconds. It seems right? like a long time. It feels like a long time when you're only being strangled. Yeah. The blood choke can take like, three to five seconds when applied correctly. You're gonna feel more pressure off to the side of your neck, okay. and the air choke is gonna be more here, like attacking your trachea. And so is it hitting these, what, are these jugulars? Your artery. Arteries, and it's just yeah. on one side. Okay, yeah. whoa, just on one? Yeah, so here, so both of you can see, All right. Coach Luke's gonna help me out real quick. So here I have Coach Luke. First things first, I make sure that I get in really tight into his body. I don't wanna be out here and then Coach Luke, I grab him and then bam, he hits me or some kind of crazy stuff happens there. So what I'm gonna do first, I'm gonna open up his collar. Right? And this, this works with a jacket just as well. Yeah. Absolutely. So you're gonna open his collar, right? And then you ever play that airplane game with your hand? Meow, right? You're gonna do the exact same thing and guide up the collar with your fingertips. It looks very sensual when you do it like that. <laughs> And then you're gonna Slowly. create pressure, and then you're gonna grip at the end and bring gotcha. your elbow in. Now that my elbow is in, I like to make sure I step off just a little bit to the side. When I'm off to the side, his stance is not very effective, right? So it's easy for me to take him down if that's my next game plan. A lot of people will teach you to go all the way up back behind his ear. Um, that's not my favorite way to do it because I'm gonna use his, cho his, his, uh, his jacket to choke him. All right, so I'm gonna grip, then I'm gonna motorcycle, Boom, and there's his choke. It's amazing because you don't see much motion on your hands at all. It's just, I guess, just no. an increase of pressure on there. For sure, and a lot of people, they think that they should move their elbows yeah. to create more of a scissor motion, right. right? But that's not what you're supposed to do. It's actually here at that focal point where I'm tightening up. Whenever I'm strangling someone, I'm restricting something. It's just a very unusual sentence to hear someone say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, and this is a blood choke. And then uh, it can be a blood or an air choke, yeah. uh, depending on That's positioning or almost every choke can be a blood or an air choke, depending okay. on where, where the, the pressure lands on their neck. Got it. I want to. How do we? How do we learn it? Hey. All right, let's do. Let's do this. How about you guys are each going to go with a different coach? Roger that. Right, and you're going to start strangling your coaches, <laughs> and they're going to and they're going to help you out. And so will I. As I come around and make small adjustments. Okay. All right. All right. right. One, two, three. Aces. First things first. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Open up. So when you open up, you keep your elbow in. Mm -hmm. Nice. You want them nice and close. Very good. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So now that we're here, yep, you're going to send your hand all the way back. And then once you get back, wait, don't squeeze your hand yet. You're gonna mm -hmm. you're gonna pull back a little bit more. Sure. And then you're gonna tighten up. Oh wow! Excellent. Now and say. Now you tell like him. That. Got your spine. Got your spine. Got your spine. See, there's a lot of fear in his eyes. So now we're gonna let go with this hand. Mm -hmm. Now you want to be slightly off center, so you're gonna take one small half step. Okay. Boom. You're gonna reach underneath. Under. Okay. There you go. Okay. Second hand is always under. So now we're going to bring these two elbows tight together. Mm -hmm. I'm going to motorcycle, vroom, bring your head in, and start to drag him down a little bit. 
You're almost there. <laughs> almost there. Very good. Oh, wow. Okay. I was like, <laughs> I'm just not doing it right at all. No. <laughs> These things aren't easy. I want you to feel this again, where I'm coming from. Yeah. Boom. Boom. All right. Now, mm -hmm. I'm pressing with this elbow out, mm -hmm. and I'm pulling with this hand. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's not just like pulling him down yeah. and choking, right? It's... I'm pressing counter pressure. Whew. Does that make sense? Yeah, all yeah. Right, let's do that again. Okay. Open him up. Send the hand in all the way back. Got your spine. Nice, excellent. Under. Send underneath. Way back here. Doesn't, doesn't have to be that far back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Since okay. you're so deep on the other hand, you don't have to be that far Pulling back. Close. Counter pressure and hey. Oh. Awesome. How'd that feel? Uh, technical. Yes. It's one of those where you. Step, 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 step. Yes. And everything should be in its exact place for maximum efficiency, but yes. there's definitely a method to it. It's yes. not just a mindless uh, attack. It's a technique. It is a technique. And you get to strangle someone. Also that, which I've always wanted. No, I haven't just, I mean, I've always heard was very gratifying. It is, it is. I love the way you put that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so combat stance, right? All right, so in order to do this choke, you wanna start in this good stance. Yep, yep. All right, now remember the first step, you're gonna use your rear hand. Come in, the thumb peels. Yes. And then you you go all the way up to the spine, grab the spine yep. with and the tag. Remember, is. when you're here, you yep. give a little extra tug at the end. Okay. Oh, you got a little extra, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So, now, so use the right hand to assist, yes, grabbing as much correct. as possible. Bring your elbow in. And you want to get a little close because you don't want to get hit. Right. Right? So now we're going to step off to the side a little bit. Okay. Reach underneath. Remember what strangles him is counter pressure. So you're going to put pressure this way and then pressure this way. Okay. You motorcycle your wrist. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Is it, am I doing it? I, I'm not, he's not reacting. It's, oh, oh, no, go. I choked Very him. good. It takes a little extra to choke <laughs> Coach Ty. You're a little flush, that was, that was amazing. I hear the uh, inception going, goes <laughs> he wow. likes. He likes to live dangerously, so he stays, he, he lets it ride all the way out. That's a legit choke. If you ch choke Coach Ty, yeah. it's a legit choke. Oh, dude, thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, now there's only one more target for me to take on. A new challenger approaches. All right. <laughs> First of all, let's remember, when you feel uncomfortable, all you gotta do is tap. Tap, tap, tap. Okay. And uh, you're not gonna be able to say it because you'll be choking. Yeah. Who's going first? I, I will go. You, you can do me first. All right, so. Start in a good stance. Good yep. stance. And I, okay. Yep. Peel. Oh, what? Oh, oh. It's okay, okay. Yep. Coming okay. in close. Oh, okay. You're under. You're too good. You're too good. You're too oh, uh, okay. Wow, 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 wow. Whoa. <laughs> I tried to pull a Coach Ty and hold on too long. <laughs> that was amazing. That's okay. <laughs> Think about Coach Ty, he's known for how much oxygen his brain doesn't need. <laughs> You're not even in the same category. Wow, uh, and I can tell, like, you know, obviously we have very timid moves at this point because we're still learning, but but like uh, we've got a friend of ours who who does MMA and like he just chung, chung, whoom, and then and, it's, and it hits you so fast. Yeah. Uh, you're you're not ready for it. For sure, that comes from repetition and practice. Right, it's yeah. your first with, day. With us, it's like, is it working? Is it working? I don't know if it's working. <laughs> uh, all right, here, let me give it a try. Yep. All right, okay. all right, now. All right, ready? Tap, <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, so. He's killed him. Yeah. All right, so the here, final I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab, do this, get some more in there. Come up underneath. from under, underneath. Get, 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 get in. Get in. No, no, oh. head on the other side. Head on the other side, okay. Now remember, five head in against his temple. Five head oh, against his oh, temple. Oh, wow. Step. Yeah. Are, are, are you feeling it? Now, uh -huh. okay, here now we go, ready? Turn it on. And turn it on. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That was, that's, that was You're a like choke. a little flush. <laughs> well, tingling. Uh, here's, here's an important thing to remember about chokes, right? You guys mind if I tell a story? Yeah, go for this, it. This is a time I was bouncing. Right, it's one of the stories I can't tell. I, there was a situation where uh, we had somebody who was getting real violent, had to take him down the stairs. Yep. Uh, let go of him, he decided he wanted to fight. So, you know, a fight ensued, right? I've been training this time. At this time, I already, um, you know, I was, I was a blue belt in jujitsu and I had already won tournaments around the world. And so I, I was very uh, confident mm -hmm. in, in, in my abilities. I, I took the guy down, put him in a position, started to strangle him and choke him out, and he didn't go out. And I got really, really, so I started to freak out. I started to get really upset with myself. I'm like, this guy, I can't believe you're not choking him out already. You're a champion, you're embarrassing your family. Ah, you know? And then I started creating a counter plan and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to transition to get on top of him. And, Cause I was behind him, right? Behind, right. And I'm strangling him and I was like, I'm gonna have to transition my hips and move, use my hands to underhook him, get on top and I'll have to knock him out. Right? Yeah. So I created my plan, start my positive self-talk. You ready, Mikhail? I'm ready. Are you ready, Mikhail? I'm ready, right? 
and then I'm about to let go, and then he goes slack and goes unconscious and goes to sleep, right? Yeah. Now to me, this is like 60 seconds of long holding this guy down, which is, which is very embarrassing, by the way, on the, on the part of a professional fighter. Yeah, because right? in your mind, the only reason this can happen is you must have executed poor form. Poor form, yeah. absolutely, right? So I looked at the other bouncers as they're, they're running up, and they're like, uh, huffing and puffing, and I'm like, I'm sorry guys, that was just like, ridiculous, I can't believe that, did you see that? And they were like, what was ridiculous? And I was like, well, that it took me like a full minute plus to strangle out this like uh, this guy and finish the fight. By the way, strangling someone unconscious is a way to win finish the fight without hurting them yeah. as, as badly, right? And right. hitting them, I have to start striking them. And yeah, I mean, obviously, I when you knock them out, they've got brain damage to deal well, with. For sure, and, maybe yeah. broken jaw, Yeah, right? All kind of, so and they were like, how long do you think it takes us to run from the top of the flight of stairs to the bottom of the flight of stairs? Oh, you were just in that time warp of the adrenaline rush. Absolutely, Yeah. right? So to me, it was 60 seconds when actuality, it took them, you know, like six, 10 seconds to run down there. That's how long the interaction lasts. Yeah. The interaction. Dude. Right? And so theoretically, like, is it safe for us to practice on each other? It is safe as long as you do something that I do to this day and that I teach all my students to do, which is to count. And that keeps you in line with reality, or we could collectively call reality. Yeah. Right? That's a whole other subject. Instead of wondering, am I doing it? Am I doing it? Instead, count up to 10 seconds, count back down from 10 seconds. If you haven't strangled them by that time, it's time to let go so you don't burn your arms out. And after I started instituting that new tool and technique for myself, mm -hmm. uh, I, by the way, have never made it all the way up to 10 let alone down to back down for the full 20. You institute a structure that is external from your situation so yes. that you don't fall into that subjective trap of, of thinking you're doing something wrong. Dude, I, we, I'm gonna choke you so much. We're gonna end every episode like <laughs> with, this. With a choke out. Yeah. Coach McCall, that was amazing. My Dude, pleasure. thank you gentlemen, all right. Oh, you didn't get to choke, you didn't get to strangle Brian. Oh no, he did. Oh, he did. Oh, he did. Oh, he did. He, he was did. first, he was yeah, first. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh no, you're right, I didn't. <laughs> Okay, it's under, you're too good, you're too good. You're seeing all the, uh, wait, uh, okay, okay, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> what is the most you've ever enjoyed alcohol? Like, like that first sip. Ah, oh, that reminds me of Tom Waits' quote. I don't want another drink, I just want that last one again. Ooh, that's pretty good. That's profound. Ugh. Usually our openings are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> How to drink whiskey. All right, we're back again with the vice chancellor and the co-founder of the Whiskey Marketing School at the Wizard Academy, Daniel Whittington. Thank you very much, it sir. It is my pleasure, <laughs> sir. It's our pleasure. Are you kidding? We're, we're yeah. the ones drinking. This is great. All right, we've learned the basics of making whiskey. We've learned how to order whiskey, but I don't know how to drink whiskey and get the most out of it. Okay, well. This is a glass. That's <laughs> <laughs> This is whiskey. <laughs> whiskey goes it's in the glass. glass and it goes Wait, in the back. Couple of sips. Uh, couple of sips. <laughs> got to take the top off. Damn it! You missed a step! <laughs> Rookie maneuver. Okay, bad news is what we're about to do is gonna make you look like snobs. The good news is you're about to start your journey of becoming a true whiskey expert. I'm, I'm in. In. Are you in. Sign me up, boss. I'm in. We're only gonna do two whiskeys. I know I spoiled you with dozens of whiskeys previously. We're gonna do two. We're gonna do an Irish whiskey, a green spot, and we're gonna do Longmorn 16. This is a Scottish single malt from Speyside. S-P-E-Y-S-I-D-E. -E. Now, remember we said subjective reality with the shrimp cocktails? <laughs> yeah. And uh, <laughs> what's your favorite food? I like shrimp cocktail. Okay, well I've had a shrimp cocktail, you're wrong. <laughs> so okay. that's, a, that's a cheap way to feel superior to someone yeah. else. Yes, exactly. So there's two things about drinking whiskey and uh, the first is glassware and it really does matter. It makes a difference. Now it doesn't matter as in it's more important, but it makes a difference. We're all talking about chemistry and physiology. So a big wide open glass lets all the alcohol vapors escape out past you and right, this is why wine glasses matter. Now I like these Glencairns, but any glass that has a vague tulip shape is helpful. Now what this does is it captures the whiskey down here and you have a high proof beverage, right? And so you're gonna have a lot more evaporation than you would in a wine. So the moment you pour it out, it starts evaporating and instantly. Starts, and starts within, if you leave a glass of neat whiskey out in a room for 30 minutes, it'll taste watered down. Now, okay, I am gonna tell you, I snuck in one of my all time favorite single malt scotches. There's a reason for it and you'll you'll recognize it when you try it, but I stumbled onto this whiskey. There's a reason the bottle is has, mostly empty. I know, right? <laughs> it has a flavor profile that I've found completely unique in Scottish whiskey and I'll describe it to you and then let you experience it. 
But first, let's talk about smelling whiskey. So first of all, this is a scotch because it's made in Scotland. Yeah. Remember, uh, single, single malt, what does malt that mean? means one distillery. Malt means- Barley. Barley, all there barley. you go. Okay, so this is a 16 year old. Which means not necessarily all of it is 16 years old. It means that the youngest, the youngest barrel. barrel is 16. These guys have been paying attention. Yeah. They have one of the best mottos of any whiskey distillery in Scotland. Long morn. I like it. Long right. no more. Uh, okay, so when you do this with wine, why do you do that? You do it to so look like an ass. Yes. Yeah, you, you Remember get, my you, snob factor yeah. comment in the earlier. Uh, I'm just saying. I'll, no, no, but, but in all seriousness, like it gets uh, aromatics, right? Yes, like yes, you yes. agitate it okay. a little bit so you get Now, this when you scent. do that with wine, which is 12, 15% alcohol, you're evaporating alcohol along with some of the chemicals of the wine. You're centering it in the glass. Right. And then you're smelling it and trying, ah, don't do that yet. No. Nope. Careful. When you do that with a 45% alcohol beverage, you evaporate pure alcohol into the glass. Okay. Right? And then if you then shove your nose into the glass and take a huge smell, you're gonna get nothing first but you'll probably alcohol. pass out. Yeah. Right? At the very least, your eyes will start watering, you'll start coughing, because you just inhaled pure alcohol vapors. Through the nose. Responsible science. That burns. <laughs> <laughs> and at minimum, you'll live a life of regret. All right. And you don't want that. Already, right? already do that. Yeah, so how close do you smell whiskey? Close enough. That's the answer to that question. And it has everything to do with experience and tolerance levels. So if you never drink hard liquor, then don't go shoving your nose in the glass. You'll take a big smell, you'll pass out. Right. If you uh, are used to drinking hard liquor on a regular basis neat, you can get right up in the glass. You'll see professional whiskey uh, drinkers get right in there and they'll move it around. Now here's what they're doing. Now they're not gonna swirl it around because you're just evaporating alcohol. Two things, one, you keep your mouth open. Mm -hmm. Now do this first. You bring your nose, the glass to your nose and take short smells. The moment it smells sharp instead of pleasant, that's when you need to stop. And if you can get right in there, then that means you're good at drinking hard liquor, which oh, is wow. maybe a It really does bad, make a difference to have the mouth open. I, I right. didn't expect that. Now here's why. You ever drive in a car down the road on a highway and one person rolls down a back window like an inch? Mm -hmm. and the whole car goes Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so same thing with your nose. If you have your mouth closed and then you inhale vapors, they just build up in your sinus cavity. Mm, okay. Right? No so taste you get buds. pure alcohol. Yeah. You are dropping science on If us. you open your mouth, it's like rolling down another window in the car. Now you get a cross through, right? And you don't get the buffeting in your ears, right? What you're allowing alcohol vapors to pass through. So now you'll smell the whiskey instead of just pure alcohol. Can we get an episode of one of your series of Whiskey Vault of how to do this and not look like an idiot? Like, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I think there's no getting around that part, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, just don't be obnoxious. You sit at a bar and you're like, <sighs> and you're, you're, like, you're looking around making eye contact with random patrons. Yes, you're see yeah. Them. You're like, uh, hey. Smelling. Hey. So, okay. No, no, no. You, know, you sit quietly. You sit calmly at the bar. It like doesn't go in your nose, you yeah. daft tosser. That's right. It's like a normal human being. One nostril will be better than the other, depending on the day. Wow. Only because of airflow, nothing to do with snot. Snot. Okay, okay so yeah, I have look, snot. looking at it, right, uh, mm -hmm. one of the things we learned with the beerists is that is that there's the look of it, right? Yep. Like wine, it has legs. Yeah. That's sugar, just, just like wine, that's sugar content. Okay, so Anytime that's, you have that's a not the oil beverage, it's, it's sugar and oil. And when you say legs, that's the attachment to the side yeah, of the Yeah, that's the dripping yeah, down yeah, yeah. of the, yeah. And all whiskey is gonna be a much higher sugar content. I mean, get any wine that's a dessert wine, higher proof, immediately you get higher sugars. You're not gonna be able to tell a lot from the legs other than that they're there. So there's no um, visual cues between no, a good one and a bad one. It's attractive, it makes okay. you feel good on the inside. And then- So we're gonna smell, but we haven't, notice we haven't, we haven't had any whiskey yet. No, we haven't. I, the whole, so far, so we're about to. All right. Okay. Now, when you drink a whiskey, Come remember. On. I, exactly. So, when you drink a whiskey, remember that it took 12 years to make this, or in this case, 16. We don't. Least. There's no Jello involved in this. We're not throwing it down, and woo there's no woohooing in this room. <laughs> it's against the rules. Like, no promises. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Do my best. Top is off. He's swinging yeah. his sugar around. <laughs> now, this is something we've just, and I will always say this. We're about to cross him from science into personal preference. I prefer to take my first sip of whiskey as just a nice sip and don't think about it too much, just take a drink. Because I think that is the just instant, that's how whiskey should be enjoyed. Just drink the damn thing. Quit being so nerdy about it, just drink some damn whiskey. So my first sip of any whiskey is just gonna be, let's just take a drink. Fair enough? Yeah, after, after, after you smell it. Fair enough. Don't let it sit around, don't do anything with it. Just take a drink. I have that habit to actually take a sip and then let it sit in my oh, mouth. Oh no, that's a, a good habit. 
but I would say do that next, because once you've done that, there's no going back. I like it because it makes my tongue tingly. Yeah. So you're at the bar, yeah. you want to get the most out of your drink, you take the first sip just to set as a palate like stabilizer, right? right? Yep. Like, like let's just set the bar, yep. and then how do you enjoy the second okay. one? Okay, now whiskey doesn't change as you drink it. People will talk about how it has this in the beginning, and then this mouth feel, and then it opens up, and then it does this after you swallow. Okay, well, what happens when people describe all these different things that a whiskey does is not that a whiskey changing in the sense that it wasn't that to begin with and all of a sudden it becomes that later on. Sure. What's happening is you're creating a reaction. Remember, this is chemistry. Like, you're this sort of science. guiding your own experience. Remember when we added water to that whiskey and it completely changed? Yeah. yeah. And when you pour this whiskey into your mouth, you're about to create another reaction with saliva. And you just heated it up to 98 degrees in seconds. And then after you've swallowed, you're gonna have alcohol eva evaporation, lingering oil, all of those combine into a certain thing, and now the smells that are hitting your nose are not just coming from the glass, they're also coming from your throat and your mouth. And so you're gonna notice completely different things in the smell, you're gonna notice different things in the taste, and it's not that they weren't there before, it's that it you changed how you're experiencing it all of a sudden. So I'm gonna show you something to look for in this whiskey, ready? This is Longmorn 16, if you can get your hands on some, okay. good luck. It took me eight years to track what, down one. What if you've got like a chunk of like burrito back there? Or yeah. Something? It's like, yeah, that'll help. So you're Philistine, or her you're savage. Depending on if it's a good burrito. <laughs> Taco Bell episode was your idea. <laughs> what I love about this one, and this is where, I'm not gonna give you how to get there, I'm just gonna tell you, what you where you arrive at. When it first hits your mouth, there's these notes of butterscotch that are sort of rounded and smooth and friendly. As soon as it crosses your tongue and the oils start to separate, there's this spike of black pepper that by the time you swallow is gone and, and vanishes under the remaining sugary aftertaste, right? So you're gonna notice round kind of butterscotch, black pepper, and then leftover mild kind of friendly herbal kind of notes. There's a poetry to the way you phrase all that stuff. Is, is there like different phases of the drinking that we should be attuned to? Uh, think about what pops into your mind about as them. you go through. Yeah, and I'm gonna hit that in just a second, but let's try that and see. All right. I love it. It's always like butterscotch and black pepper. It's never like, you're gonna get a hint of Big Mac first. Yeah. And then <laughs> probably. Gordita. Yeah. Gordita. Yeah. Twizzlers yeah. is gonna pop yeah. up out of nowhere. Exactly. Red vines than Twizzlers. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a subtle difference. Uh, all right, gentlemen. All right. Is there anything I should be doing in terms of maneuvering my tongue to get the maximum experience? You can. So some guys will swish it around like wine. I find that way too aggressive with 40, 45% alcohol. Now, did you notice that kind of progression? Yeah. yeah. Okay, absolutely. Now, let's do it again. We're gonna, this time what you're gonna do is keep it in your mouth and make a chewing motion, but don't move your tongue around. Huh. You're gonna feel like an idiot. This is one you maybe don't do at the bar. Okay, all right. With my mouth open or closed? All the way to 10. Yeah, you already drank the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> it's still in there. All right, and now you're done. Wow. Now, Notice how much more dramatic that got. That yeah. was. Uh, now, what did we just do? We created a reaction, but in your mouth instead of in the glass or after you've swallowed. See, I like that better because it's got that bite. Mm. Really? Oh no, no, no! Right no. There. I, it was unpleasant. It was. It was like I was in a face-off, and and it's like. Um, so I now, which one of you is out. wrong? <laughs> well, I mean, obviously shrimp me. Cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> the shrimp cocktail guy. No, see, that's that's how I usually drink whiskey. Is that I'll take a drink and then I'll let it sit and you really feel the bite of it. Right before all of the flavor is gone, then Man, you swallow, you know, but it's... Now, I will tell you, there's no bad way to drink whiskey. There's a lot of whiskey in a glass, so give your chance to experience all the different things, right? So, if you just take a sip first, you can still go back to the let it sit. Yeah. But if you let it sit, and you've sort of... Remember, alcohol activates the pain receptors in your tongue. That's what it does. That's why when someone who's never had alcohol can taste even cooked alcohol in a dish, right? Because your tongue is trying to tell you, hey, that thing's trying to kill you, you idiot, right? right. And you're like, no, huh, huh. Like, that's poison. I can, poison. I can quit anytime. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's all it is. You and shut so, up, tongue. To, exactly. To drink more whiskey, you're just eventually getting your brain to shut up. 
But if you let it sit in there and evaporate pure alcohol in your mouth, yeah. there's nothing you can do. It just fry, it's just, everything comes alive. Shorts and after that, out. there's no subtlety. I definitely noticed, like, after holding onto it in the mouth long enough, the, the pain goes up and it becomes vaguely unpleasant for me. But then it hits this point where it's like, I, I just feel nothing. Like, yeah. numbness hits. Numb. And then it's like, I'm not getting any taste or anything in there. Now that we've let that sort of numb overwhelming, finish this one off. Okay. Because science. When I tilt one back, mm -hmm. I always lift my tongue to let it wash underneath my tongue. Is that just me or do you guys I've do never that? done that before. We'll try it both ways. The answer is science. Yeah, Under of course, the triad, of course, of course. course. That's the thing to remember when you go through this, is there's no right or wrong way. What you're no. doing is you're gauging your own experience. Yes. And you're, you're trying to figure out which is the most pleasant way for you to experience this whiskey. Right. And, and that, how does it change? That, and that might vary from whiskey to whiskey. Yes, I was gonna say, and it's and depending on the whiskey. Okay, now we're gonna talk about brain theory. This is where we get super nerdy. Okay, I'm in. Four of your five senses communicate directly with your left brain first. And their left brain is the one responsible for practical application, language, reality, real thing. Getting stuff right? done, yeah. And action, right? So you can touch something and jerk back and then realize, oh, that was hot. And this is a whole other thing. I'm not gonna go deep into this, but the language of those senses are all objective, relatively speaking. Now, if I said, hey, go in that room and find the guy with the red shirt, as long as I spoke your language, everyone could go do that for me. Even if there's a lot of science that proves you and I see a different red, which is true. Right. Right. We could still objectively find the one red shirt. Within a spectrum. Unless you're yeah. colorblind or, yeah, right. yeah. So we're talking about fat into the dull curve, right? So smell is the only sense that has no objective language. You can smell something and suddenly you're back in seventh grade. Yes. And you, you haven't thought about this thought in a million years, yeah. The reason is because your sensors in your nose, they bypass critical thinking and they go to your right brain, to the part of your brain responsible for memory and emotion first. Then they reroute to critical thinking. And so you can walk through a room and smell perfume and look for someone. And then before it occurs to you, that person isn't here or they're maybe they're not even alive, but your brain, their first reaction was to look for their face. Right. Before your conscious mind went, wait, that's ridiculous. That's right brain. When you're smelling and drinking things, we are now entering the territory of right brain, which means if you wanna really experience a whiskey, you have to be comfortable with your brain throwing up something in your mind as an answer to what you're smelling that makes absolutely no sense, mm. but that if you give it ground, and try to understand why it said that, you'll discover something you didn't know about whiskey. There really is like a strange courtship with your own other half of the brain that happens. You yes. know, where it's like, like there's the conscious part of you is deciding how to experience this drink, knowing that you're courting the unconscious part mm. of the brain into experiencing something. I had a guy who said, he picked up a glass and said, Grandma, we took about five minutes to figure out why his brain said that, and we discovered cinnamon. He smelled cinnamon. And his right brain connects the smell of cinnamon with grandma's house. Are we about and to so do a little therapy here? We're about to do this, right? Okay, all right. Now, I will tell you, this is an Irish whiskey called Green Spot, which is amazing. Okay. It's an amazing whiskey. For years, I drank it, and I smelled shortbread biscuit and caramel and a little bit of, and, uh, and that was basically it, a little bit of green apple. So look for that real quick. Don't drink it, but smell it. Look for shortbread biscuit and green apple. By the yeah. way, it's interesting because you can't just inhale. If you inhale, everything whips right past. You gotta right. do that kind of like puff, mm -hmm. inhaling, yeah. just sort of short feel it. Short and then step away. Don't take long smells, take short smells and then pull it away. The green apple is really prominent. Right? Okay, so for two years I drank this and that's all I experienced. Now, set it down for a second. One day I picked this whiskey up and I was talking to somebody so I was distracted, which is the perfect opportunity for your right brain to kick into action. And I picked up the, because my habit when I drink whiskey is, because I'm a nerd, is I'll, we'll be sitting around talking and I'll just be doing this, you know, but not thinking about it. And so we're talking and I pick up the glass and smell and instantly I'm standing on South Padre Island. I'm 12, I'm holding one of those rubber rafts. All of a sudden there were notes of salt, coconut, and what happened was, for me, South Padre was a combination of banana boat sunscreen. Sure. And that course. coconut flavor. Yeah. Right? Dried salt water on yep. hot skin. Regret. Regret. <laughs> a life of regret. And that was it. And for, so for the first time, I smelled coconut in this whiskey. And then when I tasted it, I tasted salt water. That's your right brain talking. Now I can narrow those down to an actual thing. But my right brain didn't say coconut and salt water. My right brain said, 
12 years old South Padre Island. So I stuck my finger in some cookie dough and the moment it hit my mouth, all of a sudden I thought Magic the Gathering because when I was a freshman in college, I got obsessed We're with- We're not getting laid. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I got obsessed with eating raw cookie dough and, and playing Magic the Gathering. And it's amazing how that stuff links in it a does. totally unconscious way. Yes. Now pick this back up, right. smell it, we're gonna drink it. Now this time instead of green apple, look for coconut and salt water. Cheers. Man, this is it's a- It's right there. It's, it's- yeah, right? This is a fantastic example of priming. Like, yeah. like when you prime your brain to look for a certain thing going into it, it, it definitely it. appears. Yeah. yeah. That's the language of tasting and smell and science and right brain. You ever watch a show and you see a, an actor that you know you recognize and you know their name and you saw them in a movie last week, but you can't remember who they are? Yep. And yeah, you get so a restraining order if you try to smell them. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's this uncomfortable feeling of sure. like, ah, I know who that is. That uncomfortable gray foggy feeling, that's your left brain trying to come to terms with your right brain. That's the world you live in when you smell and taste things. All right, so if we're going to distill, as it were, all of this ah, down to a few I fundamentals. See what you did there. If you want to get the most out of your whiskey, what are the things you have to do? Uh, take nope. your time. Take your time. Don't be afraid of looking like an idiot. Yeah, which means sniffing and, yeah. and getting the nose in there. Yeah. Yeah, try I'll, smelling it. Open mouth, your open mouth. mouth closed. Right. Both, because you'll change it, right? Move it around. Take your first sip, relax. Take your next one, let it hang out a little bit. So, first sip, don't judge. Second sip is where you really yeah, settle let's into it. this thing a little bit and maybe add some water. All right, give us a proper toast. May those who love us love us, and may those who hate us, may God turn their hearts. And if he cannot turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so that we may know them by their limping. <laughs> I like that. Have you ever found just like a credit card laying around? Dude, okay, first of all, I, yeah, uh, uh, sorry, no. I thought you were getting defensive, like, <laughs> dude, okay, first of all, I thought it was mine. Credit card skimmers. If you were to put a dollar figure on it and guess how much credit card fraud happens globally per year, what would you say? I assume you mean fraudulent purchases, people stealing your credit card, punching it in? The whole thing. So it seems like, what, we're up to seven, eight billion people on the planet. It seems like one to two billion of them have credit cards. It seems like $5 a year is a reasonable number. So five billion. I'll say five billion. As of 2016, $26 billion. What? But it is a 12% increase from 2015. You know what? I bet that's the actual amount paid out because I'm sure a bunch of people have tried insane fraudulent charges of $1,000 here or there that get declined. But you were saying something about like just little microtransactions. Yeah, okay. So here's what I've heard, and, and again, this is all hearsay, but think about it. Uh, there are online forums where you could buy banks of credit cards, and a lot of them, some of them are, are fresh and, and ripe, and others are old and stale, and you pretty much get what you pay for in these underground forums. The thinking is, if you get a bunch of fresh, ripe cards, the thing you don't want to do is make insane one-time transactions for $100 to $500, because in those cases, those guys are going to, uh, they're, they're going to spot it, and it's going to get shut down really quick. If you could set up kind of a long-term bleed where you take out a little bit for a monthly subscription to some faux thing. For example, the time I noticed a fraudulent transaction was for some kind of health Asahi berry, I don't know, some kind of vitamin thing. Am I even saying that right? Asahi? Asahi. I have no idea. Is it A-C-A-I? Yeah, but it's that weird C with the S on it. C's shouldn't have S's on them. Okay, that's that's true. But my point is, is you keep them alive for a longer amount of time. Now, another version, if you buy a bank of bad credit cards, what you could do is you could actually mint your own version of the card. You actually create the magnetic strip with all the information on it that you bought. Then you go wear a fake mustache and look like a different person. Call yourself go, Ryan Rushwood. That's right. Go buy, buy a TV at Best Buy, and then that's a good $500 payout. Yeah, and after that, it will probably get dinged. But if you're just using it to like buy coffee, maybe uh, a meal at a restaurant or something like that, not all the time, but bit by bit, yep. that greatly lowers the chances that you're going to get caught because 
people use their cards every day. Yeah. Well, and think about it. Of all the times you use your credit card, think about how often it's over the phone to somebody you're not seeing that you just have to trust that they're only entering it in that one system or to a, a waiter who takes it back and then comes back with a bill. There are people who are afraid to even enter their credit card information on any website because they perceive it as not secure. Keep in mind that if it's on a website, it's gonna, if you see that HTTPS, that S means it's encrypted and secure, which means, by the way, when you call someone on the phone and you give them your credit card, all they're doing is entering it into the internet. So if you're <laughs> exactly. grandma and you're afraid of entering your credit card into the internet, then you're dumb. I'm sorry, sorry, grandma. Uh, <laughs> but the real reason you shouldn't have any fear is because your liability is so limited. In theory, if the whole world had your credit card number, you would have virtually no liability for anything somebody did without your permission. Now, of course, you're going to have to check with your bank, right? Yes, every bank is going to be a little bit different, but all of them are going to be in the United States subject to the Electronic Funds Transfer Act the EFTA, which places certain amounts of limits to your liability. For example, if you lose your credit card or your ATM card and you report it to the bank before it gets used, your liability is zero, no matter what happens from that point forward. If you report your card stolen in the first 48 hours, your liability is limited to $50 and many banks will waive that $50 charge. Beyond that, you have up to 60 days to report it, at which point your liability is still limited to $500 and after 60 days, you're a little bit screwed. If you don't report that your card got stolen and it's more than 60 days, pretty much everything on there, you're on the hook for. And that's just what they're legally required to do in the United States. The bank probably wants to go above and beyond that. Yeah, if you have a long running relationship with the bank, it is astonishing what they will let you slide on. Not only will they probably write that stuff off, but have you ever had a late fee? Uh, you realize like most credit cards, in my experience, you get one free coupon per year to just call up and say like, sorry, this was late because reasons, can you forgive it? And go sure whatever you get uh, have you ever done that no i haven't dude uh, I, I, I try not to take advantage of people and their their generosity <laughs> no that's it's not it's them taking advantage of you that's true all right so what are the different ways people could get your credit or debit card information i'm just gonna think of some of them because there are so many sure ways, right uh, I, I guess databases where poorly protected yeah you can hack into that keystroke loggers <sighs> I don't like thinking about that. That's yeah. dark. Yeah. Uh, skimmers, just the little devices that you put on an ATM or a gas pump or something like now, that. Now, we did a segment on this on hacking the system where we basically said it could be in any part of town, any situation that you're sticking your card in a thing. If it looks like there's a facade in front of it, if it looks like there's something that conceivably could be attached over the actual thing, try to kind of bang it around, yeah. see if it detaches. It might be just a straight up skimmer, right? And they're really convincing and they literally take seconds to attach. I saw a video the other day of some guys in a convenience store. They walked up and when the clerk had his back turned, they attached it to the point of sale device. And the good ones will not only gather the credit card information, but they'll actually have buttons that go over the other ATM buttons. So you insert the card, it registers that, you punch in the number, it registers that. Now they have real life access to your credit card or debit card information. Yeah, and then there's uh, RFID scanners and NFC scanners. People can just swipe the information from that without ever seeing the card. Okay, if I'm remembering correctly, RFID is basically a passive device that has to have something bounced off of it. But NFC, that's what you you use on your phone, so that's actively powered, right? Yeah, there's even an app in the Google Play Store where you can get the card information by just tapping it to the back of your Android phone. Wow. Yeah. Or you can use one of these. Okay, I have heard about these forever, but they've always seemed like an esoteric, out in the void kind of thing. This is a straight up skimmer. Yep, $50 on Amazon. What? Yes. If it's on Amazon, I have to believe that there's some kind of legitimate use for this. And if I'm being generous, I'm gonna say that there are people who don't have a Square account or a PayPal account. You're working at a flea market, and rather than write down a credit card, you just wanna swipe it. You trust that it's gonna be worth something later. It's not a bad card. And then this stores it? Right, or any type of magnetized card. You can swipe it and get the information. Like if you have your employees clocking in, they just swipe the card. Oh, wow. Okay, Oh, so, so this, this has like a time stamp? How does this work? How does this work? It's really easy. It just comes with the software, the device, and a USB cable. Give me your credit card. <laughs> really? Oh, you know what? I guess I can find out what information is on all my other magnetic yeah. cards. Yeah. Oh, oh, sweet. Let me do my frequent Parker card. We're just gonna turn it on. Now everybody's gonna know Brian parks cars for a living. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna swipe it, plug it in. Okay. Now we go to upload. 
and it's gonna pull the information off of there. See, that's all the information that's on there, so. So there's not, not much on there. Oh, this is amazing, though. Uh, okay, so apparently all that's on here is my frequent Parker number, mm -hmm. and that's it. Okay, let's try, I'm gonna try my credit card. How many of these can it store? A lot. You gotta imagine that it's just binary information. Right? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. That's my name, and that's my credit card info. That's a bunch of extra information. It's scary. Yep, that's your credit card number, and uh, when I used my debit card on there, yeah. it had my address what? and everything. Oh, you know what? I wonder what's on my driver's license. Check it out. What do you think is gonna be on there? Uh, sex offender. <laughs> God damn <it>. <gasps> <gasps> There yeah, it is. Dude. Straight up, there's my address. There's, oh, there's multiple tracks, too. Oh, wow. What type of driver's license you have. Yeah, uh, and, and it's got my driver's license number, it's got my, my full address and zip code and all that yeah. stuff. I wanna know what AAA has on me. Oh, is that, it? yeah, that's yeah, it? Yeah, that's the one right there. Okay, so that's just my AAA number, which strangely makes me feel better. Uh, dude, that is astonishing. And you know what's really scary? Yeah? You know how on Amazon where it says, customers who bought this also purchased. Yeah. It had that, an encoder, and a card cutter. <gasps> it was the full fraud package. Oh my God. So you get one of these, you swipe it, and then you clone it, and then you take it out to a Best Buy, theoretically, and use it? It runs you about $340. So I guess the lesson here is twofold. Number one, be terrified. There's a million ways to get your credit card information. But also, don't be terrified. Your liability is limited to virtually nothing. Like, if you see, the moment you see a fraudulent charge, you just report it, and then you're off the hook. Oh. That's what you took away from it. I saw nothing but opportunity. <laughs> we have to get the card maker now, and then start being waiters. You wanna be waiters? We should do a segment on waiting. No. No, you didn't like it? Didn't go so well the last time. You, you, you didn't get a good seat? I didn't. How proficient are you in firearms? Oh, dude, I can rattle off like three headshots in about four seconds. Just click, 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 click. Oh, Counter-Strike. What were you talking about? Real life? Terrorists win. <laughs> Black Black always hit your target with a gun. We are back again at Stunt Ranch with Steve Wolf of StuntScience.tv. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Thanks for coming out to play. All right, now you made the extraordinary claim that you could take anyone, who, people who have never even held a gun before in their entire life, and after one lesson, their first shot will be a bullseye. Promise. 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 <laughs> Promise. Well, I don't know that you've ever encountered people as incapable <laughs> as Brian and I. I. I seek you out, actually. So I assume the only way that's possible is that through your eyes, everyone who ever picks up a gun for the first time, they shoot everything wrong, right? What are they doing wrong? Well, actually, people who've never shot a gun don't have bad habits. It's the people who've drilled bad habits into themselves year after year that are the ones that are the hardest to work with. If you know nothing about it, I'm gonna put your feet in the right position. I'm gonna so, put your hips in the right position. I'm gonna put your shoulders in the right position. I'm gonna set up all of the architecture that's necessary to engineer the movement of a bullet from here to there, to where you want it to go. So a guy like me, who has very little experience with guns, is pretty much tabula rasa. But I heard you're slip. a hell of a ninja warrior with the nunchucks. <laughs> you're not supposed to say that on camera. It angers the Lotus Society. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the basics. All right. I think it's interesting that the first thing you brought up is body position, because yeah. what everybody thinks of is line up the sight, squeeze the trigger, right? Right, so we don't squeeze triggers because you get very little milk out of them in the first place. Okay, now, you, so. you brought this up before. You are very precise in your language. Why is that? Let's say we were talking about trigger control, which is the, the physical manipulation of the trigger from its inert position to the position that it's in when it causes the hammer to fall in the gun. So, let's say I were to ask you, squeeze my hand. All right, when you squeeze your hand, these tendons here activated movement in all of your fingers as well as your thumb. Right, right? because okay. you were told to squeeze. Right, yeah. so if we have a perfectly lined up gun and we squeeze, now we've, we've moved the gun. Right. Now it's no longer perfectly lined up. So let's say I were to ask you to pull the trigger. Go ahead, pull my hand. Pull. Okay, look at all this gross motor function of the shoulder here and the trapezoid it is. and the deltoids it's all and the biceps. Right. Right. Okay. But we've already got the gun exactly where we want it. So we don't want any pulling. Now let's say you were standing in front of the elevator and I asked you to press the elevator button. So when we press, when we think press, our brain only activates movement to the index finger. So I say Good. press the enter key press the elevator button, all right? 
So we've got everything lined up perfectly. All we want to do at this point is just activate the movement of the trigger. And so that's why it's very important to think the right words if you want the mu right muscle groups called into action. Where do we begin then? Okay, so we begin with proper footwork, all right? Now the distance that we're gonna be working with on the target here is 10 feet. This is farther than 90% of all interpersonal ballistic conflict resolution happens. Inter okay. Interpersonal conflict resolution? Yeah, I think that means killing someone. <laughs> yeah, right. sure does. Interpersonal ballistic conflict resolution is what I call it. Or shootings, all right? Right. So shootings happen at distances of typically eight feet and less. If someone's going to try to mug you, rob you, rape you, carjack you, abduct you, they've got to be close enough to talk to you. So these conversational distances, right? People don't try to steal your car at gunpoint from 100 feet away, they come right up up to here and they say, give me your car. So if you're going to be able to shoot your way out of a situation like this, or if that's necessary, then you have to be proficient with your firearm at this distance. So wait, are we, are we, uh, we're, we're what, six feet away right yeah, now? Yeah, we're six feet away. So, so you're saying, you're saying this and shorter this and is where all of it happens. where all of it happens. Wow. Right? If you look at the FBI stats, you'll see it's all, you know, eight feet and under. Wow. Typically four or five feet. And Usually surprisingly, an you know, <laughs> and, and if it's a law enforcement involved shooting, uh, they will typically miss with four out of five shots. Really? So, well, let's say you, you were to take violin lessons and you went for a lesson every six months. Every lesson is just a review of lesson one, right? So you never really build skills. And then all of a sudden you're just out in Carnegie Hall and it's like, now play! And you're like, right. Ah! Right. <laughs> And you're not going to play better just because you're under more stress. Right. Seven right. Just because you at that recital. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, just because you need to shoot well doesn't mean you're going to shoot well. In fact, your, your performance is going to drop by at least 30% because of the stress. So you want to train really well so that you're trained up here to be able to shoot to here. And I guess it's important, when I think of shooting, I always think like as far away as I can get the target, the better I'll feel if I'm able to hit it from far away. I guess that feels good, but you're actually training for the wrong situation. You're so, building the muscle memory. Well, well, tactically, that's good that you have an instinct to put distance between you and the thing that's gonna hurt you. Uh -huh. That helps. But in terms of your shooting skill, what you want to be able to do is to shoot quickly and accurately from close distance. Okay, so so let's start with the body position. So let's let's start with body position. Let's take your I'm going to refer to your to your dominant and your non-dominant side. So okay. if you're right-handed, we'd say you're right-hand dominant. Okay. Right leg dominant. So are you uh, right-handed? Right hand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you are right-handed, you're going to take your left foot and you're going to put it on a line that is directly in line with the target. So okay. we would say you're going to point your left toe I should point at out the that target. You sketched out what looks like the letter T with it's a, 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 T a seven. seven. Yeah. I'm in the T7 gang. I was okay. about to say, we don't condone <laughs> gang tags. Right. But while we're here. I have a gang sign too, by the way. What, what's that? TJ, it looks like this. <laughs> so, I mean, you, yo, it's two to the body, one to the head. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, your left to toes your side point right at the target. So we have this line here. Now, if we were to take a line that went perpendicular to your foot, halfway back, right at the inseam here, and then stopping at shoulder width for you, and then coming in there 45 degrees, that's the seven. The okay. front of your foot is gonna go here, and that is your stance right, right there. So this is a modified okay. weaver stance. A have, modified weaver stance? That's what it's called. Okay. It was developed by a brilliant highway engineer named Ray Chapman. And uh, until he was 50, he designed roads and bridges and trusses and was a recreational shooter. And then he developed this shooting posture that all of a sudden allowed him to start out shooting everyone at his club and then everyone at his estate and then everyone in the world. So at, at 50, he started this second career uh, as the founder of the Chapman Institute, teaching every three-letter agency in the world how to shoot well. Wow. So this is what he came up with. This is this foot's at zero degrees to the target. Okay. This foot's at 45 degrees to the target, just one half a step behind. And the reason that we find this very desirable is that this is a position from which you can comfortably talk to someone. So, oh, okay. so, oh, wow. so if we were to teach cops, you know, that you have to be like this to shoot and adjust mm -hmm. your pants and then this foot has to be 10 foot behind that foot, you know, it looks like you're about to shoot someone. And from a public relations standpoint, that's not a good position to stand in when, you know, you might just be, you know, helping a it distressed help. mom to find her You're, kid or something. It doesn't help right? diffuse anything. Right. So if I, if I just stand like this, it's not a totally natural position, but it's like it's a deflective position but it puts most of my vest in the direction of you. But because you're so right, like when I think shooting, I'm, you know, like, like this, right. like, like I'm about to so take off. So if you have a shooting position that's different than your normal standing posture, then it takes time to get into that position. The average time between when you shoot your gun and when you need, knew that you needed to shoot your gun is less than two seconds. Wow. So any extraneous stuff that you have to do is just costing you time. That's brilliant. 
All right. Two so, seconds. So we stand this way. It's called an interview position if it's just for informational purposes. Excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? Can wow. you take your hands out of your pocket? Yes, yes, uh, right. yeah. Okay, good. All right, so from this position here, right? I don't know what to do with my hands. Hey, hey, hey. hey. No, I don't want to right. point nope, guns nope, at him. Nope, nope, right. nope. right. I'll just so, do this. So even though people, like, they say, like, oh, you know, she had, like, a death stare, you know, people don't really kill with their eyes, right? Right. So having eye contact is really tactically meaningless, but hand to eye contact is very important. I want to know where you're hands are. That's it. the real hand-eye coordination. Right. Yeah. Right. Because people hurt people with their hands, right? Either with their bare hands or with a weapon in their hands or with a... Or nunchucks. Right. Or rolled up newspaper. <laughs> yeah. No wall so, break. So you learn to shoot from this kind of neutral position, but in combination with the rest of the ways that we position you, it's going to get you lined up properly. Okay. So zero degrees on the non-dominant side, mm -hmm. 45 degrees, half a step back to give you a little balance control. Yeah. That means we're at zero, we're at 45, so your hips are now going to be at, you know, 22 and a half degrees. You're going to split the difference. Okay. Basically, if you were to close your eyes right now and just shake your body loose, mm -hmm. your belly would land up halfway between your, your feet. Gotcha. So I'm about to enjoy the new dance craze. 22 the, degrees here. Okay? <laughs> your Jason. shoulders are going to stay right over your hips. Yep. All right. That means that this shoulder is going to be closer to the target than this one. They're going to be angled like this. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you a gun now that I have cleared. All right. And okay. before I hand this to you, I'm just going to tell you four essential safety rules. Okay. Okay. First, all guns are always loaded. If this is a gun and now is part of always, then this gun is loaded. So loaded is a status for a gun not information about whether there's bullets in it. Schrodinger's Loaded's revolver. Just, yeah, loaded just means you haven't personally checked that it's not. Right. Yeah. So therefore it is loaded. And Got we it. don't say like act as if all guns, no, there's no as if because we're not playing make-believe because death is for real. All guns are always loaded. It is its official status unless you personally checked it. Got it. And when this gun is in your hand, you're responsible for the path of the bullet. Okay. So I'm going to show you how this gun works. It's a revolver and you can see inside the cylinders that there is in fact nothing in here. So this is now an unloaded gun. If I wanted to you know, see how does the action feel, I can do that knowing that there's not going to be a bang when I expected to hear a click. So those are two bad things, right? You, you don't want to hear bang when you thought it was going to go click, mm -hmm. and you don't want to go click when you needed to go go bang. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? gotcha. Get those right. This gun has been cleared. All right, so that's our first rule. All guns are always loaded yep. until you've personally checked. The second rule is never allow a gun to point at anything that you don't want to see a hole in. Okay. okay. You don't want that thing to be destroyed. Don't point a gun at it. Don't let the gun point at it. Mm -hmm. Don't let someone else point a gun at it. Right. If someone is pointing a gun at you, you just broke the second rule because you allowed a gun to be pointed at something that you don't want to see a hole in. And I don't leave guns pointed in the direction of people because people who don't know gun safety will like, hey, that's nice. Uh, boom, and they just shot at something. Sure. Right. So I at least leave the gun pointed in a safe direction. Yeah. Okay. The third rule is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Sure. Okay, so when we hold the gun, we're holding it here. We have our grip as high on the gun as possible. Okay. Okay, we want the recoil coming back here, moving the whole hand back, not creating this lever here that moves the gun up. Right. Because we may have to solve a problem with more than one shot. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so we just want the gun moving in axis to the action, not climbing and then taking time to bring it back to where it needs to go. All right, so we're gonna go hold the gun high, these fingers here, trigger finger just lays along the side of the gun all right and it stays there until the sights are on the target gotcha. okay so sights on the target the rear sight is this blade that has a notch on it it's these two towers here mm -hmm. and they look like that yep the front sight is a single blade and it looks in the middle what you're trying to do is create an equal amount of space on either side of the front sight with the top of the sights all lined up with each other okay i didn't say put this in the center between these two. Mm -hmm. I said create an equal amount of space on either side of the front sight. And that's because your brain more rapidly detects differences in negative space than differences in positive space. Got it. So we're looking at the space on either side of the front sight and we're looking to see that the top of the sights are level with each other. If that image is then superimposed over the target, you have a proper sight alignment and a proper sight picture. So sight alignment is you've lined up the sights. Mm -hmm and sight picture is you've got your aligned sights lined up in front of the target. And then the fourth rule is to always be sure of your target and what's beyond it. Mm -hmm. We don't shoot at muzzle flash in the bush, okay? That's a cop shooting at someone who's shooting at him that you couldn't see, mm -hmm. right? We don't shoot at you know, people running after somebody with knives when you don't know who the aggressor was. We don't shoot at rustling in the trees, okay? That's kids out 
papering your neighborhood. You only shoot when you know what the target is and you know what's beyond it. The range of a handgun bullet is about a mile and a half. Wow, okay? that's so, a long way. Yeah, so we don't say, oh, well, I was just shooting that. I didn't know that those nuns were walking orphans across the street <laughs> eight blocks away. <laughs> Which, by the way, think about relocating away from the orphanage. Yeah, I, right. I don't know. Hey, but somebody breaks in your door and you're standing in your living room shooting at the at your front door. You know, well, if you live across the street from a playground, you know, you're going to have to think carefully about being able to safely park that bullet inside the body of a bad guy before you go launching it out into innocent neighborhoods. Four but rolls. who's really innocent? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. all right. And do we really know the uh, the path of any other being? Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. So that orphan has a great capacity for evil. <laughs> Not to mention the nuns. <laughs> Not to mention the nuns. <laughs> so so what's happening in the upper body? Okay, so the all? upper body. So we have the gun secured in our right hand. We have a nice firm grip around here. We're mm -hmm. holding the gun as high as possible with no space yep. here. Okay, both thumbs are always on the same side of the gun. Okay. This hand, these fingers here stay straight and they wrap around these fingers here ah. with the trigger guard resting on both hands. So it's resting on this hand and it's resting on this hand. Okay. The trigger guard rests on the forefinger of each hand mm -hmm. and the fingers wrap around each other. Both thumbs stay on the same side of the gun. Like Not on top of each other? Like just so? like that. Okay. Yeah. Not so critical for your own safety when you're handling a revolver, mm -hmm. but if you're handling uh, semi-automatic and you bring that thumb across, you're gonna chew into that bone unpleasantly. Yeah. So if we're gonna get this gun here, something's gotta give, right? And it's gonna be that elbow. Okay, so this arm is gonna be straight but not oh, locked. Okay. And this elbow is gonna be bent down, straight down from the gun. So as the gun tends, wants to climb, mm -hmm. this is hanging on here like a big weight resisting the muzzle climb. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. The other thing is you've got 26 little bones in here. This is an amazing device for, for, for painting, for conducting an orchestra, for expressing yourself. Not a great stable platform for launching bullets from. Got it. So we want to basically deactivate the wrist from being a wrist. And so what we do is we push and pull. You push with the right hand, you pull back with the left hand, that locks these bones together so that when muzzle energy comes flowing through here, instead of banging the bones into each other, like, uh, you know, Newton balls, yep, yep. Okay, the energy just flows smoothly up into this big bicep here. Got it. it. Doesn't bother anybody. And then the last thing we wanna do is we wanna bring you over your hips so that if you were standing against a fence, you could look over and see if there was a chewing gum wrapper on Boy, this side. This is the part that okay. seems super counterintuitive to me. Cause, yeah. Because that that is not the way I would think would be the right way to stand. So the, what this does is it puts your weight centered up on the ball of your forward foot so that you have positive balance. You don't want neutral balance and you certainly don't want negative balance. Yeah. Okay? Because you're about to do something that generates some energy moving this direction. Got it. So you're gonna, you have a little bit of recoil. The recoil you're gonna experience feels about like this. Oh, it's okay. substantial, yeah. Well, that's not going to knock you over. And the amount of energy that the bullet has is equal to the amount of recoil that you experience. So if Newton's laws apply everywhere all the time, and every action has an equal and opposite reaction, the bullet has exactly the same energy as the recoil coming your way. Part of that energy is used up in the, in the form of inertia. What it, what does it take to get the gun moving back? Right? And the gun is heavy and the bullet is light. The tip of the bullet is about 1 50th of the size of the back of the grip of the gun. Okay. So you have a 50 to one pressure ratio, which is why the same amount of energy coming out each side doesn't hurt you, but does hurt them. Because you've reduced the surface area of that energy down to a quarter of an inch versus three square inches. So you take this much energy and you focus that all onto one teeny little tip then you get penetration on this side and you get a slight rock back on this side. Right? Math. So this arm is straight, this arm is back. Just stand up totally straight. Brian, I want you to watch Jason's feet, ready? Uh, yeah. got, I got rock back. back. Yeah. Okay. So rock back, when you feel like you're about to fall, you're worried about falling. And I don't want you to have to worry about anything except shot placement, mm -hmm. okay? So if you're gonna keep this forward, boom. Now I can hit you all day long, we're not getting any rock back. Yeah. All right. So now all you have to focus on is keeping your sights centered on the center of the target there. Yeah. Now let's move on to trigger control. So bring that gun up again, put your finger on the trigger. You're going to gently increase the pressure on the trigger while you continue perfecting your sight alignment. So gently press the trigger straight back in your hand, move the trigger and continue to align your sights while the trigger is moving. And then at one point by surprise, the gun will go off. Okay? Well, that's interesting. You don't know that one moment. All you know is that you're going to be ready when it does. Right. You just know that you're increasing the pressure on the trigger 
while continuing to perfect your sight alignment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very zen thing. You don't yeah. say, I'm gonna shoot the gun. No, I'm gonna work on process right. and the results will take care of themselves. Wow. So the process is I'm just gonna keep in increasing the pressure and keeping myself focused in the right place. And if you're Got focused it. on that, that's kind of a, a zen that slows things down for you, it I does. imagine, rather than the adrenaline of well, the single instant action. When someone's trying to kill you, your brain's been designed to... Fight or flight. Yeah, it's gonna slow perception down immensely. So this gunfight that all the witnesses are gonna say, you know, it was over in three seconds, you're just like, I don't know, 15 minutes or something? Yeah. 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 Which is a really important point. There's a whole cocktail of chemicals released in your body when someone is trying to kill you and if you survive. So you've got all of that adrenaline, you've got the dopamine, you've got chemicals that are really happy that you're still alive. Tequila. Right. Oh, geez, and, uh -oh. And all this stuff going on there, plus someone trying to kill you. This doesn't create an ideal circumstance <laughs> for learning. So if I wanted you to, to learn a formula, a squared plus B squared equals C squared, and I want you to be able to retain that and remember it accurately. I wouldn't try to kill you while I was trying to teach you that, right? Because you're gonna get it all backwards. And yet people end up, you know, in a shooting circumstance, trying to save their lives, and then they think that they're in a state of mind where they could accurately recount to the police what happened. Yeah, sure. Murder, every, not conducive to learn. Yeah, every detail will be wrong, Yeah. okay? When the police are involved in a shooting and they get the details wrong, it's, you know, it's a traumatic exposure. Okay, if you get the details wrong, you're lying to the police. So if you end up in a situation where you have to use a firearm to defend yourself, like silence. What you don't say can never be used against you. Mm -hmm. And everything that you do say will be used against you. So the answer is always- It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. It means my name is Brian. Brian Brushwood and I want to talk to my attorney. And if there's any information that's necessary for officer safety at the time, then add that in. There's two of them and they're still in the house. Right. That's nice of you to say. But anything else is going to be, you know, you say, like, I fired twice. Okay, well, it turns out, you know, you fired till you were empty. And then you reloaded and fired again. You know, you don't know. Everything you remember about it is wrong until those chemicals leave your system. But you won't even have the opportunity to keep your mouth shut if you don't get your shots on target. So yeah. let's go, we'll, we'll focus on staying alive first. It's a big one on my list. Stay alive. Stay alive. Probably Stay alive. like yeah. close to the top. Right. Okay, so let's see, your footwork is perfect. Okay. Your hips, yep. your shoulders, and then this it, arm it, is it. straight, this elbow comes straight to oh, the yeah. ground. Oh yeah, that's what I keep forgetting. Right, you know what? If I'm shooting at you right now, I've got to go through all that bone before I can get to your vitals. Okay, this, this becomes a vest as well. You put it that way. Okay, good. Finger on the trigger, gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. Don't move the gun, just the trigger. Very nice, okay. So ears all around. Oh, going hot. So Jason, the only difference between this gun now and before is that it has a little bit of useless ammo in it that we're gonna turn into valuable brass. If you would just take this hand, cup that. Let's look at your feet, your hips, your center of gravity, that elbow pointing to the ground, pushing with this hand, pulling with this hand, looking through the rear sight at the front sight. Your eyes are just like a camera. They can't focus on three different things at the same time. You could either focus on the rear sight, the front sight, or the target, but something's gonna be blurry. So focus on the front sight. Okay. All right, and that, that's the compromise that makes it all work. Move your finger to the trigger, and without moving the gun, just gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. Bring this in a little lower, so you get a little more leverage. Ease the trigger back. Don't move the gun, just the trigger. And gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. Good, that's beautiful. You're gonna do the same thing again. Gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. And there's wow! the bullseye that I promised you. Dead solid, perfect. That was amazing. Hey, Thank you, Steve. Go. Dude, you're traveling in good company Delivered here. Delivered all the goods. If you can teach uh, this trade yeah. monkey, you can teach anyone. Yeah. Are you yeah. kidding me? <laughs> I'm a clown with giant fumbling meat hands. Yeah, well, you're also a bullseye hitting son of a gun. That well, was incredible. All right. You're all right. Up. Oh, yeah, all right. I'll right. see what if I can remember. All right. Yeah. All it's right. easy. So, T7. This right here, yeah. this right here. This comes up a little more. Uh, a little bit more? Yeah, so the, the front of this foot lines up with the instep of that. And uh, this this knee can be bent a yeah, little bit? Yeah, they're, slight, they're slightly relaxed. Okay. You're gonna have to to, to get that lean. Yeah, yeah, right. okay. Grip. Okay. Finger stays outside. Yep. High grip, fingers, Pull both thumbs on the same side of the okay. gun. This arm is straight, this elbow is bent oh, to the ground. There you there go. Oh, so right. it's, it's so, so bent that I should be able to get my hand in here God. like that, okay? Okay. It's pretty aggressive. And then you're gonna push with this hand and pull back with that hand. Okay, ready? Okay, so you're gonna gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. Don't move the gun, just the trigger. Focus on the front sight. Continue to get the front sight lined up in the center. Good. Got it. Let's see it again. Gently press the trigger. Lean forward slightly more. Okay, got it. Right, because when we go like that, we don't want this. I don't want to see that rock. Got back, it, got okay? it. Okay, ready. So, yeah, yep. lean forward a little more. There ah, we go. Let's got see. It. Boy, Feel it feels that. So strange. Yeah, yeah, but look, yeah. look how solid you are. Yeah, now, it really right? is. All right, so now we'll we'll put one in that's slightly louder than the ones that sure, are in there sure. before. Obviously, the reason that I'm not 
putting it in first up. Yep. Because I don't want you to react to the recoil before anything happens. Right. So actually, the training academies that have had to go through police school with no ammo, right, because their nations were at war, those officers actually shot better than the ones who had learned with live ammo. Wow. You actually don't need ammo to become a really good shooter. I recommend like using live ammo for every seventh training. Okay. And the rest of them you do in your bathroom with a carefully cleared gun. Wow, great. Okay, so I'm going. All right, elbows down yep, here yep. like that. Good, not too much, gentle, relax. Okay. Press with here, pull back with here. Gently press the trigger straight back in your hand. Take your time with it, ease it back. Good, good. Okay, a lot of shake. You know what it is, is I got that adrenaline rush because the pressure's on and okay. I feel that. No that pressure. You no get pressure. Also all the cocaine. Nope. Think of this as a, this is a single shot pistol match. Got it. Okay, so every time you fire, it's a one shot match. So all that matters is putting the bullet where it, ma where it matters. All right, right? leaning because forward. Because tactically, until you put a bullet where it matters, you're just wasting time. You can't miss fast enough to win. Okay, ready. Gently press, good. Good, gently press, good. Gently press, good. Wow! Hey! Nice work. <laughs> There you go. Wow, that was amazing. Excellent. Because I definitely was having a case of the nerves, which I right. guess is even better, because that's realistically how you're gonna be. Yeah. Right. But by focusing on just like, it was kind of bobbing, but it's like, keep it right there, keep it right there. And, yeah. and it really is, it, it's, it's the equivalent to keeping your eye on the center of the road while you're depressing the accelerator, and yep. then just at some point it pops. Right. God, that well, was amazing. It's like we learned uh, when we were studying Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu at ACES, Every little thing is additive, and each one that you have just perfect adds to the likelihood of you hitting the target. Yeah, yeah, correct. So, so even though I had the adrenaline rush and was getting the trem tremor, everything else was in balance. Of course, the be there, right? So it hit there, yeah. Right. And wow. when we do advanced tactical training, you'll be here shooting this way, and I'm going to be over here shooting a shotgun this way, putting you right down range of the, my muzzle blast. Just, just so, to just rattle to get me. that realistic, yeah. right? So, so you want to train under those conditions. So when you get that jolt of adrenaline, when someone is trying to kill you, you're like, oh, this isn't something new. I practiced with this. I know what to do. There's a process. It yeah. is astonishing. When you put all the pieces in together, like even under, for me, it felt like less than ideal conditions, but damn if it didn't work, you, you did it. All right. You did the impossible. Well, I want to show you one more thing. Okay. I want to show you that of, the, of all these things that we did that favor getting the bullets where you want them to land, you can actually get all of them wrong if you get the last two right. So. We talked about putting my non-dominant foot here and this here, right? Let's say I get it backwards. Let's say I, I got this foot here, and instead of getting this foot here, I got this foot here. So now, like, I'm shaky, right? I don't have a good, a good base. Let's say instead of taking the gun with two hands on a proper push-pull isometric grip, I hold the gun with one hand. Let's say instead of grabbing the gun properly, I got hold of the gun upside down, <laughs> all right? Instead of shooting it with my index finger, I, sh I shot with my pinky. Could I still hit the target? Getting everything wrong. Oh God, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Camera guys are awfully close, but we're gonna find out. <laughs> All right, so if I get everything wrong, but I maintain good sight alignment and good trigger control, I could probably still outshoot you guys. Wow! With a center shot. All right. That so, is one dead target. Oh, Steve right. Wolf, you're a champion. That was freaking amazing. Thanks for coming man. out here to play, Brian. Oh, absolutely. Jason, so we, great you. Great we work. can see more of your stuff over at StuntScience.tv, right? StuntScience.tv, yep. And of course, check out the Stunt Ranch. Man, that was great. Yeah, that's fun. What the hell did you do to your car? It's a brand new BMW. They come like that from the factory. No, they, but you drew hearts all over I it. I did not. They come like that. They do, but that's done, that's painted with love. Uh, yes, it is painted with love. I'm trying to bring more love into the world, okay? Do you have a problem with love? No, no. Are we going to do this or not? Did you bring the stuff? The, the stuff? The drugs? Yes, it's 100% drugs. Yes, the drugs? Yes, it's... I brought the drugs yes. for you to have. Yes, did you, they are drugs though? You're confirming that? Well, they're not a bomb. What was, what was that? Why are you saying it's drugs I'm, I'm, into... I have a... Itch. I have psoriasis. You have psoriasis. Chron chronic psoriasis. You never told. How did I not know you ever had? I don't psoriasis. tell you everything. Why, wait. What did you say? Bomb? Why would it be a bomb? Wait. Wait. What do you? What do you give me? The third degree? What are you a cop? You're asking me about love. 
and my my condition, I would like the drugs now. Are there drugs for your for the itch? Very personal. You know I'm self conscious okay, right. about no, look, that. Uh, look, give my regards to President Kardashian via condios. But where are you? Car Brushwood. Since day one of the modern rogue. Blow what? up a car! I know. Yes, the first thing on the list. The modern rogue would know. Blow up a car! How to blow up a car movie style. Yes! But we need an expert to teach us. Did someone say blow up a car? <gasps> Stunt scientist Steve Wolf! Steve Wolf, thank you so much for joining us, Brian, man. Jason, thank you. Now, we have always wanted to blow up a car, but I assume there's a process and things that we need. What do we need? You need a car, you need someone who knows how to blow it up safely, and you need some exciting chemistry. Now the car thing we got taken care of, they were cool enough to set us up with a BMW, like an 03. 325 XI, Yeah, whatever so that means. Yeah, exactly, sounds fancy. Uh, for the moment, we're gonna blow it up. So what do you have to do to the car first? Well, first thing, we wanna make sure that when we blow up the car, one, we don't actually want any fragmentation. So we're not using the same type of high kinetic energy devices that you'd use to cause destruction, because we're just trying to create the look of an explosion. So we're gonna remove everything from the car that could burn. We don't want any vinyl burning, anything like that. We only want the things to burn that we put in the car that are intended to burn. We're gonna get a crew in here and we're gonna strip everything flammable out of here, basically take this thing down to the metal. So it's basically minimalizing the possibility for a dangerous mess. Right, we don't want any dangerous mess. We don't want any poisonous crap in the air. We're gonna pull everything out of here. And then we actually saw the hinges saw the frame posts, everything that we want to blow up, we actually go ahead and pre-break it. And so that it only to take like a firecracker to make this thing fall apart once we finish cutting it up. How long a process does it take to prep the vehicle? Well, if you and I were to do this, we could get it done probably in eight to 10 hours. But uh, I'm thinking we don't have eight to 10 hours and we do have a movie crew. Yeah, we do have a bunch of fans. Uh, I just say, hey, everybody, let's tear this thing apart. So this is uh, John Godwin here. He's our lead engineer here and he's assembled the merry band of people that you want to not be in their way when they start uh, Appreciate going it, John, at it. Sir. Here we go, let me get my stuff out here. I don't want my phone taken this apart. This is what happens when you offer right. free pizza. I'll be over here. Yeah. <laughs> Make one pile, John, pick out where you want it to be. So this is all the flammable stuff coming out and including the seat. I didn't even think about the seat. Oh yeah. You You've blown up a number of cars. What happens when thousands, a car? Really? Uh, oh, yeah. You've wow. blown up thousands of I've cars. I've blown up thousands of cars. I've done. I haven't done any. I haven't done any at all. You know, after today, you won't be able to say that anymore. What happens to these cars after they're blown up? Because I know that we saw well, a bunch of... Yeah. After these cars are blown up, they become background uh, flora and fauna for people who are playing airsoft, paintball, and they need this burnt this out amazing. wreckage look for them. This thing is dying and going to Valhalla. We're gonna, we're gonna set fire to its pyre. And then also there's people who want to do tactical shooting drills and they need vehicles to work around. Okay. So that'll all go to Stunt Ranch. You have a number of these vehicles already on the premises. Yeah, we have a pretty good collection of them. Oh, and the nice thing is, is once it's blown up, you can blow it up over and over again, like oh, this over van over, over yeah. here. That van has been blown up at least 5,000 times. So wow. do you have any horror stories of things gone wrong when stuff wasn't properly dismantled from the car? Yeah, I've seen uh, things blow up and nearly hurt crew before. The more stuff like that you see, the more paranoid you become about safety. You send me a guy who's never been part of something that went wrong, and I don't want him because he's not gonna be careful enough. Okay. I would imagine you build up like a kind of a low grade paranoia at all times. You do, right. You know, you can do this safely if you apply the science, but if you don't, or if you don't respect the chemistry, you're gonna get hurt or hurt somebody else. Yeah, no kidding. There you go, ready? One, two, three. There we go. Oh, isn't that satisfying? There you go, one, two, three. Boy, it's really weird to just treat it like, like such garbage. Breaker. Well, I broke the, the crowbar. <laughs> yeah! Hey! There we go. Nice. Got it. Ah. There we go. Ah. Yeah, maybe we should. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll bet. Oh, right on. Okay. 
what is it we need out of the hood? Oh, there you go. Nicely done, sir. All right, for the record, that was... It was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And we had a big team, and that still took two and a half hours or so. And yeah. it's all for safety, right? So right. we're not going to have, like, bits of this shrapnel flying off? We don't want anything flying out. We don't want anything on fire that doesn't need to be. We don't want the headliner burning, the urethane foam, and all that stuff creating pollution. Now, with this chassis, though, we're not going to have, like, bits of molten, jagged metal flying out? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, disagree. remember, distance is always your friend when it comes to pyrotechnics and explosives. If you can see it, it can see you. Oh God, it's sentient? <laughs> it's, it, it might knows be. knows our fear. <laughs> It'll always be the person on the crew who is most paranoid who ends up getting hit with something. That's you. They bring uh, it yeah. to themselves. That's right. So we've got everything stripped. Describe for me the Rube Goldberg scenario of how we get flammable liquid exploding everywhere. All right, so basically liquids don't burn, only gases burn. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we have to do is we have to turn the liquids into gases. And the way we're gonna do that is just by I shock them with a, a high brisket charge. And that'll create a, what, yeah. a, a fuel air it's mixture. It's gonna atomize it, right? Okay. So we're gonna we, do alchemy. Yeah, and we're gonna do some of that. <laughs> but no alchemy before we work. That's right. right. Texas doesn't sell philosopher's stones on Sunday anyway. So. <laughs> Not before noon anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this this charge here, we're gonna put it under the liquid, we're gonna use that to push the liquid up and turn it into a vapor. Uh -huh. And then that vapor can combine with oxygen, at which point it's highly flammable and off it goes. Okay, so you've got the, the bunch of gas, you've got the, the gizmo that, that explodes and, and throws everything up. How do you trigger that gizmo remotely? So we're just gonna trigger that with electricity. We've got a piece of wire that runs from the car off to a safe distance. We add electricity. Call dibs. Uh, yeah, are we going right. to do this together? One you'll, on each you'll side. Each get one wire. There we go. Yeah, oh, that would be amazing. High five. I'm excited. <laughs> the battery. Tell me more about the gizmo. Okay, so the the gizmo is a, a flammable powder. When the powder burns, it turns into a gas. That gas creates a lot of pressure. That pressure pushes up against the liquid, and that atomizes the liquid. And that's liquid. part of the reason we have that uh, that metal pipe there is because essentially it's like a short barrel shotgun. It's just going to blast everything right. up. Right. So we're going to have a, a couple of different charges in here. Uh, the first one, we want to push vapor up against the roof here, and then it's going to mushroom out and come out the windows and go around. And then the second charge is going to be in the trunk. And in the trunk charge, we just want it to kind of pop the trunk up and, and see fire come out oh, the and back. Now this one, it's just just laying there. It's not even in a yeah, pipe thing. That's I, right. Because I assume all of this is a vessel that's going to fill with explosive force. It, it, it's all going to fill with gases. So anyone who wants to know what the powders are and what the liquids are, they could come to Pyro School. We have a Pyro licensing program. So people who decide after seeing this, like, that's what I want to do for a living. Uh, they could come here and take some training and we could actually show them how to do this yeah. and get them licensed so they could be safe. The mechanisms to do this seem very, very simple, like anyone could do it. but. Right. I want to emphasize more than I have in any other episode, don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you come here it's, this and is talk to like, super dangerous. Team. And you know, the reason that we're able to make it look easy is because we've been doing it for 30 years. But if you were to go off and try to experiment with this on yourself, there'd be at least 10 different opportunities to blow yourself up. And I've over the years seen all the different ways that these can be triggered with, you know, RF and remote control and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and Hi-Fi and everything else. I have an and, app. And, yeah, and an app. What I've found over the years is the simpler you make your science, the more reliable it is. I don't even use switches. At this point, I just take my wires and I touch it to the battery. One less thing to go wrong. So out of everything that we did to set up, you said that there was one thing that was more important than all of it put together, and that's right. to keep it from accidentally discharging. The most important thing that we do here today is called shunting. And shunting is when you take two wires and twist them together. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna take the two lead wires that are hooked up to everything else in here, and we twist them together to make sure that static electricity can't get in there, that if it's dragged along the ground and accidentally finds an old nine volt battery that someone discarded, electricity can't get in there. It's a closed circuit right now. And the it really could be the, the kind of thing where if it's, they're not shunted and, and just the act of dragging the wire could generate enough energy that you grab it, you touch the two parts and it blows up. Right. So All of a sudden, I just realized we're sitting it, against that. And we're, yeah, we're right here. Mm, so uh -huh. because it's shunted, it's safe and it won't go off until we want it to. We have to undo that short circuit and then touch that to our battery. Man, I think we're set. I guess we just need to get the shot of you getting into the car so you could get exploded. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's do this. It's a good way good to luck. die. Good luck. 
It's been fun working with you in case anything happens. It's a good day. I've, I've, I've had a good run. I've had a good run. All right, ready? Yes, are we doing fine? Yeah, just take it, just take it. Be like, it's fine. Vaya con Dios. Brushwood. All right, we're gonna load this thing. All right, make yourself scarce, yeah, sir. Right. Neatly done, right? Steve just put the flammable liquid into About the About a gallon the of it, just right on top of the explosive charge. So the explosive charge is gonna throw everything up and we get to cause it. And it'll turn to vapor uh, and then we detonate it with a detonator. Yeah. I've always wanted to use a detonator. It's high tech too. It's two pieces of wire that we stick to a battery. Cause I'm a modern rogue. <laughs> is it go time, Steve? Go. Really? Yeah. Don't you dare. It's the most, he said it's the most important thing. I got it. And you're like, but I want to untwist I, it. It's, I want to unshunt. Yeah, don't unshunt. They don't have any fire begun. They, <laughs> it's because they're professionals, man. <laughs> Give a nice loud count out. Roger that. We're about to blow up the car. All right, hold on, you're unshunting? Should I unshunt now? Unshunt and then hand each of us a wire. And then call out, fire in the hole three, and make sure there's no cars. Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Wow! Wow! Jackpot! We made a big thing go boom! <laughs> yeah! That's amazing! I was in that car! Yeah, you died! Just like a second ago! You are not alive anymore! You finally got your wish. I tricked you! There was a bomb! It wasn't drugs at <laughs> it all! It wasn't drugs at all! All right, this now's bomb our moment. Brush no, wood. no! <laughs> Holy cow! That was perfect, guys. We, uh... You're never really ready for it. There we go, we're out. Beautifully done. Wow, man. All right, we got a flare back up. So there's yeah, a lot of hot gas get rid of that out. ignition source down there. Here we go. So when I pop that, it may it may relight. You will cool that out. Look out! Woo! The stuff on the ground is okay as long as it doesn't relight the car. Wow! Look at that. That's that's just straight it's up fun. gas leaking. It's fun. That's straight up gas leaking out of the gas tank. That's every cliche. That's the beginning of of, of Mad Max. <laughs> uh, we got a little fire under the bumper here. Oh yeah! Look at that. That's how we do. Absolutely, man. That came out <laughs> great. And there was no shrapnel Nothing, that I saw. Right? There was no debris that And thanks, loose. thanks to John and his crew. Yeah. You know, a super clean extinguish. Great job, That's what guys. you're shooting for. Yeah, that's good. All right, dude, I'm no expert, but that looked like it blowed up real good. I'm going to have to take your word for it, because, of course, I didn't watch. Yeah, oh. school guys don't look at explosions, of yeah. course. <laughs> Textbook I read, yeah. But if you guys say it look good, I'm happy. We bounced up and down and looked like a couple of chimpanzees. But did, <laughs> I, did any of you yell, wow, wow? Probably. A little bit, a little yeah. bit. I'm not going to ask who, yeah. you know. <laughs> All right, so well, where can we get so much more of your amazing work? So you can check this out at stuntscience.tv. I've actually got much more detailed instructions on how to do this for people who are interested in the process. Great. And, of course, this all happens out at Stunt Ranch. It's what we do. You're the best, Steve. Thanks so Amazing. much, man. Thanks so much for coming Absolutely. out, Absolutely. Jason, thanks so much. Appreciate it, Come sir. back soon. Indeed. I thought there was going to be some sort of voodoo science going on here with uh, a mysterious device and some sort of forbidden explosives you get from a man in an alley. And Yeah, there is voodoo science. It's in the expertise of knowing exactly how far is the safe area, exactly how the fuel is going to spray everywhere, exactly how to think about ventilation and stuff. Turns out it's basic physics, right? Explodey thing, kind of like a shotgun shell, just explodey thing goes off, propulsion causes the flammable liquid to go everywhere, and the fuel air mixture just goes nuts. It was big. It was loud. It was something. It was very impressive. Uh, bucket list, right? Oh yeah, no, cross that way. I'm this much closer to death now. Oh yes, I think we all saw the Grim Reaper waiting like, how is Brian going to injure his hand today? Not today, Satan! Maybe he loses it entirely. <laughs> hey, uh, is your butt as hot as my butt uh, is? This car was just on fire, so yeah, yeah no, my, I'm kind of feeling that. Burning. Uh. Is that, is that, wait, is that a new theme song? Yes, yes it is. Okay, so you're saying explosion happens, and then it shows me and Jason, and then we hear what? 
because I'm a modern rogue. I feel like you got to belt it out. Give it, give it to me big and slow. Because I'm a modern rogue. Yep, beautiful. Cut, print, we're good. You know you can eat styrofoam packing peanuts? Well, not technically the styrofoam ones. There's something light. There are packing peanuts, but they're like made from a potato starch. I don't know what I'm saying. You can eat freaking real styrofoam. Yeah, I was about to say, agree to disagree. You can, uh, is it bad? Bad, bad is idea. It really bad, bad idea. It was a bad idea. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> you gonna turn into that little crusty powder? It's awful. It's awful. I shouldn't have done that. Melting styrofoam into knives. All right, Murphy, I'm seeing styrofoam, dangerous chemicals, and a butterfly knife. Something tells me it's we're a going. Party. Yeah. Or we're going back to prison. We are going to use styrofoam to make a knife. Nice. <laughs> I saw a guy doing this online. He ended up making like his initials with the byproduct. That's cute. Yeah, Somebody, it's somebody's like, uh, hey, leave me alone. These are my initials, man. Yeah. I thought we're going to make something dangerous because it's the modern rogue. So we're going to use acetone to break down this styrofoam and then reshape it into a blade. Yes, all the way, yes. Okay, uh, okay uh, tools of the trade. Uh, first of all, safety stuff. Gloves, respirators, acetone is nasty, nasty stuff. Yeah, nail polish remover. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when I quit my day job, uh, you know, the fuel that I use for the fire eating is Coleman Camp Fuel. It's naphtha, 100% naphtha, which is, I believe, somewhere between gasoline and benzene. But I talked to my doctor and I'm like, hey, I know you're not gonna love this, but this is what I'm putting in my body. He seemed to be way more concerned with aspirating it than actually ingesting it. Not that you would do either, but I think we have to be very serious about not breathing that stuff. Especially when it starts to break down the styrofoam, I can't imagine there's anything good going on. We want to, I assume, dissolve the styrofoam, make a goop. Exactly, we're gonna shape the goop yep. into a knife and then let it dry. It might not work. All right, we got a couple of different types of styrofoam. I don't know which one's going to work, if both of them will work, if neither of them will work. Where did you get this? I got this off of Amazon. Styrofoam is strangely expensive. This was like $10. Wow, this was definitely not $10, but this is, I think this might be for craft use or something is why it's more expensive, whereas this is industrial use. Oh, it's just packing material yeah. there. Okay, uh, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Which, what's up with the clay? What do we do with that? Oh, we're gonna make a mold for our knife. And this is actually uh, C4. It was, it was the cheapest <laughs> on Amazon, man. Yeah. This is just straight up molding clay, right? Yeah. So do we want to just copy the butterfly knife? Yeah, sure. And I'm just squeezing it down in here, you think? Yeah, and then after it dries, we're gonna have to sand it down and get it nice and sharp. And I guess in prison, you would just do that by rubbing it on concrete or whatever. Yeah, that might be too shallow. Yeah, so I'm go gonna, a little deeper, yeah, knowing gonna, that we're gonna cut some off. I'm gonna go ahead and just use my thumbs to like make some sort of crude blade. With the intention of filing it down exactly. into something real. This one I'm gonna kind of cut out just a trough. We That's a good idea. Maybe like a stabbing thing. Yeah, because mine is ridiculous. Looks like a chimpanzee crafted it. Oh, I was about to say, it looks nothing like a chimpanzee, sir. This is uh, kind of similar. When I did that video with the King of Random, we made brass knuckles and we used Play-Doh to create a mold. That worked pretty well. Oh, cool. Which makes me fairly optimistic on how this is gonna go. So we got three different impressions of the knife with different depths. We have a shiv that'll be kind of like a a dart or a dirk. Is that is that, is that a thing, a, a dirk? A dirk? Yeah, yeah, totally. yeah, 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 okay. And then we've got just a hand boat. We have a boat. A we have a boat. We have a great boat. This is an ashtray. It's a good boat. <laughs> so now what? We, we make the goop? Let's try making the goop. Uh, I don't know what kind of yield we're gonna get. We'll pour the acetone in first, and then we'll dip it in. All right. I'm just gonna start with like a tiny little, bit, tiny little bit, little bit of acetone. Let's see, let's see. In fact, I'm gonna guess that there's some moment that it becomes saturated. Uh, so we want to see. All right, there you go. Oh, okay. Uh, first yeah. lesson: everybody gets this wrong. Yeah. Do you know why they have this output? off center on this? No. When it's totally full, people tilt it and it pours out and, and it goes everywhere. The reason it's in the corner is so you go the opposite side and look how far over you can get before any comes out. There you go, like that. Yeah, way better. It was better. You ready to try it? Do not breathe the acetone, human. I, I hope this very, works. I'm very curious. Oh, oh my God, it's bubbling. Do you feel it dissolving underneath? Here, push down, push down hard. Oh, that's satisfying. Yeah, right? It's working. I didn't expect it to bubble. So is this just gonna pour out? Yeah, it'll turn into a thick goop, like almost like toothpaste. And that's just like a type of hard plastic, like uh, the same you would get out of uh, flatware, plastic flatware. Yeah. It seems like it's saturated at this point. It's not taking anymore. Really? 
Maybe we should leave that in there, get another glass, and try this one and see how that works. Oh, that's a good call. So I'm guessing when we pour this in, basically half of it will be acetone that will evaporate off, and the other half will be this mixture goop, right? That's what I'm thinking, but when I saw it, the goop was much thicker. Okay, I'm gonna try it your way, smart guy. All right. Oh, just like that. <laughs> hey, look at that. See? I got, yeah, okay. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow. Okay. This is the stuff. This is bad styrofoam we got on this end. That's the, that's the real goods right there. It's just immediate. Oh, wow. Look at that. There's mentioning, super flammable. Oh, yeah. And again, this is just nail polish remover. Yeah, dude, this is also, I've seen it as gum and spot remover for like cleaning supplies. It's actually kind of fun. Very satisfying. Yeah, dude. When you stir it around, look how fast it goes. Yeah. Yeah, dude, this one, this one just gave up. It's just done, huh? Okay. Yeah. Oh, dude, yeah. That acetone is getting super saturated now. You think we're ready to pour? I think we're ready to pour for this one, yeah. Turns into a nice, thick Boy, slurry. it really does. This seems eminently workable. Wow. Now the idea is we're gonna pour it into the mold. I, I think we should just let it dribble into the mold. I think we'll get a more precise pour that way. Let it sit for a few days. The remainder of the acetone evaporates off. Yeah. And then we're left with a uh, semi-hard plastic. Oh, look at it, it's already drying. So at this point, I'm just kind of painting it up and down the mold. And our molds are terrible. We're gonna have to do some considerable shaping afterwards, right? I don't even know that they're that terrible. I mean, they seem pretty, pretty decent. They're exact impressions of knife blades, right? Well, yours is, mine's a canoe. <laughs> I think that one's pretty good. Look at how fast it dried too. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, all right, hold on. Try this on for size. Not only do I make this one deeper. Yeah, there we go. So we get mirror images of this. Oh. I'm so curious if that's gonna work. We're gonna fuse these together to create an actual mold. Use the straw and just dribble it in. Don't do it fast. That's too fast. You want a thin line so it'll go straight down. You know what? I think we can add a, add little, a little acid. Add a little bit of acetone, yeah. yeah. There we go. So stick it in and twist it like you would some honey and then just let it dribble in there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I guess kind of stick it in and wipe it off in there. <laughs> I'm, I'm becoming increasingly uncomfortable with this imagery. <laughs> okay. You want, you want to do the dirk? Yeah, let's try that one. So all of these are just going to give us raw materials to shave down to some kind of bladed edge, right? Yeah, it's going to be vaguely knife shaped and then we're going to just reshape the hard plastic. And I don't know how hard it's going to be. They're probably going to be like one use knives, stab, break it off. Oh, geez, that would be awful. Yeah, right? It's funny because you're fine and then you catch a whiff of that acetone and it's like, woof. This leprechaun over here keeps telling me it smells really good. <laughs> I'm like, shut up, I'm trying to concentrate here. And uh, I guess just pour the rest in the boat. The purpose of this is to be, what? Something to work with? Just to make thicker. A... Yeah, okay. I wanted one that was like a little bit bigger and sturdier. Okay, well then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to get it kind of to a point here at the very tip. Yeah, that looks So it's good. a little more like a spearhead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, we're still gonna have to file it down. I'm gonna fill this up with hot goo. <laughs> Close your eyes and listen. So about like that? You yeah, think? I think so. I think I think all of them are done. I think I think I guess what we let them stay. How long? Two days? I think that's pretty good. Three or yeah. four days? Do you want to light it? No, no. Uh, maybe no. Number one, there definitely would be bad fumes that would come out from it. Number two. Oh, absolutely. It's the acetone that would burn it. I think the acetone's largely bonded. If we lit that, it would be the equivalent of lighting a plastic knife on fire. You think? Yeah. That's not a plastic knife burning, dude. <laughs> Regardless, it's not impressive. That's definitely all the acetone burning off. But you see, once it's gone, you could just, you could just blow it out, right? I think it's kind of impressive. It's not impressive. You're just, you're a child. You ready? You uh, feeling it? I'm, I'm afraid that this is gonna suck. I'm not gonna lie. It's go time. Uh, nope, I don't know. Wait, oh, down here. Yeah, the little blocks that look like C4. I, I don't think this is gonna go very well. Number one, all of these have fused to the shelf. Okay. 
So our <laughs> no, my horrible your spear tip your spear tip my horrible canoe oh spear tip that that's better yes yeah. they're all full of bubbles so that's got to make them like way more fragile all right we got four shivs what are their names <laughs> okay Inky Pinky Blinky and Clyde not bad I was thinking Inquinox Esla Verdad Mistoka Discos and. Go away, Dad. What? <laughs> I mean, look, we both had very different names. Just word salad? <laughs> so these are the two uh, we use the butterfly knife to use as the imprint. Right. That's obviously a butterfly knife. I, I mean, mean, hold I on. Mean, look. Look. Let's, let's find out. You ready? So we'll start with this one. This one okay. was, oh dear. Nope. This one was made out of the mold of a butterfly knife, and the moment I pulled it, it kind of broke apart. This whole episode might not work at all. It's <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> suddenly. Oh no! It broke apart when I tried to pluck it out. You know what it is? What is it? It's, the clay? It's the holes. The that bubbles? Bubbles throughout everything. Okay, hold on. Okay, in this so case. So that was wasted. I'm trying to pluck it out. And as I'm pulling it off, the tensile strength is not sufficient. So it's falling apart. It's still very much styrofoam. So it breaks like styrofoam. So I'm gonna say that rather than us peeling them out like they're made of steel, we should instead peel away the mold to reveal yeah. this thing in there, right? Okay. By the way, that, that's one down. That didn't work out so hot. We, yeah. That's not that's not a great experiment when the first one totally fails. Uh, okay, so let's let's try. Not feeling real good about this. No. Does it look like it's peeling off? Keep it, keep it going. Uh doing good, yeah. Keep going. Okay. At what point do I grab it and try to pluck it out? Uh, not yet, not yet, not yet. Because not you yet. can kind of see it bending right there. Yeah. Which you probably don't want it to. Oh, see, you already lost a, a okay. thing. Okay, all right, hold on. <gasps> Here we go. You okay. kind of, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. Right, there you go. <sighs> There's really not much here. Yet, 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 yet. Always yet. add the word yet. Okay. Spearhead, gentle, gentle, go slow. Go slow like it's the first time you've ever peeled back the sweet, sweet clay around a polystyrene shiv. Way to make it weird. Dude, that looks like that's working. Yeah. Who would have thought that my clumsy clay canoe could have been? <laughs> my clumsy clay canoe. That's gonna be my autobiography. <laughs> yeah. This... Okay. All right, gentle, gentle. All right. I'm thinking maybe we shouldn't have used this clay as our mold. No. Maybe we should have used a hardening clay. Whatever the problems with what we have, I feel like it's almost certainly to do with all the bubbles that are in there. Yeah. That's gonna be problematic. How, how do you get rid of that though? We could have waited in its liquid form long enough for all the bubbles to go up top and then given it a few hours and then poured just the purest poly whatever oh, it is sure. in there. Yeah. So this is the one that was the most ambitious. And to be honest, take a look at that. This one right in there, if you look right down the middle, you can see like virtually no bubbles. It looks like what we did was pour it in there because all of these were horizontal. So that means the, the bubbles went up along the structural surface. This one was vertical. So I think all the bubbles went up. Oh, do you think the, the air worked its way out? That's, that's what I'm hoping. I think that's mighty optimistic of yeah, you, sir. Yeah, you wanna find out? Yeah. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Crack, it breaks into seven pieces. Definitely cracked. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where'd it go? <laughs> There's nothing in there. How is there nothing in there? <laughs> it all leaked out. This no. is this is what it is. No. This is what. <laughs> this was a leaked out part we found <laughs> in the bottom. <laughs> it all leaked out. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> So all we got was a coated side of what used to be. This is bullshit. You mocked my technique. Okay, look. There's nothing then... in there. <laughs> all right, put your finger in and then kind right, of right. rip that out. You can see. Oh, okay. So you got like sort of something. I'm so disappointed. Yeah, I know. This is the one I thought for sure would be the biggest deal. It all, I thought that was gonna be the best it one. It all just leaked out. What do we got? We got, we got, <laughs> we got <laughs> garbage. It's fine. You got to use a lot of this stuff. You got it looks the tube like. canoe 2738. Yep. You got Shiv Master 5000. You got the blob and you got um, um, cheap chop. This is just trash. No. This is not the, yet. 
Not yet. Hold off on that one. That's our, that's, we need to experiment. Let's take the blob and see if we can make a shiv out Are of- Are you kidding me? Yes. No, I'm not. Oh, this is kind of gummy where it like mixed with the clay. Well. At this point. So you're actually going to try to make a weapon out of that blob of goo. Take a look at this. Yes, there is giant chunks of gaps. Yeah. And that, it's, it's that's not, our big problem. Yeah. But if you instead work with the thick parts, that's no. not, no, that's nope. not great. Nope. Total failure. No, no, hold like, on. Abject failure. <laughs> okay. I think I might be onto something. I feel better now that we've gotten rid of some of the clay. Because look, as that clay goes away, and it is super serrated because of the bubbles, but we're getting that raw plastic that okay. we created. I've got it pretty thin on each side. I'm gonna try to, to make it to kind of a, okay. a razor's edge. Something that'll pierce the jugular of a freaking undead walker. I don't think that's gonna be a concern because everybody knows you gotta take out their brain. Okay. In my mind, I'm gonna decide that this is gonna be kind of an arrowhead. It was supposed to be a knife. We even have all sorts of paracord and gaffer tape with which to make handles. We, we can still make it happen. We can still make it happen. Look at this. I kind of feel like you're trying to make that last sliver of soap last that's before exactly, you open another box. That's exactly what's happening. Let's say, in theory, you were able to fashion an arrowhead out of pure plastic at this point. Sure. And let's say you could get stuff like clay maybe from the arts and crafts section of yeah. prison. Most prisons have a Hobby Lobby. All right, here's what I'm Closed on do. Sundays. Give, give that a try. You, you keep doing that. I'm gonna take Big Daddy, try to file it into a decent point because this guy, I don't know, man. I think we might be in trouble. This is not working. You gotta, you just gotta believe. We got a couple more of these. We got a couple of different uh, files okay. here. All right. Meanwhile, I'll be occupied with this fool's errand. <laughs> what, what uh, salvaging this this thing? This is not. There's no salvaging it. You you got it. You got to put something like like a pencil or something. Something that'll that'll well, provide. Well, then I'll just stab people with a pencil. Interior structure. You need interior structure. I really thought this was going to work. Phenomenal. You thought it was going to be a slam dunk. It's gonna work. I think it'll just be a bit uglier than we thought. A bit. Pluck on this and feel how unbrittle that is. Oddly gummy. Gooey, right? Yeah. Like, like a chewing gum, basically, right? It's, it's like the clay I'm gonna is mixed bet, with the stuff. Well, that's what it feels like, but I'm gonna bet that those are areas where the chemical reaction didn't finish. And so you got this kind of gummy stuff, but peeling it away actually brings me to a place where I think, I think we're gonna get a reasonably sharp shiv. Did you just break it? No. It looks a little broken. I just pulled you it have, out. You have two pieces in two different hands. I just pulled it out of the clay You've on got accident. a turd tube with a pokey bit at the end. <laughs> I know. It's, that's not There's gonna get you out else. of Rikers Island. There's what nothing else to do with it. This is the shard. Do you remember that show, The Dark Crystal? I do, yeah. This is the shard. Yeah. It's getting right there. There we go. That's a start. You're like the saddest kingpin. Oh, it'll break the skin. Already, I'm, I'm, I'm just like, 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 yeah, look at that, yeah. right? Come on. I can't believe the boat ended up being the right way to go. I know. My confidence was always in this one. You realize we have no backups. Uh, yeah. We have to have a name for the shard. Oh, uh. <sighs> Shardic, hmm. the shard. Shart. No, that's. <laughs> Fine, so it shall be. <laughs> I'm 12. We all see what we want to see. I believe in the sharts, as you love to call her. <laughs> her. Her. Feeling That's looking it? formidable. Yeah. Picture this. Oh, hell, I'm dead. Like, are you starting to believe? I'm dead. Do we yeah. want to make it like a dirk thing that you, that you hold on to like this? I can flatten this out and then we can make a grabbable thing? I th yeah. What if we took some of these other pieces and just sort of made it into a stabbable? Terrible idea. Terrible idea. Looks great. Looks like absolute trash. Uh, Terrible idea. Don't nobody do asked you. Nobody asked you. You actually That's literally not. just asked me. Didn't put a whole lot into the thought of the shape, did you? I I know it should be Dirk-like. How's that starting to feel to you? Yeah. 
You think that's it? I think so. Look at it. This looks like something that you would read about, like, this was taken from a cell right, in San here. Quentin prison. Here's some soft tissue on my neck. Don't stab through my neck. Oh, Jesus Christ! That was hard. You went hard, and it was near my neck. Ah, uh, was it? I was not ready for oh, that. Oh, it was right over here. It was, okay, 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 okay. Hot damn. <laughs> Let's find some other stuff. Oh, you just juiced on my face. Really? <laughs> Sorry. All right, ready? I'm gonna throw this, and I want you to stab it. What? Oh, right, that's ready? gonna go One, poorly. One, two, three. It was pretty good. Requiescat in pace. I don't know what that means. So hold on, what about this? Oh my God, what are you doing? Okay. Look at that, you see that piece right there? Uh, okay. Hey man, we kidnapped you fair and square. You can't escape. Oh really? Oh, <laughs> oh it broke. No, you broke it! No, it's fine, it's fine. You just eliminated the weak part. So I made it shorter and more effective. Okay. And I think it's sharp enough. I think it'll poke a jugular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I okay. have the perfect target for you. Gimme. You ready? What you got? What you got? <gasps> a zombie! So I guess the scenario is I'm kidnapped by pirate ninjas who want to torture me forever. Also, they're undead pirate ninjas and I need to escape so I could get back home to play the Walking Dead video game. Put this in perspective. This thing was made out of styrofoam. styrofoam. Yeah, and it could kill somebody. Right. I, you know what? I'm John McClaning it. I'm like. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I appear to be very strong. But did I did I poke his face? Oh yeah. Dude, that does. Dead center. Look at that. All right, let's have it. Come on. Give it to me. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, stop. Oh, okay. Don't do it. <laughs> Did you bring a chicken? A delicious rotisserie chicken. I don't want to ruin the chicken. That looks good. I got it at a convenience store. It's probably been in there for like three weeks. Well, but I'm also hungry. I will only stab the chicken if I could eat a piece. Oh, it's cold. Yeah, Is it's it been in the refrigerator. I'm going to eat a chicken and throw a chicken at you. You stab the chicken. Wait, what? You're right. going to throw it. One, three. Oh, this is a terrible idea. Shit, it's gonna fine, go everywhere. Fine idea. This is good chicken. <laughs> is it? Is it good? Okay. One. Yeah. Two. Three. You punch the chicken. You tore off a leg and then you ate the leg of a chicken. All right, here you go. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, you are killing the chicken. So where are we at on this? It certainly matters that you make sure there's not a lot of bubbles. The more bubbles, the more unstructural it is, but like the big one here, this thing will poke a hole. Oh yeah. It'll poke a hole in a guy. Yeah. Stab is usually the terminology. <laughs> Don't ever hear anyone saying he was poked to death. <laughs> no, they say stabbed. You can actually craft uh, an effective shiv out of it. You just have to do it in a certain way. You have to do it right. Can't be too thin, can't be too filled with air, can't be too long. Yeah, but otherwise, yeah, it works. I'm gonna guess if you're imprisoned by pirate ninjas, you'll have enough time to formulate a few different versions of this before you find the right one. I'm gonna say legit improvised weapon, well done. Let's clean up all this chicken. It's so gross. <laughs> did a television appearance in Istanbul, Turkey once. And this is before it was easy to do digital payments of everything. So if you were a variety entertainer moving from gig to gig, pretty much you didn't want a piece of paper that promised you some amount of money. You wanted currency. And if you were an American, you wanted American currency. And then they uh, paid me in $100 bills. Like I did the gig and I came back and it was like several thousand dollars. And they're like, okay, you ready to get paid? I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. And then they just started putting $100 bills in my hand. I got unintentionally physically aroused. <laughs> it was enough that I was like, oh my God, I'm holding lots of money. It was pretty great. <laughs> the modern road doesn't counterfeit, but sure knows a lot about it. Money is so weird. They're just pieces of paper that we believe in. Did you know that only 8% of all of the money in the world is physical currency? Now, when you say money in the world, you're talking about actual accounts. Like my bank account says I have, say, $1,000 in it. 
you're saying that maybe that thousand dollars isn't even in the bank. It's it just, never existed. It's just a, a series of numbers in a ledger somewhere. Okay, well, here's what I want to talk about is all of the weird mysteries of currency. This is stuff we handle every single day. And yet there's so much about a dollar bill I don't understand. Let's just start with the number 13. 13 colonies. I know there are 13 arrowheads. And then there's 13 stars above the eagle's head. Okay, that makes sense. 13 steps up the pyramid. That's clever. At the bottom here, it says MDCCLXXVI, which I believe is 1776, right? And how many characters are in there? One, two, three, four, five, 13. That's intentional? They picked that? That seems like a happy coincidence. I think so. Like, right? Yeah, right? Dude, uh, no wonder people are terrified of the Illuminati. Oh, yeah, because this just looks like an Illuminati uh, ticket to the Illuminati show. By know? the way, that part that says Novus Ordo Seclorum underneath, the story I always heard is that it was an Illuminati thing that meant like new secular order or something, and that when the guy presented the bill, FDR said, what does that mean? And he said, it means New Deal, which I figure that's got to be horse crap, right? right? That is probably nonsense. Too good to be yeah. real. Okay, so for all of the things that you see on a dollar bill, let's talk about the things that you don't see. Okay, now you are hopefully not about to mention the spider slash owl up in the corner that everyone on every comment of every scam school video points out to me, and I'm sorry, if you don't know if it's a spider or an owl, it's clearly neither. You're very passionate about I, I, this. Okay, I've been, it's been 10 years. 10 I don't years know what of it is. people tell, okay, <laughs> it's fine. I'm actually talking about how 94% of dollar bills have bacteria on them. I would imagine even more, right? Because think about it, it's got texture, so a lot of, of skin can nest in it as it's handled. It's handled by hands. You got germy skin, you got dust mites and all that stuff for them to thrive on. And have you ever, have you ever laundered your money? <laughs> you never wash this stuff, right? 7% of that 94% is stuff that can be harmful to you. Uh, all right. Yeah, the flu out in the open dies after 48 hours but it can live for 10 days on a dollar bill. Holy crap, I never thought about a benefit of going to a cashless society would be that we would actually save lives from this this weird, like, like hi, I'm touching disease money. Would you like to touch disease money? I don't want disease okay, money. That was actually the story of the game The Division. They had some engineered plague that stuck to dollar bills That's, and it wiped out most of the country. That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, horrible. No, it's great. That's my plan. I'm gonna do oh, that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, let's get to work. <laughs> this is one I have trouble swallowing, that 90% of all U.S. bulls have traces of cocaine on. Okay, I also thought that was bogus, but then when I read the explanation, first of all, the money very often is transported with the cocaine, so some number of bills get infected with cocaine. Of course, when we think of cocaine, you think of snorting it up your nose with a rolled bill, which I'm sure that happens as well, but think about it. One of those coke bills that's been used to snort goes into population where all it does is rub up on other bills. So think about the rollers on the ATM as they're feeding the bills in and out. They're getting covered in trace amounts of cocaine There's and cocaine so on. cocaine everywhere. One of my favorite misconceptions about money is about the $100 bill. Is it that people think Benjamin Franklin was a president? Yes! No! So many people think Benjamin Franklin was president. People are dumb. He was probably the most awesome founding father. They're the opposite of Benjamin Franklin. But everyone thinks, yeah, dead presidents. Give me some of those Benjamins. Then they correct you. They're like, I said dead precedents. He set quite a precedent <laughs> as a man of science. <laughs> was there ever a bill bigger than the $100 bill? Oh, yeah. There was like a $100,000 one, I Why think. Would you, that's like a, a bit with, from The Simpsons. With Woodrow Wilson on it? Really? Yeah. So what's some information you can glean? just by looking at a dollar bill. Because things I know is, first of all, we've talked about sequential bills before. When you get them brand new from the bank, they're all in order. And in fact, there's magic tricks you can do when most of the serial numbers are the same and oh, you can yeah. alter just one. Yeah. Also, that letter, the first letter on there, the L whatever, Yep. that tells you what Federal Reserve Bank that it came from. Oh, there's what, like uh, 12 or I'm, I'm going to guess 13 since 13 colonies. Uh, it goes up through L. Is L the letter 13? 12. 12. There's only 12. There's a hidden one somewhere. <laughs> there's got to be, right? This M is hidden somewhere under New Mexico. On the back of each $1 bill, you'll notice there's an individual number right there, which I believe is the plate that it was printed on. Oh. And so there's actually magic tricks that we've put together on Scam School where you can identify, you can have somebody write in s information on one side and then they're kind of marked because you can see this one's 12, this one's 55, and you're able to, to hand everyone back their bill. Did you know that much of the ink on American currency is magnetic? 
Yeah, in fact, that was my favorite thing we did on hacking the system. We had four counterfeit bills and one real bill, and you were able to watch as a magnet just pulled it down. In fact, do we have magnets? Can uh, we yeah. try that? Let me get some. Okay, so this is one of those powerful neodymium magnets. There are some metal detectors used by federal agencies that are so strong and so precise, they can tell exactly how much money you have in your wallet. The actual different de denominations? Yes. I guess there's some finite amount of ink that's gonna be different on a five than on a one. And all of this is intentional. All of this super fine detail. That's partly because it's difficult to print with such precision, right? Yes, it's all anti-counterfeiting measures. All right, can we talk about counterfeiting? Yes. Do you know who is obsessed with counterfeiting and counterfeiters? Who? Isaac Newton. He was appointed Warden of the Mint and used to love, on a Sunday afternoon, going and watching the hanging of counterfeiters. Oh, look how gravity works. <laughs> So if you were going to counterfeit some money, how would you do it? Well, the toughest thing is getting a hold of something that feels like money paper, right? Right. So I would imagine you would start with real money paper or secure it somehow. If you had actual money, maybe you could bleach it and then print a higher denomination on it? That's actually what one woman did. Uh, a hairstylist in like the Northeast, mm -hmm. she actually used degreaser and scrubbed off all of the ink of lower denomination bills with a toothbrush. You know, there's a classic scam that works this way. Way. Somebody shows up and they has a, a whole bunch of bricks of just black paper, it looks like. And they say, look, here's the thing. These are all $100 bills. They've been completely inked on both sides with a special kind of ink, and only this solvent will reduce it. So they, sure enough, they grab, they're like, grab any of those. They grab a piece and you take this black paper, you put it in this stuff, and then you do this process and that process. It's very fancy. And then at the end, it's a $100 bill. You're like, yeah, they're all hundreds. You're gonna have to take some time with all of this. I gotta get rid of it because this is all criminal drug money. So you just take all of this. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 10 bucks on the dollar. This is $10 million. Just give me a million dollars and you can do it all yourself. You're like, great. And of course, it's nothing but construction paper and a lie. And then someone is really wanted for the rest of their life. Uh, Hunted. My guess is that you've crossed a bridge at that point. <laughs> That's probably un not unfamiliar territory. Yeah. One of the other notorious counterfeiters had uh, taped over all of the like serial numbers and so forth and then soaked it in bleach and then reprinted higher denominations on top of these bills. So they were genuine serial numbers just with the wrong denomination on there. Exactly. That's a victimless crime, right? You can get away with doing that forever? Uh, Not so much? No, I don't think so. In fact, a common war technique when two countries are at war are to print lots and lots of counterfeit bills to overinflate their economy. That's not even just a wartime thing. North Korea is the number one supplier of $100 counterfeit bills. In fact, they're so good, they're so perfect, they're called super bills because they're dead on the nose. I've also read that uh, that Iran at some point had a large counterfeiting operation as well. That makes sense. Uh, it's all in an effort to destabilize your enemy. Which is so brilliant because you can use it in the country that you're trying to take down and you get their resources and in exchange they get nothing. Yeah. Plus during wartime, countries would use Use this money that they had counterfeited to pay informants that were living in that country. Oh, double sucker. Yeah. For academic purposes, sure. let's walk through the exercise. If we were going to counterfeit something, how would we do it? Not that I would, but if I was going to, first of all, I would get some kind of dark web enabled PC, something with relative anonymity. I would imagine somewhere in the dark web are high quality scans of currency like this, right? And that is important because a lot of photo editing software won't let you edit banknotes. As a magician, I can verify that the moment you try to scan one of these, Photoshop pops up, he's like, come on, man. Really? What are you doing? What are you doing? Really? Are you doing? Yeah. Now, that's not all of them. You can still get it done. Oh, sure. Yeah, you can you know, set it at its highest DPI scan and get a good image, but Printing it is another problem. Now, is it a case where once you print it, they can tell what printer it comes from? Yes, they were able to actually recently track down the documents that were leaked from a government contractor because of the little yellow dots on the printer. Okay, so you're talking about the thing where every single printout on any inkjet has a digital signature embedded in it. They can figure out the exact serial number of the exact printer that any document came from. Yes, the Electronic Frontier Foundation decrypted them a couple of years ago and determined that it's the date, the time, the serial number, and maybe even some other information that helps them track down exactly what printer this document came from. So you would need an untraceable printer. Yes, and even then it won't help because of all of the security measures. Yeah, so 
too. You're talking about like the fine details. Some of the printing is too precise for many ink jets to be able to handle. Yeah, and the ink, as we've already determined, is magnetic. Uh, on some of the bills, it's actually color changing yeah, as well. Yeah, I know. I'm looking at the 20 right now. If you hold it on this side, it looks green. On this side, it looks orange. And the bells on the $100 bill seem to dance when oh, you move really? them back and forth. I've never done that one. There's also water marking on there. You're able to see like ghost faces of, of dead presidents and all that stuff. Check it out. Since 1990, the $10 bill has had tiny crisp writing that is almost impossible to fake. Where? Yeah, let's see here, here where, where is it? Uh, trying to find it on here somewhere. Wait, wait, first of all, your eyes are garbage. Oh, they really are. <laughs> They're terrible. Uh, uh, well, if it's there, I can't see it. We'll have to rely on the internet. That's why when you counterfeit oh, something. Oh, 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 I think I read something. Look at that, you can barely see over Hamilton. Oh, wow. Wow, look at how fine that is. It says on there, show us what you got. <laughs> no, it says the United States of America, $10 to the United States of America. That's amazing. You can barely even see it. No, you can't even tell that it's on there. Yeah. It looks like just part of the pattern. Everyone knows about the security strip, right? You're not talking about the red and blue fibers in the paper. Oh no, but there are red and blue fibers threaded into the paper because what a lot of people don't realize is that it's more cloth than paper. Yeah, well, and, and part of that is durability because paper's gonna fall right apart. I mean, think about how many times you've put currency in your pants, washed them, and then it's been just fine afterwards. Yeah, it's like 25% cotton, 75% linen. It's called rag paper and it's really hard to get your hands on. So all of the bills have a security thread in them. So if you hold it up to the light, you can see the security strip there. And the security strip actually glows under a UV light, right? Yeah, and each one is a different color. Uh, well, here, let's try it out. Okay, so on the $10 bill, there it is. Oh, wow, it's yeah. dramatic too. Yeah, it's super, totally pops. Orange. 20 has one for sure. 20 is bright green. Uh, do you have a bet on what the color for the five will be? Blue. That's the only one left, right? <laughs> Yeah, it is, it's there blue. It is. It's blue. Dude, that's awesome. And another way that they can tell, an easy way, is to take what's called a counterfeit pen that has an iodine solution in it. You drop it onto the paper. This is the thing they do at the bank where they, they strip it on there. That's iodine? It's an iodine-like solution from what I understand. Okay. And it changes the color and lets you know if it's a counterfeit bill or not. All right, so money's hard to fake. There's a billion security measures, and I would imagine that the penalties are pretty terrible if you get caught counterfeiting. Usually, but... Uh -oh. There is one guy, Canadian Frank Barassa. He is a legend along the lines of your hero, Frank Abagnale. All the Franks. Yes, all the Franks. Frank Barassa convinced a Swiss paper company to sell him the actual type of paper. Wait, he just straight up bought the right paper? Yes. I thought that was illegal or something. He spent $300,000 to make 250 million. Wait a minute, so you're saying like he full on, he bought a press and just built, like like made his own super bills himself. Yes. 250 million dollars? In American money. But he cut a deal with the Canadian authorities. So he was not in America doing this. He was in Canada making American money where I imagine the penalty is like, come on, man, knock it off. You're gonna cause trouble with our neighbors down south. He cut a deal to turn over $200 million. He only told them 200 million, there was 250. He cut a deal and uh, Canada agreed not to extradite him. Wait, so, so okay, so, so, so America, I'm sure a, a quarter billion dollars, America wants him really bad. Canada says, oh, come on, eh, don't be that way. Yep. We're just hanging out at Tim Hortons. I'll borrow your crayons. I'll give them back tomorrow. Take off. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're very good at your Canadian accent. That's exactly what happened. Okay, but he gives the money or what they think is all the money, but he didn't even give all the fake money. He didn't tell them about the extra 50 million. He signed the deal and then they found out there was another 50 million, but they couldn't do anything because the deal was a deal. Wait a minute, so so did he do any jail time at all? No, he paid a small fee. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And now he works as a government consultant for a business fraud. I have a new hero, my new favorite Frank. I have two Franks. I have Frank Abagnale and Frank- Barassa. Barassa, holy yeah. cow, that's amazing. Yeah. Frank, please write us. We'd love to have you on the Modern Rogue. He's in the pantheon of the Modern Rogue. Yeah, he is. How long do you think cash is even gonna be around? <sighs> We're probably gonna have to switch to bottle caps in the next, like, two years. Yeah, because I plan to blow up civilization. The modern rogue ends civilization. <laughs> Grab your stealth, boy. It's on. <laughs> <laughs>